As wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo today on ABC News Live. History in the House. For the first time ever, the speaker is out. Now Kevin McCarthy says he won't run again. What happens next? Who could take his spot? And what this means for Congress? A mass shooting on a college campus. Five people are injured and classes are canceled at Baltimore's Morgan State University. What we know about the victims and the search for the shooter. Donald Trump is expected back in court. It's day three of the former president's civil fraud trial, why the judge issued a gag order against him. Plus, all eyes on him. The man accused of being involved in Tupac's murder is being arraigned. Why investigators say they believe Dwayne Davis was the so-called shot caller. But we begin with the historic ousting of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. After nine months in office, members of his own party led the charge to remove him making him the first House Speaker ever to be voted out. Now the House can't do any other business until a new Speaker is voted in. Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott is on Capitol Hill with the latest. For the first time in American history, the House of Representatives voting to remove its Speaker. The Office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. A mere handful of far-right Republicans turning against Kevin McCarthy after he worked with Democrats to make a short-term deal to keep the government funded. Do you think McCarthy could ever cleanse the Speaker's gavel again? No. McCarthy was silent as he left the House chamber. Then hours later, a sudden and unexpected announcement. He will not run for Speaker again. I don't regret standing up for choosing governing over grievance. I do not regret negotiating. Our government is designed to find compromise. McCarthy has been facing threats to his speakership from the moment he clinched the gavel. He won on the 15th round, only after making concession after concession to appeal to the far right wing of his party, allowing a single lawmaker to call a vote to remove him. Facing a mutiny, McCarthy realizing the odds were stacked against him. He would need Democrats to bail him out. Do you need their help to remain in leadership? No. Um, if five Republicans go with Democrats, then I'm out. So it's what it's it's Sounds whether likely. probably so. In the end, eight Republicans joined all Democrats to oust him as speaker. We need a speaker who will fight for something, anything. If this House of Representatives has exceeded all expectations, then we definitely need higher expectations. It left the vast majority of Republicans who are squarely behind McCarthy infuriated. It's a total distraction. It is some sort of pseudo psycho political fetish that we don't have time for. On his way out, McCarthy blasting those Republican rebels that sank his speakership. They don't get to say they're conservative because they're angry and they're chaotic. That's not the party I belong to. But those who voted to remove him already eager to move on. Our, our bench is very deep. There's a lot of people that could, could serve very well in that position. So the big question, what happens now? Well, there is no permanent speaker. All action in the House is halted until next week as Republicans try to elect a new one. Congressman Patrick McHenry will serve in a temporary role, but votes have been canceled for the week. Members are now leaving town, and the government shutdown deadline is looming large right before Thanksgiving. Diane. Rachel Scott on Capitol Hill, thank you. And Chief Washington Correspondent John Carl has more on what brought Kevin McCarthy down and what happens next. Hi, John. Now that McCarthy is gone, it's unclear what's going to happen next. I mean, there will be an election for a new speaker. Steve Scalise, who is the number two in Republican leadership, uh, seems to be uh, clearly beginning gearing up for a run. Uh, Jim Jordan is also considering a run. He's a hardline Republican who was also an ally of Kevin McCarthy. But McCarthy was brought down by just a handful of Republicans, and it's far from clear that anybody else uh, can get the votes to be elected speaker. And in the end, McCarthy was brought down because, largely because, he went out and got Democratic votes for a bill to keep the government running, to prevent a government shutdown for a mere 45 days. Uh, that was the final straw for the hardliners that voted uh, to oust him. But it raises the question of even if anybody can get elected, even if a Scalise or a Jordan or somebody else can get elected, can they govern? Can they 
get the House Republicans together in a way to govern any more effectively than McCarthy did. Uh, given what we've just witnessed, uh, it's far from clear what the answer to that is. Diane. All right, Chief Washington Correspondent Jonathan Carl. Thanks, John. And the uncertainty on Capitol Hill is being felt on Wall Street. The Dow tumbled more than 430 points yesterday. This is the Fed signals interest rates are staying high. Chief Business Correspondent Rebecca Jarvis has more on that. Hi, Rebecca. It can seem like Wall Street runs purely on data and numbers, but there's also a psychology here. And there are signs that psychology is changing. The VIX, which measures fear here on Wall Street, spiking yesterday to its highest levels since May. Washington uncertainty is, of course, in the backdrop with the ousted Speaker of the House, a near government shutdown with no signs of future consensus, and public debt that is now 120% of GDP. And it's all happening in an environment with rising interest rates with the Fed signaling rates are going to stay higher for longer. That means it's more expensive to borrow, more expensive to pay off your credit cards, more expensive to take on a new mortgage or a car loan. The Labor Department and jobs are the one sign of optimism here in the economy with 9.6 million job openings more than expected announced yesterday and still nearly two jobs for every job seeker. Diane. All right, Chief Business Correspondent Rebecca Jarvis. Thanks, Rebecca. And a manhunt is underway after a shooting at Morgan State University in Baltimore. Authorities say five people are injured, four of them students at the historically black university. Faith Abube is there with more. Gunfire erupting on the campus of Morgan State University in Baltimore in the middle of homecoming week celebrations. Students and alumni running for cover in nearby buildings, telling us they heard multiple rounds of gunfire around 9.30 p.m. Everybody just kind of started screaming and alerting the people next to them that there was an active shooter and that we should all kind of like brace ourselves. It was terrifying because I'm away from home. According to police, the shooting wounded at least five people, all of them with non-life-threatening injuries. But no arrests immediately reported. The FBI joining the investigation. Emergency alerts triggering a shelter-in-place order for the entire campus. Thurgood Marshall Hall, they're in that high-rise. That is the location of the suspected shooters. Officers seen storming the historically black college. Dramatic video capturing SWAT teams clearing room by room. First responders taking victims out on stretchers. I just really try to initiate to everybody to get in there, get away from the windows, because our student center has a lot of big windows. Baltimore's mayor speaking out. When is enough going to be enough? When will the sanctity of American lives outweigh the sanctity of American guns? And Diane, that shooter remains on the run this morning. University officials have canceled classes for the day out of an abundance of caution. And they say they plan to review plans for the rest of the homecoming week celebration. Diane. Faith Abube in Baltimore, thank you. Former President Trump is expected back in court today after being admonished by the judge in his civil fraud trial. Now he's facing a gag order barring Trump from commenting on members of the court staff. Senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky has the latest. Hi, Aaron. Former President Trump is coming back here for a third day of his civil trial after he was hit with a limited gag order. Trump angering the judge with a social media post disparaging his law clerk. With Trump sitting right in front of him, Judge Arthur N. Gorin scolded Trump about personal attacks on court staff and warned of serious sanctions if it happens again. Trump does not have to be here until he's called as a witness, but he speaks frequently in the hallway to complain about the judge and attack New York Attorney General Letitia James, who brought the case. Her team has been questioning an accountant who testified Trump controlled the financial statements the judge has already ruled were fraudulent because they made Trump seem far richer than he actually was. With Trump looking on, a defense attorney marveled how the accountant prepared the tax returns for the 45th president of the United States, then adding possibly even the 47th president of the United States. That drew a laugh when a lawyer for the state objected and the judge sustained it. But it shows, Diane, how Trump is trying to use his legal peril to every political advantage. Diane. Right, senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky, thank you. And the man suspected of ordering the murder of rapper Tupac Shakur will be in court today. Prosecutors say Dwayne Davis, also known as Keith D, will be charged with murder, even though he's not suspected of pulling the trigger. Instead, investigators say he orchestrated the fatal plan carried out in 1996. Davis has admitted in interviews and in his 2019 memoir that he provided the gun used in the drive-by shooting. 
He's expected to be in a Nevada court at 11.30 Eastern, and we will take that live when it happens. And nearly 75,000 health care workers are set to walk off the job this morning in what's being called the largest health care worker strike in U.S. history. The union for Kaiser Permanente says its contract expired this past Saturday. The health care industry is already facing staffing shortages, having never fully recovered from the pandemic. Mola Lenghi is in Englewood, Colorado with the latest. Roughly 75,000 health care workers in eight states are about to go on strike. You see the patient, it's, and it's hard not to get emotional. Priscilla Offerman is a patient coordinator at a Kaiser Hospital east of San Francisco. She's one of thousands of support staff, nurses, radiologists, and lab techs set for a three-day walkout after their contract expired this past Saturday. What we want is simple. We want Kaiser executives to listen to frontline health care workers and bargain in good faith. The union wants a starting wage of $25 an hour, $4 more than Kaiser is offering. They also want annual raises between 6 and 7 percent. Kaiser's proposed increase would cap out at 4 percent. Workers also demanding an increase to staffing levels after the pandemic decimated nursing ranks. Negotiations are ongoing, and Kaiser Permanente says a strike is not inevitable and it is certainly not justified, and that their goal is to reach a fair and equitable agreement that strengthens Kaiser Permanente as a best place to work. Kaiser executives can solve this if they show up with a sense of urgency, a mind towards solutions to really do deep investment and in workforce infrastructure that is needed. A strike could impact some 13 million patients, though hospitals and ERs would remain open, non-emergency procedures likely face delays. Kaiser Permanente telling ABC News that several provisions have been agreed upon as the two sides are at the table all night as these negotiations continue. Diane? I'm Ola Lange in Englewood, Colorado. Thank you. Meanwhile, starting today, the Vatican is holding high-level meetings on the future of the Catholic Church. Delegates from all over the world are gathering for what's expected to be a defining moment for Pope Francis's reform agenda. The meetings come after the Pope suggested there could be a way to bless same-sex unions in the church. Foreign correspondent James Longman is at the Vatican with more. Hey, James. Yeah, hi, Diane. Pope Francis is convening a global gathering here in Rome to discuss the future of the Catholic Church. The Synod will last most of this month, and for the first time, lay people and women will get a vote on specific issues alongside bishops and other members of the clergy. Now, that is a radical change. It's seen as part of France's effort to make the Vatican a more inclusive institution with less of a focus on hierarchy. Some 450 attendees will discuss some of the most controversial issues of the day, including the role of women and greater inclusion of LGBT people. People, but there have already been some major disagreements over these issues. Five of the most conservative cardinals have written to Francis saying that they think that the Synod sows confusion and they've asked for clarity on same-sex unions. But the Pope is clearly keen to tackle these criticisms head-on. He published his response. He said it was clear he would not stand in the way of blessings of same-sex unions in church. Now, that's not marriage. It's important to make that distinction. But it is still a major reversal. Francis told these cardinals with with much sincerity, I tell you, it's not good to be afraid of these questions. Diane? Foreign correspondent James Longman, thanks for that. And we have some breaking news now. Former President Trump is leaving Trump Tower, making his way to court for day three of the civil fraud trial against him. We just saw the former president getting in the SUV. Now, the New York Attorney General has accused former President Trump and his sons and other executives of a fraudulent scheme to inflate Trump's net worth while lowering his tax burden. A judge has already ruled they engaged in fraud and canceled the company's business certificate to New York. The trial will now decide what additional penalties Trump and the other defendants could face. Trump has denied all wrongdoing. His attorneys have argued that he's a master at finding values where other cannot, others can't. Trump is also now facing a gag order after the judge admonished him about a social media post telling him not to make personal attacks on members of the court staff. And do stay with us for full coverage of Trump on trial throughout the day. Coming up, new details on the nine-year-old girl abducted while on a family camping trip. What we're learning about the suspect and a ransom note. Also ahead, the parents of a former U.S. swim star found dead break their silence. Why they say their daughter's death in the U.S. Virgin Islands was no accident. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky. 
No match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. Police are sharing new details about the raid that saved a nine-year-old girl who'd vanished while camping with her family. A 46-year-old man is now charged with kidnapping after police say they found the girl in a closet inside his home. Stephanie Ramos has that story. Nine-year-old Charlotte Senum, who was abducted on a family camping trip in upstate New York, now back home with her family as authorities reveal new details about the kidnapping and how she was rescued. She was very emotional. I can't imagine what was going through a nine-year-old's head as all this is going on. Police tracking down and charging 46-year-old Craig Ross Jr. with first-degree kidnapping. A ransom note left in the family's mailbox early Monday, the key to breaking the case. A fingerprint on it matched to Ross, who had been arrested for a DWI in 1999. He was in the area, the opportunity presented itself, and he, and he took advantage of that. Investigators tracking down Ross and Charlotte in a camper on his mother's property in Boston Spa, New York, Monday, about 22 miles away from where she was taken Saturday at Moreau Lake State Park. The fourth grader last seen riding her bike alone around a short loop on the campgrounds. That bike found minutes later. Authorities telling ABC News it was upright on its kickstand. SWAT teams descending on this rural property where they say they found Charlotte inside a small bedroom closet, the size of a cabinet, wearing an adult sweatshirt. <laughs> Charlotte's family overjoyed she's home. Her aunt telling WGNA radio minutes before they got news of the rescue, Charlotte's mom was hopeful. And she said, I just, I don't know, mother's intuition, I just feel like there, she, she's coming home today. Diane, police tell us they are trying to give the little girl and her family some space as they try to piece together this timeline of her disappearance. As for the suspect, he is scheduled to appear in court October 17th. Diane. All right, Stephanie Ramos, thank you. And the family of the former swimming champion who died of an alleged fentanyl overdose is raising questions about her death. Jamie Kale was found dead in the Virgin Islands. Now her family's sharing new details about the case, saying they suspect foul play. Janae Norman has this exclusive interview. A grieving family demanding answers in the death of their daughter, a former swimming star found dead in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Jamie was getting ready to leave the island on March 14th. She was coming home. It makes no sense. Um, all the evidence out there uh, has been completely overlooked. What we are looking for is justice for Jamie. We're looking for truth. 
Pat and Gary Kale claim island authorities haven't been forthcoming with details into their daughter Jamie's death, limiting access to information and withholding an official copy of the autopsy. We had somebody that we, that we authorized to go to the funeral home and to view, and that's all they would allow us, all they would allow her to see and she photographed the face. So we don't know what the rest of the, if there's anything else on the rest of the body uh, because we don't have the autopsy report. The family sharing those photos, too graphic to show here with ABC News. She had a black eye. Um, her forehead appeared to have had a blunt trauma to the forehead. Um, it appeared that her nose had been broken. Her lips had blood around them. Kale was a high school champion swimmer from Maine, winning a gold medal in the 1997 Pan Pacific Championship 800 free relay. She then notched silver at the 1998 Swimming World Cup in Brazil. She lived in the U.S. Virgin Islands for nearly two decades. The 42-year-old was found unresponsive in her home by her boyfriend back in February. According to the original police release, Kale's boyfriend, with the help of a friend, then took Kale to a nearby clinic where she CPR was rendered, but Kale succumbed to her ailment. But months later, authorities saying she died of an accidental fentanyl overdose. Her family insists Jamie didn't use drugs. Never. Jamie Kale never did drugs. Never. There's no way that she had fentanyl in her voluntarily. And her family believes critical evidence like those facial injuries is being overlooked. We reach out to authorities to ask about the investigation and those unexplained injuries, but haven't heard back. Diane. All right, Janae Norman, thank you. Coming up, the Federal Trade Commission's claims about a secret algorithm used by Amazon. How agents say the code named Project Nessie was used to drive up prices. But first, how one man is changing the lives of America's heroes one golf ball at a time. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head. That night, everything changed. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. Reporting in Moscow, Idaho, I'm Kana Whitworth. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. An 80-year-old man is making a difference for wounded warriors one golf ball at a time. 
Bob Duke sells stray golf balls to raise money for injured service members. And now he's up to nearly $500,000. Danny New has his story. This is Bob. Bob Duke turned 80 years old last month, but there's no time to celebrate. He's got golf balls to deliver. I fill my pickup truck full of golf and balls so I can replaces restock. Replaces the balls, gets the money, comes back, goes to the bank. <laughs> Bob and Vicky first started collecting about 12 years ago when Bob, a retired master sergeant who served in the Army for 36 years, there's probably 600 golf balls on these. Wanted a fundraise for the Wounded Warrior Project, which serves veterans who are healing. I said, I'm going to start giving them money because I live on a golf course and people need golf balls. It started with Bob collecting balls from their home course in North Carolina and then selling them to his neighbors for $5 a dozen. But now, as you can see, this mission has exploded into a top-notch production, especially here in the attic. To worry about the whole ceiling <laughs> from our attic falling down. And as you look around, golf balls everywhere. People drop off buckets of golf balls all the time. Clubs around the country ship them to him. And then he sells dozens in these little displays that you saw earlier. Welcome to our garage. Vicki gave up her parking spot and <laughs> it was wonderful. I'm very honored and humbled. And recently, Bob and Vicky got a big thank you for their years of service after raising nearly, get ready, nearly $500,000 to help veterans. It just made it all worthwhile. <laughs> Bob was very touched, but hey, he's not done yet. Look me up if you need some golf balls. Danny New, thank you. Coming up, the alleged shot caller in Tupac Shakur's death heads to court. Why he's being charged with murder even though prosecutors say he didn't pull the trigger. Also ahead, a new study on Ozempic, what it says about the drug's long-term effect on weight loss. Plus, the bed bug warning, what Paris is doing about a widespread issue plaguing public spaces. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. 
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Former President Trump has arrived at the courthouse in New York City for day three of the civil fraud trial against him. The New York Attorney General is accusing Trump and his sons and other executives of a fraudulent scheme to inflate Trump's net worth while lowering his tax burden. There's the former president just moments ago entering the courthouse. Now, the judge in this case has already ruled that they did engage in fraud and canceled the company's business certificates in New York. The trial will now decide what additional penalties Trump and other defendants could face. Trump has denied all wrongdoing, and his attorneys have argued that he's a master at finding value where others can't. Uh, Trump's also now facing a gag order after the judge admonished him about a social media post telling him not to make personal attacks on members of the court staff. Do stay with us for full coverage of Trump on trial throughout the day. But of course, we also have a lot of other news to get to. Here's a rundown right now. Republicans are expected to hold an election for a new Speaker of the House next week after ousting Kevin McCarthy. Eight Republicans the voted with Democrats to remove McCarthy, the marking the House first time in American history the House has voted a Speaker out. Vacant. Now, McCarthy says he won't run for speaker again. I don't regret standing up for choosing governing over grievance. I do not regret negotiating. Our government is designed to find compromise. Sources tell ABC News House Majority Leader Steve Scalise is now calling members to see if they would support him for the position. And get ready for the biggest Powerball jackpot so far this year. The Powerball drawing is now worth $1.2 billion. It's the third largest Powerball jackpot ever and the seventh largest in any U.S. lottery. And it is Fat Bear Week. Voting opens today for the annual competition to rank Alaska's bulkiest brown bears. Katmai National Park says the bears have spent the summer fattening up on salmon, berries, and grasses, and that fat is fit as they prepare for their winter hibernation. You can cast your votes for Fattest Bear at fatbearweek.org. And the man accused of ordering the murder of Tupac Shakur is set to be arraigned in a Nevada court today. Prosecutors say Dwayne Davis will be charged with murder even though they don't believe he pulled the trigger. He's said to be the last living witness to the rapper's fatal 1996 drive-by shooting. Criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Bernarda Villalona is joining me now for more on this. Uh, Bernarda, in his own memoir, Davis says that he was in the front passenger seat of this car and that he passed the gun used in the shooting to the back seat before the shots were fired in this drive-by. How will he now defend himself in court? How challenging is this defense going to be given the admissions he's already made. Well, this is going to be a huge challenge for him because the actual passing and the providing of the deadly weapon that was used to kill Tupac Shakur, that right there is fatal. That's why he can't argue that he was just merely present inside of the vehicle because that goes to show the evidence that he aided and abetted the commission of this crime, of this shooting that led to the fatal death of Tupac Shakur. The question will be now is at the time that he goes to trial, is he going to say, I lied in a memoir. That wasn't me. I was doing it in order to get some fame or to make some money. But then it also forces him, if you are going to go that route, are you going to testify? Are you going to take the stand? So he has some huge hurdles to fight, but he can also argue, wait, well, I wrote that memoir in 2018. It's 2023. So why are you coming after me now? Now, if he's admitted for years to being in the car and providing the gun, why did it take so long to arrest him? This happened in 1996. Well, there are many issues. So you got to think, even in 1996, law enforcement had a lot of the evidence that they have now. But what you know in the sense of, OK, we have an idea was you, is different than what you can prove in court. So they had to find evidence that they can present inside of a courtroom. So now using his own words, his interviews, his podcast, the YouTube interviews, and his 
but his memoir itself, they're going to use that against him. Also, they had to find corroborating evidence because you can't just use a person's statement alone to try to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt. So they couldn't just come in and say, here's his 2019 memoir. He says he did this. Case closed. Not enough. Not enough. They have to get corroborating evidence. And also, you got to think what witnesses are available because Suge Knight, yes, he was in the car. Yes, he's a witness. But will he cooperate? He's already said he's not going to cooperate. So I want to ask you about that because Suge Knight was driving the car that night that Tupac was in. He has he has um, disputed the allegations that it was Davis's nephew who was the actual shooter, but he says he won't testify in this case. So what do they do? Can they force him to testify? They can force him to testify. I was a former prosecutor, and when we wanted to get witnesses to testify, you can apply to get a material witness order where you have a judge that signs an order that says you are material and have material information as to the guilt in this case, and we want you to come in and testify. However, it's going to be difficult because, one, Suge Knight, he's in custody. He's going to be in custody for years. I believe he's serving a 30-year sentence. And aside from that, he's given so many conflicting statements that he's not a credible witness at this point. So I don't see Suge Knight taking the stand in this trial. Uh, quickly, Bernardo, what are you watching for in the arraignment today? Well, I want to see whether he's going to say anything. Is he going to make any statements? Highly unlikely, because if I were his defense attorney, I wouldn't say anything except the words not guilty. But I am curious to see whether the prosecutor will provide us with additional information in terms of what evidence they have now that is different from what they had in 1996 to actually make an arrest in this case. Because we do have the indictment, we do have the probable cause, the search warrant, but it doesn't give us much insight as to what the actual evidence is aside from their using his statements. All right, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, Bernardo Villalona. Good to see you, Bernardo. Thank you. Thank you. And you can watch Impact by Nightline special, Who Shot Pac? The Murder of Tupac Shakur, now streaming on Hulu. And now to the alert we'll all be receiving on our phones today. FEMA will be testing its cell phone emergency alert system. It's an annual test to make sure the system used to warn about national emergencies is working. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has more on what we can expect. Hi, Eva. So today our cell phones are going to go off with an alert, but don't panic. It's just a test for FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. This is the yearly test to make sure the system to warn you about public and national emergencies is in fact working. The test will happen at 2.20 this afternoon, Eastern Time, 11.20 Pacific. Any cell phone that is on and in range of a tower should get the alert. Wireless providers will transmit the test for 30 minutes, but don't worry, it won't be a constant alarm. Your phone should get the test only once. Diane. Keep an ear out for that. Thank you. And the Federal Trade Commission claims Amazon used a secret algorithm to drive prices up on its site in a practice codenamed Project Nessie. Now Amazon claims it was just used for price matching. Rebecca Jarvis has more. The secret algorithm, codenamed Project Nessie, according to redacted documents from the FTC's antitrust lawsuit against Amazon, allowed the retail giant to raise prices and watch competitors to see if they'd follow, forcing prices higher, allegedly overall for consumers. Now, that algorithm was also allegedly used to track and undercut competitors, so if a competing retailer lowered its prices, Amazon could follow suit. The company stopped using the algorithm in 2019, and a source telling the Wall Street Journal that Amazon made more than a billion dollars in revenue through use of the algorithm. Amazon declining to confirm that number to ABC News, but telling ABC News that the FTC is wrong on the facts and the law, noting that Project Nessie was a project with a simple purpose to try to stop our price matching from resulting in unusual outcomes where prices became so low that they were unsustainable. And this is all part of the government's lawsuit against Amazon claiming it is too powerful and a monopoly. Diane? All right, Rebecca Jarvis, thank you. Coming up, tens of thousands of child care centers are now at risk of closing. Why they're losing funding and what families can do to get the help. Also ahead, a new study shows a new study on Ozempic, what it says about the drug's long-term effect on weight loss. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
Get Ready America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, millions of families across the country are bracing for a major change in child care as a pandemic era emergency funding program expires. Tens of thousands of child care centers are now at risk of closing. Business reporter Alexis Christophorus has more. Tracy Hansen has been caring for young children in Colleen, Texas for 28 years, but she worries she'll have to shut down her child care center. We are hanging on by our fingernails. That's because $24 billion the federal government gave to child care centers during the pandemic has dried up, threatening to leave 3.2 million kids without care and putting 70,000 child care programs at risk of closing. With the extra money, I was able to give pay raises, paid time off for employees. I've supported families that were not able to afford tuition. I've been able to do some repairs on the building and we've revamped our playground. Without the extra funding, she's had to raise tuition and reduce hours, but says even that may not be enough. I tell myself I'm gonna give it six more months, but in reality, I just don't see us being able to make it. That would be a devastating blow to Shelby Lynch and her growing family. Her son has been attending Tracy's daycare center for years, and Shelby herself even went there as a child. It would be disastrous. My husband, with his job, he's the breadwinner, so I would have to be the one that stays at home. The average cost of child care in the U.S. now tops $10,000 a year for one child. That's more than in-state college tuition in dozens of states. Tuition for Shelby's four-year-old son, Aiden, just went up another $80 a month. And with a daughter on the way, she and her husband worry how they'll afford it. We put off having kids for so long because we knew daycare was expensive. We still have to pay almost a mortgage payment for childcare, and it's, it's just a lot. A similar scenario was playing out in Boyd, Wisconsin, where registered nurse Amanda Koenig says she and her husband got sticker shock when they saw their child care bill for the upcoming year. That fear of knowing that we're probably going to have to go paycheck to paycheck sometimes is, is very overwhelming. It's not just daycare, it's groceries, it's gas, it's, you know, all the things added up that you need just to live. Daycare four days a week for her two children would have cost $1,840 a month. But Amanda's mother-in-law has agreed to watch the baby once a week. We're saving over $400 a month by doing that. Um, we're very fortunate and grateful that we, we can get that extra help. 
Many families are not so lucky. Pre-COVID, Tracy Hansen had 150 children at her center. That number has dwindled to 63. Pandemic-era child care funding was always meant to be temporary. Democrats have been attempting to push through a $16 billion child care funding package that would offer assistance for another five years. But without GOP support, the bill faces an uphill battle in Congress. Parents are having to choose, and it's not making economical sense for them to be working outside the home and then paying for child care. And Alexis joins me now for more on this. Alexis, what can families do to try to ease the burden of child care costs? Well, as you saw in the piece with Amanda, she was one of the lucky ones because her mother-in-law is able to help out with her son. So if you can, tap family, tap friends. Even if they can help out for a few hours or a day, that can really be, uh, be a savings. But we know that's not an option for everyone. Make sure that you are also getting the tax credits that you are eligible for, the child uh, care tax credit and also the dependent care and child child tax credit. Both of these were more generous during the pandemic, but they still do exist. And you should definitely look into whether or not uh, you qualify. Also check with your employer. Are there perks, child care perks, maybe you're unaware of? Can you work a flex uh, schedule? Even working remotely one day a week could be a big help. And see if they have the dependent care FSA or flex spending account, which allows you to put pre-tax dollars aside for child care, including before and after school programs. That's, that's a big one. And finally, for low-income families, Families. Lots of states offer assistance. Go right to your state's website and check out the resources there. Now, child care was in crisis even before the pandemic. So what's the biggest challenge facing the industry now? Definitely in crisis before the, the, the pandemic. And one of the big issues is, you look, Americans spend about 27% of their income on child care. So it's, you know, it's unsustainable for so many folks. They just can't find the help. Right now, the average educator or teacher for child care makes about $12.5 an hour. That's less than most fast food workers do. They saw a bunch of those workers leave during the pandemic, and they're not going back. When I was talking to that child care owner, she was saying her biggest issue right now, she cannot offer her workers a living wage. All right, Alexis Christophers, thank you. And now to one dad's dramatic transformation after he says he took control of his health and lost 100 pounds in six months without medication. He's now sharing his tips for others. Andrew Dimbert has more. It wasn't the 15 pounds he gained during lockdown or the medications he was taking for high blood pressure and gastric reflux. Jamie Wooldridge's motivation to lose weight was this photo taken by his wife one day in church. I may or may not have fallen asleep, but anyway, the photo was not flattering at all. And and it was like, OK, I need to do something about this. Within six months, the 285 pound retiree from South Lake, Texas, had lost 100 pounds. Now he's helping others learn from his journey, starting with calorie counting. I was really shocked to see that I was probably consuming four to five thousand calories a day. It was it was humbling for his age and activity level jamie should have been getting 3300 calories a day so he joined an app for counting calories and cut to 2200 calories a day for weight loss while the pounds came off he never deprived himself of his favorite foods i'm gonna have pizza well i'm just gonna budget that into my my calorie allotment for the day he was already walking miles every day at some point he started running too sharing his journey on tiktok did my 5k and i'm gonna finish it up with about a seven mile walk this type of dramatic weight loss is likely not possible for most people. Dr. Veronica Johnson, who is not Jamie's physician, says anyone making significant changes to their diet should talk with a doctor. I think taking a, a step back and, and looking at your overall health and when you have these things in a better place, your overall health is improved. He recognized that he was struggling with his weight, but he also recognized that his cholesterol was elevated, his blood pressure was elevated, he was on the verge of having diabetes, and so he felt that losing weight would improve all of those markers. For healthier eating, Jamie decreased his processed sugar intake, used substitutions like low-fat mayo to reduce calories, and used an air fryer to cut the fat out of his favorite recipes, like French fries. His big tip for newbies, plan accordingly for life's events. Every month there's gonna be something. There's so many tools out there that can help you be successful. If I can do it, you can do it. How to stick with it? Jamie says make your resolution your routine. And he says it's not as hard as it sounds, but anybody who chooses to change their diet or is eager to lose weight should talk to their provider and determine the best course of action for them.
Diane. All right, Andrew Dimber, thank you. And a new study shows people with type 2 diabetes using the active ingredient in Osempic and Wegovi maintained improvements in blood sugar control and weight loss for three years. The study involved more than 23,000 people over three years. ABC News medical contributor and physician at Stanford Children's Health, Dr. Alok Patel, joins me now for more. Dr. Patel, what stands out to you from this study? What stands out is the sustained benefit over the course of three years. A lot of the headlines people have seen regarding Osempix, semaglutide, and these drugs have been over the course of this year. A lot of short-term benefits, and not necessarily a generalized population. So this study is really showing what can happen if people have good adherence, meaning if they're prescribed to take these medications, that they are doing it on a weekly basis over the course of many years, sustaining the side effects, following their healthcare team, that they're seeing a weight loss in this study about 10 pounds, that they are seeing a reduction in their blood sugar and overall beneficial health. Now, it's important to note that this study was partially funded by the manufacturer, and it's yet to appear in a peer-reviewed journal, but this is an important step forward as you start having the conversation about these long-term weight management solutions for certain individuals with a high BMI or with type 2 diabetes. So how can people test their blood sugar, and what should they know about the results? Well, the most important thing for people about their blood sugar is to realize that we all have certain amounts of blood sugar. We need them to live. You can have short-term symptoms if you have too low blood of sugar. Too high blood sugar, you could be pre-diabetic or diabetic, and that can cause some long-term complications. If people have questions or concerns about testing their own blood sugar, you want to check in with the healthcare professional. Now, the metric for measuring blood sugar in this study, which a lot of people have heard about, is called A1C or hemoglobin A1C, quick med school 101 overview. We all have hemoglobin, that's the part of our red blood cells that carry oxygen over time. You can have sugar kind of bind to that, and the, the A1C test is a measure of that over the course of three months. So we want that number to be below 6%, roughly about 5.7%. When we start getting above 6.5%, that's when your physician may worry about prediabetes or diabetes. The average person can expect to get tested for this about every three years if you're high risk, one to two. People with diabetes every six months. But again, it's important to check in with your doctor if you are concerned about your blood sugar or if you want to check it more frequently. Now, for those who are thinking about using a semaglutide drug for weight loss or diabetes, what should they know? What should they know is part of the question you just said right there, is that the indications are for weight loss and diabetes in certain individuals, and you want to do this under physician guidance. Diane, Osempic is not a quick fix. It is not something that people should just take without having the right medical indications. There can be side effects. And again, as we we're talking about with this study, adherence is important. If people are prescribed this medication, expect to take it for a long period of time, several years, if not for the rest of their life, and only stop taking it if directed by a physician. And also, these medications, including any weight loss medications, are part of an overall healthy lifestyle plan that would include healthy nutrition, dieting, exercise, and one of your favorites, sleep. It's a big one. ABC News contributor, physician at Stanford Children's Health, Dr. Alok Patel, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, former President Trump is in a New York City court for a third day. We are awaiting to see him enter the courtroom. Now, why he's choosing to be there and why the judge issued a gag order against him right after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Fulton County Courthouse in Atlanta, Georgia, I'm Olivia Rubin. Wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Former President Trump has arrived at court for day three of the civil fraud trial against him. A judge has already ruled Trump, his sons, and other executives engaged in fraud and ordered their business certificates in New York canceled. Now the trial will decide what additional penalties Trump and other defendants could face. Trump's also now facing a gag order after the judge admonished him about a social media post telling him not to make personal attacks on members of the court staff. Senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky joins me now from the courthouse along with ABC News legal uh, contributor Kim Whaley for more. Aaron, we saw uh, the former president walk into the courthouse. We haven't yet seen him making way, his way into the actual courtroom. Uh, talk to us about what you expect to see in court today. Well, the uh, testimony is going to continue of an accountant who used to work closely with the Trumps in preparing his annual financial statements, which the judge has already ruled to be fraudulent. And under direct examination, the accountant, Don Bender, testified that it was the Trumps that were really in control of those statements. They're the ones that provided the numbers. Aaron, I'm going to interrupt you for one second because we are seeing the former president now. It looks like he's speaking. Let's listen. We have a prosecutor, Leticia James, who's incompetent and what she's doing to our state, forcing companies out by the thousands, forcing people out, They're forcing companies out by the thousands, while crime and violent crime in particular runs rampant. So this witch hunt does not allow me a jury. A lot of people say, oh, that can't be possible. Somebody didn't check a box. It has nothing to do with it. Under 6312, you are not entitled to a jury. It's the first time it's ever been used for a purpose like this. Never been used. They used it on me. The former president, the leading candidate, I'm leading Joe Biden by a lot, which is probably why this is all happening. Not probably, but it's definitely. They're coordinating with Washington, 100%. But without that, none of these cases would be going on. They've weaponized justice in our country. This trial is a disgrace. Never happened, a thing like this has never happened before, and just simply, I put in financial statements with a disclaimer. In other words, don't even bother reading them to the banks. I borrowed money on, very under leverage, borrowed money on a building or something, many different things. I borrowed the money, I paid back the money in full, 100%. There were no defaults, there were no letters of reprimand, the banks were extremely happy, and in many cases I paid the money back early. And then I got sued years later by this horrible attorney general, this woman that ran for governor and failed. You know, she did this because she was running for governor. And then she ran and she failed. She had no polls and they forced her out. And she came back and she became attorney general again. Uh, and we got stuck with her. So she brought the case under the statute that had never been used for a thing like this before, ever. We're not entitled to a jury. Because if I had a jury, even though it's in New York, and I think I'd be fine with New York, but if I had a jury, we'd win this case very easily. But I don't have a jury. And you see what's happening. This is a railroading. And it's the beginning of communism in our country. This is the beginning of communism. So 
we're going back in, playing the game, we're doing everything right. But just you remember, I borrow money, the statements were perfect. Not only perfect, the statements are much more conservative than my real net worth. My real net worth is much higher, not lower, much higher than the statements. So I put the statements in. They don't use the statements because it has a disclaimer clause. They do their own work. The clause tells them, do your own due diligence, do your own work. And that's where we are. And I got sued. And I hear I, I may be guilty of a lot for no reason. They may give a lot of money for something where there was nothing wrong. This is a witch hunt. This is just a continuation of the witch hunt that started the day I came down the escalator in Trump Tower. And it's a shame for our country. You borrow money, you pay it back, the bank loves us. They said, what did he do wrong? He didn't do anything wrong. We loaned him money, a big bank. These are big banks, by the way, represented by the biggest law firms, most prestigious, the best law firms in the country. You borrow money, you pay it back, and you get sued by a political animal. And that's where we are. And that's the way it goes. And that's why New York State is failing. And that's why companies are leaving by the thousands. I'll see you later. Mr. President, Mr. President who, should should be who should be speaker? Who should be speaker? Who should be speaker, Mr. President? Uh, a lot of people have been calling me about speaker. All I can say is we'll do whatever's best for the country and for the Republican would, Party. Would you we'll take a job? Great people. Would Mark you take Taylor. a job? We have some great, great people. Would you take a job? A lot of people have asked me about it. I'm focused. You know, we're leading. I don't know you. I'm sure you don't read too much in the papers. But we're leading by like 50 points for president. You know, my focus is totally on that. If I can help them during the process, I would do it. But we have some great people in the Republican Party that could do a great job as speaker. Well, what about Marjorie you? Taylor Greene called for you to be speaker yesterday. Did you accept? Well, I think she's a wonderful woman, Marjorie. And a lot of other people are called for that, too. I'll do whatever it is to help, but my focus, my total focus, is being president and, quite honestly, making America great again, because we are living in a country in decline. This is a country that's failing badly. We're not respected in the world. Interest rates are through the roof. Taxes are through the roof. Inflation is horrible. What it's done to us, it's eating us alive. Energy is now over $5. I was at $1.87. It's over $5. What's happened to our country with Afghanistan, that horrible removal, the most embarrassing moment, I think, in our country's history. So I'm running for president. I'm up by 40 and 50 points and more in some cases. But whatever I can do to help with regard to speaker is good. By the way, I'm also leading Biden by a lot. If I wasn't, I wouldn't have trials like this. Thank you very much. Thank How you. is Melania, Mr. President? Your family's going through a lot. That's former President Trump heading into the courtroom now for day three of his civil fraud trial, the civil fraud trial against him in New York City. We heard Trump, as he has said in the past, go after the Attorney General, Letitia James, uh, calling her incompetent, calling the trial itself a witch hunt. Uh, I want to bring in our legal contributor, Kim Whaley, uh, for, for a little bit of color on this. Kim, one of the things we heard Trump say today is that if he had a jury trial, he could win this easily, but he, it, this is a judge trial. The judge pointed out yesterday his attorneys could have requested a jury trial, so why didn't they? That's that's really a mystery. It could have just been an error that they waived the possibility, the opportunity of requesting a jury trial, or maybe there was sort of a political uh, calculation that he could play victim. But I think that's highly unlikely because in New York for this kind of a trial, uh, you need five out of six jurors to find uh, to issue a guilty uh, decision. Not, it's not a criminal case, but to find liability. And so if there are two people that made it through the jury selection process that just support Donald Trump, um, then it's possible he would have had a hung jury and would have walked away. And right now, the, the majority of this case has already been decided against him. The court already found that he, that he engaged in fraud and his companies engaged in fraud. So this trial right now is not about 
the major part of the case. It's really about what kind of damages and other injunctive relief he will have to uh, actually pay. It's not, the, the big stuff is already out the door and that was last week in, in a, the judge's written decision. Uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron Katursky is outside the courthouse. Aaron, he's also, as he has said in the past, outside that courtroom, said he borrowed the money and he paid the money back in full, essentially saying there are no victims here, the, the banks are happy. Um, and he's saying that all of these forms include a disclaimer, essentially telling the banks to do their own due diligence. Those are the arguments he's making outside the courtroom. How are those arguments holding up inside the court so far? They've already been largely rejected by the judge, but that is the cornerstone of Trump's defense here. Basically, the so what factor. Maybe his financial statements weren't, you know, on the up and up, but the, the banks made money in the end because Trump paid back his loans, didn't miss a payment. There were no real victims here. Nobody said they would no longer do business with Trump. There's even going to be a witness called uh, who, who says as much. And so to the Trumps, it, it, it doesn't matter what the financial statement said because they may or may not have been relied on by these very sophisticated institutions who are deciding whether to lend him money or give him insurance. And the judge has already said under the law, uh, it, the way the case is charged, it doesn't matter if the financial statements were put to use and, and any harm came from them. It, it, it's just the fact that they were prepared, uh, as the judge has said, fraudulently to make it seem like Trump was far wealthier than he really was. Uh, Kim, the judge also issued a gag order yesterday over a social media post uh, that Donald Trump had, had put up. How careful does he now have to be when he makes statements like the ones uh, he just did, when he just gets up and starts speaking in front of the camera? Well, because there's no jury, uh, the decision not just on liability, but also on damages is going to be made by this particular judge. And Letitia James has asked for a quarter of a billion dollars in disgorgement. Um, his former fixer, Michael Cohen, based on his, his experience, puts that number closer to $600 million. It's a big number. Uh, so I think he is at risk in, in further irritating this judge. Of course, the judge is going to do things within the boundaries of the law because, because he'll also be subject to appeal. He could also be put in contempt. Uh, contempt, number one, the first stage of contempt would be a, a financial penalty, which it's hard to believe in this moment what number is going to deter Donald Trump because um, he's facing some a huge uh, damages number and he's still, you know, acting like this. But the judge, you know, the the ultimate the ultimate is kind of unthinkable. But the ultimate uh, arrow in the judge's quiver is to actually revert him to to jail um, to in contempt of court. That's extremely rare. That's a rare remedy. But to go after the judge's clerk, these are people that are close to the judge. Uh, they're public servants. I'm sure he's going to be extremely protective of these people that just happen to be uh, employed by the courthouse in this moment and certainly aren't, aren't don't aren't deserving of this kind of uh, damaging public uh, attack. All right, we'll be watching those proceedings closely as they get underway. Aaron Katursky, Kim Whaley, thank you both. Meanwhile, Congress is in a bit of chaos after the historic ousting of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. After nine months in office, members of his own party led the charge to remove him, making him the first House Speaker ever to be voted out. Now the House can't do any business until a new Speaker is voted in. Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott is on Capitol Hill with the latest. For the first time in American history, the House of Representatives voting to remove its speaker. The office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. A mere handful of far-right Republicans turning against Kevin McCarthy after he worked with Democrats to make a short-term deal to keep the government funded. Do you think McCarthy could ever cleanse the speaker's gavel again? No. McCarthy was silent as he left the House chamber. Then hours later, a sudden and unexpected announcement. He will not run for speaker again. I don't regret standing up for choosing governing over grievance. I do not regret negotiating. Our government is designed to find compromise. McCarthy has been facing threats to his speakership from the moment he clinched the gavel. He won on the 15th round, only after making concession after concession to appeal to the far right wing of his party, allowing a single lawmaker to call a vote to remove him. 
Facing a mutiny, McCarthy realizing the odds were stacked against him. He would need Democrats to bail him out. Do you need their help to remain in leadership? No. Um, if five Republicans go with Democrats, then I'm out. So it's what it's it's that weather. Probably so. In the end, eight Republicans joined all Democrats to oust him as speaker. We need a speaker who will fight for something, anything. If this House of Representatives has exceeded all expectations, then we definitely need higher expectations. It left the vast majority of Republicans who are squarely behind McCarthy infuriated. It's a total distraction. It is some sort of pseudo psycho political fetish that we don't have time for. On his way out, McCarthy blasting those Republican rebels that sank his speakership. They don't get to say they're conservative because they're angry and they're chaotic. That's not the party I belong to. But those who voted to remove him already eager to move on. Our, our bench is very deep. There's a lot of people that could, could serve very well in that position. So the big question, what happens now? Well, there is no permanent speaker. All action in the House is halted until next week as Republicans try to elect a new one. Congressman Patrick McHenry will serve in a temporary role, but votes have been canceled for the week. Members are now leaving town, and the government shutdown deadline is looming large right before Thanksgiving. Diane. All right, Rachel Scott on Capitol Hill. Thank you. And ABC News' Jay O'Brien is joining us now from Capitol Hill with more. Jay, former President Trump just refused to give a straight answer on whether he would be interested in becoming Speaker of the House or endorsing anyone specifically for the job, saying he is focused on the presidency, but that he's happy to help in the process if he can. Walk me through what this process now looks like, because while Steve Scalise is one of the names being mentioned, there isn't a specific candidate right now, and it doesn't even have to be someone from the House. Yeah, you don't have to be a member of Congress to serve as Speaker of the House. Uh, even as Trump seemed to pour cold water on that just a few moments ago, uh, the likelihood of a Trump bid to become Speaker of the House is incredibly, incredibly unlikely. Um, the only members we're really hearing talking about it are Marjorie Taylor Greene, for instance. Um, but we are hearing names emerge from other members, and one of them is Steve Scalise, to your point. Steve Scalise is right now the number two two Republican in the House of Representatives, even as Gates was looking to oust McCarthy before they had that vote yesterday, Gates had put Scalise's name forward as someone he believes should be considered for speakership. So Steve Scalise is a name looming large here. I can tell you, I was walking into the Capitol earlier this morning, and a Capitol police officer asked a Republican member of Congress, Congressman, what do you think about the speakership vote? And the Congressman whispered under his breath to that Capitol police officer, Scalise. So that's a name being battered around a lot in the Republican conference. Also, Jim Jordan, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, who's been running a lot of the investigations into President Biden, into President Biden's son, Hunter, is another name that's being mentioned. You ask about the process. Republicans are expected to return here next week and start on Tuesday the process of picking who their next speaker is going to be. All right. We'll see if it's a lengthy one. Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thanks, Jay. And a manhunt is underway after a shooting at Morgan State University in Baltimore. Authorities say five people are injured, four of them students at the historically black university. Faith Abube is there with more. Gunfire erupting on the campus of Morgan State University in Baltimore in the middle of homecoming week celebrations. Students and alumni running for cover in nearby buildings, telling us they heard multiple rounds of gunfire around 9.30 p.m. Everybody just kind of started screaming and alerting the people next to them that there was an active shooter and that we should all kind of like brace ourselves. It was terrifying because I'm away from home. According to police, the shooting wounded at least five people, all of them with non-life-threatening injuries. But no arrests immediately reported, the FBI joining the investigation. Emergency alerts triggering a shelter-in-place order for the entire campus. Thurgood Marshall Hall, they're in that high-rise. That is the location of the suspected shooters. Officers seen storming the historically black college. Dramatic video capturing SWAT teams clearing room by room. First responders taking victims out on stretchers. I just really try to initiate that everybody to get in there, get away from the windows, because our student center has a lot of big windows. Baltimore's mayor speaking out. When is enough going to be enough? When will the sanctity of American lives outweigh the sanctity of American guns? 
And Faith joins me now from Baltimore with more on this. Faith, the university canceled classes today out of an abundance of caution. What's it like there right now? Well, Diane, for this to be homecoming week, which is a big deal when it comes to historically black colleges, it's very, very quiet here on campus this morning. We drove around trying to find people to talk to this morning, and there were very few people here. Usually you would expect not only the student and staff members here, but also alumni and family members here celebrating homecoming week. But we're not seeing any of that today. Of course, as you mentioned, the university has canceled classes out of an abundance of caution, but also just think about the trauma that a lot of these people are feeling today. A a lot of them were at a popular event yesterday, last night. It was where they crowned Miss and Mr. Morgan State University, and they were letting out out of that event. And when they heard gunfire, had to take cover, had to run for cover, and then stay in place, uh, safe, in a safe place for several hours. And so they're dealing with that trauma as well. The university at this point is offering counseling services to all these people who need any of the counseling services. But in addition to that, you have university officials who are holding an emergency meeting today. They're going over what happens now where do they go from here this is not the first time they've had any sort of shooting related to homecoming week in fact this is the third year in a row that this has happened somewhere related to any event whether official event or unofficial event and so there is a lot for them to go through here at this point and they will be meeting sometime today and then they told us that they'll be sharing those details with the campus community as soon as that is over diane all right faith abube in baltimore thank you and nearly and we are taking a look at former President Trump in court today. He's there for day three of the civil fraud trial against him. Uh, the judge, as you know, has already ruled uh, in a central accusation in this case. But now this trial will decide what penalties uh, former President Trump could face for the fraud that the judge says he is uh, guilty of as the former president there in court. He's choosing to be there today. He doesn't have to be. Uh, but he's choosing to be there and watch these witnesses testify. Uh, again, this is day three of that case. And right now, nearly 75,000 healthcare workers are walking off the job in what's being called the largest healthcare worker strike in U.S. history. These are workers picketing in Springfield, Virginia. Healthcare workers are now on a three day strike in eight states after the Union for Workers at Kaiser Permanente says its contract expired this past Saturday. Workers say they're demanding a higher starting wage and an increase in annual raises. This comes as the healthcare industry is already facing staffing shortages, having never fully recovered from the pandemic. And it's time for Worldview with Maggie Rooley, starting at the Vatican, where three weeks of meetings have started for delegates from all over the world. They're gathering to discuss how the deal, how to deal rather, with some of the most difficult issues facing the Catholic Church. Uh, Maggie, let's get into it here because Pope Francis. Uh, one of the big things they're going to be looking at is Pope Francis has suggested there could be ways to bless same-sex unions uh, in a letter from the Vatican. What other topics will they be discussing here? Hey, Diana, this is a major meeting. It's a, it's a global gathering of hundreds of bishops, and they're going to discuss some of the most contentious issues currently facing the Catholic Church. And, Diane, rarely has a meeting at the Vatican been filled with so much hope and fear, depending on who you ask. Progressives hoping it could lead to things like more women in leadership roles, while conservatives are warning that the Church's very hierarchy is at risk. So what exactly is on the table? Well, this meeting will discuss the role of women in the Catholic Church, specifically their role in decision making. It's also going to aim to create new accountability measures to prevent leaders from abusing their authority. And as you mentioned, they'll also discuss how to welcome LGBTQ Catholics and others who have been historically marginalized by the church. Diane, that list we just went through, that's a lot of normally taboo topics for the Catholic Church. And it's hard to overemphasize what a huge shift even just talking about these topics is for the Catholic Church. And Diane, even before the meeting started, history was already made. Pope Francis decided to let women and and lay people vote alongside bishops in any final decisions made. Uh, this meeting, Diane, any decisions that come out of it, definitely one that the whole world is going to be following. Uh, meanwhile, Maggie Paris is battling an infestation of bed bugs as it prepares to host the 2024 Summer Olympics. Uh, some videos recently posted on social media, they purportedly show these bugs on public transport. Uh, what is happening? 
It's Man, like, it's just so this. icky. I know, I know. Me neither. Me neither. I, a warning, if you watch these videos, they're horrifying. It makes my entire body crawl. But yes, bed bugs, they're everywhere. They've been reported on trains, in movie theaters, even overwhelming multiple schools across the country that had to be shut down and deep cleaned. Now, I can tell, Dan, you know a thing or two about bed bugs based on your reaction. I know you all in New York City, you know about bed bugs. I was there when the city had its own infestation a few years back, but oh, this one in Paris has gotten so bad. The French government is holding a series of emergency meetings this week, trying to tackle what they're calling a potential major public health problem. Now, to be fair, there's often a bed bug boom at the end of summer, but this one does appear to be worse than in years past. And while we're seeing these sorts of bed bug increases around the world, it's obviously extra concerning for Paris. They're gearing up to host the Olympics this summer. Diane, no one wants bed bugs when they're going for gold. Or just ever, really. No, yeah, ever, ever. Uh, uh -uh, all right, uh -uh. Let, let's get a lighter note in here. It is Golden <laughs> Week in China. This is a mid-autumn festival. Let's talk about that, Maggie, shall we? Yeah, please. Um, this is a huge year. It's the first golden week since China lifted restrictions on international travel. And China, people are going wild. Now, golden week is the longest holiday break of the year in China. It's always a major travel holiday. But this year, we're seeing an increase in travel bookings up to about 20 times normal. They're expected record-breaking numbers, tens of millions of people traveling. The best way to kind of think of it, Diane, is like it's our Thanksgiving every single day of the week on repeat. That is what travel looks like right now in China. And despite a slumping economy there, people are going big. Uh, it's a trend called revenge travel. People making up for all that lost time during COVID, traveling abroad to hot spots like Thailand, Singapore, and the UK. And, and I have to say, we're talking about revenge travel for Golden Week. I saw a lot of revenge travel in the States this summer on my Instagram feed. So I feel like people, in the, people back home know a thing or two about it. Okay, love it. Maggie Ruley for Worldview. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, Diane. I'm still thinking about the bed bugs. All right, we will be right back with more of the day's top stories. Stay with us. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Welcome back. Severe weather's on the move. Damaging winds, large hail, and even a few tornadoes could pop up in Texas and Oklahoma. This as the Northeast is experiencing record-breaking heat. Meteorologist Samara Theodore is tracking it all for us. And Samara, I feel like it's almost every day we're talking about new records. This has been such a hot summer, Diane, and now we're entering a hot fall. This is not how we should feel in October, especially in a lot of these cities. Uh, you head to Green Bay, Grand Rapids. Really, for this time of year, we should be in the 60s. But they're in the mid to upper 80s this past weekend. We saw 90s. Even Newark, New Jersey, 85 degrees. So this heat is now migrating farther east. Uh, and you can see that we are still anticipating record-breaking heat in these uh, cities circled here in this purple color. So Buffalo, you could be in the upper 80s today. Now behind it, much cooler air. That's the good news, right? We've got this cooler air filtering in, but it's gonna be a drastic change. Mother Nature ain't easing us into this one, okay? Look at Bismarck, Thursday morning in the 40s, above, just above the 20s by Saturday morning, even down to Kansas City. You know, temperatures are going to be at 37 Saturday morning, so you have to have that big puffy coat ready to go for the weekend. Along the periphery of the cold front, so behind the cold front, we've got all the cold air, but along the cold front, that's where the instability really lies. That's where the atmosphere is energized and ready to get it going. So we've seen severe weather in the past few days. Here is today's threat for severe weather. If you live in Wichita Falls, Oklahoma City, down towards Fork Stockton, Lubbock, Dallas, we're looking at the threat for huge hail damaging winds, and we could certainly see a few tornadoes spin up out of this. This is going to uh, follow 
us into the evening, into the overnight hours, so be mindful of that. Now, as this front continues its progression eastward, we have this heavy rain that's gonna be making its way back into the Northeast. We just came off of that last week, and so more rain for New York, Boston, Syracuse, down the I-95 corridor into the Mid-Atlantic, the DMV. But look what's happening out in the tropics. We have Philippe. Philippe is gonna bring uh, tropical storm conditions to Bermuda. As it continues its trajectory into New England, it will become a post-tropical cyclone, so not so much tropical in nature, but compounded together, Diane, that is going to enhance the rainfall in the Northeast this weekend. All right, meteorologist Samara Theodore, thanks, Samara. Coming up, Uber says their drivers will return packages for you, but it'll cost you. How much the new service is and when it launches right after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. From the port of Newark, New Jersey, I'm Trevor Alt. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. The Wall Street Journal says Netflix is planning to raise its subscription prices and Uber is introducing a new service. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christopher has more on that and your other business headlines. Alexis, what are you watching today? Watching that price hike possibly at Netflix, Diane. Expect to pay more for your Netflix a few months after the Hollywood actor strike is over. That's according to a report in the Wall Street Journal. The streaming giant raised prices last year. Customers now paying $15.49 for the ad-free standard tier and $19.99 a month for the premium plan. Still not clear how much Netflix will reportedly raise prices this time. Time, the company has not returned ABC's request for comment. Earlier this year, Netflix started charging an extra $7.99 a month to share your account with someone outside your household. Macy says it will open up to 30 smaller stores and strip malls over the next two years. The stores are roughly one-fifth the size of its traditional stores. Macy says they'll offer a slimmed-down mix of merchandise and have a more modern and open look. The department store operator has struggled with a drop in mall traffic. Macy's didn't announce locations, but said those smaller stores will open next year. And do you have some packages you need to return? Well, now you can call Uber. The ride hailing service says its drivers will collect up to five packages and drop them off at a local post office, UPS, or FedEx store for a fee, of course, a flat fee of $5 or three bucks for Uber One members. The packages must be valued at under $100 and weigh under 30 pounds. The new feature is aimed at helping online shoppers who need to return a purchase but hate to do it. According to a study from the National Retail Federation, nearly half of consumers would prefer to sit in rush hour traffic 
then make a return via the mail. I don't know about you, Diane. I'd make the return. I am not sitting in rush hour traffic, especially in this city. I know, I'm so <laughs> bad at returns. I might need that service. Alexis, thank you. Sure. And if you have any finance questions for Alexis, leave a message on our Instagram feed. She might answer your question right here on Thursday. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. You are looking at Vatican City on this Wednesday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. Republicans are expected to hold an election for a new Speaker of the House next week after ousting Kevin McCarthy. Eight Republicans voted with Democrats to remove McCarthy, the marking the House first time in American history the House has voted to speak out. Vacant. Now, McCarthy says he won't run for speaker again. I don't regret standing up for choosing governing over grievance. I do not regret negotiating. Our government is designed to find compromise. Sources tell ABC News House Majority Leader Steve Scalise is now calling members to see if they would support him for the position. And get ready for the biggest Powerball jackpot so far this year. The Powerball drawing is now worth $1.2 billion. It's the third largest Powerball jackpot ever and the seventh largest in any U.S. lottery. And it is Fat Bear Week. Voting opens today for the annual competition to rank Alaska's bulkiest brown bears. Katmai National Park says the bears have spent the summer fattening up on salmon, berries, and grasses, and that fat is fit as they prepare for their winter hibernation. You can cast your votes for Fattest Bear at fatbearweek.org. And the man accused of ordering the murder of Tupac Shakur is set to be arraigned in a Nevada court today. Prosecutors say Dwayne Davis will be charged with murder even though they don't believe he pulled the trigger. He's said to be the last living witness to the rapper's fatal 1996 drive-by shooting. Criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Bernarda Villalona is joining me now for more on this. Uh, Bernarda, in his own memoir, Davis says that he was in the front passenger seat of this car and that he passed the gun used in the shooting to the back seat before the shots were fired in this drive-by. How will he now defend himself in court? How challenging is this defense going to be? 
given the admissions he's already made. Well, this is going to be a huge challenge for him because the actual passing and the providing of the deadly weapon that was used to kill Tupac Shakur, that right there is fatal. That's why he can't argue that he was just merely present inside of the vehicle because that goes to show the evidence that he aided and abetted the commission of this crime, of this shooting that led to the fatal death of Tupac Shakur. The question will be now is at the time that he goes to trial, is he going to say, I lied in a memoir? That wasn't me. I was doing it in order to get some fame or to make some money. But then it also forces him, if you are going to go that route, are you going to testify? Are you going to take the stand? So he has some huge hurdles to fight, but he can also argue, wait, well, I wrote that memoir in 2018. It's 2023. So why are you coming after me now? Now, if he's admitted for years to being in the car and providing the gun, why did it take so long to arrest him? This happened in 1996. Well, there are many issues. So you got to think, even in 1996, law enforcement had a lot of the evidence that they have now. But what you know in the sense of, okay, we have an idea with you, is different than what you can prove in court. So they had to find evidence that they can present inside of a courtroom. So now using his own words, his interviews, his podcast, the YouTube interviews, and his but his memoir itself, they're going to use that against them. Also, they had to find corroborating evidence because you can't just use a person's statement alone to try to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt. So they couldn't just come in and say, here's his 2019 memoir. He says he did this. Case closed. Not enough. Not enough. They have to get corroborating evidence. And also, you got to think what witnesses are available because Suge Knight, yes, he was in the car. Yes, he's a witness. But will he cooperate? He's already said he's not going to cooperate. So I want to ask you about that because Suge Knight was driving the car that night that Tupac was in. He has he has um, disputed the allegations that it was Davis's nephew who was the actual shooter, but he says he won't testify in this case. So what do they do? Can they force him to testify? They can force him to testify. I was a former prosecutor, and when we wanted to get witnesses to testify, you can apply to get a material witness order where you have a judge that signs an order that says you are material and have material information as to the guilt in this case, and we want you to come in and testify. However, it's going to be difficult because one, Shug Knight, he's in custody. He's going to be in custody for years. I believe he's serving a 30-year sentence. And aside from that, he's given so many conflicting statements that he's not a credible witness at this point. So I don't see Shug Knight taking the stand in this trial. Uh, quickly, Bernardo, what are you watching for in the arraignment today? Well, I want to see whether he's going to say anything. Is he going to make any statements? Highly unlikely, because if I were his defense attorney, I wouldn't say anything except the words not guilty. But I am curious to see whether the prosecutor will provide us with additional information in terms of what evidence they have now that is different from what they had in 1996 to actually make an arrest in this case. Because we do have the indictment, we do have the probable cause, the search warrant, but it doesn't give us much insight as to what the actual evidence is aside from their using his statements. All right, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, Bernardo Villalona. Good to see you, Bernardo. Thank you. Thank you. And you can watch Impact by Nightline special, Who Shot Pac? The Murder of Tupac Shakur, now streaming on Hulu. And now to the alert we'll all be receiving on our phones today. FEMA will be testing its cell phone emergency alert system. It's an annual test to make sure the system used to warn about national emergencies is working. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has more on what we can expect. Hi, Eva. So today our cell phones are going to go off with an alert, but don't panic. It's just a test for FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. This is the yearly test to make sure the system to warn you about public and national emergencies is in fact working. The test will happen at 2.20 this afternoon, Eastern Time, 11.20 Pacific. Any cell phone that is on and in range of a tower should get the alert. Wireless providers will transmit the test for 30 minutes, but don't worry, it won't be a constant alarm. Your phone should get the test only once. Diane. Keep an ear out for that. Thank you. And the Federal Trade Commission claims Amazon used a secret algorithm to drive prices up on its site in a practice codenamed Project Nessie. Now, Amazon claims it was just used for price matching. Rebecca Jarvis has more. The secret algorithm, codenamed Project Nessie, according to redacted documents from the FTC's antitrust lawsuit against Amazon, allowed the retail giant to 
raise prices and watch competitors to see if they'd follow, forcing prices higher, allegedly overall for consumers. Now, that algorithm was also allegedly used to track and undercut competitors, so if a competing retailer lowered its prices, Amazon could follow suit. The company stopped using the algorithm in 2019, and a source telling the Wall Street Journal that Amazon made more than a billion dollars in revenue through use of the algorithm. Amazon declining to confirm that number to ABC News, but telling ABC News that the FTC is wrong on the facts and the law, noting that Project Nessie was a project with a simple purpose to try to stop our price matching from resulting in unusual outcomes where prices became so low that they were unsustainable. And this is all part of the government's lawsuit against Amazon claiming it is too powerful and a monopoly. Diane? All right, Rebecca Jarvis, thank you. Coming up, tens of thousands of child care centers are now at risk of closing. Why they're losing funding and what families can do to get the help. Also ahead, a new study shows a new study on Ozempic, what it says about the drug's long-term effect on weight loss. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. An urgent manhunt underway. A corrections officer and the inmate disappear into thin air. This case just captivated people. How many times do you see a respected jail guard help a guy escape? Now, Friday night. The secret romantic relationship. The jailhouse romance that felt like a movie. And the chase is on. That's when she discharged a firearm. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. Every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. It's time to buy the right stuff. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, millions of families across the country are bracing for a major change in child care as a pandemic-era emergency funding program expires. Tens of thousands of child care centers are now at risk of closing. Business reporter Alexis Christophers has more. Tracy Hansen has been caring for young children in Colleen, Texas for 28 years, but she worries she'll have to shut down her child care center. We are hanging on by our fingernails. That's because $24 billion the federal government gave to child care centers during the pandemic has dried up, threatening to leave 3.2 million kids without care and putting 70,000 child care programs at risk of closing. With the extra money, I was able to give pay raises, paid time off for employees. 
I've have supported families that were not able to afford tuition. I've been able to do some repairs on the building and we've revamped our playground. Without the extra funding, she's had to raise tuition and reduce hours, but says even that may not be enough. I tell myself I'm gonna give it six more months, but in reality, I just don't see us being able to make it. That would be a devastating blow to Shelby Lynch and her growing family. Her son has been attending Tracy's daycare center for years, and Shelby herself even went there as a child. It would be disastrous. My husband, with his job, he's the breadwinner, so I would have to be the one that stays at home. The average cost of childcare in the U.S. now tops $10,000 a year for one child. That's more than in-state college tuition in dozens of states. Tuition for Shelby's four-year-old son, Aiden, just went up another $80 a month. And with a daughter on the way, she and her husband worry how they'll afford it. We put off having kids for so long because we knew daycare was expensive. We still have to pay almost a mortgage payment for childcare, and it's, it's just a lot. A similar scenario is playing out in Boyd, Wisconsin, where registered nurse Amanda Koenig says she and her husband got sticker shock when they saw their child care bill for the upcoming year. That fear of knowing that we're probably going to have to go paycheck to paycheck sometimes is, is very overwhelming. It's not just daycare, it's groceries, it's gas, it's, you know, all the things added up that you need just to live. Daycare four days a week for her two children would have cost $1,840 a month. But Amanda's mother-in-law has agreed to watch the baby once a week. We're saving over $400 a month by doing that. Um, we're very fortunate and grateful that we, we kind of get that extra help. Many families are not so lucky. Pre-COVID, Tracy Hansen had 150 children at her center. That number has dwindled to 63. Pandemic-era child care funding was always meant to be temporary. Democrats have been attempting to push through a $16 billion child care funding package that would offer assistance for another five years. But without GOP support, the bill faces an uphill battle in Congress. Parents are having to choose, and it's not making economical sense for them to be working outside the home and then paying for childcare. And Alexis joins me now for more on this. Alexis, what can families do to try to ease the burden of childcare costs? Well, as you saw in the piece with Amanda, she was one of the lucky ones because her mother-in-law is able to help out with her son. So if you can tap family, tap friends, even if they can help out for a few hours or a day, that can really be, uh, be a savings. But we know that's not an option for everyone. Make sure that you are also getting the tax credits that you are eligible for, the child uh, care tax credit and also the dependent care and child tax credit. Both of these were more generous during the pandemic, but they still do exist. And you should definitely look into whether or not uh, you qualify. Also check with your employer. Are there perks, child care perks, maybe you're unaware of? Can you work a flex uh, schedule? Even working remotely one day a week could be a big help. And see if they have the dependent care FSA or flex spending account, which allows you to put pre-tax dollars aside for child care, including before and after school programs. That's that's a big one. And finally, for low-income families, Families. Lots of states offer assistance. Go right to your state's website and check out the resources there. Now, child care was in crisis even before the pandemic. So what's the biggest challenge facing the industry now? Definitely in crisis before the, the, the pandemic. And one of the big issues is, you look, Americans spend about 27% of their income on child care. So it's, you know, it's unsustainable for so many folks. They just can't find the help. Right now, the average educator or teacher for child care makes about $12.5 an hour. That's less than most fast food workers do. They saw a bunch of those workers leave during the pandemic and they're not going back. When I was talking to that child care owner, she was saying her biggest issue right now, she cannot offer her workers a living wage. All right, Alexis Christophers, thank you. And now to one dad's dramatic transformation after he says he took control of his health and lost 100 pounds in six months without medication. He's now sharing his tips for others. Andrew Dimbert has more. It wasn't the 15 pounds he gained during lockdown or the medications he was taking for high blood pressure and gastric reflux. Jamie Wooldridge's motivation to lose weight was this photo taken by his wife one day in church. 
I may or may not have fallen asleep, but anyway, the photo was not flattering at all. And, and it was like, okay, I need to do something about this. Within six months, the 285 pound retiree from South Lake, Texas had lost a hundred pounds. Now he's helping others learn from his journey, starting with calorie counting. I was really shocked to see that I was probably consuming four to 5,000 calories a day. It was, it was humbling. For his age and activity level, Jamie should have been getting 3,300 calories a day. So he joined an app for counting calories and cut to 2,200 calories a day for weight loss. While the pounds came off, he never deprived himself of his favorite foods. I'm gonna have pizza. Well, I'm just gonna budget that into my, my calorie allotment for the day. He was already walking miles every day. At some point, he started running too, sharing his journey on TikTok. Did my 5K, now I'm gonna finish it up with about a seven mile walk. This type of dramatic weight loss is likely not possible for most people. Dr. Veronica Johnson, who is not Jamie's physician, says anyone making significant changes to their diet should talk with a doctor. I think taking a, a step back and, and looking at your overall health and when you have these things in a better place, your overall health is improved. He recognized that he was struggling with his weight, but he also recognized that his cholesterol was elevated, his blood pressure was elevated, he was on the verge of having diabetes. And so he felt that losing weight would improve all of those markers. For healthier eating, Jamie decreased his processed sugar intake, used substitutions like low-fat mayo to reduce calories, and used an air fryer to cut the fat out of his favorite recipes, like French fries. His big tip for newbies, plan accordingly for life's events. Every month there's gonna be something. There's so many tools out there that can help you be successful. If I can do it, you can do it. How to stick with it? Jamie says make your resolution your routine. And he says it's not as hard as it sounds, but anybody who chooses to change their diet or is eager to lose weight should talk to their provider and determine the best course of action for them. Diane. All right, Andrew Dimber, thank you. And a new study shows people with type 2 diabetes using the active ingredient in Osempic and Wegovi maintained improvements in blood sugar control and weight loss for three years. The study involved more than 23,000 people over three years. ABC News medical contributor and physician at Stanford Children's Health, Dr. Alok Patel, joins me now for more. Dr. Patel, what stands out to you from this study? What stands out is the sustained benefit over the course of three years. A lot of the headlines people have seen regarding Osempic, semaglutide, and these drugs have been over the course of this year. A lot of short-term benefits and not necessarily a generalized population. So this study is really showing what can happen if people have good adherence, meaning if they're prescribed to take these medications, that they are doing it on a weekly basis over the course of many years, sustaining the side effects, following their healthcare team, that they're seeing a weight loss in this study about 10 pounds, that they are seeing a reduction in their blood sugar and overall beneficial health. Now, it's important to note that this study was partially funded by the manufacturer, and it's yet to appear in a peer-reviewed journal, but this is an important step forward as you start having the conversation about these long-term weight management solutions for certain individuals with a high BMI or with type 2 diabetes. So how can people test their blood sugar, and what should they know about the results? Well, the most important thing for people about their blood sugar is to realize that we all have certain amounts of blood sugar. We need them to live. You can have short-term symptoms if you have too low blood of sugar. Too high blood sugar, you could be pre-diabetic or diabetic, and that can cause some long-term complications. If people have questions or concerns about testing their own blood sugar, you want to check with the healthcare professional. Now, the metric for measuring blood sugar in this study, which a lot of people have heard about, is called A1C or hemoglobin A1C. Quick med school 101 overview. We all have hemoglobin. That's the part of our red blood cells that carry oxygen over time. You can have sugar kind of bind to that. And the, the A1C test is a measure of that over the course of three months. So we want that number to be below 6%, roughly about 5.7%. When we start getting above 6.5%, that's when your physician may worry about prediabetes or diabetes. The average person can expect to get tested for this about every three years if you're high risk, one to two. People with diabetes every six months. But again, it's important to check in with your doctor if you are concerned about your blood sugar or if you want to check it more frequently. Now, for those who are thinking about using a semaglutide drug for weight loss or diabetes, what should they know? Which they know is part of the question you just said right there, is that the indications are for weight loss and diabetes in certain individuals, and you want to do this under physician guidance. Diane, Osempic is not a quick fix. It is not something that people should just take without having the right medical indications. There can be side effects. And again, as we we're talking about with this study, adherence is important. If people are prescribed this medication, 
expect to take it for a long period of time, several years, if not for the rest of their life, and only stop taking it if directed by a physician. And also, these medications, including any weight loss medications, are part of an overall healthy lifestyle plan that would include healthy nutrition, dieting, exercise, and one of your favorites, sleep. It's a big one. ABC News contributor, physician at Stanford Children's Health, Dr. Alok Patel, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, former President Trump is in a New York City court for a third day. We are awaiting to see him enter the courtroom. Now, why he's choosing to be there and why the judge issued a gag order against him right after the break. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years my brother's death was this mystery was he pushed did he kill himself despite some human remains found at the bottom of north head and the body was naked committing suicide naked is almost unheard of what's going on here you had some chilling evidence oh my goodness no one knew it was coming it's about finding justice for my brother sometimes you just have to stir the pot All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. Watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting in St. Petersburg, Florida, in the aftermath of Hurricane Adelia, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. An 80 year old man is making a difference for wounded warriors one golf ball at a time. Bob Duke sells stray golf balls to raise money for injured service members. And now he's up to nearly $500,000. Danny New has his story. This is Bob. Bob Duke turned 80 years old last month, but there's no time to celebrate. He's got golf balls to deliver. I fill my pickup truck full of golf and balls so I can restock. Replaces re the balls, gets the money, comes back, goes to the bank. <laughs> Bob and Vicky first started collecting about 12 years ago when Bob, a retired master sergeant who served in the Army for 36 years, there's probably 600 golf balls on these. Wanted a fundraise for the Wounded Warrior Project, which serves veterans who are healing. I said, I'm going to start giving them money because I live on a golf course and people need golf balls. It started with Bob collecting balls from their home course in North Carolina and then selling them to his neighbors for $5 a dozen. But now, as you can see, this mission has exploded into a top-notch production, especially here in the attic. You worry about the whole ceiling <laughs> from the attic falling down. And as you look around, 
golf balls everywhere. People drop off buckets of golf balls all the time. Clubs around the country ship them to him. And then he sells dozens in these little displays that you saw earlier. Welcome to our garage. Vicki gave up her parking spot, and it was wonderful. <laughs> I'm very honored and humbled. And recently, Bob and Vicki got a big thank you for their years of service after raising nearly, get ready, nearly $500,000 to help veterans. It just made it all worthwhile. <laughs> Bob was very touched, but hey, he's not done yet. Look me up if you need some golf balls. Danny New, thank you. Coming up, the alleged shot caller in Tupac Shakur's death heads to court. Why he's being charged with murder even though prosecutors say he didn't pull the trigger. Also ahead, a new study on Ozempic, what it says about the drug's long-term effect on weight loss. Plus, the bed bug warning, what Paris is doing about a widespread issue plaguing public spaces. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Federal District Courthouse in Washington, D.C., I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo today on ABC News Live. History in the House. For the first time ever, the Speaker is out. Kevin McCarthy has been ousted and says he won't run again. Which Republican representative now says they plan to run for that spot? Donald Trump is back in court. It's day three of the former president's civil fraud trial. Why the judge issued a gag order against him. And all eyes on him. The man being accused of being involved in Tupac's murder is being arraigned. Why investigators say they believe Dwayne Davis was the shot caller. But we begin with Ohio Republican Representative Jim Jordan saying he's jumping into the race to replace Kevin, McC Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the House. After nine months in office, McCarthy is the first House Speaker ever to be voted out. Now the House can't do any other business until the Speaker is voted in. ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now from Capitol Hill with more. Jay, walk me through what's happening now with Jim Jordan and what challenges does he face in running for Speaker? Yeah, we just learned moments ago that he was even throwing his hat into the ring to become Speaker. There were murmurs that he was considering it last night with a slate of other Republican candidates. That includes, as you said, the current number two Republican in the House, Steve Scalise. But then Jordan walks out of what is now former Speaker Kevin McCarthy's office. It's the main Speaker's office here in the Capitol. He walks out of that office. Reporters obviously swarm around him and they begin to ask him if he's running for Speaker. And his answer is yes. And then he 
says he's been getting texts from other Republicans over the course of last night into today encouraging him to jump into the race. So that's the current state of play. He already has a big endorsement from a prominent Republican here on Capitol Hill, Jim Banks, who just moments after he, uh, Jordan told reporters he was jumping into the race, tweeted that he would back Jordan for speaker. When you ask what challenges Jim Jordan would face, he's obviously a further right member of the House Republican Conference. He's prominent for his defenses of former President Trump over the years. And right now, he's one of the point people on those investigations and the ongoing impeachment inquiry into President Biden and into President Biden's son, Hunter. So those are attractive traits that Jordan has to some in the House Republican Conference, but also it could work against him with more moderate Republicans. And as we've seen, Diane, if you just have a few House Republicans against you and you're running for speaker, as Kevin McCarthy encountered in January, that can be a long, drawn-out process. And the Republicans I'm talking to, really on both sides of the political spectrum, the moderates and the further right of the conference, do not want a long, protracted speaker fight when they return next week. And Jay, let's talk about that process. Is it any different than when it happens at the beginning of a term? And what does anyone throwing their hat in the ring have to consider here? Well, first and foremost, we now know that the House is out for the remainder of this week, as you said earlier. They will return now on Tuesday, according to sources, when they will start that process of selecting a speaker. They will meet behind closed doors in what's called a conference meeting, and they're going to hear from the declared candidates for speaker who are going to make their case as to why they should have the speaker's gavel. Then, after that, there will be a formal vote. We don't know exactly how close to Tuesday that vote will happen. Happen. The goal, as our John Carl reported earlier on GMA and also according to my sources too, from House Republicans is to try to coalesce around a speaker candidate when they meet behind closed doors instead of having a long, drawn-out, bloody political fight on the House floor like we saw in January. The question is, can they pull that off? All right, Jay O'Brien, we will wait and see. Thanks, Jay. And former President Trump is back in court for day three of the civil fraud trial against him. A judge has already ruled Trump, his sons, and other executives engaged in fraud, ordering their business certificates in New York canceled. Now the trial will decide what additional penalties Trump and other defendants could face. Senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky joins me now from the courthouse, along with business reporter Alexis Christophorus and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for more. Aaron, what's the latest there in court? The cross-examination of an accountant uh, who was largely responsible for preparing Trump's financial statements that the judge has already determined to be fraudulent is continuing under Jesus Suarez, an attorney for former President Trump, whose tone today seems markedly different. He was rather combative and, and almost performative with Trump sitting there in the room uh, when, when the cross-examination began yesterday, marveling at how the accountant performed uh, the, the, the tax functions for the 45th president of the United States, possibly even the 47th president of the United States. That drew a laugh in court when the attorney general's team objected and the judge sustained it. But it does show, Diane, how Trump is trying to press this case to his political advantage, although today it's much more subdued and, and, uh, and, and the testimony is revolving around uh, Bender, Donald Bender's role uh, in all these accounting functions for the former president. Now, Alexis, the state's first witness was an accountant who poured over Trump's financial statements. What stuck out to you from that testimony? All right, so Aaron was just saying Donald Bender, longtime tax uh, consultant uh, and a tax accountant for Trump. And again, he wanted to show this pattern, this process that the Trump Organization uses to, um, to report large losses on their financial statements every year for the past decade. And, and he did reiterate here, possibly trying to move some of the attention off himself, that the Trump Organization and its trustees were responsible for the accounting practices and principles used in the records. We should note that Trump's lawyers tried to get Bender's testimony, uh, blank, a blanket objection to his testimony, but the judge uh, denied that. And Brian, something interesting happened earlier today. Trump spoke outside the court and he said he would have a much easier time if this were a jury trial, not a judge trial. I, I want to play that soundbite for you. So she brought the case under the statute that had never been used for a thing like this before, ever. We're not entitled to a jury, because if I had a jury, even though it's in New York, and I think I'd be fine with New York, but if I had a 
jury would win this case very easily, but I don't have a jury. Now, the judge yesterday said kind of two contradictory things. First, saying that cases like this don't usually allow for juries, but also saying that neither side asked for one. So was this a mistake by Trump's attorneys? Could they have requested a jury here? And could this be grounds for an appeal? Yes and no, as to kind of all of those questions. So it, it's just a check of the box. They could have checked the box. They could have litigated it. They could have argued it. But it makes sense for them not to check that box because typically this doesn't happen. In a case like this, it's often a bench or, or judge trial and not a jury trial. But in terms of appeal, often the phrase is, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't ask for it and then the judge denies it, you can't then take it up on appeal. I think right now, if you look at that September 26th ruling by the judge and kind of the, the defense already being behind the eight ball, so to speak, with his earlier rulings, yeah, I think Donald Trump probably does think he had had a better chance with a jury, considering what this judge already ruled, but that is long gone at this point. Now, Alexis, the judge has already canceled the Trump Organization's business certificates in New York. So what impact is that having so far? Mm -hmm. And what's the worst case scenario at this point for him and these other defendants? I think the worst case scenario is uh, Attorney General Letitia James gets everything she's asking for, which would be a permanent ban on Donald Trump and his sons from being able to um, do any business in the state of New York. She's also looking for a five-year commercial real estate ban anywhere for Trump and the Trump Organization. If the judge signs off, the Trump family will no longer be a real estate family in New York, and his name is going to come off of all of those buildings. But we should note that an appeal is expected here that would put a stay on, on uh, the ruling. This could make its way up to the state Supreme Court, so it could take years for this to wind its way through the courts, and all the while he would still be able to do business in the state. And, and Aaron, this is one of several cases the former president is facing. Sources now tell ABC News that a number of Trump's co-defendants in the Georgia election interference case have been approached about potentially making a deal. What's the latest on that? We've already seen one guilty plea in the case out of Georgia, the criminal case out of Georgia, Scott Hall, a bail bondsman who has pleaded guilty to his role in breaching the voting equipment of rural Coffee County, Georgia. And, and we've since been told, according to sources familiar with the case, there are a number of other defendants who have not only been offered plea deals, uh, but, but who are actively negotiating. And so those could come as, uh, as soon as this week. And if, if past practice it holds, that would, those deals would require those defendants to cooperate and testify against former President Trump and the others when they end up at trial. And the first trial, first of two trials in that criminal case in Georgia, is set to begin later this month. All right, Aaron Kaczorski, Alexis Christophorus, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you all. And a manhunt is underway after a shooting at Morgan State University in Baltimore. Authorities say five people are injured, four of them students at the historically black university. Faith Abube is there with more. Gunfire erupting on the campus of Morgan State University in Baltimore in the middle of homecoming week celebrations. Students and alumni running for cover in nearby buildings, telling us they heard multiple rounds of gunfire around 9.30 p.m. Everybody just kind of started screaming and alerting the people next to them that there was an active shooter and that we should all kind of like brace ourselves. It was terrifying because I'm away from home. According to police, the shooting wounded at least five people, all of them with non-life-threatening injuries. But no arrests immediately reported. The FBI joining the investigation. Emergency alerts triggering a shelter-in-place order for the entire campus. Thurgood Marshall Hall, they're in that high rise. That is the location of the suspected shooters. Officers seen swarming the historically black college. Dramatic video capturing SWAT teams clearing room by room. First responders taking victims out on stretchers. I just really try to initiate everybody to get in there, get away from the windows, because our student center has a lot of big windows. Baltimore's mayor speaking out. When is enough going to be enough? When will the sanctity of American lives outweigh the sanctity of American guns? And Diane, that shooter remains on the run this morning. University officials have canceled classes for the day out of an abundance of caution. And they say they plan to review plans for the rest of the homecoming week celebration. Diane. All right, Faith Abube in Baltimore, thank you.
And the man accused of ordering the murder of Tupac Shakur is set to be arraigned in a Nevada court today. Dwayne Davis is charged with murder, even though prosecutors say they don't believe he pulled the trigger. He's said to be the last living witness to the rapper's fatal 1996 drive-by shooting. Criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Bernardo Villalona is joining me now for more on this. Bernardo, in his own memoir, Davis says he was in the passenger seat of the car and that he passed a gun to the back seat before shots were fired. So he's the last living witness who was in that car. We know there was another witness uh, that was in the car with Tupac. Given he's already made these admissions in his own book, in interviews, how hard is it going to be for the defense to now argue their case, given that admission? Well, it's going to be definitely going to be hard for the defense to argue that he's not guilty since these are words coming out of his own mouth where he's admitting that he was in that vehicle, number one, but number two, that he provided the firearm that was used to kill Tupac Shakur, number two and number three. So that in of itself is strong evidence that's going to be presented to a jury that can by itself possibly lead to his conviction. But of course, the prosecution is going to present corroborating evidence because you don't want to present a, a case to a jury that's just based on the admission of the defendant. Now, this case dates back almost 30 years. So what do we know about the evidence collected over all that time, and how is all of that going to relate to these specific charges in this specific case? So you got to think, this happened in 1996. Times were different. Things were different. Technology was different. Back then, I think we were carrying beepers, not even cell phones. So the evidence that you would expect to see now in this day and age, you're not going to see it in this trial. Because in 1996, they really had even video. They had really had video surveillance or cell phone technology or even social media, which is now what jurors expect to see see when you're going forward in a trial. So I think this case is going to largely be based on testimony, and it's going to be based on his statements that he's made. And I want to say that there has to be at least one or two cooperators that are going to come forth and testify at trial in order for the prosecution to try to get a conviction on this man. So what are you watching out for in the arraignment today? Well, I'm looking forward to see whether the prosecutor is going to give us additional information as to what is the evidence that led you to pull the trigger and present the case to a grand jury now in 2023 when this happened in 1996. Because we got the indictment, and the indictment is only two pages, but it doesn't tell us specifically what evidence do you have to say that this man is guilty, aside from, yes, he said it in his memoir, and he's made statements about it in different interviews. But even that happened years ago. The memoir came out in 2019. So exactly. if that if that was the big thing, then why not arrest him Exactly. Then? So there has to be something more, and that's why I think that there has to be operators that are involved in this. But let's not forget, remember, that he was also bought in for a proffer in 2009. So a lot of the information that they got in 2018 and 2019, you already knew that in 2009, but they couldn't use anything that was said during the proffer as evidence in, in an indictment. Tangled Web, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Bernardo Villalona, thank you. And you can watch Impact by Nightline special, Who Shot Pac? The Murder of Tupac thank Shakur, you. now streaming on Hulu. And nearly 75,000 healthcare workers are walking off the job today in what's being called the largest healthcare worker strike in U.S. history. These are workers picketing in Springfield, Virginia. Healthcare workers are now on a three day strike in eight states after the union says the contract with Kaiser Permanente expired this past Saturday. Workers say they're demanding a higher starting wage and an increase in annual raises. This comes as the healthcare industry is already facing staffing shortages, having never fully recovered from the pandemic. The strike will impact some 13 million patients. Meanwhile, starting today, the Vatican is holding high-level meetings on the future of the Catholic Church. Delegates all over the world are gathering for what's expected to be a defining moment for Pope Francis's reform agenda. The meetings come after the Pope suggested there could be a way to bless same-sex unions in the church. Foreign correspondent James Longman is at the Vatican with more on that. J James, Pope Francis is convening this global gathering to discuss the church's future. So what are some of the key topics they're focused on? Well, Diane, they're not shying away from some of the most controversial topics that face the Catholic Church today. Women in the church famously dominated this male-dominated institution. Uh, the, 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 a lot of 
discussion will take place on the role women might be able to take. Uh, as you said there, same-sex unions as well, uh, sex abuse scandals. That is something that the wider Catholic population around the world has been really keen to get on the agenda here. And that is the whole point of this synod. It literally means journeying together. And, and it's a period of reflection over a month to really dig down into some very serious issues that the church has to contend with today in the modern world. Pope Francis, in his homily this morning, he gave mass. He said four times, this is not a parliament. It's not some clinical voting exercise. It's a period of deep reflection for people all over the world to come together to discuss these topics. It took two years of canvassing opinions uh, before they got to this point. So it sounds as though there's going to be some serious discussions around some very serious topics. Diane? Uh, James, and for the first time, lay people and women will vote on specific issues alongside bishops and other clergy. What brought about that change? Well, I mean, this speaks to really what Pope Francis is all about, I think, uh, his supporters would say. This idea of synodality, that's where we get the word synod. He wants to make it a more, I mean, for want of a better word, he wants to democratise the process a little bit more. He wants to remove the idea or the focus on hierarchy. There isn't really a much more hierarchical institution in the world than the Catholic Church, you could argue, but he wants to get back down into the roots. I saw one journalist said a focus more on the flock, less on the shepherds. So that's what it's about, including these women, some 50 or more women are involved, will be, take part in the voting process as well, as well as these lay people. That has never happened before. Of course, he's going to have his detractors who say that this is uh, watering down some of the most fundamental elements of what it is to be Catholic, uh, and there have been already some controversial uh, conversations had in the public arena around this synod, uh, but this is what Pope Francis is all about. He wants to strip things back to basics. Uh, you, you can see that, you know, when he became Pope, there was a lot made of the fact that he didn't want to stay in the papal apartments. Uh, that he preferred to kind of walk around when he was an archbishop uh, among the people rather than take official vehicles. This is his brand, and I think this synod is an extension of the brand of Pope Francis. Diane? All right, foreign correspondent James Longman in London, thank you. Coming up, the parents of a former U.S. swim star found dead are breaking their silence. Why they say their daughter's death in the U.S. Virgin Islands was no accident. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. The family of a former swimming champion who died of an alleged fentanyl overdose, fentanyl overdose is raising questions about her death. Jamie Kale was found dead in the Virgin Islands. Now her family is sharing new details about the case, saying they suspect foul play. Janae Norman has this exclusive interview. A grieving family demanding answers in the death of their daughter, a former swimming star found dead in the U.S. Virgin Islands. 
Jamie was getting ready to leave the island on March 14th. She was coming home. It makes no sense. Um, all the evidence out there uh, has been completely overlooked. What we are looking for is justice for Jamie. We're looking for truth. Pat and Gary Kale claim island authorities haven't been forthcoming with details into their daughter Jamie's death, limiting access to information and withholding an official copy of the autopsy. We had somebody that we, that we authorized to go to the funeral home and to view, and that's all they would allow us, all they would allow her to see and see photograph the face. So we don't know what the rest of the, if there's anything else on the rest of the body uh, because we don't have the autopsy report. The family sharing those photos, too graphic to show here with ABC News. She had a black eye. Um, her forehead appeared to have had a blunt trauma to the forehead. Um, it appeared that her nose had been broken. Her lips had blood around them. Kale was a high school champion swimmer from Maine, winning a gold medal in the 1997 Pan Pacific Championship 800 free relay. She then notched silver at the 1998 Swimming World Cup in Brazil. She lived in the U.S. Virgin Islands for nearly two decades. The 42-year-old was found unresponsive in her home by her boyfriend back in February. According to the original police release, Kale's boyfriend, with the help of a friend, then took Kale to a nearby clinic where CPS PR was rendered, but Kale succumbed to her ailment. But months later, authorities saying she died of an accidental fentanyl overdose. Her family insists Jamie didn't use drugs. Never. Jamie Kale never did drugs. Never. There's no way that she, she had fentanyl in her voluntarily. And her family believes critical evidence like those facial injuries is being overlooked. We reach out to authorities to ask about the investigation and those unexplained injuries, but haven't heard back. Diane. All right, Janae Norman, thank you. Coming up, encouraging kids and teens through art, how an art teacher has now become a Starbucks designer and is sharing her story. We'll be right back. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from Memphis, I'm Steve Lissonsani. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Welcome back. A Latina artist is encouraging kids and teens to think big and follow their dreams. And she's leading by example. Her colorful designs, having been an art teacher, well, they're now featured on Starbucks cups across the country. ABC's Melissa Dunn has her story as we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. So I did this thing. <laughs> Latina artist Manuela Guillen knows a thing or two about the power of a brush stroke. She's wanted to be an artist since she was five years old. I grabbed crayons and at the top of the staircase, I started drawing on the wall because I thought I was drawing a mural. Um, of course, my parents did not agree. <laughs> the Cuban Salvadorian calls Philadelphia home and at the heart of what she does is encouraging youth. A year ago, she quit her job as an art teacher to follow her passion. I did tell the students there is going to be one thing that's very passionate you're going to really want to do and you're going to have to take that leap. Her illustrations are full of flowers and warm inviting colors but behind that she uses her art to cope with emotions and encourage others to do the same. Growing up in South Florida, I witnessed a lot of like violence, especially like violence towards women. It was hard to process that stuff when I was really young, so I began making art. How important is it to use kind of that outlet to help yourself and help others. I felt like, I don't know, like it was bigger than me. People reach out, they feel very seen and heard and like they sense a presence, like their presence sometimes in some of my pieces. This South Philly wall turned into a passion project for Manuela, made up of drawings by local students. So Manuela, when you literally like walk down the, the sidewalk in the street and you're seeing this, what do you think of? Um, I think about how amazing it is that someone who could be five years old can see their art on the wall. As Manuela celebrates her community and culture, now even Starbucks has a slice of it. Creating these tumblers have been an incredible journey. How do you feel? It's surreal. It feels it feels like I'm still dreaming. I feel like I won the lottery, the artist lottery. But I, overall, I also know that I have worked in the art world for over 10 years. I have done probably like hundreds of projects. And I don't know, maybe this was was meant to be on my path. Encouraging the next generation, one brush stroke at a time. Melissa Adan, thank you. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years my brother's death was this mystery was he pushed did he kill himself despite some human remains found at the bottom of north head and the body was naked committing suicide naked is almost unheard of what's going on here you had some chilling evidence oh my goodness no one knew it was coming it's about finding justice for my brother sometimes you just have to stir the pot All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. You are looking at Vatican City on this Wednesday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. Republicans are expected to hold an election for a new Speaker of the House next week after ousting Kevin McCarthy. 
Eight Republicans voted with Democrats to remove McCarthy, the marking the House first time in American history the House has voted to speak out. Vacant. Now McCarthy says he won't run for speaker again. I don't regret standing up for choosing governing over grievance. I do not regret negotiating. Our government is designed to find compromise. Sources tell ABC News House Majority Leader Steve Scalise is now calling members to see if they would support him for the position. And get ready for the biggest Powerball jackpot so far this year. The Powerball drawing is now worth $1.2 billion. It's the third largest Powerball jackpot ever and the seventh largest in any U.S. lottery. And it is Fat Bear Week. Voting opens today for the annual competition to rank Alaska's bulkiest brown bears. Katmai National Park says the bears have spent the summer fattening up on salmon, berries, and grasses, and that fat is fit as they prepare for their winter hibernation. You can cast your votes for Fattest Bear at fatbearweek.org. And the man accused of ordering the murder of Tupac Shakur is set to be arraigned in a Nevada court today. Prosecutors say Dwayne Davis will be charged with murder even though they don't believe he pulled the trigger. He's said to be the last living witness to the rapper's fatal 1996 drive-by shooting. Criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Bernarda Villalona is joining me now for more on this. Uh, Bernarda, in his own memoir, Davis says that he was in the front passenger seat of this car and that he passed the gun used in the shooting to the back seat before the shots were fired in this drive-by. How will he now defend himself in court? How challenging is this defense going to be given the admissions he's already made. Well, this is gonna be a huge challenge for him because the actual passing and the providing of the deadly weapon that was used to kill Tupac Shakur, that right there is fatal. That's why he can't argue that he was just merely present inside of the vehicle because that goes to show the evidence that he aided and abetted the commission of this crime, of this shooting that led to the fatal death of Tupac Shakur. The question will be now is at the time that he goes to trial, is he gonna say, I lied in memoir that wasn't me I was doing it in order to get some fame or to make some money but then it also forces him if you are going to go that route are you going to testify are you going to take the stand so he has some huge hurdles to fight but he can also argue wait well I wrote that memoir in 2018 it's 2023 so why are you coming after me now now if he's admitted for years to being in the car and providing the gun, why did it take so long to arrest him? This happened in 1996. Well, there are many issues. So you got to think, even in 1996, law enforcement had a lot of the evidence that they have now. But what you know in the sense of, okay, we have an idea was you, is different than what you can prove in court. So they had to find evidence that they can present inside of a courtroom. So now using his own words, his interviews, his podcast, the YouTube interviews, and his but his memoir itself, they're going to use that against them. Also, they had to find corroborating evidence because you can't just use a person's statement alone to try to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt. So they couldn't just come in and say, here's his 2019 memoir. He says he did this case closed. Not enough. Not enough. They have to get corroborating evidence. And also, you got to think what witnesses are available because Suge Knight, yes, he was in the car. Yes, he's a witness. But will he cooperate? He's already said he's not going to cooperate. So I want to ask you about that because Suge Knight was driving the car that night that Tupac was in. He has he has um, disputed the allegations that it was Davis's nephew who was the actual shooter, but he says he won't testify in this case. So what do they do? Can they force him to testify? They can force him to testify. I was a former prosecutor, and when we wanted to get witnesses to testify, you can apply to get a material witness order where you have a judge that signs an order that says you are material and have material information as to the guilt in this case, and we want you to come in and testify. However, it's going to be difficult because one, Suge Knight, he's in custody. He's going to be in custody for years. I believe he's serving a 30-year sentence, and aside from that, He's given so many conflicting statements that he's not a credible witness at this point. So I don't see Suge Knight taking the stand in this trial. Uh, quickly, Bernardo, what are you watching for in the arraignment today? 
Well, I want to see whether he's going to say anything. Is he going to make any statements? Highly unlikely, because if I were his defense attorney, I wouldn't say anything except the words not guilty. But I am curious to see whether the prosecutor will provide us with additional information in terms of what evidence they have now that is different from what they had in 1996 to actually make an arrest in this case. Because we do have the indictment, we do have the probable cause, the search warrant, but it doesn't give us much insight as to what the actual evidence is aside from their using his statements. All right, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, Bernardo Villalona. Good to see you, Bernardo. Thank you. Thank you. And you can watch Impact by Nightline special, Who Shot Pac? The Murder of Tupac Shakur, now streaming on Hulu. And now to the alert we'll all be receiving on our phones today. FEMA will be testing its cell phone emergency alert system. It's an annual test to make sure the system used to warn about national emergencies is working. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has more on what we can expect. Hi, Eva. So today our cell phones are going to go off with an alert, but don't panic. It's just a test for FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. This is the yearly test to make sure the system to warn you about public and national emergencies is in fact working. The test will happen at 2.20 this afternoon, Eastern Time, 11.20 Pacific. Any cell phone that is on and in range of a tower should get the alert. Wireless providers will transmit the test for 30 minutes, but don't worry, it won't be a constant alarm. Your phone should get the test only once. Diane. Keep an ear out for that, thank you. And the Federal Trade Commission claims Amazon used a secret algorithm to drive prices up on its site in a practice codenamed Project Nessie. Now Amazon claims it was just used for price matching. Rebecca Jarvis has more. The secret algorithm, codenamed Project Nessie, according to redacted documents from the FTC's antitrust lawsuit against Amazon, allowed the retail giant to raise prices and watch competitors to see if they'd follow, forcing prices higher, allegedly overall for consumers. Now, that algorithm was also allegedly used to track and undercut competitors, so if a competing retailer lowered its prices, Amazon could follow suit. The company stopped using the algorithm in 2019, and a source telling the Wall Street Journal that Amazon made more than a billion dollars in revenue through use of the algorithm. Amazon declining to confirm that number to ABC News, but telling ABC News that the FTC is wrong on the facts and the law, noting that Project Nessie was a project with a simple purpose to try to stop our price matching from resulting in unusual outcomes where prices became so low that they were unsustainable. And this is all part of the government's lawsuit against Amazon claiming it is too powerful and a monopoly. Diane? All right, Rebecca Jarvis, thank you. Coming up, tens of thousands of child care centers are now at risk of closing. Why they're losing funding and what families can do to get the help. Also ahead, a new study shows a new study on Ozempic, what it says about the drug's long-term effect on weight loss. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts.
Get Ready America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, millions of families across the country are bracing for a major change in child care as a pandemic era emergency funding program expires. Tens of thousands of child care centers are now at risk of closing. Business reporter Alexis Christophorus has more. Tracy Hansen has been caring for young children in Colleen, Texas for 28 years, but she worries she'll have to shut down her child care center. We are hanging on by our fingernails. That's because $24 billion the federal government gave to child care centers during the pandemic has dried up, threatening to leave 3.2 million kids without care and putting 70,000 child care programs at risk of closing. With the extra money, I was able to give pay raises, paid time off for employees. I've supported families that were not able to afford tuition. I've been able to do some repairs on the building and we've revamped our playground. Without the extra funding, she's had to raise tuition and reduce hours, but says even that may not be enough. I tell myself I'm gonna give it six more months, but in reality, I just don't see us being able to make it. That would be a devastating blow to Shelby Lynch and her growing family. Her son has been attending Tracy's daycare center for years, and Shelby herself even went there as a child. It would be disastrous. My husband, with his job, he's the breadwinner, so I would have to be the one that stays at home. The average cost of childcare in the U.S. now tops $10,000 a year for one child. That's more than in-state college tuition in dozens of states. Tuition for Shelby's four-year-old son, Aiden, just went up another $80 a month. And with a daughter on the way, she and her husband worry how they'll afford it. We put off having kids for so long because we knew daycare was expensive. We still have to pay almost a mortgage payment for childcare, and it's, it's just a lot. A similar scenario was playing out in Boyd, Wisconsin, where registered nurse Amanda Koenig says she and her husband got sticker shock when they saw their child care bill for the upcoming year. That fear of knowing that we're probably going to have to go paycheck to paycheck sometimes is, is very overwhelming. It's not just daycare, it's groceries, it's gas, it's, you know, all the things added up that you need just to live. Daycare four days a week for her two children would have cost $1,840 a month. But Amanda's mother-in-law has agreed to watch the baby once a week. We're saving over $400 a month by doing that. Um, we're very fortunate and grateful that we, we can get that extra help. Many families are not so lucky. Pre-COVID, Tracy Hansen had 150 children at her center. That number has dwindled to 63. Pandemic-era child care funding was always meant to be temporary. Democrats have been attempting to push through a $16 billion child care funding package that would offer assistance for another five years. But without GOP support, the bill faces an uphill battle in Congress. Parents are having to choose, and it's not making economical sense for them to be working outside the home and then paying for child care. And Alexis joins me now for more on this. Alexis, what can families do to try to ease the burden of child care costs? Well, as you saw in the piece with Amanda, she was one of the lucky ones because her mother-in-law is able to help out with her son. So if you can tap family, tap friends, even if they can help out for a few hours or a day, that can really be, uh, be a savings. But we know that's not an option for everyone. Make sure that you are also getting the tax credits that you are eligible for, the child care tax credit and also the dependent care and 
child tax credit. Both of these were more generous during the pandemic, but they still do exist. And you should definitely look into whether or not uh, you qualify. Also, check with your employer. Are there perks, child care perks, maybe you're unaware of? Can you work a flex uh, schedule? Even working remotely one day a week could be a big help. And see if they have the dependent care FSA or flex spending account, which allows you to put pre-tax dollars aside for child care, including before and after school programs. That's that's a big one. And finally, for low-income families, lots of states offer assistance. Go right to your state's website and check out the resources there. Now, child care was in crisis even before the pandemic. So what's the biggest challenge facing the industry now? Definitely in crisis before the, the, the pandemic. And one of the big issues is, you look, Americans spend about 27% of their income on child care. So it's, you know, it's unsustainable for so many folks. They just can't find the help. Right now, the average educator or teacher for child care makes about $12.5 an hour. That's less than most fast food workers do. They saw a bunch of those workers leave during the pandemic, and they're not going back. When I was talking to that child care owner, she was saying her biggest issue right now, she cannot offer her workers a living wage. All right, Alexis Christophers, thank you. And now to one dad's dramatic transformation after he says he took control of his health and lost 100 pounds in six months without medication. He's now sharing his tips for others. Andrew Dimbert has more. It wasn't the 15 pounds he gained during lockdown or the medications he was taking for high blood pressure and gastric reflux. Jamie Wooldridge's motivation to lose weight was this photo taken by his wife one day in church. I may or may not have fallen asleep, but anyway, the photo was not flattering at all. And and it was like, okay, I need to do something about this. Within six months, the 285 pound retiree from South Lake, Texas had lost a hundred pounds. Now he's helping others learn from his journey, starting with calorie counting. I was really shocked to see that I was probably consuming four to 5,000 calories a day. It was, it was, humbling for his age and activity level jamie should have been getting 3300 calories a day so he joined an app for counting calories and cut to 2200 calories a day for weight loss while the pounds came off he never deprived himself of his favorite foods if i'm gonna have pizza well i'm just gonna budget that into my my calorie allotment for the day he was already walking miles every day at some point he started running too sharing his journey on tiktok did my 5k and i'm gonna finish it up with about a seven mile walk this type of dramatic weight loss is likely not possible for most people. Dr. Veronica Johnson, who is not Jamie's physician, says anyone making significant changes to their diet should talk with a doctor. I think taking a, a step back and, and looking at your overall health and when you have these things in a better place, your overall health is improved. He recognized that he was struggling with his weight, but he also recognized that his cholesterol was elevated, his blood pressure was elevated, he was on the verge of having diabetes, and so he felt that losing weight would improve all of those markers. For healthier eating, Jamie decreased his processed sugar intake, used substitutions like low-fat mayo to reduce calories, and used an air fryer to cut the fat out of his favorite recipes, like French fries. His big tip for newbies, plan accordingly for life's events. Every month there's going to be something. There's so many tools out there that can help you be successful. If I can do it, you can do it. How to stick with it? Jamie says make your resolution your routine. And he says it's not as hard as it sounds. But anybody who chooses to change their diet or is eager to lose weight should talk to their provider and determine the best course of action for them. Diane. All right, Andrew Dimber, thank you. And a new study shows people with type 2 diabetes using the active ingredient in Osempic and Wegovy maintained improvements in blood sugar control and weight loss for three years. The study involved more than 23,000 people over three years. ABC News medical contributor and physician at Stanford Children's Health, Dr. Alok Patel, joins me now for more. Dr. Patel, what stands out to you from this study? What stands out is the sustained benefit over the course of three years. A lot of the headlines people have seen regarding Osempic, semaglutide, and these drugs have been over the course of this year. A lot of short-term benefits and not necessarily a generalized population. So this study is really showing what can happen if people have good adherence, meaning if they're prescribed to take these medications, that they are doing it on a weekly basis over the course of many years, sustaining the side effects, following their healthcare team, that they're seeing a weight loss in this study about 10 pounds, that they are seeing a reduction in their blood sugar and overall beneficial health. Now, it's important to note that this study was partially funded by the manufacturer, and it's yet to appear in a peer-reviewed journal, but this is an important step forward as you start having the conversation about these long-term weight management solutions for certain individuals with a high BMI or with type 2 diabetes. 
So how can people test their blood sugar and what should they know about the results? Well, the most important thing for people about their blood sugar is to realize that we all have certain amounts of blood sugar. We need them to live. You can have short-term symptoms if you have too low blood of sugar. Too high blood sugar, you could be pre-diabetic or diabetic, and that can cause some long-term complications. If people have questions or concerns about testing their own blood sugar, you want to check in with the healthcare professional. Now, the metric for measuring blood sugar in this study, which a lot of people have heard about, is called A1C or hemoglobin A1C. Quick med school 101 overview. We all have hemoglobin. That's the part of our red blood cells that carry oxygen over time. You can have sugar kind of bind to that. And the, the A1C test is a measure of that over the course of three months. So we want that number to be below 6%, roughly about 5.7%. When we start getting above 6.5%, that's when your physician may worry about prediabetes or diabetes. The average person can expect to get tested for this about every three years if you're high risk, one to two. People with diabetes every six months. But again, it's important to check in with your doctor if you are concerned about your blood sugar or if you wanna check it more frequently. Now for those who are thinking about using a semaglutide drug for weight loss or diabetes, what should they know? Which they know is part of the question you just said right there, is that the indications are for weight loss and diabetes in certain individuals, and you want to do this under physician guidance. Diane, Osempic is not a quick fix. It is not something that people should just take without having the right medical indications. There can be side effects. And again, as we we're talking about with this study, adherence is important. If people are prescribed this medication, expect to take it for a long period of time several years, if not for the rest of their life, and only stop taking it if directed by a physician. And also, these medications, including any weight loss medications, are part of an overall healthy lifestyle plan that would include healthy nutrition, dieting, exercise, and one of your favorites, sleep. It's a big one. ABC News contributor, physician at Stanford Children's Health, Dr. Alok Patel, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, former President Trump is in a New York City court for a third day. We are awaiting to see him enter the courtroom. Now, why he's choosing to be there and why the judge issued a gag order against him right after the break. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. An urgent manhunt underway. A corrections officer and an inmate disappear into thin air. This case just captivated people. How many times do you see a respected jail guard help a guy escape? Now, Friday night. The secret romantic relationship. The jailhouse romance that felt like a movie. And the chase is on. That's when she discharged a firearm. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC.
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. An 80-year-old man is making a difference for wounded warriors one golf ball at a time. Bob Duke sells stray golf balls to raise money for injured service members. And now he's up to nearly $500,000. Danny New has his story. This is Bob. Bob Duke turned 80 years old last month, but there's no time to celebrate. He's got golf balls to deliver. I fill my pickup truck full of golf and balls so I can replace the balls, gets the money, comes back, goes to the bank. <laughs> Bob and Vicky first started collecting about 12 years ago when Bob, a retired master sergeant who served in the Army for 36 years, there's probably 600 golf balls on these, wanted a fundraise for the Wounded Warrior Project, which serves veterans who are healing. I said, I'm going to start giving them money because I live on a golf course and people need golf balls. It started with Bob collecting balls from their home course in North Carolina and then selling them to his neighbors for $5 a dozen. But now, as you can see, this mission has exploded into a top-notch production, especially here in the attic. You worry about the whole ceiling <laughs> from our attic falling down. And as you look around, golf balls everywhere. People drop off buckets of golf balls all the time. Clubs around the country ship them to him. And then he sells dozens in these little displays that you saw earlier. Welcome to our garage. Vicki gave up her parking spot and <laughs> it was wonderful. I'm very honored and humbled. And recently, Bob and Vicky got a big thank you for their years of service after raising nearly, get ready, nearly $500,000 to help veterans. It just made it all worthwhile. <laughs> Bob was very touched, but hey, he's not done yet. Look me up if you need some golf balls. Danny New, thank you. Coming up, the alleged shot caller in Tupac Shakur's death heads to court. Why he's being charged with murder even though prosecutors say he didn't pull the trigger. Also ahead, a new study on Ozempic, what it says about the drug's long-term effect on weight loss. Plus, the bed bug warning, what Paris is doing about a widespread issue plaguing public spaces. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Everything you need to know. You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. 
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the White House, I'm Elizabeth Schulze. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live, history in the House. For the first time ever, the speaker is out. Kevin McCarthy has been ousted and says he won't run again. Which Republican representative just said they plan to run for the spot? Former President Donald Trump is back in court for day three of his civil fraud trial. Why the judge issued a gag order against him. And all eyes on him, the man accused of being involved in Tupac's murder just appeared in court why he wasn't arraigned, and when he'll face a judge again. But first, we begin with Ohio Republican Representative Jim Jordan saying he's jumping into the race to replace Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the House. After nine months in office, McCarthy is the first House Speaker ever to be voted out. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell paid tribute to the ousted former Speaker, saying he's keenly aware of the thankless work it takes to be a congressional leader. He didn't hesitate to get his hands dirty. When the circumstances were tough, he drew on his faith, his family, and his belief in American exceptionalism. And do any other business until a new speaker is voted in. ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now from Capitol Hill with more. Jay, Jim Jordan's now the first person to publicly throw their hat in the ring. Who are some of the other names being floated and what do they have to consider before making the decision to run? Well, one of the names is Steve Scalise. That's been floated a lot. It's even been floated by far-right members of the House Republican Conference. Matt Gates, when he was going for Kevin McCarthy's job even earlier in the week before that vote yesterday, said that he would get behind Steve Scalise as a pick for speaker. But again, as you said, while Scalise, like we can tell you from source reporting, is exploring a bid for speaker, having meetings, reaching out to members, Jim Jordan is the only one right now who's formally thrown his hat in the ring. He just put out this letter to his House Republican colleagues laying out why he believes he should be the speaker. I think we have a graphic of that letter for you. It essentially says that it's time for an era of Republican leadership where Republicans don't back down from their policy priorities and things of that nature. Now, when you ask what's next here, the House is expected, the House Republicans rather, are expected to meet on Tuesday of next week, get behind closed doors, hear from the various candidates for speaker, whoever emerges between now and Tuesday. But I can tell you, Diane, some prominent House Republicans who we've been talking to today say that they're not confident that this race for speaker would be wrapped up by next week because there still is, as they put it, some bad blood in the House Republican conference. One McCarthy ally said that everyone needs to decompress and said he's not certain if that all could happen by next week. Jay, how are Democrats reacting to all of this? And could their decision to not save McCarthy backfire if they end up with a more conservative speaker? Well, that's certainly one of the open questions. Obviously, Jim Jordan is more publicly conservative than Kevin McCarthy is, for instance. He's the one leading, one of the members, leading the impeachment inquiry into President Biden and leading the investigations into President Biden's son, Hunter. But when you ask House Democrats why they did not step in and help out Kevin McCarthy yesterday, they mentioned to me and others one of these three things or all of these three things, depending upon the Democrat you ask. A, they hold the impeachment inquiry against Kevin McCarthy. B, they say that he backed down and backed away from that deal he struck with the president over the debt ceiling, which has put us, Democrats say, in this position about a looming government shutdown. And three, they were very, very upset about McCar comments McCarthy made over the weekend 
blaming congressional Democrats for the possibility of a government shutdown. In fact, when House Democrats met yesterday, leadership played a video of Kevin McCarthy on one of the political weekend shows essentially blaming Democrats for the current position with the possibility of a looming government shutdown. And one source tells me that riled up House Democrats. It got them mad and it put them in a position where they questioned whether or not they would really back McCarthy. All right, Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thanks, Jay. And former President Trump is back in court for day three of the civil fraud trial against him. A judge has already ruled Trump, his sons, and other executives engaged in fraud, ordering their business certificates in New York canceled. Now the trial will decide what additional penalties Trump and other defendants could face. Senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky joins me now from the courthouse, along with ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for more. Aaron, what's the latest in court? We're still going through cross-examination here, Diane, of Donald Bender, who's been the first and only witness to take the stand so far. And, and, and really, the, the two sides see his role differently. Uh, Bender testified uh, when he was under direct examination that the Trumps had full control of the inputs for the financial statements that the judge has already determined to be fraudulent uh, and that made Trump seem far richer than he actually was. Under cross-examination, uh, the defense is trying to show that Bender, as the accountant, uh, had more control or should have had more control over the integrity of those financial statements. Uh, and, and really, in the end, the judge seems a, a little bit frustrated that it's taking this long. He's been asking lawyers to just sort of get on with it, uh, you know, saying that they're, they're really dancing over things that could fit on the tip of a pen. Now, Brian, Trump's defense attorney is trying to discredit this accountant who's been testifying about Trump's financial records. What do you make of the strategy there? It seems almost twofold here. One, as Aaron is saying, kind of pointing the finger at the accountant, saying this was something that's your responsibility. And I think what it does is it takes away the intent or the knowledge aspect of these crimes. That President, former President Trump didn't have the intent or knowledge to defraud anyone, yet alone these banks or what uh, the allegations, but it was in fact Bender who was in charge of these decisions. And the other aspect is, if you do believe that the former president was in charge of this, then you discredit the accountant, the one who's actually running the numbers. It's an interesting argument. I, I don't know how well it'll work in front of a, a judge who's already made some pretty damning rulings against them, but I, I think it's the best route for a defense here. Now, uh, former President Trump is also back posting on social media again. He's criticizing the attorney general here. He was put under a gag order by the judge yesterday. So could he get in trouble for this? Who does this gag order cover? So the gag order covers all of the defendants, including Donald Trump himself. And if, as according to the judge, he goes and attacks any of the judge's staff or anyone basically in the courtroom, he would be in violation of that gag order. So we've already seen some of his tweets this morning seem to really pull back on both the uh, the vigor in which he is test, uh, tweeting, but also who he is, is targeting. So he seems to be following it, but if he does violate the gag order, he could be held in contempt of court, and those could either see financial implications or other legal implications against him. So he can't, for example, criticize the court clerk, but he can still criticize the attorney general? I mean, yeah. It seems devil's, that way, at least, The devil's right? in the details. Even more so, the judge says you can't criticize the, the court staff. I don't know if the judge is included in that court staff. Interesting. Uh, so maybe he can criticize the judge. Maybe he can criticize the attorney general. I think he's safer to, uh, to criticize the attorney general. But if I was him or his attorney, I'd just say, you know what? Let's not criticize anyone. Let's, let's just stick to the facts, make the arguments, and, and go forward. Uh, Aaron, what are you watching for as this trial continues? <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's interesting to pick up on, on your discussion. This is now the, the third time that Trump is under a judge's warning to, to back off. In the E. Jean Carroll civil trial, he was admonished by a federal judge to, to stop posting on social media about the court, about the, the plaintiff in that case. Here again now, this limited gag order here. A federal judge in Washington is considering whether to impose a gag order in the January 6th election interference case there because of what the special counsel has said, his increasingly hostile and incendiary attacks. Uh, 
In court, though, Trump cuts a much more subdued figure. He is relegated to the defense table where he sits quietly with his hands folded. Uh, he does not appear to be looking at New York Attorney General Letitia James, who brought the case, who has drawn his ire, and who's sitting there right behind him. Occasionally, he's been looking at papers, tearing them up even. We don't know whether those have to do with the case or something else. Uh, but he says he would much rather be on the campaign trail fighting to be president again. He's not obligated to be here. This is his choice, at least until he's called to testify, Diane. All right, Aaron Kaczorski, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you both. And former New York mayor and Trump attorney Rudy Giuliani says he's suing President Biden and his family. Giuliani's seeking damages for what he calls Joe Biden's lies, saying being called a Russian pawn cost him clients in the consulting business and millions of dollars in potential earnings. The lawsuit comes as the former mayor faces criminal charges for his alleged role in efforts to overturn the 2020 election in Georgia. Sources tell ABC News another of his attorneys is now seeking to withdraw from that case. And sources close to Giuliani say the former mayor is close to retaining new local representation. Meanwhile, mourners in California are paying their respects to the late Senator Dianne Feinstein today. Hey. Feinstein's body will lie in state in San Francisco City Hall, where she launched her political career as the city's first female mayor. A memorial service will be held outside San Francisco City Hall tomorrow. Speakers will include former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, and there you see former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi there live paying her respects to the late Senator Dianne Feinstein. Other speakers will also include the vice president and the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Senator Feinstein died on Thursday at her home in Washington, D.C. after a series of illnesses. And the man charged with the murder of rapper Tupac Shakur appeared in court just minutes ago. In a very brief arraignment hearing, Dwayne Davis asked for a two-week continuance, saying he has retained counsel, but that his attorney couldn't be in court. Davis is accused of ordering the murder of Tupac Shakur in 1996 and is believed to have handed the gun used in that crime to the shooter. ABC's Jacqueline Lee and criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Bernardo Villalona, join me now for more on this. Bernardo, this hearing was very brief. How does this work? Why show up if you don't have an attorney, say the attorney's not present? It how frequently do things like this happen? Well, this actually happens more often than not. So you have to think that because he was arrested last week, Friday, he is still entitled to his arraignment hearing within a certain amount of days of his arrest. So that's why he was produced today. And his defense attorney, who he retained, by the way, has said that he's not available. So, of course, the judge is going to give him the courtesy of giving him another date so he can be present. What's going to happen at the arraignment? I'm sure that the defense attorney probably took some time because he wants to put a bail package together because right now he's remanded. There's no bail that is set for his release. So I'm sure that the defense attorney is going to put something together to try to plead his case to the judge to leave his client out pending the, the proceedings. Now, Jacqueline, this murder took place almost 30 years ago. So what do we know about the evidence collected over the course of this investigation and, and what is going to tie specifically to this case? Yeah, that's right, Diane. You know, officials have made it very clear that the reason why they couldn't charge until now is because they just did not have enough evidence in the case. But what they have said is they said that Davis, it was his own statements made in 2018. He had that 2019 memoir where he had a lot of details about the night of the murder and they were able to, to piece it back to the, the night of the crime. Um, and so ultimately they executed the search warrant at his home. They confiscated computers, lap, um, computer cell phones, bullets, uh, all supporting evidence uh, to bring it to a grand jury and ultimately indict him. Diane. What's your reaction to hearing them say, oh, we didn't make an arrest earlier because we didn't have enough evidence? Meanwhile, he's saying in his own book years ago, in 2019, that he was in the car that he handed the gun to the person in the back seat, that he was in the passenger seat when this all happened. How do those two things square? So you got to think, for the prosecution, also for law enforcement, yes, you know, and you could probably have an idea, but it's what you can prove. What can you prove to bring before a jury? Because you have to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not about just making an arrest and closing the case. So yes, he made those statements, but you want corroboration of what he's admitting to, because that is something that the jury is going to be looking for. Also, in terms of him saying that he had the gun and he passed the gun to someone else, that he was just there, that's not going to be enough to to try to get him off because he's being charged not only just directly causing the death of Tupac Shakur, but also aiding and abetting another person to cause the death of Tupac Shakur.
All right, ABC's Jacqueline Lee, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Bernardo Villalona, thank you both. And you can watch Impact by Nightline's special, Who Shot Pac? The Murder of Tupac Shakur, now streaming on Hulu. Meanwhile, starting today, the Vatican is holding high-level meetings on the future of the Catholic Church. Delegates all over the world are gathering for what's expected to be a defining moment for Pope Francis's reform agenda. The meetings come after the Pope suggested there could be a way to bless same-sex unions in the church. Foreign correspondent James Longman is at the Vatican with more on that. J James, Pope Francis is convening this global gathering to discuss the church's future. So what are some of the key topics they're focused on? Well, Diane, they're not shying away from some of the most controversial topics that face the Catholic Church today. Women in the church famously dominated this male-dominated institution. Uh, the, 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 a lot of discussion will take place on the role women might be able to take. Uh, as you said there, same-sex unions as well, uh, sex abuse scandals. That is something that the wider Catholic population around the world has been really keen to get on the agenda here. And that is the whole point of this synod. It literally means journeying together. And, and it's a period of reflection over a month to really dig down into some very serious issues that the church has to contend with today in the modern world. Pope Francis, in his homily this morning, he gave mass. He said four times, this is not a parliament. It's not some clinical voting exercise. It's a period of deep reflection for people all over the world to come together to discuss these topics. It took two years of canvassing opinions uh, before they got to this point. So it sounds as though there's going to be some serious discussions around some very serious topics. Diane? Uh, James, and for the first time, lay people and women will vote on specific issues alongside bishops and other clergy. What brought about that change? Well, I mean, this speaks to really what Pope Francis is all about, I think, uh, his supporters would say. This idea of synodality, that's where we get the word synod. He wants to make it a more, I mean, for want of a better word, he wants to democratize the process a little bit more. He wants to remove the idea or the focus on hierarchy. There isn't really a much more hierarchical institution in the world than the Catholic Church, you could argue. But he wants to get back down into the roots. I saw one journalist said a focus more on the flock, less on the shepherds. So that's what it's about, including these women, some 50 or more women are involved, will be, take part in the voting process as well, as well as these lay people. That has never happened before. Of course, he's going to have his detractors who say that this is uh, watering down some of the most fundamental elements of what it is to be Catholic. Uh, and there have been already some controversial uh, conversations had in the public arena around this synod. Uh, but this is what Pope Francis is all about. He wants to strip things back to basics. Uh, you, you can see that, you know, when he became Pope, there was a lot made of the fact that he didn't want to stay in the papal apartments. Uh, that he preferred to kind of walk around when he was an archbishop uh, among the people rather than take official vehicles. This is his brand. And I think this synod is an extension of the brand of Pope Francis. Diane? Foreign correspondent James Longman, thanks for that. Coming up, the parents of a former U.S. swim star found dead are breaking their silence. Why they say their daughter's death in the U.S. Virgin Islands was no accident. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting when the nurse is on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. Welcome back. The family of a former swimming champion who died of an alleged fentanyl overdose, fentanyl overdose is raising questions about her death. Jamie Kale was found dead in the Virgin Islands. Now her family is sharing new details about the case, saying they suspect foul play. Janae Norman has this exclusive interview. A grieving family demanding answers in the death of their daughter, a former swimming star found dead in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Jamie was getting ready to leave the island on March 14th. She was coming home. It makes no sense. Um, all the evidence out there uh, has been completely overlooked. What we are looking for is justice for Jamie. We're looking for truth. Pat and Gary Kale claim island authorities haven't been forthcoming with details into their daughter Jamie's death, limiting access to information and withholding an official copy of the autopsy. We had somebody that we, that we authorized to go to the funeral home and to view. And that's all they would allow us, all they would allow her to see and see photograph the face. So we don't know what the rest of the, if there's anything else on the rest of the body uh, because we don't have the autopsy report. The family sharing those photos, too graphic to show here with ABC News. She had a black eye. Um, her forehead appeared to have had a blunt trauma to the forehead. Um, it appeared that her nose had been broken. Her lips had blood around them. Kale was a high school champion swimmer from Maine, winning a gold medal in the 1997 Pan Pacific Championship 800 free relay. She then notched silver at the 1998 Swimming World Cup in Brazil. She lived in the U.S. Virgin Islands for nearly two decades. The 42-year-old was found unresponsive in her home by her boyfriend back in February. According to the original police release, Kale's boyfriend, with the help of a friend, then took Kale to a nearby clinic where CP PR was rendered, but Kale succumbed to her ailment. But months later, authorities saying she died of an accidental fentanyl overdose. Her family insists Jamie didn't use drugs. Never. Jamie Kale never did drugs. Never. There's no way that she had fentanyl in her voluntarily. And her family believes critical evidence like those facial injuries is being overlooked. We reach out to authorities to ask about the investigation and those unexplained injuries, but haven't heard back. Diane. All right, Janae Norman, thank you. Coming up, encouraging kids and teens through art, how an art teacher has now become a Starbucks designer and is sharing her story. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. 
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. I'm Lindsay Davis reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. A Latina artist is encouraging kids and teens to think big and follow their dreams. And she's leading by example. Her colorful designs, having been an art teacher, well, they're now featured on Starbucks cups across the country. ABC's Melissa Dunn has her story as we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. So I did this thing. Latina artist Manuela Guillen knows a thing or two about the power of a brush stroke. She's wanted to be an artist since she was five years old. I grabbed crayons and at the top of the staircase I started drawing on the wall because I thought I was drawing a mural. Um, of course my parents did not agree. <laughs> the Cuban Salvadorian calls Philadelphia home and at the heart of what she does is encouraging youth. A year ago she quit her job as an art teacher to follow her passion. I did tell the students there is going to be one thing that's very passionate that you're going to really want to do and you're going to have to take that leap. Her illustrations are full of flowers and warm inviting colors but behind that she uses her art to cope with emotions and encourage others to do the same. Growing up in South Florida I witnessed a lot of like violence especially like violence towards women. It was hard to process that stuff when I was really young so I began making art. How important is it to use kind of that outlet to help yourself and help others. I felt like, I don't know, like it was bigger than me. People reach out, they feel very seen and heard and like they sense a presence, like their presence sometimes in some of my pieces. This South Philly wall turned into a passion project for Manuela, made up of drawings by local students. So Manuela, when you literally like walk down the, the sidewalk in the street and you're seeing this, what do you think of? Um, I think about how amazing it is that someone who could be five years old can see their art on the wall. As Manuela celebrates her community and culture, now even Starbucks has a slice of it. Creating these tumblers have been an incredible journey. How do you feel? It's surreal. It feels, it feels like I'm still dreaming. I feel like I won the lottery, the artist lottery. But I, overall, I also know that I have worked in the art world for over 10 years. I have done probably like hundreds of projects. And I don't know, maybe this was, was meant to be on my path. Encouraging the next generation, one brushstroke at a time. Melissa Adan, thank you. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you. 
for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. You are looking at Vatican City on this Wednesday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. Republicans are expected to hold an election for a new Speaker of the House next week after ousting Kevin McCarthy. Eight Republicans voted with Democrats to remove McCarthy, the marking the House first time in American history the House has voted a Speaker out. Vacant. Now, McCarthy says he won't run for Speaker again. I don't regret standing up for choosing governing over grievance. I do not regret negotiating. Our government is designed to find compromise. Sources tell ABC News House Majority Leader Steve Scalise is now calling members to see if they would support him for the position. And get ready for the biggest Powerball jackpot so far this year. The Powerball drawing is now worth $1.2 billion. It's the third largest Powerball jackpot ever and the seventh largest in any U.S. lottery. And it is Fat Bear Week. Voting opens today for the annual competition to rank Alaska's bulkiest brown bears. Katmai National Park says the bears have spent the summer fattening up on salmon, berries, and grasses, and that fat is fit as they prepare for their winter hibernation. You can cast your votes for Fattest Bear at fatbearweek.org. And the man accused of ordering the murder of Tupac Shakur is set to be arraigned in a Nevada court today. Prosecutors say Dwayne Davis will be charged with murder even though they don't believe he pulled the trigger. He's said to be the last living witness to the rapper's fatal 1996 drive-by shooting. Criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Bernarda Villalona is joining me now for more on this. Uh, Bernarda, in his own memoir, Davis says that he was in the front passenger seat of this car and that he passed the gun used in the shooting to the back seat before the shots were fired in this drive-by. How will he now defend himself in court. How challenging is this defense going to be given the admissions he's already made? Well, this is going to be a huge challenge for him because the actual passing and the providing of the deadly weapon that was used to kill Tupac Shakur, that right there is fatal. That's why he can't argue that he was just merely present inside of the vehicle because that goes to show the evidence that he aided and abetted the commission of this crime, of this shooting that led to the fatal death of Tupac Shakur. The question will be now is at the time that he goes to trial, is he going to say, I lied in a memoir that wasn't me I was doing it in order to get some fame or to make some money but then it also forces him if you are going to go that route are you going to testify are you going to take the stand so he has some huge hurdles to fight but he can also argue wait well I wrote that memoir in 2018 it's 2023 so why are you coming after me now now if he's admitted for years to being in the car and providing the gun, why did it take so long to arrest him? This happened in 1996. Well, there are many issues. So you got to think, even in 1996, law enforcement had a lot of the evidence that they have now. But what you know in the sense of, okay, we have an idea with you, is different than what you can prove in court. So they had to find evidence that they can present inside of a courtroom. So now using his own words, his interviews, his podcast, the YouTube interviews, and his but his memoir itself, they're going to use that against them. Also, they had to find corroborating evidence because you can't just use a person's statement alone to try to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt. So they couldn't just come in and say, here's his 2019 memoir. He says he did this. Case closed. Not enough. Not enough. They have to get corroborating evidence. And also, you got to think what witnesses are available because Suge Knight, yes, he was in the car. Yes, he's a witness. 
But will he cooperate? He's already said he's not going to cooperate. So I want to ask you about that because Suge Knight was driving the car that night that Tupac was in. He has he has um, disputed the allegations that it was Davis's nephew who was the actual shooter, but he says he won't testify in this case. So what do they do? Can they force him to testify? They can force him to testify. I was a former prosecutor, and when we wanted to get witnesses to testify, you can apply to get a material witness order where you have a judge that signs an order that says you are material and have material information as to the guilt in this case, and we want you to come in and testify. However, it's going to be difficult because once Shug Knight, he's in custody. He's going to be in custody for years. I believe he's serving a 30-year sentence. And aside from that, he's given so many conflicting statements that he's not a credible witness at this point. So I don't see Shug Knight taking the stand in this trial. Uh, quickly, Bernardo, what are you watching for in the arraignment today? Well, I want to see whether he's going to say anything. Is he going to make any statements? Highly unlikely, because if I were his defense attorney, I wouldn't say anything except the words not guilty. But I am curious to see whether the prosecutor will provide us with additional information in terms of what evidence they have now that is different from what they had in 1996 to actually make an arrest in this case. Because we do have the indictment, we do have the probable cause, the search warrant, but it doesn't give us much insight as to what the actual evidence is aside from their using his statements. All right, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, Bernardo Villalona. Good to see you, Bernardo. Thank you. Thank you. And you can watch Impact by Nightline special, Who Shot Pac? The Murder of Tupac Shakur, now streaming on Hulu. And now to the alert we'll all be receiving on our phones today. FEMA will be testing its cell phone emergency alert system. It's an annual test to make sure the system used to warn about national emergencies is working. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has more on what we can expect. Hi, Eva. So today our cell phones are going to go off with an alert, but don't panic. It's just a test for FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. This is the yearly test to make sure the system to warn you about public and national emergencies is in fact working. The test will happen at 2.20 this afternoon, Eastern Time, 11.20 Pacific. Any cell phone that is on and in range of a tower should get the alert. Wireless providers will transmit the test for 30 minutes, but don't worry, it won't be a constant alarm. Your phone should get the test only once. Diane. Keep an ear out for that, thank you. And the Federal Trade Commission claims Amazon used a secret algorithm to drive prices up on its site in a practice codenamed Project Nessie. Now Amazon claims it was just used for price matching. Rebecca Jarvis has more. The secret algorithm, codenamed Project Nessie, according to redacted documents from the FTC's antitrust lawsuit against Amazon, allowed the retail giant to raise prices and watch competitors to see if they'd follow, forcing prices higher, allegedly overall for consumers. Now, that algorithm was also allegedly used to track and undercut competitors, so if a competing retailer lowered its prices, Amazon could follow suit. The company stopped using the algorithm in 2019 and a source telling the Wall Street Journal that Amazon made more than a billion dollars in revenue through use of the algorithm. Amazon declining to confirm that number to ABC News, but telling ABC News that the FTC is wrong on the facts and the law, noting that Project Nessie was a project with a simple purpose to try to stop our price matching from resulting in unusual outcomes where prices became so low that they were unsustainable. And this is all part of the government's lawsuit against against Amazon claiming it is too powerful and a monopoly. Diane? All right, Rebecca Jarvis, thank you. Coming up, tens of thousands of child care centers are now at risk of closing. Why they're losing funding and what families can do to get the help. Also ahead, a new study shows a new study on Ozempic, what it says about the drug's long-term effect on weight loss. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Number 
one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I think vulnerability is sexy. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point because I identified so much with what she stood for and what her message was. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. From the jump, it was not a good environment. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Lizzo is denying it all, defiant for all to see. While Lizzo might be under fire now, she isn't the only one facing backlash. Why would we be scared of any backlash for simply just sharing our truth? Lizzo's legal limbo. This is Impact by Nightline. I was so shocked. The road is going to be rocky for Lizzo. Now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, millions of families across the country are bracing for a major change in child care as a pandemic-era emergency funding program expires. Tens of thousands of child care centers are now at risk of closing. Business reporter Alexis Christophers has more. Tracy Hansen has been caring for young children in Colleen, Texas for 28 years, but she worries she'll have to shut down her child care center. We are hanging on by our fingernails. That's because $24 billion the federal government gave to child care centers during the pandemic has dried up, threatening to leave 3.2 million kids without care and putting 70,000 child care programs at risk of closing. With the extra money, I was able to give pay raises, paid time off for employees. I've supported families that were not able to afford tuition. I've been able to do some repairs on the building and we've revamped our playground. Without the extra funding, she's had to raise tuition and reduce hours, but says even that may not be enough. I tell myself I'm gonna give it six more months, but in reality, I just don't see us being able to make it. That would be a devastating blow to Shelby Lynch and her growing family. Her son has been attending Tracy's daycare center for years, and Shelby herself even went there as a child. It would be disastrous. My husband, with his job, he's the breadwinner, so I would have to be the one that stays at home. The average cost of childcare in the U.S. now tops $10,000 a year for one child. That's more than in-state college tuition in dozens of states. Tuition for Shelby's four-year-old son, Aiden, just went up another $80 a month. And with a daughter on the way, she and her husband worry how they'll afford it. We put off having kids for so long because we knew Jake here was expensive. We still have to pay almost a mortgage payment for childcare, and it's, it's just a lot. A similar scenario was playing out in Boyd, Wisconsin, where registered nurse Amanda Koenig says she and her husband got sticker shock when they saw their child care bill for the upcoming year. That fear of knowing that we're probably going to have to go paycheck to paycheck sometimes is, is very overwhelming. It's not just daycare, it's groceries, it's gas, it's, you know, all the things added up that you need just to live. Daycare four days a week for her two children would have cost $1,840 a month. But Amanda's mother-in-law has agreed to watch the baby once a week. We're saving over $400 a month by doing that. Um, we're very fortunate and grateful that we, we kind of get that extra help. Many families are not so lucky. Pre-COVID, Tracy Hansen had 150 children at her center. That number has dwindled to 63. Pandemic-era child care funding was always meant to be temporary. Democrats have been attempting to push through a $16 billion child care funding package that would offer assistance for another five years. But without GOP support, the bill faces an uphill battle in Congress. Parents are having to choose, and it's not 
making economical sense for them to be working outside the home and then paying for child care. And Alexis joins me now for more on this. Alexis, what can families do to try to ease the burden of child care costs? Well, as you saw in the piece with Amanda, she was one of the lucky ones because her mother-in-law is able to help out with her son. So if you can, tap family, tap friends. Even if they can help out for a few hours or a day, that can really be, uh, be a savings. But we know that's not an option for everyone. Make sure that you are also getting the tax credits that you are eligible for, the child uh, care tax credit and also the dependent care and child tax credit. Both of these were more generous during the pandemic, but they still do exist, and you should definitely look into whether or not uh, you qualify. Also, check with your employer. Are there perks, child care perks, maybe you're unaware of? Can you work a flex uh, schedule? Even working remotely one day a week could be a big help. And see if they have the dependent care FSA or flex spending account, which allows you to put pre-tax dollars aside for child care, including before and after school programs. That's that's a big one. And finally, for low-income families, Families. Lots of states offer assistance. Go right to your state's website and check out the resources there. Now, child care was in crisis even before the pandemic. So what's the biggest challenge facing the industry now? Definitely in crisis before the, the, the pandemic. And one of the big issues is, you look, Americans spend about 27% of their income on child care. So it's, you know, it's unsustainable for so many folks. They just can't find the help. Right now, the average educator or teacher for child care makes about $12.5 an hour. That's less than most fast food workers do. They saw a bunch of those workers leave during the pandemic, and they're not going back. When I was talking to that child care owner, she was saying her biggest issue right now, she cannot offer her workers a living wage. All right, Alexis Christophers, thank you. And now to one dad's dramatic transformation after he says he took control of his health and lost 100 pounds in six months without medication. He's now sharing his tips for others. Andrew Dimbert has more. It wasn't the 15 pounds he gained during lockdown or the medications he was taking for high blood pressure and gastric reflux. Jamie Wooldridge's motivation to lose weight was this photo taken by his wife one day in church. I may or may not have fallen asleep, but anyway, the photo was not flattering at all. And and it was like, okay, I need to do something about this. Within six months, the 285 pound retiree from South Lake, Texas had lost a hundred pounds. Now he's helping others learn from his journey, starting with calorie counting. I was really shocked to see that I was probably consuming four to 5,000 calories a day. It was, it was, humbling for his age and activity level jamie should have been getting 3300 calories a day so he joined an app for counting calories and cut to 2200 calories a day for weight loss while the pounds came off he never deprived himself of his favorite foods if i'm gonna have pizza well i'm just gonna budget that into my my calorie allotment for the day he was already walking miles every day at some point he started running too sharing his journey on tiktok did my 5k now i'm gonna finish it up with about a seven mile walk this type of dramatic weight loss is likely not possible for most people. Dr. Veronica Johnson, who is not Jamie's physician, says anyone making significant changes to their diet should talk with a doctor. I think taking a, a step back and, and looking at your overall health and when you have these things in a better place, your overall health is improved. He recognized that he was struggling with his weight, but he also recognized that his cholesterol was elevated, his blood pressure was elevated, he was on the verge of having diabetes, and so he felt that losing weight would improve all of those markers. For healthier eating, Jamie decreased his processed sugar intake, used substitutions like low-fat mayo to reduce calories, and used an air fryer to cut the fat out of his favorite recipes, like French fries. His big tip for newbies, plan accordingly for life's events. Every month there's going to be something. There's so many tools out there that can help you be successful. If I can do it, you can do it. How to stick with it? Jamie says make your resolution your routine. And he says it's not as hard as it sounds. But anybody who chooses to change their diet or is eager to lose weight should talk to their provider and determine the best course of action for them. Diane. All right, Andrew Dimber, thank you. And a new study shows people with type 2 diabetes using the active ingredient in Osempic and Wegovy maintained improvements in blood sugar control and weight loss for three years. The study involved more than 23,000 people over three years. ABC News medical contributor and physician at Stanford Children's Health, Dr. Alok Patel, joins me now for more. Dr. Patel, what stands out to you from this study? What stands out is the sustained benefit over the course of three years. A lot of the headlines people have seen regarding Osempic, semeglutide, and these drugs 
even over the course of this year, a lot of short-term benefits and not necessarily a generalized population. So this study is really showing what can happen if people have good adherence, meaning if they're prescribed to take these medications, that they are doing it on a weekly basis over the course of many years, sustaining the side effects, following their healthcare team, that they're seeing a weight loss in this study about 10 pounds, that they are seeing a reduction in their blood sugar and overall beneficial health. Now, it's important to note that this study was partially funded by the manufacturer, and it's yet to appear in a peer-reviewed journal, but this is an important step forward as you start having the conversation about these long-term weight management solutions for certain individuals with a high BMI or with type 2 diabetes. So how can people test their blood sugar, and what should they know about the results? Well, the most important thing for people about their blood sugar is to realize that we all have certain amounts of blood sugar. We need them to live. You can have short-term symptoms if you have too low blood of sugar. Too high blood sugar, you could be pre-diabetic or diabetic, and that can cause some long-term complications. If people have questions or concerns about testing their own blood sugar, you want to check in with the healthcare professional. Now, the metric for measuring blood sugar in this study, which a lot of people have heard about, is called A1C or hemoglobin A1C, quick med school 101 overview. We all have hemoglobin, that's the part of our red blood cells that carry oxygen over time. You can have sugar kind of bind to that, and the, the A1C test is a measure of that over the course of three months. So we want that number to be below 6%, roughly about 5.7%. When we start getting above 6.5%, that's when your physician may worry about prediabetes or diabetes. The average person can expect to get tested for this about every three years if you're high risk, one to two. People with diabetes every six months. But again, it's important to check in with your doctor if you are concerned about your blood sugar or if you want to check it more frequently. Now, for those who are thinking about using a semaglutide drug for weight loss or diabetes, what should they know? What should they know is part of the question you just said right there, is that the indications are for weight loss and diabetes in certain individuals, and you want to do this under physician guidance. Diane, Osempic is not a quick fix. It is not something that people should just take without having the right medical indications. There can be side effects. And again, as we were talking about with this study, adherence is important. If people are prescribed this medication, expect to take it for a long period of time, several years, if not for the rest of their life, and only stop taking it if directed by a physician. And also, these medications, including any weight loss medications, are part of an overall healthy lifestyle plan that would include healthy nutrition, dieting, exercise, and one of your favorites, sleep. It's a big one. ABC News contributor, physician at Stanford Children's Health, Dr. Alok Patel, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, former President Trump is in a New York City court for a third day. We are awaiting to see him enter the courtroom. Now, why he's choosing to be there and why the judge issued a gag order against him right after the break. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Did he trip? Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's no way to undo it. <laughs> he tried. This guy was fearless all of his life. He came out to both of us, and I was scared. I knew people who were gay. I knew people who had been beaten. I thought he would be an easy target. Scott decided he moved to Australia. It didn't really cross my mind that he could get into trouble. There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. That night, everything changed. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. It was an absolute hornet's nest. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. The walls were closing in. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? 
Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. An urgent manhunt underway. A corrections officer and an inmate disappear into thin air. This case just captivated people. How many times do you see a respected jail guard help a guy escape? Now, Friday night. The secret romantic relationship. The jailhouse romance that felt like a movie. And the chase is on. That's when she discharged a firearm. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. An 80-year-old man is making a difference for wounded warriors one golf ball at a time. Bob Duke sells stray golf balls to raise money for injured service members. And now he's up to nearly $500,000. Danny New has his story. This is Bob. Bob Duke turned 80 years old last month, but there's no time to celebrate. He's got golf balls to deliver. I fill my pickup truck full of golf and balls so I can replace restock. the balls, gets the money, comes back, goes to the bank. <laughs> Bob and Vicky first started collecting about 12 years ago when Bob, a retired master sergeant who served in the Army for 36 years, there's probably 600 golf balls on these. Wanted a fundraise for the Wounded Warrior Project, which serves veterans who are healing. I said, I'm going to start giving them money because I live on a golf course and people need golf balls. It started with Bob collecting balls from their home course in North Carolina and then selling them to his neighbors for $5 a dozen. But now, as you can see, this mission has exploded into a top-notch production, especially here in the attic. You worry about the whole ceiling <laughs> from our attic falling down. And as you look around, golf balls everywhere. People drop off buckets of golf balls all the time. Clubs around the country ship them to him. And then he sells dozens in these little displays that you saw earlier. Welcome to our garage. Vicki gave up her parking spot and <laughs> it was wonderful. I'm very honored and humbled. And recently, Bob and Vicki got a big thank you for their years of service after raising nearly, get ready, nearly $500,000 to help veterans. It just made it all worthwhile. <laughs> Bob was very touched, but hey, he's not done yet. Look me up if you need some golf balls. Danny New, thank you. Coming up, the alleged shot caller in Tupac Shakur's death heads to court. Why he's being charged with murder even though prosecutors say he didn't pull the trigger. Also ahead, a new study on Ozempic, what it says about the drug's long-term effect on weight loss. Plus, the bed bug warning, what Paris is doing about a widespread issue plaguing public spaces. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the border of Texas and Mexico, I'm Mireya Villargal. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Today on ABC News Live, the House makes history. Kevin McCarthy out as Speaker and the Republican Party in turmoil. What comes next and who's poised to take McCarthy's seat? We are live on Capitol Hill. Donald Trump back in court doubling down on his alleged net worth and the judge issuing a gag order forbidding the former president from posting about the case on social media. Will he stay quiet? America on strike. More than 75,000 health care workers walk off the job. The demands and what it means for patients ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Let's get right to our top story this hour. An extraordinary moment never witnessed in American history until now. Republican Kevin McCarthy ousted by members of his own party, becoming the first House Speaker ever to be voted out. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. Paralyzing the House and throwing it into chaos and uncertainty, North Carolina Congressman Patrick McHenry will now serve as interim House Speaker until the chamber votes to fill the seat as early as next week. Our Jay O'Brien, who covers the Hill, joins us now, along with senior White House correspondent Selena Wang. So Jay, of course, you know, this is an unprecedented moment, and it's garnered a lot of reaction from both sides of the aisle. Yeah, and the reaction is unprecedented because the moment is unprecedented, Kira. I can tell you there's that group of handful of House Republicans, eight of them, who voted against McCarthy last night. And from last night into today, some of them are celebrating. An aide to one of them said that they made history. But then, of course, you've got 210 Republicans who voted to back McCarthy. It just wasn't enough. And some of them are angry this morning. One said that they ceded their power to Democrats with the vote last night. There is still some bad blood in the House Republican Conference. A McCarthy ally, Congressman Garrett Graves, says that he doesn't believe they're going to get to a place where they can select a speaker next week because the conference needs to, so the word he used was decompress. So that's the situation on this side of the Capitol in the House. In the Senate, there was also a reaction from the top Republican and Democrat. Here's what they said. Because McCarthy was a partner I could trust, to be honest, and candid, and without fail, optimistic. I'm grateful for the enthusiasm he brought to our shared work and for the patriotic, conservative convictions he wears on his sleeve. We find ourselves in a dangerous situation. With about 40 days to go before the government shuts down, the House has ground completely to a halt. Until Republicans stop their infighting, the House can vote on no bills. So I can tell you, back in here in the House, again, those tensions are still high, but sources on every side of the political spectrum in the House Republican Conference, from the far right to the moderates, say they want to handle the selection of their next speaker behind closed doors. They don't want to slug it out on the House floor like they did in January, but they've got some relationships to mend, Kira, before they can do that. So, Jay, so uh, a number of names have been thrown out there. Steve Scalise, Jim Jordan. Uh, he says he wants to, you know, go for the gig. Who could we possibly see as the successor here? 
Well, Jim Jordan is the first to officially declare. He sent a letter to his colleagues moments ago this morning. There is a lot of rumblings about Steve Scalise, currently the number two Republican in the House, that he will also throw his hat in the ring. Steve Scalise has support from the further right of his conference. Matt Gates said he would back Scalise earlier this week. He's also got some allies in different part of the conference, but Jim Jordan picked up some endorsements today. And then there's Congressman Kevin Hearn of Oklahoma as well. So those are the three you're seeing on your screen. We already know that Jordan and Scalise are having meetings behind closed doors with the Texas and Florida delegations trying to gauge what their support looks like. The earliest we could see this really kick off is next Tuesday when sources tell us Congress, uh, the House Republicans will return, meet behind closed doors, and hear from their speaker candidates. So, Selena, the White House has kept a pretty tight lip, you know, with regard to McCarthy's removal. Are we hearing anything now? Well, Kira, this White House has been very consistent in trying to keep President Biden above the fray, but calling on Congress to quickly elect a new speaker. Now, this White House, they have been very careful in trying to avoid weighing in on the speakership fight, telling me that this chaos is on Congress to fix. And look, there's no love lost here between McCarthy and Biden, especially after McCarthy launched that impeachment inquiry into President Biden. But all of this chaos, Kira, it could make it harder for President Biden to accomplish what he wants. For instance, Ukraine funding more aid to Ukraine. That is a key priority. McCarthy, he had publicly supported this. It's unclear if the next speaker will. And look, time is running out here. The White House says they only have a bit longer to continue to sustain Ukraine's battlefield needs. On top of this, another major obstacle for Congress is to get legislation passed before mid-November to keep this government open. All of that dysfunction is what the White House wants to clearly separate President Biden from. But, Jay, that it's going to be hard to make that separation because the House is basically paralyzed. There, no legislation can be passed until we see a permanent speaker here. Yeah, there's a temporary speaker, a speaker pro tem, Patrick McHenry. It's unclear exactly what his powers are. There are some who view him as having broader powers, and then there are others who say he's more of a seat filler. But you're exactly right, Kira. The House is paralyzed. They can't bring big pieces of legislation to the floor. And just to uh, encapsulate that, and again, that comes, as Selena said, as the clock is ticking toward a government shutdown, but just to encapsulate how much the House is somewhat frozen in place, Speaker McCarthy has an office here in the Capitol. It's just down the hall there. There's a sign on the door that says Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy. That sign is still there, a sign that we are very much still raw from the events of last night, and the House can't do anything until there is someone else in that Speaker's chair. All right, a lot more to come. Jay, Selena, thank you so much. Now to the largest health care strike in U.S. history. More than 75,000 Kaiser Permanente health care workers have now walked off the job and hit the picket lines after their contract expired on Saturday and no deal was made across hundreds of Kaiser Permanente facilities in California, Oregon, Colorado, Washington, Virginia, Maryland, and Washington, D.C., Thousands of patients now directly impacted by this. Uh, Melissa Don joins us from the picket lines there in Los Angeles. So let's talk about, uh, Melissa, some of the demands here that these health care workers have. Uh, hey there, Kira. Good to be here with you. So when you think about a lot of these strikers, and uh, we've seen it in the unions really across the country, at the heart of these health care workers is really clear. It's the same message that we're seeing in so many places better wages and better staffing. When it comes to better staffing, think about the pandemic and how critical that was to so many healthcare workers. Because part of this union, what makes it so large here is that it's not just nurses. It is a specialist that work here. It is those that work in the offices. It is, you know, those that are basically helping out with other duties within the healthcare system. There are so many people here and they've said, that they feel burnt out, especially since the pandemic. They've seen a decrease in staffing numbers. That's something that Kaiser themselves have admitted to and says that they're working to grow and add on to that, those staffing demands. Then on the back end of that, the wages. The wages are something that are huge, something, of course, we've seen in all these unions, also when they're talking about inflation, saying that these wages need to keep up with the inflation that we're seeing. Specifically here, the union is asking for a starting wage of $25 an hour. That's four more dollars than Kaiser is offering. They also want annual raises between 6 and 7 percent, so something to offset, of course, what we're looking in the future. But Kaiser's proposed increase would cap out at 4 percent. Kira? So you can hear uh, the workers there right behind you, uh, striking right behind you. You've been out there on the picket lines. What have they been telling you today? 
Uh, definitely, Kira. So this is a day one for them. You know, it was just really a few hours ago uh, out here in Los Angeles that so many of them had put up their signs. And the moment that I pointed to them, they're in really good spirits, great mood. You know, their signs clearly say, put patients first, respect healthcare workers, and they say they won't be silenced. A big part of what they're feeling is that since the pandemic, that's when there was so much attention to the healthcare worker industry. They feel like folks have moved on, and then they've also dropped that sort of interest in making sure that they're not burned out, that they have those better wages. They say that they want to be taken care of so they can take care of everyone else that comes in for care. Kira? Well, and that's the big concern, that the Kaiser patients that are there now receiving care, what happens during the strike? I mean, how does that all work? We were just getting ready here to go on and chat with you. We actually saw a woman that needed help trying to access Kaiser, and it was difficult for her to actually get by. But Kaiser has said, look, they're open. You have an emergency. Please come in. But what's going to be concerning is if we see this go on to day one, day two, day three, they're going to have to start making different situations, basically uh, non-emergency or non-essential surgeries that are going to have to be postponed. Kaiser says they already have plans in place trying to send out prescriptions to people to avoid them having to come in, things like that. You're going to have to just directly deal with Kaiser to make sure that your appointment is still on because the good news is well at least on this end doctors are not part of the union here so they're still working other of course sectors are still working but again we're talking about a lot of healthcare workers that are in just so many critical uh, sectors in the hospital system that are out here well we'll continue to track it with you for sure Melissa Don thank you so much and Donald Trump addressing reporters outside the New York City courtroom where the third day of his civil fraud trial is underway. The former president once again attacking New York Attorney General Letitia James and the Justice Department for what he calls corruption. The judge overseeing the case issued a gag order against the former president just yesterday after he made disparaging posts on social media about a member of the judge's staff. The $250 million lawsuit brought by the AG accuses Trump of lying about his wealth and inflating the value of his properties by more than $2 billion. Our investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky, is there outside the courtroom. So, Aaron, what's happened so far today at court? It's been rather dramatic uh, in court, actually, because uh, what, what had turned into rather tedious testimony from Trump's former longtime accountant, Donald Bender, uh, became kind of heated when the judge pounded the bench and accused the defense of wasting time. This case is in its third day, and Bender has been the only witness, and the judge had been asking the defense to speed it up. At one point, saying, this is ridiculous, and, and defense attorneys fighting back, saying the state has accused Trump of a staggering fraud, and the accountant can't remember anything except what the government wants him to remember. The judge simply asked the defense to try and truncate a line of questioning that was bogging down in specific numbers from specific years that the accountant said he couldn't remember. And it all kind of came to a, a head with the judge admonishing the defense to get on with it. And uh, that came just before a break when Trump came out of the hallway, said the fix is in because he believes he's going to lose this case because the judge is a Democrat. Well, earlier today, also, I guess Trump was claiming that he wasn't entitled to a jury in this case. But does he understand that this is a bench trial? Well, he's certainly seeing the, the results of that. And, and the way the, the law is written, it does largely provide for a bench trial, not a trial by jury. And, and customarily, when the relief at the end sought is more than money, as it is here, because the attorney general also wants to, to bar Trump from doing business in New York again, that is customarily reserved for a bench trial, for a, for a judge to decide. Uh, Trump's attorneys could have made an argument, at least, and they never did. Uh, so I think the reality was see, sinking in that uh, Trump is sort of stuck here. And he, as you point out, Kira, has already angered this judge with a, a social media post about his law clerk that was disparaging of her and questioning her politics, and the judge told him to knock it off. So, I know, and the question is now, will he listen to the judge, right? Um, Trump was also only expected to appear for part of the trial yesterday. He's back in court today on his own accord, despite claiming the court is keeping him from campaigning in key states. So, what's his strategy here? 
Yeah, the, the, the president, the former president said a moment ago, I'm stuck here. You know, I'd rather be in Iowa or New Hampshire or South Carolina or Ohio, but I'm stuck here because of, of what he called this rigged case. Uh, the reality is he's not stuck here. The only time he'll be required to attend the civil trial is when he's called to testify as a witness. Uh, so he is here of his own volition. And when we called out to say, well, then what are you doing here? Uh, he said, well, he wanted to bring it to the attention of the press that he thinks this trial is, is stacked uh, against him. Uh, so he is, I think, trying to press this legal peril to a political advantage, Kira. No doubt. Aaron, thank you so much. And coming up, the scramble to stop the salt water. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z reports along the Mississippi River and the water crisis seeping into Louisiana. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, a manhunt is underway after a shooting outside a packed homecoming event at Morgan State University in Baltimore. Authorities say that five people were injured, four of them students at the historically black university. Faith Abube, Abube rather, is there. Gunfire erupting on the campus of Morgan State University in Baltimore in the middle of homecoming week celebrations. Students and alumni running for cover in nearby buildings telling us they heard multiple rounds of gunfire around 9.30 p.m. Everybody just kind of started screaming and alerting the people next to them that there was an active shooter and that we should all kind of like brace ourselves. It was terrifying because I'm... Straight to President Biden talking about his efforts to cancel student loan debt. Let's listen in. The argument we reached uh, was uh, all about what, uh, what comes next, but we had an agreement. We reached an agreement over the weekend funds for government only another 40 days. We cannot and should not uh, again be faced with 11th hour decision of uh, brinksmanship that uh, threatens uh, to shut down the government. And we know what we have to do. We, and we, got, we have to get it done in a timely fashion. More than anything, we need to change the poisonous atmosphere in Washington. You know, we have strong disagreements, but we need to stop seeing each other as enemies. We need to talk to one another, listen to one another, work with one another, and we can do that. I join with Minority Leader Jeffers, Je excuse me, Jeffries uh, in saying that our Republican colleagues uh, remain committed to working in a bipartisan fashion. We were prepared to do it as well for the good of the American people. Twice in the last six months, both houses came together on a bipartisan basis, once to avoid default, once to keep the government open. 
And while we should never have been in a situation in the first place, I'm grateful that leaders on both sides came together, including former Speaker McCarthy, to do the right thing. Now, turning to student debt relief. When I ran for president, I vowed to fix our broken student loan program. Because while college degree is still the ticket to the, uh, a better life, that ticket has become excessively expensive. Americans who are saddled with unsustainable debt in exchange for a college degree has become the norm. Since my administration has taken significant action to provide student debt relief to as many borrowers as possible, as quickly as possible. That starts with making sure the existing system works in the way it was supposed to work for student borrowers. We fixed what was called the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, which was designed originally to make sure school teachers, firefighters, social workers, and other public servants can get their student loans forgiven if they make 10 years of payments and do 10 years of public service. By the time I took office, that program had been placed for, in place for nearly 15 years. But because of red tape, only 7,000 borrowers had been helped. Well, today, thanks to the reforms, more than 700,000 borrowers have had their debts forgiven. Just the other day, I spoke with Tanya and Chad, a married couple in their 50s, who both work at public high school in Milwaukee. For years, they paid over $800 a month toward their student loans. It meant they couldn't pay, put away any money for retirement. And this summer, thanks to fixes we made to the debt relief program for people in public service, Chad and Tanya's remaining balance was forgiven. Tanya said, quote, the amount of relief this gives us is indescribable, end of quote. Now they can finally start savings for retirement. Next, we fixed what's called the Income Driven Payment Repayment Program. And here's how that works. If you have an undergraduate loan, after 20 years of straight paying, not missing paying the debt on, the, on a monthly basis, whatever is left of your loan is forgiven after 20 years. But because of, of administrative failures, some people who did pay their loans for 20 years or more did not get the debt relief they had earned. We fixed that and made sure borrowers got credit for every single payment they made. As a result of these changes, today I'm announcing my administration has approved an additional $9 billion in relief for 125,000 borrowers in just the past few weeks under that program. With the latest debt cancel cancellation in total, my administration has canceled $127 billion in student debts for nearly 3.6 million Americans. This kind of relief is life-changing for individuals and their families, but it's good for our economy as a whole as well. By freeing millions of Americans from the crushing burden of student debt, it means they can go and get their lives in order. They can think about buying a house. They can start a business. They can be starting a family. This matters. It matters in their daily lives. This latest progress builds on other steps we've taken. We made the largest increase in Pell Grants in over a decade, helping students and families making less than $60,000 a year get to college. We made additional improvements in the income-driven repayment program. Before I took office, student borrowers would pay no more than 10 percent pay no more than 10 percent of their discretionary income on a monthly basis if they wanted to do it that way. But under my administration's plan, which is called Save Plan, we reduced that to 5 percent for undergraduate borrowers. It's now the most generous repayment program ever. Under this plan, no one with an undergraduate loan today or in the future, whether a community college or a four-year college, will have to pay more than 5 percent of their, their discretionary income to repay these loans. This in, that's income after you pay for necessities like housing, food, and other necessities. You can sign up for the SAVE plan at studentaid.gov slash SAVE. Studentaid.gov slash studentaid.gov slash SAVE. And remember, if you keep up your payments after 20 years, whatever's left in those loans is forgiven. And we're still not done. As you might remember, last year I announced a major proposal for student debt relief. We're on the verge of providing more than 40 million Americans with real relief from their student debt. The money was literally about to go out the door, but Republicans and elected, Republican elected officials and special interests stepped up and sued us. And the Supreme Court sided with them, snatching from the hands of millions of Americans thousands of dollars in debt, student debt relief. 
that was about to change their lives. As I said at the time, I believe the court's decision to strike down my student debt relief program was wrong, but I promised I wouldn't give up. Since then, my administration has been pursuing a new approach, grounded and under a different law, the Higher Education Act. This act allows the Secretary of Education to compromise, waive, or release loans under certain circumstances. <clears throat> Last week, the Department of Education took a critical step in this process by identifying specific challenges that borrowers face in the current system so we can move forward with a new rule to address these changes. For example, there are many borrowers who have made payments for many years, but because of interest, they still owe more than they originally borrowed. My administration is doing everything it can to deliver student debt relief to as many as we can as fast as we can. This is in contrast to House Republicans who helped block the previous debt relief plan nearly shut down the government over the extreme demands, which would have hurt hardworking families. But they had no problem with the Paycheck Protection Program. Remember that? The PPP program during the, during the, uh, the last several years, which was designed to help business owners who lost money, which was legitimate, because of the pandemic. Members of Congress got over hundreds of thousands of dollars in order because they lost, their businesses lost money. That wasn't a worthy, it was a worthy program. Let's be clear. Some of the same elected Republicans or members of Congress who were strongly opposed to giving relief to students got hundreds of thousands of dollars in relief for themselves to keep their businesses open. Several members of Congress got over a million dollars, and all those loans were forgiven. The hypocrisy of this I find stunning. I supported that program, and I support the student debt program. My administration will continue to use every tool at our disposal to help ease the burden of student debt so more Americans be, can, free to, can be free to achieve their dreams. It's good for our economy, it's good for our country, and it's going to change their lives. Thank you very much. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President. Speaker McCarthy, if I can. Speaker McCarthy, then Speaker McCarthy, said that the two of you haven't spoken directly in a long time. Why is that, and are you committed to engaging more regularly with the next House Speaker? We had two agreements. We shook hands with on, and uh, I assumed he was working with. Uh, I knew he was working with the Democrats in the House and Senate. It wasn't for me to uh, do anything. If he wanted to talk to me, I was available. I'm available to whomever wants to talk to me. But the idea that I was going to somehow convince McCarthy to change his view was not reasonable. Does the disarray on Capitol Hill after your conversation with allies yesterday worry you that you won't be able to deliver the aid that the U.S. has promised to Ukraine? It does worry me, and but I know there are a majority of members of the House and Senate in both parties who have said that they support funding Ukraine. With your, uh, I'm going to be announcing very shortly a major speech I'm going to make on this issue and why it's critically important for the United States and our allies that we keep our commitment. Mr. President, are you also concerned about the rest of your uh, domestic and foreign policy initiatives being in peril because of what we saw happen yesterday, the dysfunction in Congress, uh, the chaos that we saw on the House side? Does that concern you in any way? <laughs> the dysfunction always concerns me. The programs that uh, we have uh, argued over, we passed bipartisanly. I'm not concerned that they're going to all of a sudden come in and try to undo them, although there will be some. There will be some, I'm sure. There's uh, half a dozen or more extreme MAGA Republicans, Republicans who would like to eliminate just about everything I've done. Um, but uh, I, I don't think that's going to get there. If I may, um, without additional funding, how long will the United States be able to support Ukraine? We can support Ukraine in the next tranche that we need, and there is another means by which we may be able to uh, find funding for that, but I'm not going to get into that now. Mr. President, have you promised President Zelensky attacks for Ukraine? Say again. Sir. Have you promised President Zelensky during his visit in the White House that you would provide Atacans, the long range missiles for Ukraine? I have spoken with Zelensky, and everything he's asked for, we've worked out.
Tell us a little Mr. More President, Mr. Tell us a little bit more about this speech you're going to give. What, what argument are you going to make? <laughs> Why don't you wait and listen to it? <laughs> I'm going to make the argument that it's overwhelmingly in the interest of the United States of America that Ukraine succeed. And it's overwhelmingly in our interest. I've spent two and a half years putting together coalitions that no one thought could be put together. And they've strengthened us across the board, not just as it relates to Ukraine, whether it's Japan and South Korea, or whether it's what's happening in Europe itself. And so I think that uh, it's clear to the vast majority of the foreign policy community on both left and right that this has been a valuable exercise for the United States of America to increase the support we have around the world. And what I don't want to do is uh, we, put, we put together our 50 nations. 50 nations supporting Ukraine. And we have the we are the organizer of that. I met with, uh, don't hold me the exact number, 16 or 17 yesterday in a long conversation, and uh, made the case that I knew that the majority of the American people still supported Ukraine, and the majority of the members of the Congress, both Democrat and Republican, supported it. So I don't think we should let them gamesmanship get in the way of blocking it. Mr. Not that they're asking, what's your advice to the next, next House Speaker? <laughs> we don't want to go back to the President. He was giving that sheepish grin to reporters there as they were throwing out another question. Oh, there you go. Um, that's how it always goes at these live events, folks. The reporters, uh, even though it doesn't matter what the president is talking about, they'll go for news of the day first, and that's exactly what they did. So let's bring in our senior White House correspondent, Selena Wang, and also our Elizabeth Schulze, who covers the White House and the Hill for us. Selena, let's start with you. We'll get to the student loan debt uh, in just a second, but this is the first time we have heard the president uh, in depth talk about the fact that the House Speaker uh, got the boot, and is he concerned about his agenda now? And if anything can happen with the House being stalled, and also, who does he see as becoming the new speaker? Yeah, exactly, Kira. I've been in a lot of rooms like that, and that's exactly right. He fielded so many questions about Ukraine and the fact that is his foreign policy agenda in peril now that we don't know who the next speaker is going to be. And he did talk about how the dysfunction always concerns him and that there are some extreme MAGA Republicans, he says, who want to undo everything that he's done. But he says that's only a small minority. And he believes that the majority of Congress still supports his policies, including more aid to Ukraine. But again, he faced a lot of pushback on that. How can he reassure allies? How can he be sure, given we don't know who the next speaker is going to be? And he repeated there that he's going to soon make more remarks, in fact, to say that it is in the overwhelming interest of the United States to continue to support Ukraine, to ensure that Ukraine succeeds. This is a key priority for him. He also said that he hopes the government does not lurch towards the brink of another government shutdown, and it shouldn't be left to the last moment. He also called this poisonous atmosphere Atmosphere in Washington, D.C., in politics today. He said before that he's been around for a long time, and this is a president who spent a long time in Congress himself. He prides himself on being able to reach across the aisle, and he said before that he's never seen a Congress act quite like this. When it comes to legislative priorities, well, in a divided Congress like this, there's no hope, really, that any of his major legislative priorities big picture ones, whether it's around immigration or gun violence, are going to get through. However, they're going to focus on implementing what's already been passed and trying to take executive action wherever they can, including here on student loans, which we'll hear more about. And this is really an example of the White House trying to show this split screen. Chaos, dysfunction on the Hill, while the president here, business as usual, governing, legislating. Let's bring in our Elizabeth Schulze and also Jay O'Brien, uh, both of whom uh, cover the White House and the Hill for us uh, as well. Uh, I'll have you both sort of weigh in here on what we heard from the president there regarding McCarthy. Elizabeth, I was a little surprised. I thought that one of the reporters in the room would have asked the, the, the president about these allegations that Matt Gates made, which led to this coup to take down uh, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, and that is, was any type of secret deal made with regard to Ukraine funding uh, over the last weekend to help avert a government shutdown. I don't know. I didn't hear that come up particularly in the room, that question in particular. Uh, but what are your thoughts about um, the questions that were asked and what the president uh, did reveal? Elizabeth, we'll, well start I with you. And then, Jay, I'd love for you to weigh in. 
Well, and Kara, frankly, President Biden did double down on this idea that he had made two deals with Speaker McCarthy. One was made after the debt ceiling debacle, where the two came together after these months of back and forth. They had a handshake agreement. They passed this agreement to avert a debt default. And then they came up with this bipartisan plan for the budget. And of course, that was one of the initial disagreements over on the Hill with people like Representative Gates and other congressmen who said, we don't like that deal. And that, that got them going uh, when it came to the shutdown. But President Biden also said there was a second deal that he made with Speaker McCarthy. And it was notable that he, he went out of his way to say that he is grateful that all sides came together, including Speaker McCarthy, to come and do the right thing, whether it was avoiding a debt default or a government shutdown. He said at the end of the day, Speaker McCarthy did the right thing, and it is his hope that that's something that the next speaker might be able to do, but of course, not throwing his weight behind any person at this point on who that might be, and acknowledging the fact that there is this poisonous atmosphere, in his own words, that is going to make getting anything done a lot more difficult in the ways that he would hope when it comes to reaching across the aisle, Kira. So, Jay, did the president just debunk then basically what Matt Gates said? As Elizabeth points out, he was very transparent about the conversations that he had with McCarthy about Ukraine funding. Uh, it doesn't sound like it was very secret. Yeah, a couple of things to walk through. First and foremost, uh, Speaker McCarthy uh, denied that there was any kind of secret deal. And last night, when he gave that press conference, when he said he wouldn't seek the speakership again, he said that the quote-unquote deal that we're talking about was an agreement with the president that in this 45-day period where the government is temporarily funded, if they had to move money around to Ukraine, that was allowed for in the provision of the temporary funding measure. So that was McCarthy's explanation. Nonetheless, while Gates made a point of saying that that deal was one of the grievances he had with Speaker McCarthy, as Elizabeth noted, if it wasn't that, it was going to be something else. Matt Gates had been talking about coming for Kevin McCarthy for weeks and months. Uh, he had even talked about it in January during the speaker fight. So that's one element of things. The other element in what we hear from the president is, don't forget, this is the leader of the Democratic Party talking about, as Selena mentioned, drama amongst House Republicans, but also drama that Democrats yesterday said they didn't want any part of. And a lot of that had to do with President Biden's relationship with Speaker McCarthy. I've been talking to Democrats, and many tell me that one of the reasons they didn't jump in, or a few of the reasons they didn't jump in to bail McCarthy out was, one, they felt that he walked away from that debt ceiling deal that Elizabeth was talking about and went for further budget cuts beyond what was agreed to with the president. Two, they did not like the impeachment inquiry, which they referred to as partisan. And three, they didn't like being blamed, as McCarthy did over the weekend in some Sunday TV shows shows for possibly bringing the government close to the brink of a government shutdown. So those three things combined really irked Democrats. And so McCarthy's relationship with Biden, when it came to Democrats not bailing him out, was a huge factor in last night's vote and his loss. Because if you just had a few Democrats go McCarthy's way, we could be having a whole different conversation today. And just while we have you, Jade, to follow up, now the two names out there, the two individuals that have formally said they want to go for the House Speaker uh, role, and that's Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan. That's right. Steve Scalise just made it official moments ago. He released a letter to his colleagues announcing his intention to run for Speaker of the House. He has some support. Of course, he's the number two Republican in the House of Representatives. He's already got the number three Republican, Tom Ember, the majority whip, squarely behind him. Even Matt Gates earlier this week said that Steve Scalise would be a good choice for Speaker. But then, of course, on the other side of that, Jim Jordan earlier today announced his intention to run for Speaker as well. And when we talk about President Biden. We have a conversation following President Biden's remarks. It's worth pointing out Jim Jordan is one of President Biden's primary antagonists here on Capitol Hill. He is one of the three committee chairs who are running the impeachment inquiry investigations into President Biden and also mounting the investigations into President Biden's son, Hunter. So both are picking up support in different parts of the House Republican Conference. There's potentially a third, Kevin Hearn, who might jump into the race. But what we're hearing from House Republicans is they're going to try to settle this problem next week and emerge from a meeting behind closed doors next week with a speaker candidate. The question is, can they settle some of the bad blood in their party and actually coalesce around someone to lead them? 
Again, the president addressing questions just a moment ago regarding the fact that House Speaker Kevin McCarthy was voted out of his role yesterday, a historic move, a move that hasn't been made uh, for more than 100 years. Uh, even back then, that vote, uh, it didn't even get to a vote. It failed. This did go through. The president answering questions about it just moments ago at the White House. Speaker McCarthy, if I can, Speaker McCarthy, then Speaker McCarthy said that the two of you hadn't spoken directly in a long time. Why is that? And are you committed to engaging more regularly with the next House Speaker? We had two agreements we shook hands with on. And uh, I uh, assumed he was working with, uh, I knew he was working with the Democrats in the House and Senate. It wasn't for me to uh, do anything. If he wanted to talk to me, I was available. I'm available to whomever wants to talk to me. But the idea that I was going to somehow convince McCarthy to change his view was not reasonable. So, Selena, the, the president making it sound like, hey, there was no secret here. We did talk a couple of times and we discussed Ukraine funding. So, but he still didn't go uh, any farther than that with regard to uh, his thoughts about the speaker being voted out, the historic moment that it was. And now that the f House is paralyzed, how does he go forward um, passing legislation or doing anything domestically or globally with regard to his agenda? Yeah, Kira, we heard there again this president emphasizing this careful line that this White House has been trying to walk, which is trying to keep him separated from that dysfunction, from that chaos, very careful to avoid weighing in on this speakership fight, saying this chaos, this dysfunction, that is on Congress to fix, not on the president. So here now, with all of this dysfunction, with the House pretty much at a standstill, this president is focused on doing what he can with his executive powers and trying to focus on implementing the legislation they've already passed. So just just moments ago, he was announcing that he's going to be relieving another $9 billion in student loan relief. This is for 125,000 Americans. And the White House saying that since Biden came into office, more than 3 million Americans, 3.6 million Americans, they have benefited from student loan relief. Now, however, this announcement, it is pretty incremental compared to what Biden had originally wanted, which is to relieve up to $20,000 in student loans to tens of millions of Americans. So an incremental step here, but Biden trying to tell Americans, trying to tell voters that, look, the Supreme Court, they struck down what I wanted to do, but I'm doing my best to deliver for Americans despite all of the chaos that's happening on the House. May not be able to get them to agree on anything, but look, I'm trying my best. And Elizabeth, you've been covering uh, just the student loan debt uh, subject matter uh, for quite a while now weigh in on what you think about what the president laid out today and also what about you know borrowers who don't have any debt forgiveness are there any steps that they can take now well, you know, Kara, this is ultimately an incremental step that the president is trying to show they are doing something in this administration when it comes to debt forgiveness. And this was a big promise that the president made in his campaign, and he continues to try to promise borrowers he can deliver on. Of course, after the Supreme Court struck down that broad debt cancellation plan, giving up to $20,000 in debt cancellation for millions of borrowers, now he's saying, here's what we can do to right some of the wrongs in the system that already exists without having to change laws, without having to go through the legislative process that he acknowledges is in disarray, especially because he says of House Republicans. So now here are some of these steps, specifically these apply to income-driven repayment programs, public service loan forgiveness programs. So there are a significant number of borrowers who will be affected by this. But when you think about the reality that we are in right now, 28 million borrowers are going to be paying their student loan debt back for the first time this month in more than three years because that federal policy ended. And, and this means that those people are going to be on the hook for payments that they hadn't been on before. And so this is a significant difference for the for a lot of people when it comes to their budgets. The administration is trying to point out how that there is still, you know, a good amount of people, you can see the number on your screen there, who are getting relief through these other programs. But in the big picture, this is a massive, uh, you know, the reality of the student debt kind of numbers are big for this administration. They're trying to figure out, is there a path forward through another law to give debt forgiveness? But acknowledge that, you know, frankly, at, at the end of the day, that this is the, the, the budget reality for a lot of Americans as they're making these payments that are now due this month, Kira. Elizabeth, thanks so much. Selena, Jay, appreciate it. Keep it here. We've got a lot more news right after this. With so much
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Hit me with them good vibes. Bitches on my phone lives. Everything is so fine. Little bit of sunshine. Dance more, just a little bit. Breathe more, just a little bit. Smile a little more in a minute. Ah, 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 ah. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. Glad you're streaming with us. A U.S. manhunt is underway now after a shooting outside a packed homecoming event at Morgan State University in Baltimore. Authorities say five people were injured, four of them students at the historically black university. Faith Abube has the story. Gunfire erupting on the campus of Morgan State University in Baltimore in the middle of homecoming week celebrations. Students and alumni running for cover in nearby buildings, telling us they heard multiple rounds of gunfire around 9.30 p.m. Everybody just kind of started screaming and alerting the people next to them that there was an active shooter and that we should all kind of like brace ourselves. It was terrifying because I'm away from home. According to police, the shooting wounded at least five people, all of them with non-life-threatening injuries. But no arrest immediately reported. The FBI joining the investigation. Emergency alerts triggering a shelter-in-place order for the entire campus. Thurgood Marshall Hall, they're in that high-rise. That is the location of the suspected shooters. Officers seen swarming the historically black college. Dramatic video capturing SWAT teams clearing room by room. First responders taking victims out on stretchers. I just really try to initiate everybody to get in there, get away from the windows, because our student center has a lot of big windows. Baltimore's mayor speaking out. When is enough going to be enough? When will the sanctity of American lives outweigh the sanctity of American guns? Well, this afternoon, the university president put out this statement saying, what happened on our campus was such a senseless act of violence perpetrated on our community. Thanks again to Faith for that. Well, the scramble is on to stop a water crisis in Louisiana and save the drinking water. The mighty Mississippi River at risk now of having its water supply become completely undrinkable. The river's water levels are so low that salt water from the Gulf of Mexico is just seeping in and could soon pollute the water systems of more than a million people in less than a month. Our chief meteorologist Ginger Z is in New Orleans. It's been months since Mitch Jurisich and 4,000 others in Southern Plaquemines Parish have been able to confidently use the water that comes out of their taps. We got the word on June 19th that the chloride level had risen from like 250 to 700 and something parts per million overnight. Wow. It sparked, you know, panic. Chloride is salt that came up from the Gulf of Mexico into their water. People don't realize just how important the commodity water is to us, but when you see it shut down schools, businesses, 
changing people's lives. Mitch lives about an hour south of New Orleans, but the salt water is now moving up that river. More than a million people in New Orleans are now within 19 days of salt water polluting their water supply for the first time since 1988. Unfortunately, the last two years, we've seen those flows be low enough to where the Gulf of Mexico has started to creep into the state. Historically low river levels, sinking land, a rising sea, and a constantly changing river structure are all making this slow moving disaster. Earlier this summer, the Army Corps of Engineers built a sill. It's basically an underwater barrier to keep the salt water out. But that sill overtopped, and just last week, they had to start building it higher. While they work on building up that sill, they are barging in water. This barge came from upriver where it grabbed a half a million gallons of fresh water, then brought it down here, pumped it into the water treatment facility so they can dilute the salt water that they're taking in. It's a 24 seven operation. They've also brought in reverse osmosis machines that can desalinate the water. These are the mandates. These are temporary fixes. We need to revamp all of our water plants. Water leaves, so does the quality of life. Here at the base of the Jackson Square steps, in an average year, that Mississippi River water is way up to here, so you see how low it is. And they're going to have to move fast to make these mitigation efforts work. The Sewer and Water Board of New Orleans tells me they're actually moving ahead with a plan to build a pipeline that will take fresh water from 12 miles upriver and dump it at their water treatment plants. It's expensive, it's going to take time, and they've got to move fast to make it work uh, before the salt water gets here. And unfortunately, even though more than half Half of the state of Louisiana is in the highest level of drought. Uh, it's not about rain here. It's about rain way up north. Look at this map. Ohio, Missouri, and North Branch of the Mississippi rivers. That basin is where we need rain. And unfortunately, a local hydrologist tells me it takes weeks to get here, and it certainly doesn't look like it's happening in the next month. They are hoping for a turn by November. Kira? All right, Ginger, thanks so much. We'll definitely stay on the story with you. And coming up, she touched a security guard's arm and was sentenced to one year in prison. Now, this New York college student was set free after being locked up in Dubai for months. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Glad you're streaming with us. Other headlines we're tracking this hour. At least 21 people are dead and more than a dozen others hurt after a bus fell off an overpass in Italy. Authorities say the bus was heading to a campsite just outside Venice when it careened off the road. 
Prosecutors now investigating whether the bus driver became suddenly ill and whether the bus was even certified. New York City College student who was sentenced to a year in prison in Dubai has been freed. An advocacy group says that Elizabeth Polacanza de Los Santos is heading home now after she was accused of assaulting and insulting customs officials at the Dubai International Airport. The advocates say the 21-year-old merely brushed up against an officer after a screening. That Russian journalist who protested her country's invasion of Ukraine live on air has been sentenced to eight and a half years in prison. Marina Osiankova made headlines last year when she appeared on a live news broadcast with a sign that read, Stop the war. Don't believe the propaganda. They are lying to you here. She was tried in absentia after fleeing to France with her daughter. So police are sharing new details now about the raid that saved a nine-year-old girl who vanished while camping with her family in New York. A 46-year-old man is now in custody, charged with the kidnapping after police say they found the girl stuffed in a cabinet. Stephanie Ramos has the story. Nine-year-old Charlotte Senna, who was abducted on a family camping trip in upstate New York, now back home with her family as authorities reveal new details about the kidnapping and how she was rescued. She was very emotional. I can't imagine what was going through a nine-year-old's head as all this is going on. Police tracking down and charging 46-year-old Craig Ross Jr. with first-degree kidnapping. A ransom note left in the family's mailbox early Monday, the key to breaking the case. A fingerprint on it matched to Ross, who had been arrested for a DWI in 1999. He was in the area, the opportunity presented itself, and he, and he took advantage of that. Investigators tracking down Ross and Charlotte in a camper on his mother's property in Boston Spa, New York, Monday, about 22 miles away from where she was taken Saturday at Moreau Lake State Park. The fourth grader last seen riding her bike alone around a short loop on the campgrounds. That bike found minutes later. Authorities telling ABC News it was upright on its kickstand. SWAT teams descending on this rural property where they say they found Charlotte inside a small bedroom closet the size of a cabinet wearing an adult sweatshirt. <laughs> Charlotte's family overjoyed she's home. Her aunt telling WGNA radio minutes before they got news of the rescue, Charlotte's mom was hopeful. And she said, I just, I don't know, mother's intuition, I just feel like there, she, she's coming home today. Kira, police tell us they're trying to give the little girl and her family some space as they piece together this timeline of her disappearance. As for the suspect, he is scheduled to appear in court October 17th. Kira. Just so glad she's home. Stephanie, thanks. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News to all the stories that matter to you. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Neither do we. We'll be right back. I think vulnerability is sexy. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point because I identified so much with what she stood for and what her message was. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. From the jump, it was not a good environment. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. You never like expect for it to turn into that. Lizzo is denying it all, defiant for all to see. While Lizzo might be under fire now, she isn't the only one facing backlash. Why would we be scared of any backlash for simply just sharing our truth? Lizzo's legal limbo. This is Impact by Nightline. I was so shocked. The road is going to be rocky for Lizzo. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. 
We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Today on ABC News Live, history in the House. For the first time ever, the speaker is out and Kevin McCarthy says he won't run again. What happens next? Who could take his spot and what this means for Congress? Donald Trump back in court. The former president speaking to reporters just moments ago, blasting New York's attorney general. Trump claiming the whole system is corrupt. Child care in crisis, skyrocketing costs and daycare centers shutting their doors. Why families could soon be left with nowhere to turn. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. We do begin with our top story this hour, and that's the extraordinary moment ever witnessed in American history. Republican Kevin McCarthy ousted by members of his own party, becoming the first House Speaker ever to be voted out. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The Office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. That move paralyzing the House and throwing it into chaos and uncertainty. North Carolina Congressman Patrick Mahenry will now serve as interim House Speaker until the chamber votes to fill the seat as early as next week. Our Jay O'Brien is tracking it all from the Hill. So, Jay, President Biden just commented on McCarthy's removal moments ago. Let's take a listen. House and Senate. It wasn't for me to do anything. If he wanted to talk to me, I was available. I'm available to whomever wants to talk to me. But the idea that I was going to somehow convince McCarthy to change his view was not reasonable. So Matt Gates alleged that there was this secret deal made on Ukraine, but Jay, the president, being pretty transparent that they talked about Ukraine several times, uh, the president and Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, and that was one of the many grievances that Matt Gates said he had with the speaker, what he alleged was a deal that the speaker cut with the president over funding for Ukraine. That's something that McCarthy strongly denies. Last night he said there wasn't a secret deal. It was part of the continuing resolution that kept the federal government open and, and an understanding that money could be moved within that 45-day period of the temporary government funding to Ukraine aid or to any other avenue if it was needed. Nonetheless, as you and I have been talking about for the last few weeks really if it wasn't that 
it would be something else. Matt Gates had been telegraphing for weeks and months that he was coming for Kevin McCarthy, that he was going to introduce a motion to vacate, and Kevin McCarthy, having Democrats put that temporary funding measure over the goal line and averting a government shutdown, was the straw that broke the camel's back for Gates. What comes next here in Congress? Firstly, the House Republican Conference has got to heal. We've heard from a number of members who say there is still a lot of bad blood in the House Republican Conference, and they are concerned that the conference might not be healed to the point that they could coalesce around a candidate for speaker when everybody returns to D.C. next week. And it, you know, it, it all sounds good when the president says he's committed to bipartisanship and the Democrats will do whatever is the best thing to do for the country. But if you listen to Matt Gates and his far-right conservative posse, it doesn't sound like they're going to be all sitting down having tea. Well, and, and here's the thing, twofold. One, it, it's very fair to say, and we've heard this from House Republicans, especially moderate House Republicans, that McCarthy got booted because he made a move, a bipartisan move, to keep the government open. That was one of Matt Gaetz's biggest grievances against Kevin McCarthy. That's what kicked all of this off. And then, of course, within that, those eight members who voted to boot McCarthy from his job, they have different reasons for why they voted it. But certainly, Gates's primary reason was he doesn't like the CR that was cut with Democrats. But another thing we've heard from House Republicans is that there are 210 House Republicans, as you're seeing the numbers on your screen, that voted to keep McCarthy in his job. And a lot of them are angry today about the result of last night's vote. And so we already have candidates putting their names forward to become the next Speaker of the House. The number two Republican in the House, Steve Scalise, is one. Jim Jordan, the chair of the judiciary, is another. There may be a third, Kevin Hearn of Oklahoma. And and because of the dynamics in the House Republican Conference right now, again, because of this need, as one lawmaker put it, to decompress, the question becomes, is there enough time for the conference to really come down a notch and get behind a speaker candidate by next week so there isn't this long, protracted floor fight, the kind that you and I covered for hours and hours and hours on the air in January, Kira? Right. I think it's important that you put it out that you, you made the point that not every Republican was disappointed in this bipartisan move uh, that the Speaker made. So Congressman Patrick McHenry uh, will now serve as interim Speaker. Let's talk about why him. Well, right now, he's got some strong popularity amongst House Republicans, and he was a close ally of Speaker McCarthy's as well. The question becomes how much power does McHenry have in his temporary role as Speaker? And the honest answer is the jury is somewhat out. It's unlikely that if Republicans wanted to, they could pass big legislation with a temporary Speaker in the chair, not just because they have a temporary Speaker, but because the conference's priority right now is to get a permanent Speaker. It's also unclear exactly. There are, there are kind of parliamentary debates as to how much power McHenry has as a temporary speaker. Um, the rules say that he has as much power as he needs to and views to be used in emergency type situations. But again, how much does he have to get across the goal line? The reality is, Kira, the work of the House is very much paralyzed right now until House Republicans can pick a new speaker. There is this period of kind of lull, and they have to do something before they can start to work on those bills that they could pass to avert a government shutdown. All right, Jay O'Brien on the Hill for us. Jay, thanks. And just a little while ago, Donald Trump spoke outside the New York City courtroom where the third day of his civil fraud trial is underway. The former president once again attacking New York Attorney General Letitia James and the Justice Department for what he calls corruption. The judge overseeing the case issuing a gag order against the former president just yesterday after he made those disparaging posts on social media about a member of the judge's staff. The $250 million lawsuit brought on by the AG accuses Trump of lying about his wealth and inflating the value of his properties by more than $2 billion. Our senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky, joins us now by phone from the courthouse. Uh, what's happened this hour, Aaron? Well, the, uh, the, the case is about to resume here, Kira, with uh, the cross-examination of an accountant, Donald Bender, who so far has been the only witness to testify at this trial. And the judge has been urging uh, the, the defense cross-examination to speed up. But we're also waiting to hear from New York Attorney General Letitia James, who has been the victim uh, of a number of, of Trump's attacks and, and intense rhetoric uh, since this trial began. He has called her corrupt. He has called her incompetent. 
uh, said that she has brought a rigged case against him. And, and she is, uh, I think, prepared to respond, uh, but also speak out, as you mentioned, about the, uh, the partial gag order that was imposed after Trump posted disparaging uh, things about the judge's clerk. Uh, she's uh, going to come back in here to court, where she's been seated over the last couple of days right behind Trump, and, and talk about how some of that rhetoric can be dangerous. Pictures now of Letitia James there, sitting not far behind uh, the former president uh, as he's looking straight up at the judge there. And, you know, earlier today, as you mentioned, Trump claimed he wasn't entitled to a jury in this case. Um, but this is a bench trial, and his defense team never even requested one in the first place. Yeah, and, and the way the case is charged and the way the, the relief that's being sought would make this uh, bench trial almost a foregone conclusion. Now, Trump's attorneys could have at least tried, and, and they never really did to get this before a jury, even though Trump today said he wished there could be a jury. And he's clearly frustrated by that because he believes that if the case were before a jury, uh, he'd win because he says there's no case and people would understand that he's being charged with fraud uh, for, for nothing. Uh, the way he sees it, he's entitled to value his real estate properties the, the way he sees fit, the way he thinks uh, that, you know, they're, they, they're worth. Uh, and, and he doesn't necessarily have to listen to the assessed value of places like Mar-a-Lago or his penthouse apartment or, or the like. So Trump was only expected to appear for part of this trial yesterday, yet he shows up again today on his own accord. But he's still claiming that the court is keeping him from campaigning in key states. Clearly, that's not the case. He's free to go, come and go as he pleases. This is a civil case. It's not a criminal case, Kira. So he is not required to attend, but he is, um, he is here of his own volition. Uh, and, and when he says he's stuck and, and you know, off the campaign trail, uh, that's by choice, although he has now departed court and, uh, and appears to be leaving New York to return perhaps to Florida. So we mentioned this gag order, Aaron, that was issued by the judge. What exactly did Trump say about the judge's clerk on social media? He posted a picture of her with uh, Senate uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and questioned her politics and, and, and questioned her integrity in the case. And the judge said that personal attacks against court staff are, are unacceptable and are off limits. And he said if Trump does it again, there could be serious sanctions. Aaron Katursky, appreciate the coverage. And now to the child care crisis spreading across America. Millions of families across the country are bracing for a major change in child care as the pandemic era emergency funding program is set to expire. Thousands of child care centers are now at risk of closing. Our business correspondent, Alexis Christophorus, takes a deeper dive. <laughs> Tracy Hansen has been caring for young children in Colleen, Texas for 28 years, but she worries she'll have to shut down her child care center. We are hanging on by our fingernails. That's because $24 billion the federal government gave to child care centers during the pandemic has dried up, threatening to leave 3.2 million kids without care and putting 70,000 child care programs at risk of closing. With the extra money, I was able to give pay raises, paid time off for employees. I've supported families that were not able to afford tuition. I've been able to do some repairs on the building and we've revamped our playground. Without the extra funding, she's had to raise tuition and reduce hours, but says even that may not be enough. I tell myself I'm gonna give it six more months, but in reality, I just don't see us being able to make it. That would be a devastating blow to Shelby Lynch and her growing family. Her son has been attending Tracy's daycare center for years, and Shelby herself even went there as a child. It would be disastrous. My husband, with his job, he's the breadwinner, so I would have to be the one that stays at home. The average cost of child care in the U.S. now tops $10,000 a year for one child. That's more than in-state college tuition in dozens of states. Tuition for Shelby's four-year-old son, Aiden, just went up another $80 a month. And with a daughter on the way, she and her husband worry how they'll afford it. We put off having kids for so long because we knew daycare was expensive. We still have to pay almost a mortgage payment for childcare, and it's, it's just a lot.
A similar scenario is playing out in Boyd, Wisconsin, where registered nurse Amanda Koenig says she and her husband got sticker shock when they saw their child care bill for the upcoming year. That fear of knowing that we're probably going to have to go paycheck to paycheck sometimes is, is very overwhelming. It's not just daycare, it's groceries, it's gas, it's, you know, all the things added up that you need just to live. Daycare four days a week for her two children would have cost $1,840 a month. But Amanda's mother-in-law has agreed to watch the baby once a week. We're saving over $400 a month by doing that. Um, we're very fortunate and grateful that we, we can get that extra help. Many families are not so lucky. Pre-COVID, Tracy Hansen had 150 children at her center. That number has dwindled to 63. Pandemic-era child care funding was always meant to be temporary. Democrats have been attempting to push through a $16 billion child care funding package that would offer assistance for another five years. But without GOP support, the bill faces an uphill battle in Congress. Parents are having to choose, and it's not making economical sense for them to be working outside the home and then paying for child care. <laughs> and for more, let's bring in Alexis uh, to discuss this. Child care already an issue for most families pre-pandemic, Alexis. Let's just talk about how much harder it is now you know, without the funding. Right. Well, there's a big gap there now for lots of families. And, and actually, according to one survey, uh, U.S. Uh, household income, 27 percent of U.S. household income uh, goes towards child care. I mean, that's an incredible amount, right? So it's just out of reach uh, for so many folks. And, you know, on top of that, so many people left the industry during the pandemic that a lot of these child care places just can't find qualified workers. And the woman I spoke to there uh, mentioned in the piece, Tracy Hansen, said now that she doesn't have the funding, She's afraid workers will start to leave because she can no longer offer them a living wage. You know, a lot of those uh, educators make less than fast food workers do per hour in this country. Yeah, it's like your paycheck goes right into child care. It's just not fair. And I guess let's talk about the options out there, anything that families can do to ease the cost of child care. Well, you know, like in the piece, we saw one of the moms, Amanda, she was able to tap her mother-in-law to help out with her newborn one day a week. And that's going to save that family $400 a month. That's a huge savings. So if you have a family member, a neighbor, um, a friend who can help out uh, in any small way, that is great. But, you know, a lot of people don't have that option, right? So other things you might want to do, make sure you are getting all the applicable tax credits coming your way. There is the child care tax credit for those 17 and under, but also the dependent care and, and child tax credit. These were more generous during the pandemic, but they are still out there and you should try to take advantage of them. Also contact your employer, the HR department. Are there any perks that maybe you don't know about? Can you work out some sort of a flex schedule? Even working remotely from home one day a week could help and see if your job has what's called a dependent care FSA or flexible spending account, which lets you put pre-tax dollars aside for daycare related costs. And that does include before school and after school care. And then finally, a lot of states offer resources, especially for low-income families, and the best bet there is just to go to your state's website, see what the resources are, see if you're eligible, and you can apply there uh, right online. And Alexis, I don't know about you, you know, we're both moms, but there was a time where we tapped in to babysitters in the neighborhood and asked if, you know, she would take on a couple families and then we all sort of split the bill, which was really helpful for a period of time. Um, and then there's child care centers as well, right? I mean, how are they keeping the lights on without the extra funding that they were already receiving? Right. So Tracy, who we spoke to in the piece, said that her state of Texas is not trying to fill that gap right now. There are just a handful of states who are extending that federal funding. Uh, for a few more months, but there is not a major plan after that. So right now, these child care centers are looking for either private donors or they're looking for legislators uh, to make a move. But right now, it seems like Cong Congress is stymied. Uh, we are still trying to avert a shutdown in another 44 days, is it? So uh, uh, sadly, I don't think this is on the front burner for lawmakers right now, Kira. No, I don't think it will be either. Alexis, appreciate it. Such an important topic, especially for all the working parents out there. Coming up, more than 75,000 workers walking off the job in the largest health care strike in U.S. history. We are on the picket line.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, the largest health care strike in U.S. history is currently underway. More than 75,000 Kaiser Permanente health care workers have walked off the job and hit the picket lines after their contract expired on Saturday. And no deal was made to hundreds of Kaiser workers and facilities from California, Oregon, Colorado, Washington, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. Thousands of patients directly impacted. Our Melissa Don joins me now from the picket lines there in L.A. Melissa? Kiro, what we're seeing out here in Los Angeles outside of this Kaiser Permanente is just so many of the healthcare workers that are now on strike. A lot of what they're asking for comes down to really two main points. They're talking about challenges with staffing and they're asking for better wages. A lot of these workers, some of them tell us that they've been here since the pandemic and through the pandemic they dealt with feeling burned out, feeling that so many people left when we we're talking about nurses or other workers within the healthcare system. They're feeling that those numbers of staffing have gone down. That's something that Kaiser Permanente has addressed and they say that they're ramping up and adding jobs. But again, that is one sector of it. Then the other are wages, something that we're seeing with unions across the country all asking for better wages. Of course, inflation, one big part of it. But specifically here, the union are sharing with us that they want a starting wage of $25 an hour. And that's four more dollars than Kaiser is offering. They're also wanting raises between 6 and 7 percent. Kaiser coming over to the table, we were told, with an increase that would cap out at 4 percent. So they're definitely bargaining, but this strike is ongoing for the next three days. That's what we're expected to see until they can get into some better terms. But really, right now, a lot of the healthcare workers just sharing with us that they want to feel that their care is at the center because they say that if they can take care of themselves, they'll be much better equipped to take care of all of us. So it's something that we'll be watching closely. Kira? All right. Well, stay tuned. Thanks so much, Melissa. Now to Vatican City, where delegates from across the world are gathered to debate the future of the Catholic Church. They'll be talking about a lot of things, including married priests and same-sex unions, which Pope Francis suggested could eventually be, eventually rather, be blessed by the Church. Our foreign correspondent, James Longman, is at the Vatican with more. 
Yeah, hi, Kira. Pope Francis is convening a global gathering uh, here in Rome to discuss the future of the Catholic Church. It's called a synod, and it'll last most of this month. But for the first time, lay people and women will vote on specific issues alongside bishops and other members of the clergy. That is a radical change from what's gone before, and it's seen as part of France's efforts to make the Vatican a more inclusive institution with less of a focus on hierarchy. Some 450 attendees will discuss some of the most controversial issues of the day. They will include the role of women and a greater inclusion of LGBT people. But there have already been some major disagreements over these issues. Five of the most conservative cardinals have written to Francis saying the Synod was sowing confusion and they asked for clarity on same-sex unions. But the Pope is clearly keen to tackle these criticisms head on. He published his response, making it clear he wouldn't stand in the way of blessings of same-sex unions in church. Now, that's not marriage. It's important to make that distinction, but it is still a major reversal. Francis told these cardinals with much sincerity, I tell you, it's not good to be afraid of these questions. Kira? James, appreciate the update. And coming up, a deadly crash in Italy after a bus fell from an overpass onto a highway, killing at least 21 people. The possible cause next. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Other stories that we're tracking this hour. A search is on for a shooter who injured five people near Baltimore's Morgan State University. Police say four of the victims are students and all suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Baltimore police say they haven't identified a suspect yet and all classes are canceled today. At least 21 people are dead and more than a dozen others hurt after a bus fell off an overpass in Italy. Authorities say the bus was heading to a campsite outside Venice when it careened off the road. Prosecutors are now investigating whether the bus driver became suddenly ill and if the bus was even certified. Lady Gaga won't have to pay a $500,000 reward to that woman who returned her stolen dogs back in 2021. Jennifer McBride was charged with receiving stolen property after she handed the French Bulldogs over to the pop star. McBride sued Gaga for the reward anyway, claiming she did know that Koji and Gustav were stolen when she took them, but she only did it to make sure they were returned safely. A judge now siding with Gaga saying McBride's intentions didn't play into this. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. From breaking news to all the stories that matter to you, you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on ABCnews.com. The news never stops. Neither do we. We'll be right back.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News, America's number one news source. Today on ABC News Live, history in the House. For the first time ever, the speaker is out and Kevin McCarthy says he won't run again. What happens next? Who could take his spot and what this means for Congress? Donald Trump back in court. The former president speaking to reporters just moments ago, blasting New York's attorney general. Trump claiming the whole system is corrupt. Child care in crisis, skyrocketing costs and daycare centers shutting their doors. Why families could soon be left with nowhere to turn. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. We do begin with our top story this hour, and that's the extraordinary moment ever witnessed in American history. Republican Kevin McCarthy ousted by members of his own party, becoming the first House speaker ever to be voted out. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. That move paralyzing the House and throwing it into chaos and uncertainty. North Carolina Congressman Patrick Mahenry will now serve as interim House Speaker until the chamber votes to fill the seat as early as next week. Our Jay O'Brien is tracking it all from the Hill. So, Jay, President Biden just commented on McCarthy's removal moments ago. Let's take a listen. House and Senate. It wasn't for me to do anything. If he wanted to talk to me, I was available. I'm available to whomever wants to talk to me. But the idea that I was going to somehow convince McCarthy to change his view was not reasonable. So Matt Gates alleged that there was this secret deal made on Ukraine, but Jay, the president, being pretty transparent that they talked about Ukraine several times, uh, the president and Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, and that was one of the many grievances that Matt Gates said he had with the speaker. What he alleged was a deal that the speaker cut with the president over funding for Ukraine. That's something that McCarthy strongly denies. Last night he said there wasn't a secret deal. It was part of the continuing resolution that kept the federal government open and, a, and an understanding that money could be moved within that 45-day period of the temporary government funding to Ukraine aid or to any other avenue if it was needed. Nonetheless, as you and I have been talking about for the last few weeks, really. If it wasn't that, it would be something else. Matt Gates had been telegraphing for weeks and months that he was coming for Kevin McCarthy, that he was going to introduce a motion to vacate. And Kevin McCarthy, having Democrats put that temporary funding measure over the goal line and averting a government shutdown, was the straw that broke the camel's back for Gates. What comes next here in Congress? Firstly, 
the House Republican conference has got to heal. We've heard from a number of members who say there is still a lot of bad blood in the House Republican conference, and they are concerned that the conference might not be healed to the point that they could coalesce around a candidate for speaker when everybody returns to D.C. next week. And it, you know, it, it all sounds good when the president says he's committed to bipartisanship and the Democrats will do whatever is the best thing to do for the country. But if you listen to Matt Gates and his far right conservative posse, it doesn't sound like they're going to be all sitting down having tea. Well, and, and here's the thing, twofold. One, it, it's very fair to say, and we've heard this from House Republicans, especially moderate House Republicans, that McCarthy got booted because he made a move, a bipartisan move, to keep the government open. That was one of Matt Gates's biggest grievances against Kevin McCarthy. That's what kicked all of this off. And then, of course, within that, those eight members who voted to boot McCarthy from his job, they have different reasons for why they voted it. But certainly, Gates's primary reason was he doesn't like the CR that was cut with Democrats. But another thing we've heard from House Republicans is that there are 210 House Republicans, as you're seeing the numbers on your screen, that voted to keep McCarthy in his job. And a lot of them are angry today about the result of last night's vote. And so we already have candidates putting their names forward to become the next Speaker of the House. The number two Republican in the House, Steve Scalise, is one. Jim Jordan, the chair of the judiciary, is another. There may be a third, Kevin Hearn of Oklahoma. And because of the dynamics in the House Republican conference right now, again, because of this need, as one lawmaker put it, to decompress, the question becomes, is there enough time for the conference to really come down a notch and get behind a speaker candidate by next week so there isn't this long, protracted floor fight, the kind that you and I covered for hours and hours and hours on the air in January, Kira? Right. I think it's important that you put it out that you, you made the point that not every Republican was disappointed in this bipartisan move uh, that the speaker made. So Congressman Patrick McHenry uh, will now serve as interim speaker. Let's talk about why him. Well, right now, he's got some strong popularity amongst House Republicans, and he was a close ally of Speaker McCarthy's as well. The question becomes how much power does McHenry have in his temporary role as Speaker? And the honest answer is the jury is somewhat out. It's unlikely that if Republicans wanted to, they could pass big legislation with a temporary Speaker in the chair, not just because they have a temporary Speaker, but because the conference's priority right now is to get a permanent Speaker. It's also unclear exactly. There are, there are kind of parliamentary debates as to how much power McHenry has as a temporary speaker. Um, the rules say that he has as much power as he needs to and views to be used in emergency type situations. But again, how much does he have to get across the goal line? The reality is, Kira, the work of the House is very much paralyzed right now until House Republicans can pick a new speaker. There is this period of kind of lull, and they have to do something before or they can start to work on those bills that they could pass to avert a government shutdown. All right, Jay O'Brien on the Hill for us. Jay, thanks. And just a little while ago, Donald Trump spoke outside the New York City courtroom where the third day of his civil fraud trial is underway. The former president once again attacking New York Attorney General Letitia James and the Justice Department for what he calls corruption. The judge overseeing the case issuing a gag order against the former president just yesterday after he made those disparaging posts on social media about a member of the judge's staff. $250 million lawsuit brought on by the AG accuses Trump of lying about his wealth and inflating the value of his properties by more than $2 billion. Our senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky, joins us now by phone from the courthouse. Uh, what's happened this hour, Aaron? Well, the, uh, the, the case is about to resume here, Kira, with uh, the cross-examination of an accountant, Donald Bender, who so far has been the only witness to testify at this trial. And the judge has been urging uh, the, the defense cross-examination to speed up. But we're also waiting to hear from New York Attorney General Letitia James, who has been the victim uh, of a number of, of Trump's attacks and, and intense rhetoric uh, since this trial began. He has called her corrupt. He has called her incompetent, uh, said that she has brought a rigged case against him. And, and she is, uh, I think, prepared to respond, uh, but also speak out, as you mentioned, about the, uh, the partial gag order that was imposed after Trump posted disparaging uh, things about the judge's clerk. Uh, she's uh, going to come back in here to court, where she's been seated over the last couple of days right behind Trump. 
and, and talk about how some of that rhetoric can be dangerous. Pictures now of Letitia James there sitting not far behind uh, the former president uh, as he's looking straight up at the judge there. And, you know, earlier today, as you mentioned, Trump claimed he wasn't entitled to a jury in this case. Um, but this is a bench trial and his defense team never even requested one in the first place. Yeah, and, and the way the case is charged and the way the, the relief that's being sought would make this uh, bench trial uh, almost a foregone conclusion. Now, Trump's attorneys could have at least tried, and, and they never really did to get this before a jury, even though Trump today said he wished there could be a jury. And he's clearly frustrated by that because he believes that if the case were before a jury, uh, he'd win because he says there's no case and people would understand that he's being charged with fraud uh, for, for nothing. Uh, yeah, the way he sees it, he's entitled to value his real estate properties the, the way he sees fit, the way he thinks uh, that, you know, they're, they, they're worth. Uh, and, and he doesn't necessarily have to listen to the assessed value of places like Mar-a-Lago or his penthouse apartment or, or the like. So Trump was only expected to appear for part of this trial yesterday, yet he shows up again today on his own accord. But he's still claiming that the court is keeping him from campaigning in key states. Clearly, that's not the case. He's free to go, come and go as he pleases. This is a civil case. It's not a criminal case, Kira. So he is not required to attend, but he is, um, he is here of his own volition. Uh, and, and when he says he's stuck and, and you know, off the campaign trail, uh, that's by choice, although he has now departed court and, uh, and appears to be leaving New York to return perhaps to Florida. So we mentioned this gag order, Aaron, that was issued by the judge. What exactly did Trump say about the judge's clerk on social media? He posted a picture of her with uh, Senate uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and questioned her politics and, and, and questioned her integrity in the case. And the judge said that personal attacks against court staff are, are unacceptable and are off limits. And he said if Trump does it again, there could be serious sanctions. Aaron Katursky, appreciate the coverage. And now to the child care crisis spreading across America. Millions of families across the country are bracing for a major change in child care as the pandemic era emergency funding program is set to expire. Thousands of child care centers are now at risk of closing. Our business correspondent, Alexis Christophorus, takes a deeper dive. <laughs> Tracy Hansen has been caring for young children in Colleen, Texas for 28 years, but she worries she'll have to shut down her child care center. We are hanging on by our fingernails. That's because $24 billion the federal government gave to child care centers during the pandemic has dried up, threatening to leave 3.2 million kids without care and putting 70,000 child care programs at risk of closing. With the extra money, I was able to give pay raises, paid time off for employees. I've supported families that were not able to afford tuition. I've been able to do some repairs on the building and we've revamped our playground. Without the extra funding, she's had to raise tuition and reduce hours, but says even that may not be enough. I tell myself I'm gonna give it six more months, but in reality, I just don't see us being able to make it. That would be a devastating blow to Shelby Lynch and her growing family. Her son has been attending Tracy's daycare center for years, and Shelby herself even went there as a child. It would be disastrous. My husband, with his job, he's the breadwinner, so I would have to be the one that stays at home. The average cost of childcare in the U.S. now tops $10,000 a year for one child. That's more than in-state college tuition in dozens of states. Tuition for Shelby's four-year-old son, Aiden, just went up another $80 a month. And with a daughter on the way, she and her husband worry how they'll afford it. We put off having kids for so long because we knew daycare was expensive. We still have to pay almost a mortgage payment for childcare, and it's, it's just a lot. A similar scenario was playing out in Boyd, Wisconsin, where registered nurse Amanda Koenig says she and her husband got sticker shock when they saw their child care bill for the upcoming year. That fear of knowing that we're probably going to have to go paycheck to paycheck sometimes is, is very overwhelming. It's not just daycare, it's groceries, it's gas, it's, you know, 
all the things added up that you need just to live. Daycare four days a week for her two children would have cost $1,840 a month. But Amanda's mother-in-law has agreed to watch the baby once a week. We're saving over $400 a month by doing that. Um, we're very fortunate and grateful that we, we can get that extra help. Many families are not so lucky. Pre-COVID, Tracy Hansen had 150 children at her center. That number has dwindled to 63. Pandemic-era child care funding was always meant to be temporary. Democrats have been attempting to push through a $16 billion child care funding package that would offer assistance for another five years. But without GOP support, the bill faces an uphill battle in Congress. Parents are having to choose, and it's not making economical sense for them to be working outside the home and then paying for child care. <laughs> and for more, let's bring in Alexis uh, to discuss this. Child care, already an issue for most families pre-pandemic, Alexis. Let's just talk about how much harder it is now you know, without the funding. Right. Well, there's a big gap there now for lots of families. And, and actually, according to one survey, uh, U.S. Uh, household income, 27 percent of U.S. household income uh, goes towards child care. I mean, that's an incredible amount, right? So it's just out of reach uh, for so many folks. And, you know, on top of that, so many people left the industry during the pandemic that a lot of these child care places just can't find. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. I jumped to the rear bumper. Mrs. Kennedy was screaming. I wasn't fast enough. Um, we fly! It's spooky season. I've got the plans for Halloween. Yeah, I got them screaming. What fun that is. We're just getting started. Over the nights of Halloween. Watch all October on Freeform. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. For 30 years, my brother Steph was this mystery. Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head. That night, everything changed. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. What does it take to be America's number one news? 
It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, the largest health care strike in U.S. history is currently underway. More than 75,000 Kaiser Permanente health care workers have walked off the job and hit the picket lines after their contract expired on Saturday. And no deal was made to hundreds of Kaiser workers and facilities from California, Oregon, Colorado, Washington, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. Thousands of patients directly impacted. Our Melissa Don joins me now from the picket lines there in L.A. Melissa? Kiro, what we're seeing out here in Los Angeles outside of this Kaiser Permanente is just so many of the healthcare workers that are now on strike. A lot of what they're asking for comes down to really two main points. They're talking about challenges with staffing and they're asking for better wages. A lot of these workers, some of them tell us that they've been here since the pandemic and through the pandemic they dealt with feeling burned out, feeling that so many people left when we we're talking about nurses or other workers within the healthcare system. They're feeling that those numbers of staffing have gone down. That's something that Kaiser Permanente has addressed and they say that they're ramping up and adding jobs. But again, that is one sector of it. Then the other are wages, something that we're seeing with unions across the country all asking for better wages. Of course, inflation, one big part of it. But specifically here, the union uh, sharing with us that they want a starting wage of $25 an hour. And that's four more dollars than Kaiser is offering. They're also wanting raises between 6 and 7 percent. Kaiser coming over to the table, we were told, with an increase that would cap out at 4 percent. So they're definitely bargaining, but this strike is ongoing for the next three days. That's what we're expected to see until they can get into some better terms. But really, right now, a lot of the healthcare workers just sharing with us that they want to feel that their care is at the center because they say that if they can take care of themselves, they'll be much better equipped to take care of all of us. So it's something that we'll be watching closely. Kira? All right, well, stay tuned. Thanks so much, Melissa. Now to Vatican City, where delegates from across the world are gathered to debate the future of the Catholic Church. They'll be talking about a lot of things, including married priests and same-sex unions, which Pope Francis suggested could eventually, be, eventually rather, be blessed by the Church. Our foreign correspondent, James Longman, is at the Vatican with more. Yeah, hi, Kira. Pope Francis is convening a global gathering uh, here in Rome to discuss the future of the Catholic Church. It's called a synod, and it'll last most of this month. But for the first time, lay people and women will vote on specific issues alongside bishops and other members of the clergy. That is a radical change from what's gone before, and it's seen as part of France's efforts to make the Vatican a more inclusive institution with less of a focus on hierarchy. Some 450 attendees will discuss some of the most controversial issues of the day. They will include the role of women and and a greater inclusion of LGBT people. But there have already been some major disagreements over these issues. Five of the most conservative cardinals have written to Francis saying the synod was sowing confusion and they asked for clarity on same-sex unions. But the Pope is clearly keen to tackle these criticisms head on. He published his response, making it clear he wouldn't stand in the way of blessings of same-sex unions in church. Now, that's not marriage. It's important to make that distinction. But it is still a major reversal. Francis told these cardinals 
Cardinals with much sincerity, I tell you, it's not good to be afraid of these questions. Kira? James, appreciate the update. And coming up, a deadly crash in Italy after a bus fell from an overpass onto a highway, killing at least 21 people. The possible cause next. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. I think vulnerability is sexy. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point because I identified so much with what she stood for and what her message was. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. From the jump, it was not a good environment. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Lizzo is denying it all, defiant for all to see. While Lizzo might be under fire now, she isn't the only one facing backlash. Why would we be scared of any backlash for simply just sharing our truth? Lizzo's legal limbo. This is Impact by Nightline. I was so shocked. The road is going to be rocky for Lizzo. Now streaming on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. Reporting from the Gulf Coast of Florida, covering Hurricane Adalia. I'm Micah Jachi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source.
Welcome back to ABC News Live. Other stories that we're tracking this hour. A search is on for a shooter who injured five people near Baltimore's Morgan State University. Police say four of the victims are students and all suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Baltimore police say they haven't identified a suspect yet and all classes are canceled today. At least 21 people are dead and more than a dozen others hurt after a bus fell off an overpass in Italy. Authorities say the bus was heading to a campsite outside Venice when it careened off the road. Prosecutors are now investigating whether the bus driver became suddenly ill and if the bus was even certified. Lady Gaga won't have to pay a $500,000 reward to that woman who returned her stolen dogs back in 2021. Jennifer McBride was charged with receiving stolen property after she handed the French Bulldogs over to the pop star. McBride sued Gaga for the reward anyway, claiming she did know that Koji and Gustav were stolen when she took them, but she only did it to make sure they were returned safely. A judge now siding with Gaga saying McBride's intentions didn't play into this. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News to all the stories that matter to you. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on ABCnews.com. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. ABC News Live, the House makes history. Kevin McCarthy out as speaker and the Republican Party in turmoil. What comes next and who's poised to take McCarthy's seat? We are live on Capitol Hill. Biden and student loan debt. The president touting efforts to ease the burden on borrowers. How the White House's relief plan will impact Americans just ahead. Strikes sweeping across America. More than 75,000 health care workers walk off the job. Their demands and what it means for patients straight ahead. And there we go. Hi, everyone. I'm Terry Moran. And I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, an extraordinary moment never witnessed in American history until now. Republican Kevin McCarthy ousted by members of his own party, becoming the first House Speaker ever to get the boot. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. That move has now paralyzed the House of Representatives, thrown it into chaos and uncertainty. North Carolina Congressman Patrick Mahen McHenry, he will serve as interim House Speaker until the chamber votes to fill the seat, perhaps as early as next week. But we've heard that before. <laughs> uh, ABC Joe Bryan is tracking it all from 
the Capitol, along with contributing political correspondent Rachel Bade, both of them experts in this subject. So, Jay, let me start with you. Uh, President Biden, he weighed in on this historic ousting of a House speaker calling on Congress to change the, quote, poisonous atmosphere in Washington. Good luck with that. Uh, and come together. So, uh, really, what's going to happen next? Well, in the near future, Terry, sources are telling us, as Rachel knows too, Congress or the House of Representatives, House Republicans are going to return on Tuesday. They're going to have a conference meeting and hear from the various candidates vying to be speaker. We already know of two declared candidates. One is the number two Republican in the House, Steve Scalise. The other is the chair of the Judiciary Committee, Jim Jordan. You're seeing on your screen there, though, the people that they're going to have to contend with, the eight Republicans who voted to oust Kevin McCarthy. And then, of course, there are 210. Republicans who voted to keep McCarthy in his job. And I can tell you in the near future, one of the things sources are telling us is that there are a lot of relationships that need to be mended within the House Republican Conference to get them to a position where they could potentially coalesce around a speaker candidate next week. There's a lot of bad blood members are telling us within the conference. One McCarthy ally, ally Garrett Graves, was asked by reporters if he thinks Republicans could get behind a speaker candidate by next week. His response, Terry Kira, was hell no. <laughs> <laughs> yep, straight to the point. Uh, so, Rachel, you know, you've got such great sources there. You know the majority of all the players here. Why don't we talk about Steve Scalise first? That was the first name yep. to come up in conversation, right? Um, you know, what do you think? Do you think he really does want to piece of this? And do you think he can get the 218 GOP votes to actually get the gavel? So, oh, Kira, no doubt he wants this job. He's actually pined for this job for a number of years. And I mean, Scalise is somebody who has good relationships across the conference. He's close with conservatives, folks in the South, but also more moderate Republicans uh, who have backed him in his current leadership post. Steve Scalise, just so you know, you know, he has also survived a gunshot wound, uh, currently under undergoing chemo uh, for a rare blood cancer. And so actually a lot of members here sort of really like him, feel for him. Um, and I think that actually, you know, might prop him up in terms of his survival skills on that. His problem is going to be that Kevin McCarthy and his allies do not like Steve Scalise. They had this rivalry for a really long time and we're already hearing that McCarthy allies are trying to undercut him by suggesting maybe he can't do the job and that's going to be a problem for him as he tries to get 218. And, and Rachel, what about Jim Jordan? We're looking at him there. Uh, everybody knows him. He never wears a jacket in Congress, I guess. <laughs> Warm yeah, or something he, like that. He did yesterday, he, if I remember correctly. Did he? Yes, I wonder he if, did. He, what if he became speaker. <laughs> so he he's actually thrown his hat in the ring. Uh, what do you, what do his prospects look like? Well, I mean, Jay can probably speak to this too, but like if you would have told me that Jim Jordan is an actual viable speaker for can uh, candidate for speaker just a couple years ago, I would have laughed in your face. And that is because House Republicans, he was one of the most hated House Republicans amongst his own members for cheering shutdown showdowns, for wanting Republicans not to make, you know, deals with Democrats, for uh, rooting for, you know, fiscal calamity in terms of uh, debt ceiling negotiations. And he's really under undergone a transformation in the past couple years. He's now seen as a member of the leadership team. People actually look to him as a leader. He's kind of moderated a little bit. He's not moderate by any means. Still a conservative, uh, you know, darling in that regard. Uh, but the fact that he's actually viable right now is like quite a change for Jordan. I also would say watch Donald Trump because Donald Trump loves him some Jim Jordan. When, you know, he was in the White House, I remember he used to fawn over Jim Jordan all the time. He would call him after he was on television defending the president at the time during the impeachment inquiries. So, you know, if Trump endorses Jordan, does that sort of put him above Scalise? I don't know, but it's it's certainly going to be a race. But what about those suggesting, suggesting that Donald Trump should go for House Speaker? That was swirling around uh, yesterday and today, and Trump was even asked about it today when he showed up at his fraud case in New York. Yeah. I, I would take that. Roll it up and throw it in the trash. <laughs> not going to happen yet. Look, we gave each other. Um, yeah, that, that's not a likely possibility, of course, as Rachel just said. But you are hearing some members of the further right of the House Republican Conference, Marjorie Taylor Greene, I think Anna Paulina Luna as well, start to say that it's something they would like to see. But that is just kind of a means of getting that headline out there. Go ahead. What it also underscores to me, though, is how some Republicans have learned virtually nothing from the past few days and the past couple months because the House has actually been paralyzed, you know, in this infighting. If Trump was speaker, my goodness, can you imagine the drama? <laughs>
Oh, do, do you think? <laughs> Can you imagine, Terry? <laughs> No. It would be Actually, quite an interesting ride. You know, anything well, is possible when it comes to it is. the former president, And the Donald Republican Trump. Party he leads. Exactly. Yes, and that he's, he is leading the party right now in the polls. I think anything is possible. Um, but then, Rachel and Jay, they're saying, crumple it up, toss it out. That's okay, it. we'll stick with that. They're the experts on the Hill. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Well, President Biden says he's uh, canceling another $9 billion in student loan debt. This comes as borrowers are bracing for payments to restart after a three-year pause during the pandemic and afterwards. This latest round of loan forgiveness is expected to help 125,000 borrowers. The president announced the move at the White House just a little while ago. This kind of relief is life-changing for individuals and their families, but it's good for our economy as a whole as well. By freeing millions of Americans from the crushing burden of student debt, it means they can go and get their lives in order. They can think about buying a house. They can start a business. They can be starting a family. This matters. It matters in their daily lives. For more, let's bring in our Elizabeth Schulze. So, Elizabeth, which borrowers will actually be directly impacted by this specific announcement? And, you know, what does it mean for them? Well, Kira, this is not a new program here. Basically, what the Biden administration is doing is trying to right some of the wrongs in the existing student loan repayment system to try to give relief to borrowers who've already been enrolled in those programs and should have their debt forgiven but didn't for various reasons like administrative reasons or just overlooked by the Department of Education. So today's announcement covers $9 billion in student debt cancellation. About 125,000 borrowers will be affected. And specifically, we're talking about borrowers who are enrolled in public service loan forgiveness programs and an income-driven repayment programs. Uh, these are a drop in the bucket when we're talking about the backdrop here, and I think this is really important, the context that as of this month, 28 million borrowers are repaying their student loans because that federal pause on payments came to an end. And so the Biden administration is trying to show we're taking the incremental steps that we can, but there is this reality that a lot of borrowers are going to once again be on the hook after they weren't for three years during the pandemic. And I've been talking to a lot of those borrowers. One of them is Jessica Record. She works in education in California. She said that the pause really gave her family a lot of breathing room during the pandemic. And here's what she said now that those payments are starting up once again. I don't think as far as, you know, any line items, there's not really anything that we can cut. There was breathing room in the pandemic, and now there's no more breathing room. So the president acknowledging the reality here that millions of borrowers facing that that new constraint on their budgets with these payments do, trying to say we can are trying to take the steps possible within the existing system, knowing that there's not a lot of action on Congress on this, and that the Supreme Court already struck down that broader plan for up to $20,000 in debt cancellation too, guys. Right, and the Supreme Court did so because they say only Congress can forgive that much debt. The president can't do it on his own. Uh, he lost that argument in the court, so it's up to Congress. And you say they're a little busy trying to get themselves organized. So, <laughs> you know, once again, to, to, to people, how, how should people be preparing to start making payments again? Right. So a couple of steps that, you know, over ac across the board to consider as these payments restart. One is the fact that there is actually a one-year grace period. So even if you miss a payment, the, the government has said that they're not going to report you, at least this for federal student loans, they're not going to report you to credit bureau. So basically, you won't be delinquent. So there is a little bit of a buffer period there when it comes to that. There's also a new program that the Department of Education launched called SAVE, and this is an income-driven repayment program. This is an attempt to try to lower some monthly payments, but at the end of the day, key thing to know, if you, if you have bills due, try to make it because the interest is adding up and it adds up really fast, guys. Elizabeth Schulze, always great to see you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, we turn now to the largest health care strike in U.S. history. Union leaders say more than 75,000 Kaiser Permanente health care workers have walked off the job and hit the picket lines after their contract expired on Saturday and no deal was made. Across hundreds of Kaiser Permanente facilities in California, Oregon, Colorado, Washington, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C., that's where all these employees are coming from and thousands of patients. Well, the question is, how are they going to get care? Our Melissa Don joining us now from the picket lines there in uh, Los Angeles. You're right in the middle of it. Tell us what's going on this hour. 
Hey there, Kira and Terry. So there are a lot of folks out here in this uh, Los Angeles, Kaiser Permanente. I want to show you just the thousands of people, right? We're talking about across the country. Here there's hundreds. And we're also seeing a lot of supporters that are coming out because when we're talking about nurses and so many of the techs or whatnot, we've also seen a surgeon, one of the doctors coming out to support the people out here because it's not just nurses, it's RUD, lab techs, technicians. Uh, we've spoken already with so many people that have shared how much and how critical all of this is to them and so we've been seeing a lot of the supporters a lot of their signs very reminiscent of a lot of the strikes that we've seen across the country a big point though is that the healthcare workers there's just so many different roles and so many things that they're looking out for a lot of signs saying that they won't be silenced but of course a big part of it also uh, what we've been noticing though this is day one here and what they're doing is kind of like a three-day strike we're gonna be following them Kaiser saying that they are coming to the table but again they didn't this morning which is why they went on um, Kira and they decided to get these strikes underway uh, and Melissa you're right there on the picket lines with healthcare workers what are they telling you I do just ask somebody about how important this is and what are you hearing yeah, Terry, it was incredible. So I spoke earlier with a nurse and she told me that she worked during the pandemic and she says during the pandemic it was rough and it was highlighted, right, how difficult it was for so many healthcare workers. But she says right now the biggest problem is that a lot of her other nurses, a lot of her healthcare workers can't get their own time off so they can go to their own medical appointments, their own doctor's visit. She told me the irony in that is something that is so frustrating when it comes to highlighting the staffing shortage problem. Then, of course, you talk about the wages, right, uh, when we're looking at inflation we're looking at so many of the different wages and prices that people are trying to look for um, that's another big issue that I've heard seen a lot of people I also want to point out now to you here uh, we've seen some of the unions coming out uh, sharing their own different uh, signs of respect and value healthcare workers that's another big point too a lot of folks feeling that they're lacking respect because their main sticking point is if they don't feel well enough to take care of themselves, how can they take care of others? Terry, mm. Kira. Melissa, Don, appreciate it. Right there in the middle of it all. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And coming up, child care in crisis, skyrocketing costs and daycare centers shutting their doors. What it means for American families just ahead. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts.
All right, we're talking about the child care crisis now. It's just spreading across America with millions of families across the country bracing for a major change in child care as the pandemic era emergency funding program is set to expire. Thousands of child care centers now at risk of closing. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus has more for us. Tracy Hansen has been caring for young children in Colleen, Texas for 28 years, but she worries she'll have to shut down her child care center. We are hanging on by our fingernails. That's because $24 billion the federal government gave to child care centers during the pandemic has dried up, threatening to leave 3.2 million kids without care and putting 70,000 child care programs at risk of closing. With the extra money, I was able to give pay raises, paid time off for employees. I've supported families that were not able to afford tuition. I've been able to do some repairs on the building and we've revamped our playground. Without the extra funding, she's had to raise tuition and reduce hours, but says even that may not be enough. I tell myself I'm gonna give it six more months, but in reality, I just don't see us being able to make it. That would be a devastating blow to Shelby Lynch and her growing family. Her son has been attending Tracy's daycare center for years, and Shelby herself even went there as a child. It would be disastrous. My husband, with his job, he's the breadwinner, so I would have to be the one that stays at home. The average cost of child care in the U.S. now tops $10,000 a year for one child. That's more than in-state college tuition in dozens of states. Tuition for Shelby's four-year-old son, Aiden, just went up another $80 a month. And with a daughter on the way, she and her husband worry how they'll afford it. We put off having kids for so long because we knew daycare was expensive. We still have to pay almost a mortgage payment for childcare, and it's, it's just a lot. A similar scenario was playing out in Boyd, Wisconsin, where registered nurse Amanda Koenig says she and her husband got sticker shock when they saw their child care bill for the upcoming year. That fear of knowing that we're probably going to have to go paycheck to paycheck sometimes is, is very overwhelming. It's not just daycare, it's groceries, it's gas, it's, you know, all the things added up that you need just to live. Daycare four days a week for her two children would have cost $1,840 a month. But Amanda's mother-in-law has agreed to watch the baby once a week. We're saving over $400 a month by doing that. Um, we're very fortunate and grateful that we, we can get that extra help. Many families are not so lucky. Pre-COVID, Tracy Hansen had 150 children at her center. That number has dwindled to 63. Pandemic-era child care funding was always meant to be temporary. Democrats have been attempting to push through a $16 billion child care funding package that would offer assistance for another five years. But without GOP support, the bill faces an uphill battle in Congress. Parents are having to choose, and it's not making economical sense for them to be working outside the home and then paying for child care. Uh, this is such a crisis and an American problem uh, in contrast to many other countries in the world. Let's go to our ABC News business reporter, Alexis Christophorus, joins us uh, now. That was a great report, Alexis. Just a ballpark figure. How much are families spending on health care, would you say? It is, and you're right, Terry. I mean, this child. is sort of unique to um, to America, the, the fact that we spend so much of our annual income on child care. According to one survey, the average family is now spending 27% of their household income on child care, and they're having to make some really tough decisions. Do they have both parents work? Does it make more sense, economically speaking, for that parent to stay back? And that has a ripple effect for the family and for the economy. Uh, people can't find the, the, the people to do the jobs. It affects how much they're going to be spending, so that, of course, affects the overall health of the economy. Just to put that 27% number in perspective, uh, the Department of uh, Health and Human Services believes that health care, uh, that child care is affordable when it's just 7% of your income going towards child care. So as you can see, we have a big gap there. Right. So a lot of families, they've got to get creative. They have to. So let's just talk about some of the options out there to ease the burden. What you've learned, maybe some things that, you know, folks have done in the past. 
Yeah. Get creative is really what it's all about. You know, there are some communities out there where they're sort of pooling their resources. Can children stay at a neighbor's house and uh, a bunch of uh, parents in that neighborhood sort of pool their money uh, to pay that one neighbor to watch the children? Those kinds of things are going on. Do you have a family member or a friend who can help out? Even one day a week, as you saw in that story, the mom, Amanda, was able to save $400 a month because her mother-in-law is helping out. And here are some other things you can do. There are some tax credits you can still get. They were more robust during the pandemic, but they're still out there. The dependent care and child care tax credits, if you uh, if you qualify. Check with your employer what are the benefits they offer. Can you do any sort of a flex schedule, maybe remote one day a week? And does your job offer a dependent care FSA or flexible spending account, which lets you put some money aside, pre-tax dollars for child care expenses? And included in that, by the way, is before school and after school care, which is huge for working parents. And also, finally, a lot of states have resources as well. You can go right on to their website, your state's website, for resources and see if you're eligible. And, and in many cases, you can just apply right online. That, that's so helpful, Alexis, the practical help. But we still don't have a, a national, robust policy, as so many other countries do, to support families with children, child care. But we do have the, the child care centers, as we saw uh, some of in your piece. How are, how are they keeping the lights on now without the extra funding they were receiving during the pandemic? I think the unfortunate um, situation is that many of them will be forced to close. I mean, they don't have a, a lot of tools there in the box, right? They can they can reduce their hours. That doesn't help parents. They can raise the amount they're charging the parents. That also adds to the burden. And their problem overall, and, and I spoke to Tracy Hansen in that piece and several others, said they cannot find qualified workers who want to work for what they're offering to pay. Right now in this country, child care uh, educators, on average, make about $12.5 an hour. That is less than fast food workers, teenage fast food workers. Um, and so uh, there's something wrong with that picture. Mm. Yeah, agree with that. And then I was talking about my cousin. You know, she at her company, they had a daycare right there mm. in the building. She was so lucky. Mm. They gave a great price, you know, for, for her because she was an employee. She was a happier employee. Right. She wanted to work harder. She could stay longer. And then she didn't have to worry. Her son was just downstairs. I mean, exactly. we aren't doing it right. We should, all businesses should do that. Be incredible for families. Yeah. <laughs> Alexis Gustavus, thanks very thanks, much. Thanks, guys. And coming up, well, forget the shores of Normandy or the forests of Belgium. There's a new invasion of France. It's causing panic in the streets of Paris. I'm talking about le bed bugs. <laughs> We've got all the dirty details for you coming up next. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Hit me with them good vibes, pictures on my phone, like everything is so fine. Little bit of sunshine. Dance some more, just a little bit. Breathe more, just a little bit. Smile a little more, and I'm into it. Ah, 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 ah. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. 
Reporting in Moscow, Idaho, I'm Kana Whitworth. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. The French government is expanding its all-out assault on Paris. And, of course, we're talking about bed bugs. <laughs> the infestation comes as the city prepares to host the 2024 Summer Olympics. Our Inez de la Quatera has all the dirty details from Paris. <laughs> hey, Kira. Yeah, so this really all began with some lovely videos circulating online showing bed bugs crawling out of seats on trains, on metros, at movie theaters, mostly in Paris, but in other parts of France as well. You then had the deputy mayor of Paris coming out to say that no one is safe amid a widespread rise in bed bugs, and that set off all sorts of concerns, especially in light of the upcoming Summer Olympics, which will be held in Paris next summer. You then had government officials coming out to try and uh, call for calm, try and reassure the public. So you had the French health minister, for instance, saying that there's no reason for widespread panic, and he insists we haven't been in invaded by bedbugs. The transportation minister today met with representatives from several transportation outlets. He insists there is no outbreak of bedbugs in public transport, but he is announcing new measures to crack down on bedbugs, including the use of sniffer dogs. The debate over bedbugs is also uh, taking a political turn. So we saw uh, this week uh, lawmakers uh, on the floor of the French National Assembly grilling the prime minister, calling out the government's years of inaction on this issue. This uh, one lawmaker saying that millions of French citizens were now dealing with infestations, losing sleep over bedbugs, growing paranoid and becoming socially isolated. And for added drama, this one lawmaker even brought a flask of bedbugs with her to the floor of the National Assembly. So certainly a hot topic right now. We are expecting another government meeting to be held on Friday to tackle the issue. I will say I haven't personally seen any bedbugs, thankfully, but I do know a number of people who are now refusing to sit when they take public transportation and are instead choosing to stand. Kira? Oh, Inez, I'm very uh. glad you have not come across any of the bed bugs. You know, just make sure you're not itching. Um, thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. And no bed bugs, but lots of breaking news and all the stories that matter to you. And you can find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years my brother's death was this mystery was he pushed did he kill himself there's been some human remains found at the bottom of north head and the body was naked committing suicide naked is almost unheard of what's going on here you had some chilling evidence oh my goodness no one knew it was coming it's about finding justice for my brother sometimes you just have to stir the pot All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. 
You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Today on ABC News Live, history in the House. For the first time ever, the speaker is out and Kevin McCarthy says he won't run again. What happens next? Who could take his spot and what this means for Congress? Donald Trump back in court. The former president speaking to reporters just a moment ago, blasting New York's attorney general. Trump claiming the whole system is corrupt. Child care in crisis, skyrocketing costs and daycare centers shutting their doors. Why families could soon be left with nowhere to turn. Hello everyone, I'm Kira Phillips. We do begin with our top story this hour and that's the extraordinary moment ever witnessed in American history. Republican Kevin McCarthy ousted by members of his own party becoming the first House Speaker ever to be voted out. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The Office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. That move paralyzing the House and throwing it into chaos and uncertainty. North Carolina Congressman Patrick Mahenry will now serve as interim House Speaker until the chamber votes to fill the seat as early as next week. Our Jay O'Brien is tracking it all from the Hill. So Jay, President Biden just commented on McCarthy's removal moments ago. Let's take a listen. It wasn't for me to do anything. If he wanted to talk to me, I was available. I'm available and whomever wants to talk to me. But the idea that I was going to somehow convince McCarthy to change his view was not reasonable. So Matt Gates alleged that there was this secret deal made on Ukraine, but Jay, the president, being pretty transparent that they talked about Ukraine several times, uh, the president and Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, and that was one of the many grievances that Matt Gates said he had with the speaker, what he alleged was a deal that the speaker cut with the president over funding for Ukraine. That's something that McCarthy strongly denies. Last night he said there wasn't a secret deal. It was part of the continuing resolution that kept the federal government open and, a, and an understanding that money could be moved within that 45-day period of the temporary government funding to Ukraine aid or to any other avenue if it was needed. Nonetheless, as you and I have been talking about for the last few weeks really if it wasn't that it would be something else Matt Gates had been telegraphing for weeks and months that he was coming for Kevin McCarthy that he was going to introduce a motion to vacate and Kevin McCarthy having Democrats put that temporary funding measure over the goal line and averting a government shutdown was the straw that broke the camel's back for Gates what comes next here in Congress firstly the House Republican Conference has got to heal. We've heard from a number of members who say there is still a lot of bad blood in the House Republican Conference, and they are concerned that the conference might not be healed to the point that they could coalesce around a candidate for speaker when everybody returns to D.C. next week. And it, you know, it, it all sounds good when the president says he's committed to bipartisanship and the Democrats will do whatever is the best thing to do for the country. But if you listen to Matt Gates and his far right conservative posse, it doesn't sound like they're going to be all sitting down having tea. Well, and, and here's the thing, twofold. One, it, it's very fair to say, and we've heard this from House Republicans, especially moderate House Republicans, that McCarthy got booted because he made a move, a bipartisan move, to keep the government open. That was one of Matt Gaetz's biggest grievances against Kevin McCarthy. That's what kicked all of this off. And then, of course, within that, those eight members who voted to boot McCarthy from his job, they have different reasons for why they voted it. But certainly, Gates's primary reason was he doesn't like the CR that was cut with Democrats. But another thing we've heard from House Republicans is that there are 210 House Republicans, as you're seeing the numbers on your screen, that voted to keep McCarthy in his job. And a lot of them are angry today about the result of last night's vote. And so we already have candidates putting their names forward to become the next Speaker of the House. The number two Republican in the House, Steve Scalise, is one. Jim Jordan, the chair of the judiciary, is another. There may be a third, Kevin Hearn of Oklahoma. And because of the dynamics in the House Republican Conference right now, again, because of this need, as one lawmaker put it, to decompress, the question becomes, is there enough time for the conference to really come down a notch and get behind a speaker candidate by next week so there isn't this long, protracted floor fight, the kind that you and I covered for hours and hours and hours on the air in January, Kira? 
Right. I think it's important that you put it out that you, you made the point that not every Republican was disappointed in this bipartisan move uh, that the speaker made. So Congressman Patrick McHenry uh, will now serve as interim speaker. Let's talk about why him. Well, right now, he's got some strong popularity amongst House Republicans, and he was a close ally of Speaker McCarthy's as well. The question becomes how much power does McHenry have in his temporary role as Speaker? And the honest answer is the jury is somewhat out. It's unlikely that if Republicans wanted to, they could pass big legislation with a temporary Speaker in the chair, not just because they have a temporary Speaker, but because the conference's priority right now is to get a permanent Speaker. Speaker. It's also unclear exactly. There are, there are kind of parliamentary debates as to how much power McHenry has as a temporary speaker. Um, the rules say that he has as much power as he needs to and views to be used in emergency type situations. But again, how much does he have to get across the goal line? The reality is, Kira, the work of the House is very much paralyzed right now until House Republicans can pick a new speaker. There is this period of kind of lull, and they have to do something before they can start to work on those bills that they could pass to avert a government shutdown. All right, Jay O'Brien on the Hill for us. Jay, thanks. And just a little while ago, Donald Trump spoke outside the New York City courtroom where the third day of his civil fraud trial is underway. The former president once again attacking New York Attorney General Letitia James and the Justice Department for what he calls corruption. The judge overseeing the case issuing a gag order against the former president just yesterday after he made those disparaging posts on social media about a member of the judge's staff. The $250 million lawsuit brought on by the AG accuses Trump of lying about his wealth and inflating the value of his properties by more than $2 billion. Our senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky, joins us now by phone from the courthouse. Uh, what's happened this hour, Aaron? Well, the, uh, the, the case is about to resume here, Kira, with uh, the cross-examination of an accountant, Donald Bender, who so far has been the only witness to testify at this trial. And the judge has been urging uh, the, the defense cross-examination to speed up. But we're also waiting to hear from New York Attorney General Letitia James, who has been the victim uh, of a number of, of Trump's attacks and, and intense rhetoric. Uh, since this trial began, he has called her corrupt, he has called her incompetent, uh, said that she has brought a rigged case against him. And, and she is, uh, I think, prepared to respond, uh, but also speak out, as you mentioned, about the, uh, the partial gag order that was imposed after Trump posted disparaging uh, things about the judge's clerk. Uh, she's uh, going to come back in here to court, where she's been seated over the last couple of days right behind Trump, and, and talk about how some of that rhetoric can be dangerous. Pictures now of Letitia James there sitting not far behind uh, the former president uh, as he's looking straight up at the judge there. And, you know, earlier today, as you mentioned, Trump claimed he wasn't entitled to a jury in this case. Um, but this is a bench trial, and his defense team never even requested one in the first place. Yeah, and, and the way the case is charged and the way the, the relief that's being sought would make this uh, bench trial almost a foregone conclusion. Now, Trump's attorneys could have at least tried, and, and they never really did to get this before a jury, even though Trump today said he wished there could be a jury. And he's clearly frustrated by that because he believes that if the case were before a jury, uh, he'd win because he says there's no case and people would understand that he's being charged with fraud uh, for, for nothing. Uh, the way he sees it, he's entitled to value his real estate properties the, the way he sees fit, the way he thinks, uh, that, you know, they're, they, they're worth. Uh, and, and he doesn't necessarily have to listen to the assessed value of places like Mar-a-Lago or his penthouse apartment or, or the like. So Trump was only expected to appear for part of this trial yesterday, yet he shows up again today on his own accord. But he's still claiming that the court is keeping him from campaigning in key states. Clearly, that's not the case. He's free to go, come and go as he pleases. This is a civil case. It's not a criminal case, Kira. So he is not required to attend, but he is, um, he is here of his own volition. Uh, and, and when he says he's stuck and, and you know, off the campaign trail, uh, that's by choice, although he has now departed court and, uh, and appears to be leaving New York to return perhaps to Florida.
So we mentioned this gag order, Aaron, that was issued by the judge. What exactly did Trump say about the judge's clerk on social media? He posted a picture of her with uh, Senate uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and questioned her politics and, and, and questioned her integrity in the case. And the judge said that personal attacks against court staff are, are unacceptable and are off limits. And he said if Trump does it again, there could be serious sanctions. Aaron Katursky, appreciate the coverage. And now to the child care crisis spreading across America. Millions of families across the country are bracing for a major change in child care as the pandemic era emergency funding program is set to expire. Thousands of child care centers are now at risk of closing. Our business correspondent, Alexis Christophorus, takes a deeper dive. <laughs> Tracy Hansen has been caring for young children in Colleen, Texas for 28 years, but she worries she'll have to shut down her child care center. We are hanging on by our fingernails. That's because $24 billion the federal government gave to child care centers during the pandemic has dried up, threatening to leave 3.2 million kids without care and putting 70,000 child care programs at risk of closing. With the extra money, I was able to give pay raises, paid time off for employees. I've supported families that were not able to afford tuition. I've been able to do some repairs on the building and we've revamped our playground. Without the extra funding, she's had to raise tuition and reduce hours, but says even that may not be enough. I tell myself I'm gonna give it six more months, but in reality, I just don't see us being able to make it. That would be a devastating blow to Shelby Lynch and her growing family. Her son has been attending Tracy's daycare center for years, and Shelby herself even went there as a child. It would be disastrous. My husband, with his job, he's the breadwinner, so I would have to be the one that stays at home. The average cost of childcare in the U.S. now tops $10,000 a year for one child. That's more than in-state college tuition in dozens of states. Tuition for Shelby's four-year-old son, Aiden, just went up another $80 a month. And with a daughter on the way, she and her husband worry how they'll afford it. We put off having kids for so long because we knew daycare was expensive. We still have to pay almost a mortgage payment for childcare, and it's, it's just a lot. A similar scenario was playing out in Boyd, Wisconsin, where registered nurse Amanda Koenig says she and her husband got sticker shock when they saw their child care bill for the upcoming year. That fear of knowing that we're probably going to have to go paycheck to paycheck sometimes is, is very overwhelming. It's not just daycare, it's groceries, it's gas, it's, you know, all the things added up that you need just to live. Daycare four days a week for her two children would have cost $1,840 a month. But Amanda's mother-in-law has agreed to watch the baby once a week. We're saving over $400 a month by doing that. Um, we're very fortunate and grateful that we, we kind of get that extra help. Many families are not so lucky. Pre-COVID, Tracy Hansen had 150 children at her center. That number has dwindled to 63. Pandemic-era child care funding was always meant to be temporary. Democrats have been attempting to push through a $16 billion child care funding package that would offer assistance for another five years. But without GOP support, the bill faces an uphill battle in Congress. Parents are having to choose, and it's not making economical sense for them to be working outside the home and then paying for child care. <laughs> and for more, let's bring in Alexis uh, to discuss this. Child care, already an issue for most families pre-pandemic, Alexis. Let's just talk about how much harder it is now you know, without the funding. Right. Well, there's a big gap there now for lots of families. And, and actually, according to one survey, uh, U.S. Uh, household income, 27% of U.S. household income uh, goes towards child care. I mean, that's an incredible amount, right? So it's just out of reach uh, for so many folks. And, you know, on top of that, so many people left the industry during the pandemic that a lot of these child care places just can't find qualified workers. And the woman I spoke to there uh, mentioned in the piece, Tracy Hansen, said now that she doesn't have the funding, She's afraid workers will start to leave because she can no longer offer them a living wage. You know, a lot of those uh, educators make less than fast food workers do per hour in this country. 
Yeah, it's like your paycheck goes right into child care. It's just not fair. And I guess let's talk about the options out there, anything that families can do to ease the cost of child care. Well, you know, like in the piece, we saw one of the moms, Amanda, she was able to tap her mother-in-law to help out with her newborn one day a week. And that's going to save that family $400 a month. That's a huge savings. So if you have a family member, a neighbor, um, a friend who can help out uh, in any small way, that is great. But, you know, a lot of people don't have that option, right? So other things you might want to do, make sure you are getting all the applicable tax credits coming your way. There is the child care tax credit for those 17 and under, but also also the dependent care and, and child tax credit. These were more generous during the pandemic, but they are still out there and you should try to take advantage of them. Also contact your employer, the HR department. Are there any perks that maybe you don't know about? Can you work out some sort of a flex schedule? Even working remotely from home one day a week could help and see if your job has what's called a dependent care FSA or flexible spending account, which lets you put pre-tax dollars aside for daycare related costs. And that does include before school and after school care. And then finally, a lot of states offer resources, especially for low-income families. And the best bet there is just to go to your state's website, see what the resources are, see if you're eligible, and you can apply there uh, right online. And Alexis, I don't know about you, you know, we're both moms, but there was a time where we tapped in to babysitters in the neighborhood and asked if, you know, she would take on a couple families and then we all sort of split the bill, which was really helpful for a period of time. Um, and then there's child care centers as well, right? I mean, how are they keeping the lights on without the extra funding that they were already receiving? Right, so Tracy, who we spoke to in the piece, said that her state of Texas is not trying to fill that gap right now. There are just a handful of states who are extending that federal funding. Uh, for a few more months, but there is not a major plan after that. So right now, these child care centers are looking for either private donors or they're looking for legislators uh, to make a move. But right now, it seems like Cong Congress is stymied. Uh, we are still trying to avert a shutdown in another 44 days, is it? So uh, uh, sadly, I don't think this is on the front burner for lawmakers right now, Kira. No, I don't think it will be either. And Lexis, appreciate it. Such an important topic, especially for all the working parents out there. Coming up, more than 75,000 workers walking off the job in the largest health care strike in U.S. history. We are on the picket line. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, the largest health care strike in U.S. history is currently underway.
more than 75,000 Kaiser Permanente health care workers have walked off the job and hit the picket lines after their contract expired on Saturday. And no deal was made to hundreds of Kaiser workers and facilities from California, Oregon, Colorado, Washington, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. Thousands of patients directly impacted. Our Melissa Don joins me now from the picket lines there in L.A. Melissa? Kiro, what we're seeing out here in Los Angeles outside of this Kaiser Permanente is just so many of the healthcare workers that are now on strike. A lot of what they're asking for comes down to really two main points. They're talking about challenges with staffing and they're asking for better wages. A lot of these workers, some of them tell us that they've been here since the pandemic and through the pandemic they dealt with feeling burned out, feeling that so many people left when we're talking about nurses or other workers within the healthcare system. They're feeling that those numbers of staffing have gone down. That's something that Kaiser Permanente has addressed and they say that they're ramping up and adding jobs. But again, that is one sector of it. Then the other are wages, something that we're seeing with unions across the country all asking for better wages. Of course, inflation, one big part of it. But specifically here, the union is sharing with us that they want a starting wage of $25 an hour. And that's four more dollars than Kaiser is offering. They're also wanting raises between 6 and 7%. Kaiser coming over to the table, we were told, with an increase that would cap out at 4%. So they're definitely bargaining, but this strike is ongoing for the next three days. That's what we're expected to see until they can get into some better terms. But really, right now, a lot of the healthcare workers just sharing with us that they want to feel that their care is at the center because they say that if they can take care of themselves, they'll be much better equipped to take care of all of us. So it's something that we'll be watching closely. Kira? All right, well, stay tuned. Thanks so much, Melissa. Now to Vatican City, where delegates from across the world are gathered to debate the future of the Catholic Church. They'll be talking about a lot of things, including married priests and same-sex unions, which Pope Francis suggested could eventually, be, eventually rather, be blessed by the Church. Our foreign correspondent, James Longman, is at the Vatican with more. Yeah, hi, Kira. Pope Francis is convening a global gathering uh, here in Rome to discuss the future of the Catholic Church. It's called a synod, and it'll last most of this month. But for the first time, lay people and women will vote on specific issues alongside bishops and other members of the clergy. That is a radical change from what's gone before, and it's seen as part of Francis's efforts to make the Vatican a more inclusive institution with less of a focus on hierarchy. Some 450 attendees will discuss some of the most controversial issues of the day. They will include the role of women and and a greater inclusion of LGBT people. But there have already been some major disagreements over these issues. Five of the most conservative cardinals have written to Francis saying the Synod was sowing confusion and they asked for clarity on same-sex unions. But the Pope is clearly keen to tackle these criticisms head on. He published his response, making it clear he wouldn't stand in the way of blessings of same-sex unions in church. Now, that's not marriage. It's important to make that distinction. But it is still a major reversal. Francis told these cardinals with much sincerity, I tell you, it's not good to be afraid of these questions. Kira? James, appreciate the update. And coming up, a deadly crash in Italy after a bus fell from an overpass onto a highway, killing at least 21 people. The possible cause next. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the Fulton County, Georgia Courthouse, I'm Rena Roy. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Other stories that we're tracking this hour, a search is on for a shooter who injured five people near Baltimore's Morgan State University. Police say four of the victims are students and all suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Baltimore police say they haven't identified a suspect yet and all classes are canceled today. At least 21 people are dead and more than a dozen others hurt after a bus fell off an overpass in Italy. Authorities say the bus was heading to a campsite outside Venice when it careened off the road. Prosecutors are now investigating whether the bus driver became suddenly ill and if the bus was even certified. Lady Gaga won't have to pay a $500,000 reward to that woman who returned her stolen dogs back in 2021. Jennifer McBride was charged with receiving stolen property after she handed the French Bulldogs over to the pop star. McBride sued Gaga for the reward anyway, claiming she did know that Koji and Gustav were stolen when she took them, but she only did it to make sure they were returned safely. A judge now siding with Gaga saying McBride's intentions didn't play into this. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News to all the stories that matter to you. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on ABCnews.com. The news never stops. Neither do we. We'll be right back. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never like expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Gulf Coast of Florida, covering Hurricane Adalia. I'm Mike Ajachi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hello, I'm Terry Moran, and here are some of the top headlines we're watching at ABC News Live at this hour. 
beginning with that extraordinary moment never witnessed in American history until now. Republican Kevin McCarthy ousted by members of his own party, becoming the first House Speaker ever to be voted out. The move has paralyzed the House and thrown it into chaos uncertainty. President Biden now calling on Congress to work quickly to elect a new Speaker and, quote, change the poisonous atmosphere in Washington. We have strong disagreements, but we need to stop seeing each other as enemies. We need to talk to one another, listen to one another, work with one another, and we can do that. We cannot and should not uh, again be faced with 11th hour decision of brinksmanship that threatens uh, to shut down the government. Until the House of Representatives votes to fill the seat of Speaker as early as next week, North Carolina Congressman Patrick McHenry will serve as interim House Speaker. So far, House Majority Leader Steve Scalise and Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan have both entered the race to succeed McCarthy. While the closing bell sounding on Wall Street, now stocks bouncing back from yesterday's sell-off. The Dow, S&P 500, and NASDAQ, they're all closing higher. Big winners today include Tesla, AMD, and American Airlines. Oil prices are retreating from last week's high, settling 5% lower on the day, and that's good news. Thousands of healthcare workers in multiple states are now leading the largest healthcare strike in U.S. history. Union leaders say more than 75,000 Kaiser Permanente healthcare workers have walked off the job and hit the picket lines after their contract expired on Saturday and no deal was made. In August, unions representing Kaiser workers asked for a $25 hourly minimum wage. They also demanded a pay increase of 7% each year in the first two years and 6.2% each year in the two years that follow. Kaiser Permanente is one of the country's larger insurers and healthcare system operators, serving nearly 13 million people. Well, thanks for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, on Roku, on the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. GMA3 starts right now. What do you need to know right now on GMA3? Is hereby declared vacant. With that strike of the gavel, Capitol Hill and new chaos, the historic, stunning rebuke of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and a revolt by hard right Republicans. Plus, the arraignment today and what we're now learning about the Tupac Shakur murder investigation. Our team with the latest. And our Ginger Z in New Orleans. All that salt water is moving up, potentially polluting the water here. And that's why we went with the Army Corps of Engineers and an urgent mission to prevent it from happening. You'll see all of it coming up right here on GMA3. Plus, it's the matchup everyone wanted. The Aces versus the Liberty in the WNBA Finals. The Liberty hoping to bring home New York's first championship. My conversation with the team stars on chemistry and the growth of the league. Also, it's the season for savings on these fall fashion staples. Tori's here with Deals and Steals. And one that got away, the musical moment you don't want to miss with the American indie pop band, Muna. Now, from Times Square, DeMarco Morgan and Eva Pilgrim with Dr. Jen Ashton and What You Need to Know. And you got to say it just like that, Muna! Muna is in the house and we can't wait to share it with you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to What You Need to Know. Hey, we are so excited. They mm -hmm. are so much awesome. fun to watch. Oh, a ton of fun. And people are crazy about that. Of course they are. So good to have Dr. Darian Sutton with us here Happy on the to desk. Be here. It is good always good to see you. And since you're here, we'd love to pick your brain about some <laughs> sure, things. Sure, I'm ready. Yes, let's talk medical news that we can. Uh, several states across the country have yeah. issued West Nile virus alerts, uh, including uh, there's some concern about the death of a woman in the Pittsburgh area. What yes. do we need to know? It, these headlines are always concerning. They're always jolting. But I want to provide a little bit of um, uh, understanding of what this is but also a little bit of calm because this still the numbers overall remain low but here's some important facts that you need to know about West Nile virus just to identify it and how it spreads so first let's start with transmission it spread from mosquitoes to people and the symptoms often include fever headache body aches and joint pain and it can even include a rash for most the symptoms 
pretty much stay at flu-like symptoms. Very rarely do they progress to severe symptoms. And most of those who are at risk are those over the age of 65 or those who are elderly. And in terms of prevention, it is spread by mosquitoes. So trying to avoid them as best as possible is important. It's now in the middle currently of mosquito season. So you want to do your best to get rid of those standing bodies of water around your house. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take hikes, avoid dusk and dawn because those are the times where you're more likely to get a mosquito bite and wear repellent. And then in terms of treatment, unfortunately, there is no official treatment for West Nile virus. It's mostly supportive. But if you feel like your symptoms need more help than the comfort of your own couch, you should see a provider. All right, Doc, thank you. We turn now to ABC's Elizabeth Schulze in Washington with our latest headlines. Good afternoon, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, Eva. It is so great to see you on this Wednesday. And we are going to start with the unprecedented chaos here in Washington. GOP House Speaker Kevin McCarthy ousted in a revolt by a handful of far-right Republicans. No speaker of either party throughout U.S. history has ever been voted out of office. McCarthy says he will not run again for the job. The vast majority of Republicans who were behind him are furious. All action in the House is halted until a new speaker is chosen. And the dangerous moments in Maryland, the mass shooting at Morgan State University in Baltimore, police ordering students and others to shelter in place for hours, at least five people injured in the middle of homecoming week celebrations. The FBI is now joining the investigation on the campus of the historically black college. And former President Trump is expected in court for a third day in his civil fraud case, now under a limited gag order from the judge after Trump angered that judge yesterday with a social media post attacking the judge's law clerk. One of a series of inflammatory remarks by Trump in recent days. The social media post in question has been deleted and the judge warning the former president faces serious sanctions if he continues. Trump denies all wrongdoing. And picketing has begun in the largest health care strike in American history. More than 75,000 Kaiser Permanente workers in eight states walking off the job for one to three days. The union is pushing for higher starting wages and other benefits. Kaiser says their goal is to reach a fair and equitable agreement. And a reminder, you will likely hear an emergency notification this afternoon on your cell phones, TV, and radio. The nationwide alert is an annual test from FEMA to hit at 2.20 p.m. Eastern time, expected to set off on any mobile phone that is within range of a tower. And one more reminder, the big bucks are up for grabs tonight. That Powerball jackpot is growing. Now at least $1.2 billion. Good luck to everyone out there who's got a ticket. Someone has got to win one of these days, guys. Somebody's got to win. Yeah, you know? 1.2 billion. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. <laughs> I might go get a ticket. Yeah. Or two. <laughs> or two. All right, Elizabeth, thank you very much. Still ahead on this Wednesday on GMA3, the cold case now heating up. Who shot Tupac? Our team on the latest developments and the arraignment expected today. Plus, the clean drinking water crisis facing millions. Our Ginger Z on board with the Army Corps of Engineers on a critical mission. GMA3 will be right back. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. 30 years. My brother's death was his mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. 
ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All the chicks was like, Tupac, Tupac. And he was like, hey, like a celebrity, like he was in the parade. He wouldn't even been out the window. We would have never seen him. You said the shots came from the back. Big Dre. Orlando, who shot Tupac? They came from the cold of the streets. It just came from the back seat for Yeah, this case has been fascinating for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to GMA3. That's Keefe D, also known as Dwayne Keith Davis, talking with BET, answering that now infamous question, who shot Tupac? And now, 27 years after Tupac's death, Davis has been arrested and charged for Tupac's murder, indicted Friday, set to be arraigned today. Joining us now are ABC News contributors Mike Muse and Brian Buckmeyer. I mean, this is kind of crazy when mm -hmm. you think about it all. Las Vegas police saying Davis was the shot caller who allegedly orchestrated orchestrated the murder of Tupac. Brian, he's being rained, arraigned today. What do you think we're going to find out? So arraignments are pretty standard. He's going to go up there, here are the charges. He's going to plead either guilty or not guilty. And because he's already indicted, uh, the next step is then picking a court date. But we're going to find out a lot more about the case because, interesting enough, the way he's indicted, he's not just saying, oh, you shot and killed Tupac. They're also saying you potentially orchestrated it by aiding and abetting, either with DeAndre Smith or Orlando Anderson, because from his own words, he supposedly supplied a gun and passed it back. So he could either be the person that's considered to do the actual shooting or aiding and abetting others. And that's a serious uh, jail time that he can face. And I'm curious because we saw that video. How mm -hmm. critical is that video going to be in all this? All of it's critical. I mean, you go back from the, the July uh, search warrant where they searched his home and they got the memoirs and the documents. I keep telling people, I think enough of us know about books and stuff like that. The information that makes the book or makes the memoir is only a fraction of what's actually out there. So that search warrant probably got a lot more of the background that he's talking about this. And the police have been said it was corroboration. They knew some information about the shooting. Now they can corroborate with his own words. It makes it from that much more of a case against him. And Mike, again, we've been talking about this case for nearly 30 years now. And as time goes by, you think, will they ever find out who killed Tupac? How significant is this to the rap community? It's very significant. I'm just listening to you use the word 30 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a long time. But for me, what that symbolizes is this the great dynamic artist that Tupac was. Uh, that that man, his image, his artistry, his lyrics, his songs, his music still continues to this day. And he was that important to culture that we're still talking about this narrative of who actually shot him. It's good for the rap community because it actually begins to have healing um, and closure to one, Tupac's family, but then two, to the rap genre, because the rap genre was so criticized as a whole mm -hmm. for this murder that happened, and now we know that this was an isolated incident, allegedly possibly between two different rival gangs that had something to do with this. And so now it allows us to remove that it's an issue within the rap community and genre and really focus on why is gang culture so prevalent in American society today and what are we doing as elected officials and politicians and advocacy groups to heal and solve for that problem. I'm curious, Brian, because this memoir of his came out in 2019 that he was in the car when Tupac, Tupac was shot. Why did they just now arrest him and indict him and all of this? I mean, that's a million dollar question. <clears throat> Part of it, when I tell people, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. Okay, so they've already told us that since 2018, that since a memoir came out, this reinvigorated the investigation into the murder of Tupac. For me, I think it's partly a number of things. We all have the shared love of Tupac, but if you're investigating this case, 
I've represented rappers, not as big as Tupac, but if there was gang violence involved, officers just typically look at it as it's two gang members killing each other. They might not be as um, eager to solve that crime as other crimes. But now as we have this love of Tupac, the way it's grown, the way it's moved, it's more than just crime on crime violence. It's, it's about Tupac. So I think that invigorates it as well. And then again, Keefe D just talking left, right, and center, mm -hmm. just making it so much easier for them to say, you know what? Street rules are one, one type of rule, but what we do in the court of law, that's another. And aiding and abetting, we can arrest you for that. So many questions mm -hmm. and people really still looking for answers. Mm -hmm. ABC News contributors Mike Views, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you both so good much. Always you, good to have you. <laughs> Up next right here on GMA3, Ginger Z on board, bringing us the latest on an urgent mission by the Army Corps of Engineers. It is so important they are trying to halt the dangerous spread of salt water into drinking water. The Mississippi River now standing at record low levels. We're back in a moment. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Give it to me. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Hit me with them good vibes, bitches on my phone lies. Everything is so fine, little bit of sunshine. Dance more, just a little bit. Breathe more, just a little bit. Smile a little more in a minute. Ah, 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 ah. from the Fulton County Courthouse in Atlanta, Georgia, I'm Olivia Rubin. Wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Folks, we're back now with a major mission underway to stop the saltwater threat to Louisiana's water supply, putting millions of people in danger. The problem spreading as the Mississippi River reaches record lows for a second year in a row. Now, ABC chief meteorologist Ginger Z and managing editor of our climate coverage is getting a first-hand look, taking us on board an Army Corps of Engineers vessel. It's been months since Mitch Jurisich and 4,000 others in Southern Plaquemines Parish have been able to confidently use the water that comes out of their taps. We got the word on June 19th that the chloride level had risen from like 250 to 700 and something parts per million overnight. Wow. It sparked, you know, panic. Chloride is salt that came up from the Gulf of Mexico into their water. People don't realize just how important the commodity water is to us, but when you see it shut down schools, businesses, changing people's lives. Mitch lives about an hour south of New Orleans, but the salt water is now moving up that river. More than a million people in New Orleans are now within 19 days of salt water polluting their water supply. 
for the first time since 1988. Unfortunately, the last two years, we've seen those flows be low enough to where the Gulf of Mexico has started to creep into the state. Historically low river levels, sinking land, a rising sea, and a constantly changing river structure are all making this slow-moving disaster. Earlier this summer, the Army Corps of Engineers built a sill. It's basically an underwater barrier to keep the saltwater out. But that sill overtopped, and just last week, they had to start building it higher. While they work on building up that sill, they are barging in water. This barge came from upriver, where it grabbed a half a million gallons of fresh water, then brought it down here, pumped it into the water treatment facility so they can dilute the salt water that they're taking in. It's a 24-7 operation. They've also brought in reverse osmosis machines that can desalinate the water. These are the band-aids. These are temporary fixes. We need to revamp all of our water plants. Water leaves, so does the quality of life. And Ginger joins us right now from New Orleans. Uh, Ginger, it is good to see you. Do officials believe that they are confident uh, about what they're doing right now to keep residents safe? Uh, the simple answer is no, that it is not enough, especially if you think right now they are mitigating for about 25,000 people in Plaquemine Parish. But up here in New Orleans, we're talking 400,000 from one water treatment plant and then add all the hotels, all the tourists, all of the water that they're going to need. So they're going to need to do something else. And they're actually moving forward with a really ambitious plan. The Water and Sewer Board tells me here in New Orleans that they are building a pipeline from 12 miles up that will go to their water treatment plant so that they can dilute that salt water as it comes in. So they are ready for it, but they're going to have to move so fast and it is very expensive. I'm curious, Ginger, how long are they going to have to do this? Well, that's the thing. Until they get the water that they need from upstream. So even though Louisiana has had incredibly hot, some places the hottest summer on record, and they're in major drought, more than half the state in the highest level of drought, it's not about the drought here. It's actually 90% of the water levels are driven by the Ohio River, Missouri River, and North Branch of the Mississippi. That is where they need rain. And unfortunately, the pattern does not look good for the next week, and certainly not, the hydrologist here told me, for the next month. On top of all of the rain issues and you know record lows, the folks here, including the president of the Plaquemine Parish, tells me they really need to look at these crevasses. The actual structure of the river has changed dramatically, and that, in some places, is because of lack of maintenance. Basically, they've opened up large crevasses that have allowed more salt water in than they normally would. And it's impacted a lot of people. Mm -hmm. mm. Ginger Z, thank you so much. I know you're going to continue to follow this for all of us. We appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Just ahead here, Dr. Darian with the update on an overseas health scare. What you need to know if you're traveling. Yeah, stick around for that. Plus, savings that will make you smile. The Tory's here with a look at some Paul Fashion deals and steals. When we come back, stay with us. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it.
with so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. You know those tests that you can do at home and then you ship them off to a lab to get results? Mm -hmm. They're super convenient, super. but now the FDA is making moves to step up its oversight on them. And Dr. Darian is here with us to break this down this for us. One. I know, and, I, and many people are fans of this. You know, being able to order a test, get it at home, take it in the comfort of your own home, send it out, and then get that result. The problem comes in the result. Uh, mainly, the FDA is trying to strengthen policies on safeguarding and making sure that these tests are accurate and also that you're interpreting them correctly. And unfortunately, there's not much oversight on many of these genetic tests, some tests that you can test to see if you're in early menopause, even certain tests to see if you have a sexually transmitted infection. They don't have specific ruling or guidance over the FDA, so many times people can be left with an answer that may not be correct or with an answer they're just not sure what to do with. But how much of it has to do with access? That's a big Because, problem. I mean, testing is so expensive. Absolutely, and it, it's, a, it's unfortunately a uniquely American problem with the access to care. Many people want that convenience, but cannot get that appointment with the primary care provider. So because I completely insurance. understand yeah. why you would choose this method. I think with the education that comes out of this is just understanding that you just really need to understand where you're getting that test from, and you need to understand what testing has been done before that in order to make sure that it's accurate. And then you have to at least have some form of a connection with a provider so that you can interpret it correctly. And if it's in, if it's an in, in incorrect value or if it's a concerning value, you want to know what to do next. Yeah, because getting the wrong results can take you down a whole nother yeah. rabbit hole. Right? Can lead you doctor. down into harm. Yeah, absolutely. I know it's difficult, but you should definitely take a lot of caution when taking these tests at home. Good advice. Thank you, Doc. We're back in a moment. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it.
What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Hello, I'm Terry Moran, and here are some of the top headlines we're watching at ABC News Live at this hour. Beginning with that extraordinary moment never witnessed in American history until now. Republican Kevin McCarthy ousted by members of his own party, becoming the first Speaker of the House ever to be voted out. The move paralyzing the House and throwing it into chaos and uncertainty. President Biden now calling on Congress to work quickly to elect a new Speaker and, quote, change the poisonous atmosphere in Washington. What? We have strong disagreements, but we need to stop seeing each other as enemies. We need to talk to one another, listen to one another, work with one another, and we can do that. We cannot and should not uh, again be faced with an 11th hour decision of brinksmanship that threatens uh, to shut down the government. Well, until the House of Representatives votes to fill the Speaker's seat as early as next week, North Carolina Congressman Patrick McHenry will serve as interim House Speaker. So far, House Majority Leader Steve Scalise and Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan have both entered the race to succeed McCarthy. And President Biden announced he is canceling another $9 billion in student loan debt. This comes as borrowers are bracing for payments to restart after a three-year pause during the pandemic and afterwards. This latest round of loan forgiveness is expected to help 125,000 borrowers. The president announced the move at the White House earlier this afternoon. Watch. This kind of relief is life-changing for individuals and their families. But it's good for our economy as a whole as well. By freeing millions of Americans from the crushing burden of student debt, it means they can go and get their lives in order. They can think about buying a house. They can start a business. They can be starting a family. This matters. It matters in their daily lives. The White House says they are conducting what they call fixes to a broken student loan system, trying to put those, quote, fixes in place. Thousands of health care workers in multiple states are now leading the largest health care strike in U.S. history. Union leaders say more than 75,000 Kaiser Permanente health care workers have walked off the job and hit the picket line after their contract expired on Saturday and no deal was made. In August, unions representing Kaiser workers asked for a $25 an hour hourly wage and minimum wage. They also demanded a pay increase of 7% each year in the first two years and 6.25% each year in the two years that follow. Kaiser Permanente is one of the country's larger insurers and healthcare system operators, serving nearly 13 million people. Well, thanks for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, on your social media apps, and of course on ABCnews.com. The news never stops. More GMA right now. Back now here on GMA3 and the news of the Paris bed bug infestation is spreading faster than, well, those little bed bugs. So, Dr. Darian, break down for us how to spot bed bugs bites yes uh, and what to do <laughs> if it happens to you so unfortunately this is a, this is a definite problem in Paris and as we were discussing Paris Fashion Week ends this week and, and it's people are coming to back to the US mm -hmm. because bed bugs are only a plane right away so mm -hmm. there are some symptoms that you want to pay attention to if you think you might have been exposed to bed bugs and specifically what the rash looks like you might notice small blisters or pimples on your skin and specifically in a zigzag pattern that's very what we call pathognomonic for a bed bug infection or a bed bug bite also you might notice raised pimples with a dark red center and then you might also notice a little bit of a blister formation and many people associate bed bugs with being dirty and mm -hmm. bed bugs don't care how clean your room is you can find them anywhere so there are recommendations that you should probably check your room before you go especially if you're traveling and if you notice that you have bed bug bites you want to make sure that you wash the area keep it clean treat it like any other bite you can if you're finding that your skin is really irritated you can apply things like corticosteroid cream on there or antihistamines but again it's about finding the source I know I'm grossing you out tomorrow. How do you get I'm rid sorry. of them, though? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, oh, yes. 
<laughs> all right, folks, we'd love to hear from you, so hit us up on Instagram with all of your medical questions at ABC GMA3. Thank you, Doc. All right, coming up, the amazing women of the WNBA, Eva's revealing conversation with the stars of the New York Liberty and how they teamed up with one goal in mind. That's such a cool story. Plus, mm -hmm. fall fashion staples you'll want in your wardrobe, stat. Dory's here with her deals and steals, GMA3, right after this. Let's get down, let's get down to business. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. For 30 years, my brother's death was his mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Let's get down, let's get down. All right, folks, welcome back to GMA3. The WNBA Finals are set to kick off this weekend, and our home team, New York Liberty, are in position to do something that no other New York basketball team has done in the last 50 years, and that's bring home a title to the Big Apple. Which is crazy mm -hmm. when you think about how much New York loves basketball. The Liberty's super team is comprised of this year's MVP of the WNBA, Brianna Stewart, mm -hmm. former MVP, John Quell Jones, all-star Sabrina Ionescu, and Courtney Vandersloot, they are built to win. I sat down with the four stars to talk about their title hopes, their growing bond, and the future of women's hoops. It's a showdown of the super teams for this year's WNBA Finals. The Las Vegas Aces, the defending champs, versus the New York Liberty. Vandersloot, she got it. We've never won a championship. We came together for one goal, and that's to win a championship. In the offseason, these ladies helped turn the franchise and the WNBA world upside down, sparking a transformation unseen in the history of the league. <laughs> This year's WNBA MVP, Brianna Stewart, alongside John Quell Jones and Courtney Vandersloot, joining Sabrina Ionescu in New York with one goal in mind, to win. What the Liberty was able to do in free agency is something that really hasn't happened that much in the WNBA. The ability for players to kind of move where they want and, and figure that out. We're coming together for a number of reasons. How did it all start? Did someone text someone and say, hey, I want you to come here? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. Just express the vision that I had, but also 
knowing what we could accomplish if we all came here together, just who we are as people and understanding that there's going to be a lot of sacrifice to come together and, and want to win and having so many great players on the court. We all have to, you know, be at the right, with the right mindset and, and having the same goals and I believe we all shared that vision. All of us just are really competitive so we expect a lot from ourselves first of all and then of each other as well. It's easy to speak to somebody when you know that they have the same level of drive as you and same, same passion for the game. The star power on the court bringing big expectations to the Big Apple and big ratings. She got it. Plus the foul. This season, the most watched regular season across the league's networks in over 20 years. Let's talk about kind of the state of women's basketball at the moment. It's pretty exciting. All-time high viewership, record sponsorship, attendance is crazy high. When you see that, what do you think? We've been trying to get people to see what we do on the court and come out to games, and, and now it's it's finally um, being put in that spotlight. It's exactly what the WNBA deserves. It's what women's sports deserves. Just continuing to fight for equality and know that this is bigger than just us here in, in New York and in Brooklyn, but we're trying to really change the game in a broader sense. Now our league is in a position to have a lot of firsts in, in knowing that we're part of that and bringing that here in New York City with a great crowd that we've been able to draw every single night. And then we've been a part of that change and excited to see where it's going to go into the playoffs as well. It's a lot of pressure. No? Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, you know, we kind of put a target on our back when we decided, I think, in the offseason to all come here. And people are, I don't think we started the, the super team narrative, but that name kind of, you know, followed us around. You know, we're, we've enjoyed it. The move paying off. After five consecutive losing seasons, the Liberty punching their ticket to the finals. Dominant performance to get the job done. Something is definitely brewing. And these ladies are determined to bring the first WNBA title to New York. Yonescu connects on the other end. You want to win the championship? Yes. yes. <laughs> if we don't, then, yeah, it's not the outcome we wanted. Uh, I think they got to do it. And you talked about the big ratings. So what and who do we credit for the big following, the huge interest? Well, I mean, if you watch them, they're a lot mm. of fun to watch. And it's a whole vibe when you go there. I mean, there are celebrities sitting courtside. People are into it. They are having a good time. You can't help but, like, really walk away amped up. Whether you're into women's mm -hmm. basketball or basketball at all, it's fun. And I saw that move. You look like you know what you're doing on the court. Okay. <laughs> I am not a basketball player. <laughs> you can catch the New York Liberty face off against the Las Vegas Aces in the WNBA Finals this Sunday, October 8th at 3 p.m. Eastern on ABC. We'll all be watching. Great piece, friend. Coming up, a look at some specials just in time for fall fashion next here on GMA3. It's Tori's autumn-themed deals and steals. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news.
Monterey Park, California. I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. When I am with you, there's no Welcome back. It's time for another edition of Deals and Steals. Tori Johnson bringing us the big savings on fashion staples you'll want in your closet this fall. Yeah, we love it when Tori walks in the door. And you can start shopping for these deals by pointing your cell phone camera directly at the QR code on your screen. Tori, what's up first? The shacket. Mm, looks so good. Oh, the shacket. Is, yes, that is okay. the shacket. It is, you have been touching that as all day. we've been preparing. It is so incredibly <laughs> soft, soft. And that's what Softies is all about. Mm. Really mm. soft material. But what's awesome about this piece is that you could put it on at home if you're feeling a little chilly and mm -hmm. just hanging on the couch or you can throw it on with jeans leggings whatever and head out to do your errands and it's just like you look perfectly put together but you're wearing in a sense like the most comfortable piece of clothing in the world and it looks good it does yeah. look good and you can style it so many different ways but it's that comfort that's key 50 percent off today we've got a variety of colors oh, that's really steal. fun yeah. this really kind of makes me sad because we have to talk about it getting cold but these yeah. are cute yeah. so you know fall <laughs> is around the corner the really fun glove and a little hat weather is around the corner so we've got beanies and gloves you, yeah too. and that that's what's special about them they have this faux suede stretch palm mm -hmm. so it really does fit like a glove <laughs> that's where that saying comes from they live up to it here <laughs> but also the puffer hats are really fun plus they're also lined on the inside little faux fur palm but this uh, little puffer detail quilted detail mm -hmm. is so fun so you can either coordinate your set or mix up on your own your choice they start at $22 yeah, and they've been, nice they they been making good. these accessories for over 30 years so Justin oh. Gregory really knows what they're doing cool. another brand that really knows Arm what they're doing candy. yeah Marlon Schiff one of my favorite jewelry designers so this is all about a little bit of bling you can wear these pieces with whatever kind of style you like and what I love about her these pieces is that she's all about versatility so you can wrap these on your wrist a couple of times those are really inspired by kind of like the whole Taylor Swift era of everyone so nice. was wearing their yeah, friendship yeah, the bracelets. Swifties. Yep, there you go. Yes, yes. yes Rachel gave me this. One. Yes. <laughs> so these, you just pile these up and they're so fun and they're also really accessibly priced. So if you meet someone you really like and you want to take it off and give it to them, okay. it's okay because these prices start at $9. But they're so versatile. So whether you wear it as a bracelet, a necklace, a wrap, the earrings, these beaded ones, I, I could talk about her line all day. Tourist, really fun. you meet someone that you really like. That you really like. <laughs> you got a really yeah, like good <laughs> $9 and you give it to them. Love this it. is Bandy, uh, not your uh, granny's fanny pack. This is just oh, a, a really, pack. yes, and it's so sleek that you don't even realize that. It's got that hidden pocket there mm -hmm. that is just enough for phone, uh, cash, card, whatever you need when you're on the go, and you just need a little extra hand. So those are awesome. They also have the scrunchies. Just this is a great company. Mm -hmm. These are all made in America, which I also love, and that's so hard to find. Everything slash and have starts at $12. Stylish as well. Remember running. in the 80s when the yeah. ladies were wearing the t-shirts and mm -hmm. they pull it up a little bit over the belt? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And a lot of people travel with these, I mean, too. I mean, like to be sleek under their clothes. Okay. This is uh, Malibu Sky, and it's uh, what's great about this is that it's very versatile. So you can carry it uh, with the little gold handles, but then it also has a cross body. It's got a, po a little flat pocket. Oh, look, someone put some cash in here. Oh, for my God, this is real. No, it's not it's real cash. It's not real cash, but I got excited for a second. Exactly. Uh, and then it's got this whole zippered um, compartment in the middle for all your credit cards. Oh, like, I'm just trying cool. to show you this because there's so many details on this. Yeah. And when you hear the price for all these details, this is $20 and free shipping from Malibu Sky. I love this is organization. a good one. Oh. So organized with <laughs> Looks this. Looks good. And All then, right, more jewelry. Yes, more jewelry. This is a new company that we've never featured before, VB and Co. Designs. I am kind yeah. of in love with these pieces. I, I'm wearing a couple nice. right now to show you because I love them. Look at these earrings. Those That's are these yeah. right here in front. They look so so incredibly expensive, I swear. When I first saw them, when they were pitched to me, I thought like, oh, this is like fine jewelry. Like this isn't gonna work yeah. for my segments. And because I like the look of fine, but the price that's accessible. Mm -hmm. So we've got their beautiful crystal pieces here. Everything is handmade in America, which I happen to love too. Lots of just really fine details. I'm also wearing one of their necklaces Ooh, that you can coordinate it with it. They're really beautiful pieces. Everything slash and half starts at $12. Sure. Really accessibly priced. Coming mm -hmm. through. 
Oh, Tori Johnson in the house. Thank you. And we have partnered with six amazing small businesses on these great deals just for you. And to get yours today, you can scan the QR code on your screen or visit us at our website for all of the best deals. Well, still ahead, Muna is in the house in studio. Yeah, they all met in college and they spent an amazing summer opening for Taylor Swift. Mm. They are here to perform for us. Stay with us. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News, America's number one news source. Life's so fun, life's so fun. All right, welcome back to GMA3. That was the hit viral song, Silk Chiffon, by one of the biggest bands, Muna. The top-selling band, I had to say it that way, has been entertaining us for more than a decade now, uh, playing out to sold-out crowds all over the world, including a stadium tour with the Taylor Swift. We have a packed studio today. Mm -hmm. Their latest self-titled album, Muna, has been called one of the best indie pop albums of the year. Please welcome Muna, Katie, Gavin, Naomi McPherson, and Josette Mask. Yeah! To see you guys. This is very nice. I didn't know we were that big of a band until you guys told us. We're learning new information. Uh, what I love about y'all is y'all are friends. You met in college. How did this all come together? I mean, we all shared some classes together, and we weren't maybe. Uh, I see trouble. Yeah. I see trouble. Uh, <laughs> we we weren't maybe like your typical USC students. No offense to anyone who goes to USC. They I mean, know look at exactly us. what I'm talking about. Look at us. Um, and yeah, we were drawn to each other um, due to our shared interest in music and our shared politics. And yeah, we just, we were fast friends. So we can't get enough. So here we are. Nice. So cool. I need better friends. <laughs> Not only do you all have amazing voices, but you've been an incredible voice for the queer community. You've even played at the Stonewall Inn, an iconic place to mm. perform. Did you just naturally go into that? Did you plan that? How did that all work out? I think in a way uh, it, it wasn't exactly a choice because, you know, we're three queer individuals and we knew that that was going to be a part of our narrative no matter what. Now let's get to the fun stuff. You guys have played nine shows. Open it up for Taylor Swift. Yes. Okay, got some Swifties in the house. Tell us about it. Um, I would say, was that the best experience of her life for yeah. <laughs> I mean, we are just so grateful. Which, which camera's on? <laughs> Taylor. Just look at Taylor. <laughs> that one. Taylor, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, we're just so, but seriously, like, you know, even going back to, like, we're a queer band, and, like, not everybody 
has the courage to be like, mm -hmm. I'm going to support a queer band and put them out on the stage that, you know, not everybody is going to be there for us, but she took a chance, and we're just so grateful, and we just hope she takes us again. <laughs> Girl, sure we are available. Sure yeah, we're available. Will. Well, Muda, thank you guys. We appreciate it. And Muda's latest self-titled album is available everywhere that music is sold and streamed. They are also on our GMA3 playlist. Check it out by scanning that QR code right there on your screen. And now, here is Muna performing One That Got Away. Yeah, baby. this Wednesday. We will see you tomorrow. I'm DeMarco Morgan. I'm Eva Pilgrim. And I'm Dr. Darius. For all of us here at GMA3 and Muna, make it a great one. Yeah. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. So much.
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Des Moines, Iowa, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Kenny Whitworth here in Los Angeles and right now on ABC News Live, chaos on Capitol Hill. The House making history, ousting Kevin McCarthy from his speakership. McCarthy announcing that he won't run for speaker again. So now, who's jockeying to replace him? We're live on Capitol Hill. And America on strike. More than 75,000 health care workers walk off the job. The workers' demands and what it means for patients. Also, New Orleans under threat. The desperate effort underway right now to avoid saltwater pollution for more than a million people in Louisiana. Our Ginger Z is there. But of course, we begin with our top story. The House paralyzed from the unprecedented chaos there on Capitol Hill. This historic ousting of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy by far right members of his own party grinding the chamber to a halt. The House floor sitting empty today with no permanent speaker. Some Republicans are vying for the job as GOP members face the difficult task of unseating, this, of uniting around a successor. Now, House Majority Leader Steve Scalise is now in line for that role, but he is already facing a challenge from Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio, a favorite among conservatives who publicly announced that bid today. So joining us now is ABC News' Jay O'Brien on the Hill and ABC News' senior White House correspondent, uh, Selena Wang. Thank you both for being here with us. And Jay, you know, starting with you, obviously there's a lot of jockeying already in place, McCarthy uh, there on the Hill. So Jay, I read an editorial, it was out of New Orleans, and it said basically that in their opinion, if anyone can unite the Republicans, it is Louisiana native Steve Scalise. But then today, the surprise with Jim Jordan. So what's the latest there? Well, that was the pitch that Scalise made earlier today when he announced that he was vying for the speakership, is that he's the person that can unite the party. But both are trying to jockey for various endorsements here, and both are picking them up. Jim Jordan is getting endorsements not just from the further right of the Republican conference, but from lawmakers like Jim Banks as well. But here's the thing. They both face a tall order because there are deep divisions at this hour in the House Republican conference. Because remember, eight members of the House Republican conference voted to boot McCarthy, but 210 voted to back McCarthy, and they are mad today about the current state of play. One McCarthy ally, Representative Garrett Graves, was asked if he thinks the conference can get together enough and coalesce around a speaker candidate next week so they don't have a fight on the House floor like we saw McCarthy have to go through in January. Here was his response. Are you confident that the conference can coalesce around someone on Tuesday to avoid a 15 ballot race like we saw in January? Hell no. Hell no. But I think letting people go home and, and kind of uh, uh, decompress a little bit's a good idea. His response there again, if they could get up behind a candidate by early next week, hell no, Kana. That's slightly unsettling there, Jay. Uh, also, acting Speaker Patrick McHenry. He's already making some pretty serious moves. Sources telling ABC News that former Democratic House leaders Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer were ordered to vacate these so-called hideaway offices. Tell us more about that. Yeah, it was really his first order of business as the temporary Speaker of the House. His reasoning behind it is still very much unclear. It's being viewed as a punishment, though, to those two top Democrats. Speaker Pelosi, of course, formerly the top Democrat in the House. And one of the reasons is, some Republicans are speculating, is because Democrats did not come to McCarthy's aid. And McCarthy made a point last night in his remarks saying that he wouldn't seek the Speakership again, of saying that Pelosi had previously promised him that she would support him in a motion to vacate situation. Some that Pelosi's allies have poured cold water on today. I can tell you Democrats said last night and into today that McCarthy didn't give them any reason to bail him out, and that's why they didn't back him up yesterday. 
Interesting, Jay, and I wrote down this note that Rachel Scott sent. She said, you know, those offices essentially are a gesture of respect. Clearly, that respect is gone. Uh, Selena, to you, uh, President Biden's request for Congress to pass more funding for Ukraine now hangs in limbo. So what is he saying about all of this? There's a really candid moment today when President Biden said he's worried about the future of aid to Ukraine. In the past, he's only ever expressed confidence, saying that, look, there is bipartisan support in Congress. But look, there's no love loss between former Speaker McCarthy and President Biden, especially after McCarthy launched that impeachment inquiry into Biden. But the truth is, is that it may be even harder for Biden to accomplish what he wants under the new speaker. Representative Jim Jordan, who's thrown his hat into the ring, he said he would be against moving an aid package on Ukraine if he were to become speaker. Well, McCarthy, he had at least publicly supported more aid to Ukraine, which is a White House priority. And time is running out. The White House says they only have a bit longer to currently satisfy Ukraine's battle field needs. Now, take a listen here to what else President Biden had to say about the historic vote yesterday. More than anything, we need to change the poisonous atmosphere in Washington. You know, we have strong disagreements, but we need to stop seeing each other as enemies. We have a lot of work to do, and the American people expect us to get it done. And after the press briefing today, I asked the White House press secretary if Democrats regret not backing McCarthy if Jim Jordan is the next speaker. And all she'd say is that President Biden is committed to working in a bipartisan way, but she is something that's very difficult considering the last speaker was ousted precisely for working with Democrats. Kena. Interesting. Jay O'Brien and Selena Wang, our thanks to both of you. Also now, the man charged with the murder of rapper Tupac Shakur appearing in court today, Dwayne Keefe D. Davis, requesting that his arraignment be continued so that his lawyer can be present. That hearing is now set for later this month. Prosecutors say the 60-year-old Davis was the mastermind behind the 1996 drive-by shooting near the Las Vegas Strip that killed Tupac. Prosecutors say they're not accusing Davis of pulling the trigger but they say he orchestrated the killing of Tupac and provided the murder weapon. Davis is being held with no bail. And now to the largest health care strike in U.S. history. More than 75,000 workers at Kaiser Permanente, a massive insurer and health care system operator, have walked off the job, and they've hit the picket line instead. This is after their contract expired on Saturday without a new deal. Thousands of patients now directly impacted across hundreds of Kaiser Permanente facilities. You see the map there, California, Oregon, Colorado, Washington State, Virginia, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. Uh, ABC's Melissa Adan is live along those picket lines. She's here in Los Angeles for us. And Melissa, thank you for being with us. You know, Kaiser says there's been some progress with these agreements. Uh, they talked about several proposals long through the night. But what are these sticking points for the people on the ground that you're talking with today? Uh, definitely, Kena, good to be here with you. So first and foremost, wages, right? That's something that so many people have been talking to us about. They're really stressing the importance of inflation being a rising factor. And then, of course, just the amount of what's been added onto their job. Because the other big concern for them are the staffing challenges. They feel so short-staffed. They say that it's impacting them because people are working double, triple, taking on extra loads and it is overwhelming, so much so. I spoke with a nurse who was here on the picket lines herself. She's telling me that she is so frustrated because it's something that these staffing levels, they felt it during the pandemic and they're feeling it again. She says she doesn't know how much more they can squeeze out of her and her colleagues. Have a listen. But if you don't take care of yourself, yeah. who's gonna take care of us? It feels stressful because, you know, um, I have coworkers that can't even get the time off to go to their own proper appointment because, you know, there's staffing needs. So definitely frustration there, Kena, that you can hear from the people. And it's something that we keep hearing from so many of these strikes, Kena. And Melissa, so far, what do you know about what Kaiser Permanente has come to the table with in terms of meeting their demands? Right. So they were negotiating, right? This is on Saturday. That's kind of when the contract expired and they gave that authorization to then go on strike for these next three days. And where they left at was that increase. Like the union wants those starting wages when you think about, let's say, a receptionist or an entry level, a technician of a sort. They want those entry level wages to start at $25 an hour. That is shy of the $21. So $4 difference that Kaiser offered. Then also they're looking into annual increases uh, for wages. They were pushing for a 6 to 7 percent. Kaiser proposed a 4 percent cap to that. Kena. 
Okay, Melissa, and you know, you know better than anyone, it's been the summer of strikes here in California. We're also seeing the hotel workers on strike. Uh, you were out there actually covering several other major movements, including the auto workers strike. Uh, we've covered the SAG-AFTRA and WGA strikes as well. Are you talking to people that perhaps feel energized and even, you know, happy about the deals they've seen so far in some of these strikes? And that's a great word, Kena. They're definitely energized, right? I've seen the people out here really in good spirits, and they tell me that this is solidarity for them. I was speaking, actually, one was a nurse, one her friend was a receptionist. Another one said, they were like, this is just uh, my sibling that's out here with us. They're like, we're using all of these other unions, they say, as an example, that if they can get what they want, we saw it with the writers, it took them several months, but they got something going. They feel like hopefully they here can too. A lot of the same exact feeling. And I'm telling you, Kena, every time I've done an interview with someone, the same sentiment is that people feel like they're not being heard, they're not being seen. So they feel like all of this is that perfect opportunity to be seen and heard. Kena. All right, Melissa Adan, our thanks to you. And now to Donald Trump back in court in New York today for day three of his civil fraud trial. The former president once again attacking New York Attorney General Letitia James and the entire Justice Department again for what he calls corruption. The judge overseeing this civil case issuing a gag order against him yesterday after he made disparaging posts on social media about a member of the judge's staff. Now this $250 million lawsuit brought by the AG accuses Trump of lying about his wealth and inflating the value of his properties by more than two billion dollars. ABC News senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky is live outside that courthouse in lower Manhattan for us again. So Aaron, thank you for being here. What happened in court today and what did you hear again from the former president who has not been shy about taking to that mic? No, not at all. In fact, he spent the last three days here at Court Cana when he didn't necessarily have to be here, but he said he, he wanted to make sure that he could explain how, in his words, corrupt this whole case is. A and he has repeated some of those grievances and some of that anger uh, during his appearances in the hallway, taking aim specifically at the woman who brought the case, New York Attorney General Letitia James. So she brought the case under the statute that had never been used for a thing like this before, ever. We're not entitled to a jury, because if I had a jury, even though it's in New York, and I think I'd be fine with New York, but if I had a jury, we'd win this case very easily, but I don't have a jury. The way this case is charged, though, Kena, the, it really isn't jury eligible. Cases involving monetary damages typically go before a jury. But when the, the government is seeking injunctive relief, the way the attorney general is, and seeking to bar Trump from operating a business in New York again, that's usually reserved for a bench trial before a judge can. Right. And Aaron, how is the attorney general responding to these criticisms from Trump? Letitia James stood in the exact same spot where, where Trump has been standing for the last three days and denounced his rhetoric. Take a listen. I will not be bullied. And so Mr. Trump is no longer here. The Donald Trump show is over. This was nothing more than a political stunt, a fundraising stop. And now we can continue to go forward with our trial, and we are confident that justice will be served. So the attorney general is confident not only in her case, but, but also in the attorneys that are now presenting it before the judge. And, and today they uh, had another witness on the stand, another accountant, who testified that it was Trump who had ultimate responsibility for the financial statements that the judge has already determined, Kena, were fraudulent. All right, now passing the buck to his organization there. Aaron, thank you so much for your reporting. We appreciate it. Also now to President Biden today announcing that he is canceling another $9 billion in student loan debt. It comes as borrowers are bracing for these payments. They're going to restart after this three-year pause during the pandemic. The president says that this latest round of loan forgiveness will help 125,000 borrowers across America. This kind of relief is life-changing for individuals and their families. But it's good for our economy as a whole as well. By freeing millions of Americans from the crushing burden of student debt, it means they can go and get their lives in order. They can think about buying a house. They can start a business. They can be starting a family. 
says that they are conducting what they call fixes to a broken student loan system. All right, coming up next here, the urgent mission underway to stop the saltwater threat to Louisiana's water supply, putting millions of people in danger. We'll be right back. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. And welcome back. Louisiana officials right now are scrambling to stop a water crisis. The mighty Mississippi River is at risk of having its water supply become undrinkable. The river's levels are so low that salt water from the Gulf of Mexico is seeping into it and then could soon pollute the water systems of more than a million people. ABC News Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z is in New Orleans with the latest. It's been months since Mitch Jurisich and 4,000 others in Southern Plaquemines Parish have been able to confidently use the water that comes out of their taps. We got the word on June 19th that the chloride level had risen from like 250 to 700 and something parts per million overnight. Wow. It sparked, you know, panic. Chloride is salt that came up from the Gulf of Mexico into their water. People don't realize just how important the commodity water is to us, but when you see it shut down schools, businesses, changing people's lives. Mitch lives about an hour south of New Orleans, but the salt water is now moving up that river. More than a million people in New Orleans are now within 19 days of salt water polluting their water supply for the first time since 1988. Unfortunately, the last two years, we've seen those flows be low enough to where the Gulf of Mexico has started to creep into the state. Historically low river levels, sinking land, a rising sea, and a constantly changing river structure are all making this slow-moving disaster. Earlier this summer, the Army Corps of Engineers built a sill. It's basically an underwater barrier to keep the saltwater out. But that sill overtopped, and just last week, they had to start building it higher. While they work on building up that sill, they are barging in water. This barge came from upriver where it grabbed a half a million gallons of fresh water, then brought it down here, pumped it into the water treatment facility so they can dilute the salt water that they're taking in. It's a 24-7 operation. They've also brought in reverse osmosis machines that can desalinate the water. These are the band-aids. These are temporary fixes. We need to revamp all of our water plants. Water leaves, so does the quality of life. I'm here at the base of the Jackson Square steps. People know these pretty well. That Mississippi River on an average year, 
puts water right up to here. When it's flooding, it's way over them. And so this is a good marker to tell you we are really low. And that's why New Orleans and the Sewer and Water Board tells me that they are moving forward to build a pipeline. This is wild, Cana, where that pipeline would take fresh water from 12 miles up and pump it to their water treatment plant. That's expensive. And they're going to have to move really fast to beat this salt water. And unfortunately, even though more than half of this state is in the highest level of drought, it's not about getting rain here. This is fascinating, but 90% of the water levels at the southern Mississippi are driven by the Missouri, Ohio, and north branch of the Mississippi River. That's where we need rain, and unfortunately, the local hydrologist tells me it would take weeks to get here, and we've got to shift the pattern. Doesn't look good in the next month. They're hoping for a shift in November. Kena. Oh, wow. Ginger Z, our thanks to you. I've stood on those steps so many times. I know exactly what she's talking about. Uh, coming up next here, it is the WNBA matchup that you have been waiting for. We take you behind the scenes with New York Liberty's superstar players when we come back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Okay, so the WNBA Finals are set to kick off this weekend. The New York Liberty looking to bring their first championship home to the Big Apple. What stands between those ladies and a trophy? Yeah, it's the defending champs, the Las Vegas Aces. GMA3's Eva Pilgrim sat down with four of the superstars from this, if you will, super team to talk about their hopes for a title, their growing bond, and the future of women's hoops. It's a showdown of the super teams for this year's WNBA Finals. The Las Vegas Aces, the defending champs, versus the New York Liberty. Vandersloot, she got it. We've never won a championship. We came together for one goal, and that's to win a championship. In the offseason, these ladies helped turn the franchise and the WNBA world upside down, sparking a transformation unseen in the history of the league. <laughs> This year's WNBA MVP, Brianna Stewart, alongside John Quell Jones and Courtney Vandersloot, joining Sabrina Ionescu in New York with one goal in mind, to win. What the Liberty was able to do in free agency is something that really hasn't happened that much in the WNBA. The ability for players to kind of move where they want and, and figure that out. We're coming together for a number of reasons. How did it all start? Did someone text someone and say, hey, I want you to come here? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. Just express the vision that I had, but also 
knowing what we could accomplish if we all came here together, just who we are as people and understanding that there's going to be a lot of sacrifice to come together and, and want to win and having so many great players on the court. We all have to, you know, be at the right with the right mindset and, and having the same goals and I believe we all shared that vision. All of us just are really competitive so we expect a lot from ourselves first of all and then of each other as well. It's easy to speak to somebody when you know that they have the same level of drive as you and same, same passion for the game. The star power on the court bringing big expectations to the Big Apple and big ratings. Got it. Plus the foul. This season, the most watched regular season across the league's networks in over 20 years. Let's talk about kind of the state of women's basketball at the moment. It's pretty exciting. All-time high viewership, record sponsorship, attendance is crazy high. When you see that, what do you think? We've been trying to get people to see what we do on the court and come out to games, and, and now it's it's finally um, being put in that spotlight. It's exactly what the WNBA deserves. It's what women's sports deserves. Just continuing to fight for equality and know that this is bigger than just us here in, in New York and in Brooklyn, but we're trying to really change the game in a broader sense. Now our league is in a position to have a lot of firsts in, in knowing that we're part of that and bringing that here in New York City with a great crowd that we've been able to draw every single night. And then we've been a part of that change and excited to see where it's going to go into the playoffs as well. It's a lot of pressure. No? Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, you know, we kind of put a target on our back when we decided, I think, in the offseason to all come here. And people are, I don't think we started the, the super team narrative, but that name kind of, you know, followed us around. You know, we're, we've enjoyed it. The move paying off. After five consecutive losing seasons, the Liberty punching their ticket to the finals. Dominant performance to get the job done. Something is definitely brewing. And these ladies are determined to bring the first WNBA title to New York. Yonescu connects on the other end. You want to win the championship? Yes. yes. <laughs> if we don't, then, yeah, not the outcome we wanted. All right, that starts on the 8th. So exciting. And our thanks to Eva for that story. We have a lot more ahead here on ABC News Live. In today's big story, the race to find a new speaker heats up with prominent Republicans throwing their hats in the ring. I'll speak with Republican Congressman from Arkansas, Bruce Westerman, on who he believes can handle the job and unite the Republicans. And in our spotlight, more than 75,000 healthcare workers walk off the job, marking the largest healthcare worker strike in history. Our panel weighs in just ahead. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. All right, Speaker Showdown on Capitol Hill and a historic vote to oust Kevin McCarthy. I'm Kena Whitworth here in Los Angeles, and that's today's big story. The race to find a speaker growing more urgent by the hour. Now, which Republicans are jockeying for the job? I'll speak with Republican Congressman from Arkansas, Bruce Westerman, about the battle for the gavel and who he believes can unite the Republicans. And in our spotlight, America on strike. More than 75,000 health care workers walk off the job after their contract expires expired on Saturday, their demands and what it means for patients straight ahead. And of course, we start with our big story here. Kevin McCarthy's run as House Speaker has come to an end. He is the first speaker in U.S. history to be voted out. And now lawmakers are concerned about the potential impact and the consequences of having a vacant speakership with some Republicans already throwing their hats into the ring to fill that role. So joining me now is our Republican representative from Arkansas, Bruce Westerman. And Bruce, thank you so much for being here with us today. And you know, a lot of us watched you speak uh, on the House floor yesterday. And some things that stood out to me, I want to mention, you asked your fellow Republicans before they voted. Will your vote make America stronger? Will your vote strengthen conservative policies? And you ask them to really think about their votes. So I'm really curious as your thoughts where we sit here today and why you voted to keep McCarthy. Well, I think Kevin McCarthy was leading our Republican conference in the right direction and doing a great job. Uh, it's very unfortunate that what happened yesterday happened. Uh, but the fact is it happened and here we are today we're still in a country that's got uh skyrocketing debt we've got uh, this window to november 17th until we run out of funding again uh, we've got uh, migrants pouring across the southern border creating havoc in uh, many of our cities across the country uh, huge amounts of fentanyl coming in and uh, killing many americans every day the problems haven't gone away but we're at a, with a lack of leadership in the House right now. We don't have a Speaker of the House. And uh, it's unfortunate that what happened happened, but now we've got to figure out how to move forward, how to lead our country, and how to get back to the, to the task at hand. You know, we were uh, supposed to be here, Kena, this week doing appropriation bills uh, on a, what was going to be a tight schedule to get them done before November 17th. Uh, now we've had this huge disruption uh, that's stopped action on the House floor. A speaker's race isn't something that just happens like running for class president. Uh, there's uh, you got to give people time to contact members to make their case uh, to the conference. And then you've got to get the votes on the floor. You saw what happened in January with Speaker McCarthy, who got over 200 votes in our conference, and it took 15 votes for him to get elected on the House floor. I think that's only been complicated now. And uh, we've got to, you, you mentioned, how do we unite? 
we've got to unite as a conference so that we can unite behind a leader that can move us forward uh, to take this country where we need to be. Certainly. And let's talk about moving forward. Let's talk about who can possibly unite the Republicans. A number of people here throwing their hats into the ring. That includes Louisiana Representative Steve Scalise and also Ohio Representative Jim Jordan, who is, of course, a Trump ally. Uh, in your opinion, can either of these lawmakers really do the job and unite the Republican Party? I think both of them can if the Republican Party would unite to begin with. Uh, the problem is not that Kevin McCarthy couldn't lead a united party. He actually led a, uh, a party with a lot of divisions in it better than I think anybody could lead it. And it's hard to lead people who don't want to be led. And that's what we've got to do as a Republican conference. We have to come together and figure out what it is that draws us together. You know, I thought that was fiscal responsibility and securing our border, yet Speaker McCarthy put a bill on the floor that 21 Republicans voted against. So it's gonna be one of those, uh, uh, and it's probably gonna take several meetings for us to come together and decide what it is we really want, what we can unite around, and who's gonna be the person that leads us forward in doing that. Well, in your opinion, who is that person? Well, I think that's a discussion that we've got to have. Steve Scalise would be like the natural progression uh, for that. Jim Jordan's a great guy. I think there's others that have uh, said they're interested in it as well. But it's not something that um, I can answer here, and I don't think it's the pertinent question right now. I think the pertinent question is how are Republicans going to come together? Are there rule changes that need to happen? Is there uh, some other mechanism that needs to be in place so that whoever the speaker is can actually lead and govern? whoever that speaker is can actually lead and govern. I, I want to ask you this. Do you support some of these calls from lawmakers uh, like Representative Don Bacon and former House Speaker Newt Gingrich to expel Matt Gates uh, from the GOP conference? Do you support that idea? Well, he's still got to vote, and that's the, that's the issue. It doesn't matter what your conference rules are or who are it, who's in your conference, as long as they're voting on the floor and not being a, a team player and trying to push the Republican agenda forward, um, it, I don't know that it makes any difference whether you have them in the conference or out of the conference. The goal has to be is to unite our conference, to bring people together. Um, mm -hmm. Somehow we've got to figure out how to stop the divisions, get more unity in the party, get more unity in the conference uh, so that we can move forward a very aggressive agenda, which is what Kevin McCarthy was doing. He had success after success and now all of that's on hold because uh, we had this motion to vacate the chair. It created a huge disruption. It's uh, like I said in my floor speech, it is not going to advance any kind of conservative policies and it's not good for America right now, but I've got faith that we're gonna get through it and get to a point where we are doing the things that are best for the American people. I mean, you certainly have a lot of conservative Americans that are looking at the Republican Party right now and hoping that you can come together and move forward and get some things done. And so let me ask you this. If your new speaker is in this similar position as McCarthy, right, where they would have to work with the Democrats uh, to, and work with President Biden even to keep the government open, as you mentioned, that day is close, quickly approaching. Do you think that the Republican Party will be able to stand behind this new speaker if they have to do some of those things, like work with Democrats? That's the big question we have to answer. And <clears throat> that's where Pres or, uh, Speaker McCarthy was hamstrung. He, um, he had all these different factions. We had a, an overwhelming majority of our conference that had a direction we wanted to go in, that we wanted to use what leverage we had. We wanted to pro, uh, put the policies out there that are conservative, that are policies that are good for America, and use those in the debate and the negotiations. Uh, but apparently that wasn't good enough and uh, I don't think we're any better off today than we were yesterday. We're actually worse off today than we were yesterday. And we're gonna have to figure out how to get unified around those core conservative principles uh, and give that message to America and put those votes on the board and give somebody the authority to go talk to the Senate, go talk to the White House and say, here's where we are we see where you are, how do we come together to do what's best for the country? And that's exactly what Kevin McCarthy uh, has been doing the whole time and doing a great job at it. It's again, just unfortunate uh, that he was kicked out of the speaker's chair. 
Well, Representative Westerman, uh, we will, of course, be keeping a close eye on this, and we certainly appreciate your time on a very busy day today. Thank you so much. And I want to bring this big story now uh, to our panel. So joining us today is ABC News contributor Mike Muse, ABC News political contributor and former Republican representative for Virginia, Barbara Comstock, ABC News political contributor and former Democratic senator for North Dakota, Heidi Heitkamp, along with ABC News' Catherine Falders. And so again, we're, you're joining me on this uh, historic day here. Barbara, let's start with you. We just heard uh, from this Republican representative there, Bruce Westerman. Uh, do you think that they actually have the ability to unify the Republican conference here? Is, is It was almost as if he was saying, you know, the speakership wasn't the problem. It, it was everyone else in the Republican Party. And we're focusing so much on these eight votes and maybe not looking across the board at all the other votes that tried to keep them in. Well, right. And, you know, Bruce is one of those serious people who actually legislates and gets things done. So, you know, I feel his pain. Um, yeah. uh, but, you know, I think when you look at the two who've announced thus far, you know, Steve Scalise does have a lot of goodwill across the entire mm -hmm. conference. You know, he was somebody, you know, when you pass legislation, regardless of what part of the party you were from, he sent you a cookie, you know, he was always trying to help whatever, you know, part of the party you were from. Um, you know, and I think it contrasts with um, Jim Jordan, who actually, I don't think Jim has ever passed a bill. Um, he, uh, maybe he did a post office, but he's not certainly not passed legislation. Um, even uh, Matt Gates was attacking him for how bad those hearings went recently. Um, so he's not really, and, and Jim isn't somebody who really understands all the variety of membership across the spectrum of the party. So certainly from the two announced candidates, it makes a lot more sense to have somebody who's been in that position, but also somebody who has not, you know, is, is well liked and has not really had a lot of enemies throughout his time in leadership. Yeah, certainly a lot less divisive. Uh, Catherine, to you, ABC is reporting that Republican lawmakers are having these closed door meetings. So what are you hearing there from lawmakers on the Hill? Who is poised to, you know, succeed McCarthy here? Yeah, and Barbara knows this well from her time up there. There's been a lot of closed door meetings on Capitol Hill uh, today. Obviously, you've seen Jim Jordan throw his hat in the ring. You've seen Steve Scalise, the Republican leader, throw his hat in the ring here. Uh, it's an interesting dynamic. You see Jordan with, with reporters up there earlier today saying uh, that he plans to throw his hat in the ring and he wants the conference to support him. Jordan is a close McCarthy ally here. Uh, of course, Scalise is too. Uh, I talked to a lot of Republicans up there today who say they're going to start making calls for Jim Jordan. But I think I think the question here is who can really get to 218? I've heard from a lot of Republicans mm -hmm. that they don't think that they have that number, that they have that number uh, to elect the next speaker. I know that they want to do this next week. It seems, again, from talking to members up there, that this is not really going to happen uh, next week. I could totally be wrong. Uh, things can change in the House at any second. Uh, but again, I think it's what happens next? Obviously, they're up there huddling. And do they really get this done by next week? A huge question, right? Potential vote on Wednesday. Uh, Heidi, to you, obviously, yesterday we witnessed these Democrats band together to oust McCarthy. And now we're hearing today that you know, he thought he might actually get support from the likes of Nancy Pelosi. That did not happen. What are the consequences here for the Democratic Party? I don't think there's any consequences. There's a consequence for the country, and that is I look forward or in, in, in into the future, into the, the funding of government and this cliff that we have, and I don't know if there's one person in the Republican caucus conference that can, in fact, deliver a deal. And so this is really, for, for them, they've got a huge image problem after what happened yesterday. But we, as a country, have a huge governing problem because they seem ungovernable and mm -hmm. unwilling to cross the aisle to get Democratic support, and that seems to be the kiss of death. And so this has consequences much more for the Republican conference, for the image that they're projecting, and for governing the country. And I hope they get it together because we need to get a budget done. Right. And Mike, to you on that note of an image problem here, right? There was a, a someone said yesterday, you know, a lot of Americans may not understand the minutia of what happened, but they definitely understand the headlines. And in all likelihood, they're going to blame Republicans. 
they absolutely are going to blame the Republicans because what's going to happen, this path doesn't get any easier for the Republican Party at hand. Because of the fact of the image, they have to figure out who they are as a Republican Party. And whether we like it or not, those eight individuals who voted to oust Kevin McCarthy is going to wield a lot of power within the GOP caucus. Whoever goes up for the speakership is going to have to negotiate with those eight and really one person who is Matt Gates to determine what is it that they want in a speaker in order to create opportunities for legislation to move forward out of the caucus in order for it to even have any bipartisan impact. You have to look at a Republican like Matt, like Representative Lawler, who is more the moderate, who is actually angry with this eight. And so how do you reconcile the moderate wing of Republican Party who are angry with this eight in order to advance one to get 218 votes. The math is challenging. The math is challenging. A lot of things are challenging in this moment. You're absolutely right, Mike. Uh, Mike, Barbara, Heidi, and Catherine, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate it. And coming up next here, uh, the largest strike of healthcare workers in U.S. history. Who is answering the call button in hospitals with 75,000 workers on the picket lines today? Whenever news breaks. To crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Spotlight today, the largest healthcare strike in U.S. history. More than 75,000 workers today walking off the job at Kaiser Permanente, a massive insurer and healthcare system operator. And this, of course, after their contract expired on Saturday. The talks between union leaders and company executives failed to reach this new deal. I want to bring in our panel here to discuss this. Mike, Barbara, Heidi, and back with us is Melissa Adon, who is actually on the picket lines uh, there in Los Angeles for us. So thank you all for being with us. And Melissa, we'll start with you. You know, you've been covering the story. What are you hearing from some of those striking workers right now? 
Uh, Kena, it's definitely frustration. This is something that we've been hearing and seeing for so many of these other union that we've also been covering. When it comes to the Kaiser workers, you're thinking about nurses, you're thinking about lab techs, you're thinking about even the receptionists, all part of this coalition of unions together. One of the nurses I spoke with says that they feel like the short staffed and the staffing issues that they're experiencing is so frustrating. She says it's pushing herself and so many others to the brink that she's worried that folks may not come back or return for their job. And this is critical. She says she wants to be inside the hospital, not outside here on a picket line. So that's where just so much of that frustration is coming from. And then, of course, it's the other argument that people telling me, you know, like a receptionist that was working here, she says, can I be paid a fair wage with inflation, with so many other things. So, Kena, top of mind, of course, those staffing issues and those wages. Right, Melissa, thank you. And Barbara, too, you know, we've seen these recent strikes, obviously, in several different industries over this last year. That includes the writers and actors right here on the West Coast. Uh, we saw President Biden and former President Trump with the auto workers in Michigan just last week. You know, a lot of Republicans for decades sort of campaigned on weakening organized labor unions. So the climate is really different now. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think this is really mixing it up, um, but, you know, between the parties and people are really talking about this differently. Post-pandemic, there's really mm. a different world now that I think both parties have to address differently about wages and about how to deal with uh, unions and workers. You know, we have a worker shortage, you know, hours that people want to work. And, you know, I think immigration is an issue on how we're going to have enough workers, but also um, giving people, you know, better wages and, and hours. Mm -hmm. So I think they're, but but also that we have these strikes and that we're not dealing with them well and that we need to do better on this is, a, I think, a challenge to both parties to address it a little bit differently than either party has, has dealt with over history. And, and I, I don't think either party's been doing very well with it. Well, no, and of course, when we're seeing, you know, record housing prices and inflation keeps creeping yeah, up, it's um, harder yeah. and harder. Yeah. Uh, so, Heidi, to you, you know, Democrats typically have been supportive of unionized labor. President Biden, as you meant, you know, he joined the picket lines. Was a, He made history by doing that just outside Detroit. Uh, does that support, though, have a limit? I don't think so. I think when you look at where the organized labor movement is today and where labor is today, they're basically saying we're getting squeezed. Not only, and you heard this from the workers, not only are we getting squeezed um, monetarily, we're being expected, especially in healthcare, to work even harder. And so this isn't just about wages, it's about work conditions, it's yeah. about not having enough workers. And if ever you're going to advance your cause, you do it when supply demand works for you, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a low supply of workers and a high demand. And so this should surprise no one that people are on the picket line. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think it is surprising anyone, right, at this time. So, Mike, too, you know, healthcare workers have endured so much during the pandemic. They're right now, they're asking for a minimum wage of $25 an hour and increased staffing. I want to point out to everyone that last week in California, the state raised a minimum wage for fast food workers to $20 an hour. So what is your thought on the nurses' arguments here? And I'm just going to throw it out there. That, like, I remember the names of the nurses when I was delivering my baby. You know, I mean, they are so important. I know, Kana, when you put that into the context of you're basically saying to these healthcare workers that their job is valued at the same of a fast food. Now, I love Chipotle, I love my McDonald's, but that isn't a life-saving moment or place or establishment. What they're saying is that we are working at a life-saving institution. Yeah. And so the stress that is on that, the, the playing God, in essence, uh, that comes with it, they're saying they deserve uh, the quality of pay for the quality of work that they're doing to ensure uh, that their patients get incredible care and incredible service. And you would want that. Uh, when you go to get medical help, someone who feels uh, valued. Right, and you know these medical workers feel that too. They, they've said it's going to be a three-day strike because they, they know how important their jobs are. Uh, Mike, Barbara, Heidi, and Melissa, thank you all for this discussion. Uh, coming up next here in our last call, you know <laughs> the purple dinosaur? Dinosaur? Yeah, I know, I know. Well, he's headed back to the big screen, and it might surprise you how the new film is being described. Yes, yes, we're talking about Barney. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Whit Johnson, reporting from Maui. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. for that song <laughs> love it or hate it it is time now for our last call hot on the heels of barbie's billion dollar summer blockbuster the iconic purple dinosaur from our childhood is now making a comeback and it is not for the toddler set here mattel films and oscar winning actor daniel kalua producing a new barney live action film that mattel's ceo says will be fun entertaining and culturally oriented and not odd by the way, uh, I want to bring back our panel. So, uh, Mike, first of all, back in July, I know, uh, Mattel Films told, <laughs> told the New York Magazine, get it together, uh, that, that this would lean on the millennial angst of the property. They're kind of walking that back now, but that makes me laugh. <laughs> Kana, please go to Barbara on this one. I don't even want to address it. I don't even want to take it. I am triggered. I am perplexed. I am confused. How is this for millennial adults and not for kids? I, I, I don't even know how that's even possible, but I'm intrigued. I'll go see it out of curiosity. I think we should go together as a group. <laughs> Oh, that's a good idea. Barbara, are you in? I mean, do you think they can make this somehow appeal to an older audience? Uh, no, yeah, my, my kids, it was my kids' age, but I, I still liked Winnie the Pooh and uh, the classics, you know, Peter Rabbit, uh, you know, Paddington Bear. Never was a big Barney fan. <laughs> I hear you on that. Uh, Heidi? Yeah, what's your take on well, this? Well, I'm telling you, you know, the culture warriors have come after Barbie and Taylor Swift. I think Barney better watch out because they're coming for him next. Look out, Barney. So, so, Catherine, one of my favorite things that they said that they are walking back a little bit, though, is that they're talking about the trials and turbulations of being a 30-something in this. I don't know. I'm with everybody else because there's been so much said about this movie. You just said it. It's, it's odd. It's not going to be about millennial angst. I think I just need to go see it. So maybe we can table the conversation and talk about it later. Kana, okay, do you think Bar like is Barney in therapy, Kana? Like, what is this? <laughs> I mean, you're the one that's triggered, Mike. Maybe. 
Mike is triggered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are amazing. That's it for our last call in this half hour. Mike, Barbara, Heidi, thanks to all of you and Barney, I guess. Uh, thank you so much for streaming with us. I'm Kana Whitworth. Follow ABC News Live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories and the impact they have on you. The news never stops, neither do we. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the nation's capital, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles, and right now on ABC News Live, chaos on Capitol Hill. The House making history, ousting Kevin McCarthy from his speakership. McCarthy announcing he will not run again. So now, who is jockeying to replace him? We are live on Capitol Hill. And America on strike. More than 75,000 health care workers walk off the job. The workers' demands and what it means for patients. And reclaimed, we look at the new podcast highlighting the forgotten stories of Negro League baseball players. The host, Vanessa Ivy Rose, joins us live. But of course, we begin with our top story, the House paralyzed from the unprecedented chaos on the Capitol. The historic ousting of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy by far right members of his own party grinding the chamber to a halt. The House floor, you see it there, sitting empty today with no permanent speaker. Some Republicans are vying for that job as GOP members face the difficult task of uniting around a successor. House Majority Leader Steve Scalise is now in line for that role, but he is already facing a challenge from Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio, a favorite among some conservatives who publicly announced his bid today. So joining us now is ABC's chief Washington correspondent, John Carl. Uh, he's in our D.C. bureau, along with ABC News' Jay O'Brien, who's on the Hill, and ABC News senior White House correspondent, Selena Wang. Thank you all so much for being here with us. And John, you know, we're already seeing some of these Republicans come out with these new demands for whoever replaces McCarthy. What are they saying? I mean, here we go again. Uh, you have uh, McCarthy went through this process in January 
where, you know, everybody, he, you know, he needed every vote he could possibly get, and people started making demands, and he started offering just about everything he had to offer, including the thing that ultimately brought him down. So we're hearing demands from people on the far right. There was a, a demand that was issued uh, by a, uh, a Republican congresswoman from Florida that whoever the speaker be, the, the speaker candidate be, uh, would have to promise to defund the investigations into Donald Trump. Uh, defund Jack Smith and the special counsel and immediately move to have a vote of impeachment against uh, Joe Biden. So you have those kind of demands on the right, but the moderates have demands, too. And one of the demands uh, that, that, that some of the moderates uh, are, are talking about is they want to do away with this idea that a single person could file a motion to vacate. They think it makes the House too unstable. They point to what just happened uh, with Kevin McCarthy and Matt Gates. Uh, so you're going to see a range of demands and whoever is ultimately going to win this race will probably realize that giving in to all the demands is actually not the way you become an effective speaker. No, in fact, it could pave the way to your demise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Jay, you know, McCarthy, he faced threats to his speakership, I mean, from the moment he clenched the gavel, but I think even well before that. So will this Republican infighting continue to surround the next speaker? Well, that's the conversation being had right now in the House Republican Conference, Kena. I can tell you, lawmakers we were talking to today said they are concerned that because of the current temperature in the House Republican Conference, that they will not be able to coalesce around a speaker candidate by early next week. One, Representative Garrett Graves said that it almost got so heated on the House floor yesterday that he could have seen things turning physical. And he said everyone's got to go home, which they are for the right of latter part of this week and decompress before they can get back in a room on Tuesday, which is the plan, and hear from those candidates who are vying to be the speaker. So the temperature is high right now in the House Republican Conference, and as you and John were just saying, there are different factions here that have a lot of demands. Stepping up now are the moderates who want to get rid of that motion to vacate that ousted McCarthy. And Selena, to you, you know, President Biden's request for Congress to pass more funding to Ukraine now hangs in limbo. What is he saying about that? Well, in a really candid moment today, President Biden said, quite frankly, he's worried about the future of aid to Ukraine. In the past, he's only ever expressed confidence, saying there's support, bipartisan support in Congress. And look, there's no love lost between President Biden and former Speaker McCarthy, especially after McCarthy launched that impeachment inquiry into Biden. But the reality is, is that the next speaker may be harder to work with than McCarthy was. McCarthy at least publicly supported more aid to Ukraine, which is a key Biden priority. Others who've thrown their hats into the ring, like Representative Jim Jordan have said that he's against sending more aid to Ukraine. President Biden today also slamming the infighting among Republicans. He called the atmosphere in Washington poisonous, and he said that even though there's disagreements among both sides, they need to stop seeing each other as enemies. And I asked today during the press briefing the White House press secretary if Democrats regret not backing McCarthy if someone like Jim Jordan were to become the next speaker. And her response was only that President Biden is committed to working in a bipartisan way no matter what. But that's a difficult task considering McCarthy was ousted for working with Democrats. Certainly. And John, you know, back to you. Rick Klein to me yesterday said this whole thing had Donald Trump's fingerprints all over it, right? As if he's the puppeteer right now of the Republican Party. But now, tell us what you're hearing about the possibility that former President Trump, he's saying that people are calling him about actually holding this speakership position? Well, first of all, I would always listen to Rick Klein on, on these things. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's just rule number one. Uh, but, but secondly, um, th th this is a little bit of a case of deja vu. Uh, back, I'm going to answer your question, but first, some context. Uh, back in January, when McCarthy went through his 15 rounds of balloting, at one point, I think it was the seventh or eighth ballot, uh, Matt Gates voted for uh, Donald Trump. And it was the only vote he got. Uh, there was laughter in the, mm. uh, in, in, in the chamber when it happened. And then he did it again, still only one vote. And then finally, in the second to last round of voting, uh, Gates went further and he officially nominated Donald Trump to be Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. And again, only one person voted for him. So uh, yes, uh, 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 people close to Trump, uh, Trump himself are you know, talking about how, well, a lot of people are saying it should be Donald Trump, because remember, the Speaker of the House doesn't have to be a member of the House. And Donald Trump could do this in a, in a temporary basis to get everything in line. It is not going to happen. Um, 
We saw uh, this, this, uh, this idea put forward back in January, and again, the only person in the history of the Congress that's ever voted for Donald Trump to be speaker was Matt Gates. Interesting. And that is really good and important <laughs> context there, yeah. John. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, John, Jay O'Brien, and Selena Wang. We really appreciate your time. Uh, and now we're going to go back to this largest health care strike in U.S. history. More than 75,000 workers today walking off the job at Kaiser Permanente, which is a massive insurer and healthcare system operator. And this happened after their contract expired Saturday. Uh, talks between union leaders and company executives failed to reach this new deal. So joining me right now is Caitlin Donovan, the senior director director for the National Patient Advocate Foundation. So thank you for being with us. And first of all, you know, what is the impact on patients first when there's a strike like this? Small, the strike usually works into account that patients need, still need care. So they make mm -hmm. sure there are people there for the next three days who can handle critical and emergency conditions. Yeah, and we're hearing from some people that were able to actually have their appointments today and, and others that weren't. But, you know, a lot of people on the picket line say this big sticking point is staffing. Uh, it's nurses that are saying they're overworked, they're underpaid. That's something that we hear across the country. And they're advocating, you know, not just for themselves, but they're advocating for better care for their patients in doing this. Absolutely. And, you know, for a lot of patients, the nurses are the frontline person at the hospital. They're the people they interact with the most and who know them as people. It's really mm -hmm. critical and patients generally understand that when nurses are short staffed, that means that quality of care goes down. This is a critical long-term issue for patient care. And it's not just the nurses that are striking here. Joining them on the picket lines are home and health aides, uh, technicians, food service workers as well. So how does that affect all the operations in the hospital? Well, the hospital is a really finely tuned ecosystem. So a patient may notice that their food gets delivered a little bit later or they have a hard time finding sheets for their bed. But what really matters to a patient is the care that they're getting and that they know that they're getting the best possible quality care. I know with Kaiser in particular, they're thinking about outsourcing some of their pharmaceutical um, work just to make sure that patients are getting their pharmacy products on time. And that's really important here. But what's long-term important are the goals that we're no longer short staffing our hospitals and all of our critical care areas so that patients can get the quality care they deserve. All right, Caitlin Donovan, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. And now to our prime preview here. Over the past couple of weeks, over 100,000 ethnic Armenian refugees have fled the disputed area of Azerbaijan. This mass exodus is now being condemned as one of the worst instances of ethnic cleansing in recent decades, though local officials in Azerbaijan deny it. ABC's Patrick Revol brings us this heartbreaking and shocking story. Two weeks ago, Azerbaijan, backed by Turkey, launched a successful military offensive to recapture the region. The enclave's Armenians then started to flee to Armenia, unwilling to live under Azerbaijan's rule. In less than a week, virtually the entire population has gone, a community that's lived there for centuries completely driven out. <laughs> These videos showing the region's capital a ghost town. Eerily empty. Like one day, you lost everything. All your history, all your memories. I lost Nagorno-Karabakh and I lost myself. I, this is uh, what I feel. I, I feel lost. And you'll see more of that. Be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. That's coming up tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern, right here on ABC News Live and streaming on Hulu. And now to Vatican City, where delegates from across the world are gathering to debate the future of the Catholic Church. Many issues on the agenda, including married priests and same-sex unions, which Pope Francis suggests could eventually be blessed by the Church. ABC News foreign correspondent James Longman is at the Vatican with that story. Hi, Kena. Yeah, the first day of this synod, this global gathering of Catholics, has now wrapped up. We know that Pope Francis addressed the group earlier today. A synod means uh, journeying together, uh, and there's a lot of talk of uh, the sort of synodian uh, quality of Pope Francis's papacy. And what that means is essentially the idea of ruling together, uh, almost. He wants to break down the ideas of hierarchy. It's a incredibly hierarchical institution, of course, the Catholic Church, 
he wants to focus more uh, on the flock and less on the shepherds. And that's why we're having uh, this synod. Uh, and for the first time, women are taking part in this and lay people as well, not just bishops uh, and other clergy. And they're going to be taking on some of the most controversial issues in the Catholic Church today, the role of women in the church, uh, also same-sex unions uh, and sex abuse scandals that have rocked the church over decades. Uh, Catholics around the world have been asking for these issues to be on the agenda. Well, they will be uh, for the next month here in Rome. Kena. All right, James Longman, our thanks to you as always. And coming up next here, oh, okay, it seems <laughs> it's not just celebrities and supermodels that are visiting Paris. We'll tell you who else uh, made an appearance or what else it is. They're crawling around Paris these days. Oh, more on that story when we come back. <laughs> Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I mean, you know that Paris is often the forefront of fashion, food, and culture, but now sightings of a new French twin, a uh, trend, I should say, uh, have people saying, you know, like, oh no, instead of ooh la la. Yeah, here's ABC's Inez de la Catera. Hey, Kana, yeah, that's right. So this really all began with some lovely videos circulating online showing bedbugs crawling out of seats on trains, on metros, at movie theaters, mostly in Paris, but in other parts of France as well. You then had the deputy mayor of Paris coming out to say that no one is safe amid a widespread rise in bedbugs, and that set off all sorts of concerns, especially in light of the upcoming Summer Olympics. You then had government officials coming out to try and reassure the public they were calling for calm you had the french health minister for instance saying that there's no reason for widespread panic he insists we haven't been invaded by bedbugs the transportation minister today meeting with representatives from several transportation outlets he also insists there is no outbreak of bedbugs in public transport but he is announcing new measures to crack down on bedbugs including the use of sniffer dogs the debate over bedbugs is also reaching the political arena Arena with the issue uh, making its way to the French National Assembly earlier this week. You had one lawmaker grilling the prime minister, calling out the government's years of inaction on bedbugs, saying that millions of French citizens were now uh, dealing with infestation, saying that they were losing sleep over bedbugs, growing paranoid and becoming socially isolated. For added drama, this one lawmaker even brought a flask filled with bedbugs with her 
to the floor of the French National Assembly. So this cer certainly is a, a hot topic uh, right now. We are expecting the government to hold additional meetings on the issue later this week. I will say I have not personally seen any bed bugs, thankfully, but I will say I do know several people who are now refusing to sit when they take the metro and are instead choosing to stand. Kena? Oh my gosh, that is harsh perspective. Inez, thank you. I feel a little itchy, actually. Um, all right, coming up next here, a woman's tribute to her grandfather, honoring his remarkable career in the Negro Baseball League when we come back. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Columbiana, Ohio, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And welcome back. There's a new podcast series from ABC News, and it's called Reclaimed, The Forgotten League. And it tells the story of a Negro baseball league through the voice of the host, Vanessa Ivy Rose. Rose is the granddaughter of Hall of Fame great outfielder Norman Turkey Stearns. His rise through the ranks of the league and his remarkable career stats. Here's a clip from the trailer. In 1947, Jackie Robinson famously broke the color line. But before that, there was a whole other chapter of American baseball, a chapter that belongs to thousands of black players who competed in a segregated league. This is not in the pages of American history books. And so countless generations of us went through our own formal educations without knowing one of the most significant chapters, not in baseball history, but in American history. Well, joining us now is the host, Vanessa Ivy Rose. Uh, Vanessa, let me just say congratulations and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. It's such an honor, it's a blessing. Of course, so Vanessa, your grandfather, Turkey Stearns, he's a Negro League legend, inducted to the National Baseball Hall of Fame, class of 2000. What has it been like for you to introduce the podcast audience to this story, which is a story, sadly, a lot of people are unaware of? It's been unbelievable. You know, he passed away in 1979, and I actually never had the chance to meet him. And I was born in 1983, so to be here in 2023, telling his story, giving him a voice, and giving a voice to all the Negro leaders who, you know, most of them have passed away, it's just truly an honor. It's, it's super fascinating, and I'm just really so honored to do this work. And tell us a little bit about your grandfather's legacy. You know, how did you learn about his activism within the sport of baseball? I was fortunate enough to have my grandmother living with me for, you know, the majority of my life. Um, she ended up passing away when she was 95. So she shared so many rich stories with me about the Negro Leagues. 
in the history of the Negro Leagues as well. And so I came to know him um, through her stories, through watching baseball with her sitting on the living room floor, uh, being introduced to the game. And then so many different historians were sharing different pieces of the puzzle, putting it together for me that really helped me understand that my granddad was not just a baseball player who was pretty good, but he was one of the greatest baseball players of all time. And that the Negro Leagues was essentially the story of America, too, as well. Right. And in your podcast, you, you compare his stats to that of Babe Ruth, which I thought was pretty good. And you, you know, you're this huge baseball fan, but you're a teacher, you're an activist. So talk about the importance of telling your grandfather's story and, and educating people about the racial prejudice and oppression that athletes over time faced. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this is a history that was buried. And, you know, when I was in school, I didn't learn about this stuff. I talked to teachers all the time who were really fascinated by this because they said they never learned it. And so we have a responsibility as educators now to make sure that everyone knows this story and that we uncover those things that were hidden intentionally due to racism and systemic oppression. So, you know, the podcast is going to open a lot of minds. I think it will open a lot of hearts, too, as well, mm -hmm. and hopefully be a transformative experience for people to, you know, learn this information and take it out into the real world and put it into practice to make this world better. Yeah, can you tell me about the plaque? Your grandfather has a plaque, but it's the placement of it that I think we should talk about. Yeah, the placement is outside, which is pretty symbolic or poetic. Essentially, it's right there in center field, which is the position that he played, but most of the players are honored within the park. So I think having the plaque outside just illustrates the um, exclusion and the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, the Negro League excluded from playing within Major League Baseball. So it's very symbolic that it's actually outside. Uh, and honestly, a lot of people don't even know that it's there. It's pretty much like it's invisible. And that's the story of the Negro Leagues, too. A lot of those players mm -hmm. were invisible in terms of American history and the story of baseball. So that's what, why the podcast is so important. It's going to make sure that there's visibility and representation and it's a fascinating story that I think every single person will be um, in awe of, to be honest. I agree. And I think, you know, a lot of people associate, you know, they think about baseball and they think about the transformative nature of baseball and they think about Jackie Robinson. And you touch on the fact that, no, there's a lot more to the Negro Leagues and baseball before Jackie Robinson. Absolutely. You know, everyone knows 42. So many people have seen the movie because mm -hmm. of Chadwick Bose, but... You know, due to Jim Crow segregation, there's thousands of black players who have incredible stories that need to be told. And in fact, there's a living Negro leaguer right now in Detroit named Ron Schoolboy Teasley. And he's a, a mm. fantastic storyteller. He's sharp as a tack. He can share his information with everyone. And I think people will really just go on a journey with him learning about his story because he's, he's really a, a living legend and a walking history lesson. Um, so, sure. you know, the beauty of the podcast is that it shares his story and many other people's stories, too, as well. If there was one thing that you would hope a listener would take away from this podcast, what is it? I would hope that people can, you know, come to this story with their hearts open, their minds mm -hmm. open, and that they will actually be transformed by the stories that they're hearing uh, so that it's not just that they're learning information and learning about the stories and then saying, okay, that's really wonderful, that's really fascinating, but actually that they would take it out into the real world and create some type of sustainable change that will bring people together. That's the beauty of baseball. It can bring everyone yes. together. That's the beauty of sports, right? So that's what I'm hoping the podcast will do. And so far, so good from everyone who's been listening to the first two episodes. It's fantastic. I was able to listen to the first one, and I sort of giggled to myself when you talked about the tradition of eating a kielbasa to start the game. I love that. So. <laughs> well, you got to come to Detroit and have kielbasa on me. Right. Okay. It's a date. Vanessa Ivy Rose, thank you so much for your time. And everybody, please listen to Reclaimed, the Forgotten League, the third season of ABC News audio series Reclaimed, uh, wherever you get your podcast. We hope that you'll check it out. And there's a lot more news ahead here on ABC News Live. And today's big story, the race to find a new speaker. It heats up with prominent Republicans throwing their hats in the ring. I'll speak with Republican Congressman from Arkansas, Bruce Westerman on who he believes can handle the job and unite Republicans. And in our spotlight, more than 75,000 healthcare workers walk off the job, marking the largest healthcare worker strike in history. Our panel weighs in next. First 
thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was his mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. All right, Speaker Showdown on Capitol Hill and a historic vote to oust Kevin McCarthy. I'm Kena Whitworth here in Los Angeles, and that's today's big story. The race to find a speaker growing more urgent by the hour. Now, which Republicans are jockeying for the job? I'll speak with Republican Congressman from Arkansas, Bruce Westerman, about the battle for the gavel and who he believes can unite the Republicans. And in our spotlight, America on strike. More than 75,000 health care workers walk off the job after their contract expires expired on Saturday, their demands and what it means for patients straight ahead. And of course, we start with our big story here. Kevin McCarthy's run as House Speaker has come to an end. He is the first speaker in U.S. history to be voted out. And now lawmakers are concerned about the potential impact and the consequences of having a vacant speakership with some Republicans already throwing their hats into the ring to fill that role. So joining me now is our Republican representative from Arkansas, Bruce Westerman. And Bruce, thank you so much for being here with us today. And you know, a lot of us watched you speak uh, on the House floor yesterday. And some things that stood out to me, I want to mention, you asked your fellow Republicans before they voted. Will your vote make America stronger? Will your vote strengthen conservative policies? And you ask them to really think about their votes. So I'm really curious as your thoughts where we sit here today and why you voted to keep McCarthy. Well, I think Kevin McCarthy was leading our Republican conference in the right direction and doing a great job. Uh, it's very unfortunate that what happened yesterday happened. Uh, but the fact is it happened and here we are today we're still in a country that's got uh, skyrocketing debt we've got uh, this window to november 17th until we run out of funding again uh, we've got uh, migrants pouring across the southern border creating havoc in uh, many of our cities across the country uh, huge amounts of fentanyl coming in and uh, killing many americans every day the problems haven't gone away but we're at a, with a lack of leadership in the House right now. We don't have a Speaker of the House. And uh, it's unfortunate that what happened happened, but now we've got to figure out how to move forward, 
how to lead our country and how to get back to the to the task at hand. You know, we were uh, supposed to be here, Kana, this week doing appropriation bills uh, on a what was going to be a tight schedule to get them done before November 17th. Uh, now we've had this huge disruption uh, that's stopped action on the House floor. A speaker's race isn't something that just happens like running for class president. Uh, there's uh, you got to give people time to contact members to make their case uh, to the conference. And then you've got to get the votes on the floor. You saw what happened in January with Speaker McCarthy, who got over 200 votes in our conference, and it took 15 votes for him to get elected on the House floor. I think that's only been complicated now. And uh, we've got to, you, you mentioned, how do we unite? We've got to unite as a conference so that we can unite behind a leader that can move us forward uh, to take this country where we need to be. Certainly. And let's talk about moving forward. Let's talk about who can possibly unite the Republicans. A number of people here throwing their hats into the ring. That includes Louisiana Representative Steve Scalise and also Ohio Representative Jim Jordan, who is, of course, a Trump ally. Uh, in your opinion, can either of these lawmakers really do the job and unite the Republican Party? I think both of them can if the Republican Party would unite to begin with. Uh, the problem is not that Kevin McCarthy couldn't lead a united party. He actually led a, uh, a party with a lot of divisions in it, better than I think anybody could lead it. And it's hard to lead people who don't want to be led. And that's what we've got to do as a Republican conference. We have to come together and figure out what it is that draws us together. You know, I thought that was fiscal responsibility and securing our border, yet Speaker McCarthy put a bill on the floor that 21 Republicans voted against. So it's gonna be one of those, uh, uh, and it's probably gonna take several meetings for us to come together and decide what it is we really want, what we can unite around, and who's gonna be the person that leads us forward in doing that. Well, in your opinion, who is that person? Well, I think that's a discussion that we've got to have. Steve Scalise would be like the natural progression uh, for that. Jim Jordan's a great guy. I think there's others that have uh, said they're interested in it as well. But it's not something that um, I can answer here, and I don't think it's the pertinent question right now. I think the pertinent question is how are Republicans going to come together? Are there rule changes that need to happen? Is there uh, some other mechanism that needs to be in place so that whoever the speaker is can actually lead and govern? whoever that speaker is can actually lead and govern. I, I want to ask you this. Do you support some of these calls from lawmakers uh, like Representative Don Bacon and former House Speaker Newt Gingrich to expel Matt Gates uh, from the GOP conference? Do you support that idea? Well, he's still got a vote, and that's the, that's the issue. It doesn't matter what your conference rules are or who are it, who's in your conference, as long as they're voting on the floor and not being a, a team player and trying to push the Republican agenda forward, um, it, I don't know that it makes any difference whether you have them in the conference or out of the conference. The goal has to be is to unite our conference, to bring people together. Um, mm -hmm. Somehow we've got to figure out how to stop the divisions, get more unity in the party, get more unity in the conference uh, so that we can move forward a very aggressive agenda, which is what Kevin McCarthy was doing. He had success after success and now all of that's on hold because uh, we had this motion to vacate the chair. It created a huge disruption. It's uh, like I said in my floor speech, it is not going to advance any kind of conservative policies and it's not good for America right now, but I've got faith that we're gonna get through it and get to a point where we are doing the things that are best for the American people. I mean, you certainly have a lot of conservative Americans that are looking at the Republican Party right now and hoping that you can come together and move forward and get some things done. And so let me ask you this. If your new speaker is in this similar position as McCarthy, right, where they would have to work with the Democrats uh, to, and work with President Biden even to keep the government open, as you mentioned, that day is close, quickly approaching. Do you think that the Republican Party will be able to stand behind this new speaker if they have to do some of those things, like work with Democrats? That's the big question we have to answer. And <clears throat> that's where Pres or, uh, Speaker McCarthy was hamstrung. He, um, he had all these different factions. We had a, 
an overwhelming majority of our conference that had a direction we wanted to go in, that we wanted to use what leverage we had. We wanted to pro, uh, put the policies out there that are conservative, that are policies that are good for America, and use those in the debate and the negotiations. Uh, but apparently that wasn't good enough. And uh, I don't think we're any better off today than we were yesterday. We're actually worse off today than we were yesterday. And we're going to have to figure out how to get unified around those core conservative principles uh, and give that message to America and put those votes on the board and give somebody the authority to go talk to the Senate, go talk to the White House and say, here's where we are. We see where you are. How do we come together to do what's best for the country? And that's exactly what Kevin McCarthy uh, has been doing the whole time and doing a great job at it. It's, again, just unfortunate uh, that he was kicked out of the speaker's chair. Well, Representative Westerman, uh, we will, of course, be keeping a close eye on this, and we certainly appreciate your time on a very busy day today. Thank you so much. And I want to bring this big story now uh, to our panel. So joining us today is ABC News contributor Mike Muse, ABC News political contributor and former Republican representative for Virginia, Barbara Comstock, ABC News political contributor and former Democratic senator for North Dakota, Heidi Heitkamp, along with ABC News' Catherine Falders. And so, again, we're, you're joining me on this uh, historic day here. Barbara, let's start with you. We just heard uh, from this Republican representative there, Bruce Westerman. Uh, do you think that they actually have the ability to unify the Republican conference here? Is, is It was almost as if he was saying, you know, the speakership wasn't the problem. It, it was everyone else in the Republican Party. And we're focusing so much on these eight votes and maybe not looking across the board at all the other votes that tried to keep him in. Well, right. And, you know, Bruce is one of those serious people who actually legislates and gets things done. So, you know, I feel his pain. Um, yeah. uh, but, you know, I think when you look at the two who've announced thus far, you know, Steve Scalise does have a lot of goodwill across the entire mm -hmm. conference. You know, he was somebody, you know, when you pass legislation, regardless of what part of the party you were from, he sent you a cookie, you know, he was always trying to help whatever, you know, part of the party you were from. Um, you know, and I think it contrasts with um, Jim Jordan, who actually I don't think Jim has ever passed a bill. Um, he uh, maybe he did a post office, but he's not certainly not passed legislation. Um, even uh, Matt Gates was attacking him for how bad those hearings went recently. Um, so he's not really, and, and Jim isn't somebody who really understands all the variety of membership across the spectrum of the party. So certainly from the two announced candidates, it makes a lot more sense to have somebody who's been in that position, but also somebody who has not, you know, is, is well liked and has not really had a lot of enemies throughout his time in leadership. Yeah, certainly a lot less divisive. Uh, Catherine, to you, ABC is reporting that Republican lawmakers are having these closed door meetings. So what are you hearing there from lawmakers on the Hill? Who is poised to, you know, succeed McCarthy here? Yeah, and Barbara knows this well from her time up there. There's been a lot of closed door meetings on Capitol Hill uh, today. Obviously, you've seen Jim Jordan throw his hat in the ring. You've seen Steve Scalise, the Republican leader, throw his hat in the ring here. Uh, it's an interesting dynamic. You see Jordan with, with reporters up there earlier today saying uh, that he plans to throw his hat in the ring and he wants the conference to support him. Jordan is a close McCarthy ally here. Uh, of course, Scalise is too. Uh, I talked to a lot of Republicans up there today who say they're going to start making calls for Jim Jordan. But I think I think the question here is who can really get to 218? I've heard from a lot of Republicans mm -hmm. that they don't think that they have that number, that they have that number uh, to elect the next speaker. I know that they want to do this next week. It seems, again, from talking to members up there, that this is not really going to happen uh, next week. I could totally be wrong. Uh, things can change in the House at any second. Uh, but again, I think it's what happens next? Obviously, they're up there huddling. And do they really get this done by next week? A huge question, right? Potential vote on Wednesday. Uh, Heidi, to you, obviously, yesterday we witnessed these Democrats band together to oust McCarthy. And now we're hearing today that you know, he thought he might actually get support from the likes of Nancy Pelosi. That did not happen. What are the consequences here for the Democratic Party? I don't think there's any consequences. There's a consequence for the country, and that is I look forward or in, in, in into the future, into the, the funding of government and this cliff that we have, and I don't know if there's one person in the Republican caucus conference that can, in fact, deliver a deal. And so this is really, for, for them, 
they've got a huge image problem after what happened yesterday. But we as a country have a huge governing problem because they seem ungovernable and mm -hmm. unwilling to cross the aisle to get Democratic support. And that seems to be the kiss of death. And so this has consequences much more for the Republican conference, for the image that they're projecting, and for governing the country. And I hope they get it together because we need to get a budget done. Right. And Mike, to you on that note of an image problem here, right? There was a, a someone said yesterday, you know, a lot of Americans may not understand the minutia of what happened, but they definitely understand the headlines. And in all likelihood, they're going to blame Republicans. They absolutely are going to blame the Republicans because what's going to happen, this path doesn't get any easier for the Republican Party at hand. Because of the fact of the image, they have to figure out who they are as a Republican Party. And whether we like it or not, those eight individuals who voted to oust Kevin McCarthy is going to wield a lot of power within the GOP caucus. Whoever goes up for the speakership is going to have to negotiate with those eight and really one person who is Matt Gates to determine what is it that they want in a speaker in order to create opportunities for legislation to move forward out of the caucus in order for it to even have any bipartisan impact. You have to look at a Republican like Matt, like Representative Lawler, who is more the moderate, who is actually angry with this eight. And so how do you reconcile the moderate wing of Republican Party who are angry with this eight in order to advance one to get 218 votes. The math is challenging. The math is challenging. A lot of things are challenging in this moment. You're absolutely right, Mike. Uh, Mike, Barbara, Heidi, and Catherine, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate it. And coming up next here, uh, the largest strike of healthcare workers in U.S. history. Who is answering the call button in hospitals with 75,000 workers on the picket lines today? So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020, winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live.
our spotlight today, the largest health care strike in U.S. history. More than 75,000 workers today walking off the job at Kaiser Permanente, a massive insurer and health care system operator. And this, of course, after their contract expired on Saturday. The talks between union leaders and company executives failed to reach this new deal. I want to bring in our panel here to discuss this. Mike, Barbara, Heidi, and back with us is Melissa Adon, who is actually on the picket lines uh, there in Los Angeles for us. So thank you all for being with us. And Melissa, we'll start with you. You know, you've been covering the story. What are you hearing from some of those striking workers right now? Uh, Kena, it's definitely frustration. This is something that we've been hearing and seeing for so many of these other union that we've also been covering. When it comes to the Kaiser workers, you're thinking about nurses, you're thinking about lab techs, you're thinking about even the receptionists, all part of this coalition of unions together. One of the nurses I spoke with says that they feel like the short staffed and the staffing issues that they're experiencing is so frustrating. She says it's pushing herself and so many others to the brink that she's worried that folks may not come back or return for their job. And this is critical. She says she wants to be inside the hospital, not outside here on a picket line. So that's where just so much of that frustration is coming from. And then, of course, it's the other argument that people telling me, you know, like a receptionist that was working here, she says, can I be paid a fair wage with inflation, with so many other things. So, Kena, top of mind, of course, those staffing issues and those wages. Right, Melissa, thank you. And Barbara, too, you know, we've seen these recent strikes, obviously, in several different industries over this last year. That includes the writers and actors right here on the West Coast. Uh, we saw President Biden and former President Trump with the auto workers in Michigan just last week. You know, a lot of Republicans for decades sort of campaigned on weakening organized labor unions. So the climate is really different now. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think this is really mixing it up, um, be, you know, between the parties and people are really talking about this differently. Post-pandemic, there's really mm -hmm. a different world now that I think both parties have to address differently about wages and about how to deal with uh, unions and workers. You know, we have a worker shortage, you know, hours that people want to work. And, you know, I think immigration is an issue on how we're going to have enough workers, but also... Um, giving people, you know, better wages and, and hours. Yeah. So I think they're, but but also that we have these strikes and that we're not dealing with them well, and that we need to do better on this is a, I think, a challenge to both parties to address it a little bit differently than either party has has dealt with over history. And, and I, I don't think either party's been doing very well with it. Well, no, and of course, when we're seeing, you know, record housing prices and inflation keeps creeping yeah, up, it's um, harder yeah. and harder. Yeah. Uh, so, Heidi, to you, you know, Democrats typically have been supportive of unionized labor. President Biden, as you meant, you know, he joined the picket lines. Was a, He made history by doing that just outside Detroit. Uh, does that support, though, have a limit? I don't think so. I think when you look at where the organized labor movement is today and where labor is today, they're basically saying we're getting squeezed. Not only, and you heard this from the workers, not only are we getting squeezed um, monetarily, we're being expected, especially in healthcare, to work even harder. And so this isn't just about wages, it's about work conditions, it's yeah. about not having enough workers. And if ever you're going to advance your cause, you do it when supply demand works for you, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a low supply of workers and a high demand. And so this should surprise no one that people are on the picket line. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think it is surprising anyone, right, at this time. So, Mike, too, you know, healthcare workers have endured so much during the pandemic. They're right now, they're asking for a minimum wage of $25 an hour and increased staffing. I want to point out to everyone that last week in California, the state raised a minimum wage for fast food workers to $20 an hour. So what is your thought on the nurses' arguments here? And I'm just going to throw it out there. They're like, I remember the names of the nurses when I was delivering my baby. You know, I mean, they are so important. I know, Kana, when you put that into the context of you're basically saying to these healthcare workers that their job is valued at the same of a fast food. Now, I love Chipotle, I love my McDonald's, but that isn't a life-saving moment or a place or establishment. What they're saying is that we are working at a life-saving institution. Yeah. And so the stress that is on that, the, the playing God, in essence, uh, that comes with it, they're saying they deserve uh, the quality of pay for the quality of work that they're doing to ensure uh, that their patients get incredible care and incredible service. And you would want that. 
uh, when you go to get medical help, someone who feels uh, valued. Right, and you know these medical workers feel that too. They, they've said it's going to be a three-day strike because they, they know how important their jobs are. Uh, Mike, Barbara, Heidi, and Melissa, thank you all for this discussion. Uh, coming up next here in our last call, you know <laughs> the purple dinosaur? dinosaur? Yeah, I know, I know. Well, he's headed back to the big screen, and it might surprise you how the new film is being described. Yes, yes, we're talking about Barney. We'll be right back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you look cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I love you, you love me. We're a happy family. I mean, were you ready for that song? <laughs> love it. Time now for our last call. Hot on the heels of Barbie's billion dollar summer blockbuster, the iconic purple dinosaur from our childhood is now making a comeback and it is not for the toddler set here. Mattel Films and Oscar winning actor Daniel Kaluuya producing a new Barney live action film that Mattel's CEO says will be fun, entertaining, and culturally oriented and not odd by the way. Uh, I want to bring back our panel. So uh, Mike, first of all, back in July, I know, uh, Mattel Films told, <laughs> told the New York Magazine, get it together, uh, that, that this would lean on the millennial angst of the property. They're kind of walking that back now, but that makes me laugh. <laughs> Kana, please go to Barbara on this one. I don't even want to address it. I don't even want to take it. I am triggered. I am perplexed. I am confused. How was this for millennial adults and not for kids? I, I, I don't even know how that's even possible, but I'm intrigued. I'll go see it out of curiosity. I think we should go together as a group. Oh, that's a good idea. Barbara, are you in? I mean, do you think they can make this somehow appeal to an older audience? Uh, no, yeah, my, my kids, it was my kids' age, but I, I still like Winnie the Pooh and uh, the classics, you know, Peter Rabbit, uh, you know, Paddington Bear, never was a big Barney fan. <laughs> I hear you on that. Uh, Heidi, yeah, what's your take on Well, this? I'm telling you, you know, the culture warriors have come after Barbie and Taylor Swift. I think Barney better watch out because they're coming for him next. Look out, Barney. So, so, Catherine, one of my favorite things that they said that they are walking back a little bit, though, is that they're talking about the trials and turbulations of being a 30-something in this. 
I don't know. I'm with everybody else because there's been so much said about this movie. You just said it. It's it's odd. It's not going to be about millennial angst. I think I just need to go see it. So maybe we can table the conversation and talk about it later. Kana, okay, do you think Bar like is Barney in therapy, Kana? Like, what is this? <laughs> I mean, you're the one that's you're triggered, dinosaur. Mike. Maybe. Mike is triggered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are amazing. That's it for our last call in this half hour. Mike, Barbara, Heidi, thanks to all of you and Barney, I guess. Uh, thank you so much for streaming with us. I'm Kana Whitworth. Follow ABC News Live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories and the impact they have on you. The news never stops, neither do we. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Atlanta, I'm Steve Osinsami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, all the day's major developing stories here on Prime. I'd like to start by thanking Speaker McCarthy for his service. For the first time ever, a leaderless House and a Congress in chaos as the financial health of the nation hangs in the balance. Plus... More than 100,000 Armenians have fled in what's being called ethnic cleansing. In tonight's Prime Focus, we bring you what's at the center of the conflict and the international concerns over a potential genocide. And the opening arguments are underway in the trial of the infamous FTX founder Sam Bankman Freed. Tonight, we sit down with celebrated author Michael Lewis on his newest book, where he got unprecedented access to the controversial crypto founder and the alleged fraud he's embroiled in. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including a healthcare system in crisis, the largest healthcare strike in U.S. history, with more than 75,000 workers walking off the job. What's at the center of their strike and the ripple effects being felt nationwide? Plus, why the sons of infamous drug lord El Chapo may have taken a big step against trafficking fentanyl and the potential impact it could have here in the U.S. And my rare sit down with former second lady Karen Pence as we talk politics, her fears after January 6th, and the man behind the candidate, her husband, Mike Pence. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we begin on Capitol Hill with what comes next after that unprecedented and historic ousting of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Two high-profile candidates, Representative Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan, have both come forward saying that they plan to seek the speakership. But since just one Republican can move to oust a speaker, getting 218 Republicans to agree on anything may prove to be quite a challenge.
Moderate House Republicans are beginning a push to try to expel Matt Gates from the GOP conference for ousting McCarthy. Some had suggested former President Trump should be speaker, as a speaker does not have to be a member of the House. But for his part, Trump says he's focused on getting elected president again. The House cannot conduct any other business until a new speaker is chosen. So what comes next in this process? Mary Bruce leads us off tonight from Capitol Hill. Tonight, an all-out power struggle in the House, one day after a handful of rebel Republicans forced Kevin McCarthy out as Speaker, the first time that's happened in American history. Now the race to succeed him already in high gear. Jim Jordan of Ohio, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, the first to announce he's running. But are you That's confident you can unite Republicans? Is that even possible at this point? Well, we better. But Jordan is known as a lightning rod on the Hill, the founder of the far-right Freedom Caucus. He's a close ally of Donald Trump. The question now, can he control the chaos in his party? But why are you confident you can do what McCarthy couldn't? Um, I, I, think I, can, I think I can unite the conservative base and the party and the conference. Uh, that's why I'm running, and we'll, uh, we'll see over the next week. An hour later, he had competition. The number two Republican in the House, Steve Scalise of Louisiana, making it official. Scalise imploring his fellow Republicans not to lose sight of our shared mission, saying they must mend the deep wounds that exist within our conference. But Scalise faces health challenges. He's currently battling blood cancer and undergoing aggressive treatment. This after he was shot and seriously wounded in 2017 at a congressional baseball practice. Do you feel you could do this job? I feel great. Uh, I know we have a lot of work to do. Uh, help us stay focused on getting our job or get our job done. We have people. Right now, McCarthy's close ally, Patrick McHenry, is serving as interim speaker. Republicans hope to unite around a new leader next week, though many are skeptical. Hell no. Hell no. I think there are scenarios where Patrick McHenry could be in this job for, for an extended period of time. But they are up against the clock, just 42 days left to prevent a government shutdown. One looming question, will the new speaker support additional funding for Ukraine? Jordan says he doesn't. I'm, I'm, I'm against that. The most pressing issue on Americans' mind is not Ukraine. President Biden today admitting he's worried, but he's still staying out of the speaker fight. Sir, not that they're asking, what's your advice to the next, next House speaker? <laughs> That's above my pay Playing a little dodgeball there. Mary Bruce joins us now from the Capitol. Uh, Mary, what's the timeline for how this moves forward and what happens in the House until this speaker battle is resolved? Well, Lindsay, the House is now at a complete standstill. All work has ground to a halt. They can't get anything done until they pick a new speaker. Now, members have all actually gone home for the rest of the week. They will be back in to try and tackle this on Tuesday. But, Lindsay, the reality is this could possibly drag on for a while. Lindsay. All right, Mary Bruce for us from the Capitol. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. A summer of strikes have now extended to health care workers. 75,000 health care workers walked off the job this morning at facilities run by Kaiser Permanente. It is the largest health care worker strike in U.S. history. Workers say understaffing and low pay are hurting patient care. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, reports from Los Angeles. Tonight, more than 75,000 health care workers walking off the job in multiple states. The union coalition calling it the largest health care worker strike in U.S. history. Why are we here? Care. They're picketing Kaiser Permanente, the company that provides health care for nearly 13 million people. Who's got the power? Workers from California, Oregon, and Washington State to Colorado and Virginia and Washington, D.C. are fighting for increased pay and against what they say are unfair labor practices and unsafe staffing levels. Respiratory therapist David Boston telling me... We're working, you know, one respiratory therapist that should be doing the job of two or three. How is there shame? Crystal Dunn works in the optometry department. She says she has to work side jobs to make ends meet. I can't even cover outside of my rent, everything else that I need, groceries and food, um, to just toiletries, different things like that. The strike set to last for three days in the West and one day in the East. Doctors are not striking, though, and Kaiser is using temporary workers in place of its employees who are. Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, are the two sides still negotiating? 
They are, Lindsay. I'm told they're holed up in a San Francisco hotel negotiating round the clock. Now, Kaiser says despite those temporary workers stepping in, that hasn't compromised patient care. They also say that they are committed to reaching a new agreement with this coalition of unions. Lindsay. Matt Gutman for us before a very active picket line. Matt, our thanks to you. An update tonight from General Motors, where 400 more Ford layoffs will take effect tomorrow. In a statement, a Ford spokesperson said the UAW strike has impacted some operations in Chicago as well as Detroit. The result of the layoffs is a consequence of the strike. These 400 layoffs are in addition to the 930 layoffs at other facilities. Ford's total layoffs now total more than 1,300. And now to the manhunt after the murder of a Brooklyn man in what was apparently a random attack on the street. Ryan Carson and his girlfriend were returning from a wedding early Monday morning when the well-known social justice advocate was stabbed multiple times. Authorities say the suspect has been identified and they are looking for him tonight. Here's ABC's Trevor Alt in Brooklyn. Tonight, the NYPD says they've identified a suspect in the brutal killing of a man in front of his girlfriend at a New York City bus stop in what appears to be an unprovoked attack. Police pouring over this video showing 32-year-old Ryan Carson, a well-known social activist, sitting with his girlfriend just before 4 a.m. Monday. The suspect walking past, the couple then heading in the same direction. This male then turns his attention to Mr. Carson, stating, what are you looking at? Mr. Carson immediately places himself between the male and his female companion to protect her. Carson tries de-escalating the situation, backing up and tripping over the bus stop bench. He's then stabbed in the heart several times. The male with the knife kicks him in the chest, threatens to stab the woman companion, and spits in her face. The suspect then running away. Soon after, a woman who police believe is the suspect's girlfriend appears, apologizing and referencing a person named Brian, who authorities believe is the suspect. And police sources tell ABC News the suspect works at a nearby school and frequents a park not far away. They're now searching for him in that area. Hello, my name is Ryan Thorson Carson, and I'm a political organizer and policy analyst from Brooklyn, New York. Ryan Carson was a well-known activist working to reduce poverty and overdose deaths in New York City. His friends and colleagues now remembering him as a generous man who loved poetry. Overnight, more than 100 people gathering in Brooklyn for a vigil in his honor. It's incredibly tragic. A, you know, a life full of promise uh, is uh, snuffed out and uh, the world is the worst place for it and we'll miss him dearly. Such an unfortunate story here. Trevor all joins us now. Trevor, what are police saying about the suspect's history and their efforts to track him down? Yeah, so Lindsay, from what we've heard from police sources is last year this suspect has a summons out for disorderly conduct and actually just two months ago his aunt called 911 and described him as emotionally disturbed. Now authorities from what we're hearing know where he is often seen and where he was working. It's a matter of finding him now. Lindsay? Yeah, certainly is. All right, Trevor Alter, thanks to you. Tonight, a manhunt for those involved in a shooting that injured five people at Morgan State University in Baltimore. The gunshots happened as homecoming celebrations were underway. A shelter-in-place order went into effect, and students then huddled inside for hours, but the shooter or shooters sleep slipped away. ABC's Faith Abube is in Baltimore for us tonight with the latest on the investigation. Tonight, authorities in Baltimore say five people, including four students shot on campus at Morgan State University during homecoming festivities, were likely unintended targets. We know that there was more than one person with a weapon. It looks like it was probably a dispute between two smaller groups. Officers racing toward the gunfire around 9.25 p.m. on Tuesday near the Murphy Fine Arts Center in Thurgood Marshall Hall. Gosh, they're going to have to shoot at Morgan State. Finding those five victims all taken to hospitals with non-life-threatening injuries. The entire campus sheltering in place for several hours. Students recording the chaos on their cell phones. First responders loading one person onto a stretcher. <laughs> as SWAT teams went room by room, yeah, yeah, clearing yeah, the yeah, dorms, yeah, searching for a suspect. Tonight, the mayor of Baltimore defending the university and its security protocol surrounding homecoming events. This is about people's reckless abandon, the overproliferation of guns, uh, folks' inability to deal uh, with, with conflict and their inability to handle their mental health in the right way. So many people eager to have that conversation. Faith Abube joins us now. Faith, what's the campus doing to protect students as they are continuing to search for those involved? 
Well, Lindsay, just this evening, the president from Morgan State University announcing that all events surrounding homecoming are either canceled or postponed until there is a suspect in custody. All classes are also canceled for the rest of the week. Lindsay. Faith Abube from Morgan State University. Thank you. Former President Trump was back in court today and appeared before cameras several times in order to blast the prosecutor, New York Attorney General Letitia James, as well. After he left, James said the Donald Trump show is over and I will not be bullied. Our senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky has the latest. Tonight, after three days of sitting in court, then stepping into the hall to attack the judge and New York Attorney General Letitia James, Donald Trump pulling up stakes and heading home to Florida. And when he was gone, James firing back. This case was brought simply because it was a case where individuals have engaged in a pattern and practice of fraud. And I will not sit idly by and allow anyone to subvert the law. And lastly, I will not be bullied. Trump was not required to be in court at all, but he came anyway. I attend because I want to point it out to the press how corrupt it is because nobody else seems to be able to do it. James brushing that off. Mr. Trump is no longer here. The Donald Trump show is over. This was nothing more than a political stunt, a fun-raising stop. It comes 24 hours after Judge Arthur N. Gorin imposed a partial gag order on the former president after Trump disparaged the judge's clerk on social media. The judge had already ruled Trump committed fraud by grossly overstating the values of prized properties like his Trump Tower penthouse, his Palm Beach estate, Mar-a-Lago, and golf courses across the country. Today, Trump's attorneys appealed that ruling, asking a higher court to dismiss the case. Aaron Katursky joins us now. Aaron, why do we think that the former president continues to show up in court when he doesn't need to be there? He told us today, Lindsay, he said he wanted to talk to the press and try to show how corrupt his trial is. He's trying to use this to his political advantage. It is the centerpiece of his campaign, all of his legal troubles. And he's going to have to come back here under different, different circumstances when he testifies as a witness. That could be weeks from now. The whole case could last until December. But, Lindsay, as soon as he left for the day, the whole vibe in the courtroom seemed to relax. The judge was joking with the attorneys, even wishing one of them a happy birthday. Lindsay? All right. Aaron Katursky for us. Thanks so much, Aaron. The son of the suspect who allegedly abducted a nine-year-old girl is speaking out and telling the media what he thinks of his father. Stephanie Ramos continues in upstate New York for us tonight. With the investigation into the kidnapping of nine-year-old Charlotte Senna heating up, tonight a neighbor of suspect Craig Ross Jr. claims he came close to abducting her nine-year-old grandson over the summer while they were doing yard work. Um, and there's at a this man point standing, standing with his back behind to me, him. right over him. And right about here, I yelled, hey! What's going on? Carol Brown says that man was Craig Ross Jr. Yes. When you said, hey, what did he tell you? He said, turned his body towards me, started backpedaling a little. And he said, hey, I was just asking him if he could come help me. I got a weed whacker. Carol says when she offered to get her husband to help, he quickly left. He jumped on the bike and took off. Took off and this week, yes. Brown says when she saw the photo of the man who allegedly abducted Charlotte from a state park, oh, she hand. recognized him immediately. I, I literally almost got sick to my stomach, fell off my chair almost. It was the exact same man that I had approached right here on the front lawn with my grandson inches away. Before Ross moved into that camper where police say they rescued Charlotte from a bedroom closet, Craig Ross lived in another neighborhood, less than a mile away from Charlotte's home. A young man at that address tells TMZ that he is one of Ross's children, but he wants nothing to do with his father. Oh, no. He's disgusting. He's gross. He should die. I can care less. Yeah, that son not holding back at all. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, any information about a possible connection between the alleged abductor and Charlotte? Well, Lindsay, state police tell us that they are still investigating, but so far they have not found a connection between Ross and nine-year-old Charlotte. So we are right outside of the jail where Ross is being held. His next court appearance is scheduled for October 17th. But, Lindsay, the best part of all of this is that Charlotte was found in good physical condition, and she is now home with her family. Lindsay. You are so right about that. All right, Stephanie Ramos for us. Thank you.
The suspect charged in Tupac Shakur's fatal shooting made his first court appearance in Las Vegas. Dwayne Keefe D. Davis, who was facing a murder charge for Tupac's death 27 years ago, stood shackled wearing a dark blue jail uniform. He was scheduled to be arraigned on the charge today, but the hearing was cut short after he asked the judge to postpone the hearing while he retains counsel. Mr. Davis, sir, have you retained counsel to represent you in this case? Yes, ma'am. Who have you retained? Edie Paul. Okay, and is that person going to be here today? No, he's, uh, he, he needs two weeks to, say to be here. All right, we're going to continue this matter for two weeks. The arraignment has been rescheduled for October 19th. Mexico's Sinaloa cartel has reportedly said they will not produce, transport, or sell fentanyl in Sinaloa. Banners across the state have appeared claiming that the cartel has banned the sale and production of synthetic opioid fentanyl. But experts are doubting the accuracy of the claim, saying that fentanyl, which has caused tens of thousands of overdoses in the U.S., remains one of the cartel's most lucrative products. Sinaloan prosecutors confirmed that the banners appeared on overpasses and near roadways, but cannot confirm who hung them. And next tonight, we go inside Uganda. The East African nation is considered to be the harshest anti-LGBTQ law in the world. Being gay could be punishable by death. And even failing to report same-sex acts is a crime. The U.S. has condemned the law, but American-based evangelical groups played a role in shaping it. James Longman reports from inside the country where he visited a secret shelter providing refuge to gay people on the run. Tonight, inside Uganda, these men and women are living in fear under what's considered the harshest anti-LGBTQ law in the world. Here, being gay could now be punishable by death. Hi, Henry. Hi. hi. How's it going? We meet Henry, who operates secret shelters for those on the run, a rare lifeline. While we're there, he receives a call. Somebody has just called me that they need a shelter. Uh, he has been evicted and uh, he is on his way. He's coming now? He is coming. We have to be careful. This refuge outside Kampala could be raided at any moment. Here, even renting a room to a gay person is illegal. Under the new law, a person found guilty of same-sex conduct could get life in prison. Someone simply advocating for gay rights could serve up to 20 years behind bars. And critically, failing to report same-sex acts to police is a crime. It essentially turns everyone into a potential snitch. Thank you so much. Hi. Asuman Basirwala is one of the law's sponsors. For us, we look at gay as a deviation. A deviation? Yes, there's no doubt about it. Activists claim U.S. evangelical groups have fueled the anti-LGBTQ sentiment that's spreading here and across Africa, spending tens of millions of dollars on their campaign. Before the bill was signed, the head of one such group, Arizona-based Family Watch International, was seen on Ugandan state TV at a conference called Protecting African Culture and Family Values. We must stop this cultural imperialism that is destroying our children and our families. The group denies it helped author the bill, posting on its website that it opposed the law and its penalties, including the death penalty and punishing people for not turning in others. Now that law is forcing people like Emmanuel, the man who called the shelter looking for a bed, into hiding. My biggest fear is um, the police can find me anywhere. Lindsay, the U.S. government has condemned Uganda's anti-LGBT law, even though U.S. evangelical groups have played a role in shaping it. And this goes way beyond Uganda. There are countries across this continent considering similar legislation. Lindsay. James, thank you. And you can see much more of James reporting on the danger from inside Uganda tonight on a special edition of Nightline, Am I Next? Gay and Targeted in Uganda. Mourners in San Francisco are paying their respects today to the late Senator Dianne Feinstein, whose casket is lying at San Francisco's City Hall. Grievers brought bouquets and cards to her casket in City Hall, the same place where she launched her groundbreaking political career, spending a decade as the city's first female mayor. Fellow San Franciscan and former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was among the officials in attendance. Feinstein died last week at her Washington, D.C. home after a series of illnesses. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime. The distressing moment caught on camera as a plane goes down. What we're learning about the resulting crash. But next in our Prime Focus, as a decades-long conflict intensifies, thousands of ethnic Armenians are fleeing their homes. We go to the Norgono karabakh region to see just how much Armenia and Azerbaijan's recent fighting has devastated the region. Весь 
whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. More than 100,000 ethnic Armenians have jumped into cars, trucks, and buses, fleeing the separatist region of Nargono Karabakh that has been at the center of a decades-long conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And tonight in our Prime Focus, we take you on the ground there to see firsthand the devastation the exodus is having on the men, women, and children forced to flee, and why some onlookers worry it could be the first step toward genocide. Tears, pain. This is what ethnic cleansing looks like. Over 100,000 ethnic Armenians fleeing. Families carrying only what they can hold. Children, the elderly, uprooted from their homes. They've left the disputed enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh, a forgotten corner of the world, but one that is home to one of its most bitter ethnic conflicts. Two weeks ago, Azerbaijan, backed by Turkey, launched a successful military offensive to recapture the region. The enclave's Armenians then started to flee to Armenia, unwilling to live under Azerbaijan's rule. In less than a week, virtually the entire population has gone, a community that's lived there for centuries completely driven out. <laughs> These videos showing the region's capital a ghost town. Eerily empty. Like one day, you lost everything. All your history, all your memories. I lost Nagorno-Karabakh and I lost myself. I, this is uh, what I feel. I, I feel lost. Located in the region sandwiched between Russia and Turkey, Nagorno-Karabakh has been at the center of a bloody conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan for decades. In the 90s, the two former Soviet countries fought a brutal war as the USSR collapsed. Armenians who'd lived in the region for centuries tried to break away from Azerbaijan. Hundreds of thousands of Azerbaijani civilians were also driven out of the region during the fighting that left Armenians in control. But in 2020, Azerbaijan reignited the conflict, launching a six-week war that killed thousands and decisively defeated Armenia. Russia brokered a truce and deployed peacekeepers that remain in the region. But for the last nine months, Azerbaijan blockaded Nagorno-Karabakh, causing food shortages, and then... two weeks ago, launched its new offensive. It defeated the local Armenian authorities in just two days. As you can see, we're still uh, stuck in a road. Uh, this 
exodus is unbearable. Sirinush Sargsyan is a local journalist. She also fled her home last week. She spent 30 hours driving to get out. It's hard to find place to live. Most of us, like personally me, I'm struggling to find a place to live, my family and thousands of people. Armenia is now trying to house tens of thousands of the refugees. Every day we were like explaining, begging, uh, screaming what's happening here. And nobody uh, took any kind of action. They were all watching and expressing hope like everything will be OK. They were watching like literally how people starving. There has been little reaction from the international community. The Biden administration providing $11.5 million in aid and last week dispatching Samantha Power, the administrator of USAID, to the region, seeing the exodus for herself. A United Nations mission also arrived last weekend to assess humanitarian needs, but many Armenians saying they're far too late. They didn't reach Nagorno-Karabakh until well after 99% of the Armenians were driven and forced to flee from Nagorno-Karabakh. So again, too little, too late. This is textbook, uh, classic example of uh, indicators of genocidal intent. And I think that there absolutely needs at this point in time to be international intervention. There has to be robust oversight um, and protection for uh, ethnic Armenians who choose to return. Azerbaijani civilians driven out in the 90s have said they will return and resettle in the now empty enclave. <laughs> The Armenians driven out now are still coming to terms with their loss. It's just not possible to, to accept that, like, we're just saying, like, we lost Nagorno-Karabakh. But I still am not ready to, um, to accept this reality. And I'm still struggling with myself to accept it and to to go further. A community that's lived in the region for centuries, gone in just a matter of days. What a harsh reality. Our thanks to Patrick Revel for bringing us that. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, how much do you really know about former second lady Karen Pence? She sits down with us in a rare interview and shares her fears on January 6th and pulls back the curtain on her husband, who's now vying for the presidency. What do you think that the American people need to know in order to help them fall in love with Mike Pence? He takes his job very seriously. Um, when he uh, has a responsibility, um, he, he's very careful. But next, it is Fat Bear Week. We take a look at the contestants and the history behind the lighthearted competition by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. 
We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. While the battle in Washington has kicked off for a new House speaker, thousands of miles away, another competition is heating up. That's right, it is Fat Bear Week. Let's take a look by the numbers. Today marks the first day of voting in the online contest with brown bears of Katmai National Park in Alaska facing off in a bracket challenge as they transform from scrawny and skinny to pleasantly plump as they pack on the pounds ahead of hibernation. The March Madness style contest started back in 2014 with fans now watching live cams on explore.org to track and vote on their favorite bears in the remote southwest Alaska National Park. The bears can eat up to 40 salmon in one day or about 100,000 calories. There are eight cameras available to spot the bears, including an underwater salmon cam in the Brooks River. The average adult male weighs between 700 to 900 pounds in the summer, but they can grow to more than 1,000 pounds by the fall. 12 bears identified by names and numbers, all unbeknownst to them. They're in this single elimination tournament, which runs through Fat Bear Tuesday next week when the champion will be crowned. The voting is subjective. You could back either the fattest or fastest growing bear or simply your favorite. Bear number 747, Colbert, is one of the park's largest bears at an estimated 1,400 pounds. He won the crown for the second time last year when more than a million total votes were cast online. Another fan favorite is number 480, Otis, a 27-year-old who is one of the oldest bears in the park and a four-time champion, but you will not want to sleep on number 128, Grazer, a mama bear who one ranger told the Washington Post can outfish the competition, saying, quote, she's tough, she doesn't put up with any bear. <laughs> and we still have much more ahead on Prime tonight. It was once a requirement, and soon you won't be able to get one. The pandemic-era policy the CDC is now dropping. And before former crypto founder Sam Bankman-Fried was charged with federal crimes, journalist Michael Lewis spent hours with him and was there as it all fell apart. He tells us what he learned from his time with the embattled former CEO. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? 
going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Heart-stopping video captures the moment a plane goes down. The CDC makes a decision on a once-necessary pandemic-era policy. And the next time you need to return a package, you might just call an Uber. Those stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. A frightening plane crash caught on camera in Oregon. Officials say a small plane fell on a house after going into a tailspin. Rescue crews say they found two people in the plane dead and airlifted a third to a nearby hospital. There were people home when the plane crashed, but no one inside hurt. The plane registered to a flight training school. Investigators not certain what caused the crash. Florida-based company called X Social Media is suing X Corp, the company formerly known as Twitter. The plaintiff alleges trademark and service mark infringement over the use of the letter X, which they say has already done financial damage to the company. The company, which does advertising and social media for law firms, is seeking damages and an injunction blocking X Corp's use of the letter. Last year, Elon Musk acquired what was then Twitter, changing the social media platform's name to X this past July. New York City Mayor Eric Adams is heading to South America to tell would-be migrants not to come to New York. His trip includes stops in Mexico, Ecuador, and Colombia. He's expected to cap off the trip at the Darien Gap, a stretch of jungle often traveled by migrants that links Panama to Colombia. The mayor is struggling to contain the flow of migrants in the city and is asking for federal assistance as the city predicts it could spend $12 billion providing government services for asylum seekers. A 
symbol of peak pandemic is ending. The CDC saying it will stop issuing the familiar white COVID vaccination proof cards. Agency saying if people still want those immunization records, they should ask their state health departments to provide digital proof. Pharmacies, though, still recommending people bring in cards if they receive a new booster or vaccine, and the pharmacists will fill it out. A court has sentenced an exotic animal trainer featured in the Netflix Tiger King docuseries for helping traffic rare animals. South Carolina zoo owner Doc Antle found guilty of buying endangered lion cubs in Virginia to display at his zoo. He had faced up to 20 years in prison, but the Virginia Attorney General said they reduced that to a two-year suspended sentence, which includes no jail time. Antle also given a five-year ban from owning or dealing exotic animals in Virginia. Ride-sharing app Uber is branching out ahead of the holiday season. It's now offering a service to return your unwanted packages to UPS, FedEx, or the post office. Drivers can handle up to five packages at a time, and it'll cost you about five bucks per return. The company is looking to diversify its revenue streams after posting a $9.1 billion loss in 2022. The company says they just became profitable this year for the first time in its 14-year history. Next tonight to our series, Running Mates, where we get to know what some may call the better half of the presidential candidates. We'll let you be the judge of that. We got to know who is Mike Pence earlier this week and how he met the love of his life, Karen Pence. Tonight, we get to know the former second lady. She's a lifelong teacher, mother of three. And in a rare TV interview, she opens up to us about what type of first lady she would be and how critical faith has been in her marriage. Obviously, you all have three children, now three grandchildren. Mm -hmm. What's Mike Pence like as a father and grandfather? Mike likes to make sure he has time for all of the kids. And that was something we really fought for during their growing up years. We were one of the few members of Congress who chose to move our family to Washington. And we really served as a family, I would say. The kids were very involved, and only as much as they wanted to be. but. As they've grown and now they're all adults, they're all married, we make a point to connect with them. Just last night, we made sure that we talked to every single one of our kids or their spouses if we couldn't talk to them. And what's he like as a husband? He's great. He's the best ever. <laughs> he really is my best friend. Honestly, we just seem to click from the very beginning. It's like our first date, I just knew I was going to marry him. We just had so much in common. My family even said he's like the male version of Karen. We just mm. had so many things that we shared, interests and things that we didn't like. We both shared those, too. So um, we just connected right away. What role does faith play in your relationship? When we first started dating, um, we kind of made that promise to each other that our faith was going to be center of our relationship. And we still, we read the Bible and pray every morning together. And I think that's something that grounds us and, and gets us set for the day. What do you think that the American people need to know in order to help them fall in love with Mike Pence? He takes his job very seriously. Um, when he uh, has a responsibility, um, he, he's very careful, he's very measured, uh, very cautious, and just takes his time before he makes decisions. Not to say he's not decisive, he can be very, very decisive, um, but he's somebody that they can trust. What would you say is his greatest asset? His greatest asset is his integrity. Hmm. Biggest weakness? Greatest weakness, um, ice cream. <laughs> Take us to January 6th. You were inside the Capitol. There's that picture of you, a really poignant moment as you're drawing the curtain inside one of your daughters, your husband, your husband's brother. What's going through your mind in that moment? Whenever you're in a situation where someone might be able to shoot through the window, mm -hmm. just close the drapes. That, that was my thinking at the time was like, Wait a minute, things are starting to happen out there. Let's close the drapes. Did you ever fear for your lives? Never. And I just was discussing this with someone here in Iowa a few minutes ago. I never felt afraid. Mm. And I really felt like we just had such a peace and God's presence and just a sense of purpose. 
and determination uh, that I don't think any of us uh, in the whole group, all the staff and everyone with us, I don't think any of us felt fear. I think we felt like uh, a sense of resolve. Is there a, a prior first lady who you would see as, as a role model? Yes, 100%. <laughs> it's Barbara Bush. I just connect with her so much. But the minute that George became the nominee, <laughs> they started, she said, my tongue started getting me in trouble and it's oh. gotten me in trouble ever <laughs> since. I just had a fondness for her that she didn't try to be somebody that she wasn't. She was not out to impress people. She really just had a heart for the American people and wanted to do something to make a difference. You obviously been very supportive of military spouses. If you were to become first lady, what would you like your platform to be? Well, that's that's a great question too, and I'm 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 not there mm. in my head yet. There are so many issues out there right now. Um, uh, I feel like you know human trafficking is one that's that seems to be on everyone's mind right now, and and I'm glad that there's more attention being drawn to that. There are a lot of issues that military spouses and art therapy was one of my initiatives. The second lady, but I think I'd want to think about it long and hard and make sure that I chose something where I could really make a difference as First Lady. Our thanks to Karen Pence for the conversation. The trial of former crypto tycoon Sam Bankman-Fried got underway this week as the one-time billionaire now faces fraud, conspiracy, and money laundering charges before SBF's cryptocurrency exchange FTX imploded in one of the biggest financial collapses in American history. Famed author and journalist Michael Lewis was already embedded in the company. He's now telling that story in his new book, Going Infinite, The Rise and Fall of a New Tycoon, and Michael Lewis, kind enough to join you. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Let's start with the idea that Sam has has entered a plea of not guilty to the idea that he has misused clients' funds for his own personal projects and finances. But you have this nearly $9 billion that's missing that was funneled through his hedge fund, Almeda Research. After all the time that you've spent with him, do you feel that he knowingly committed fraud? I just wrote 250 pages avoiding answering that question <laughs> and just telling the story because I want the reader to answer that question. Mm -hmm. So I won't answer that question, but I will say this, it's more complicated than what you just said. So there was eight that you talked to the bankruptcy people, they've released this stuff. Uh, $8.6 billion of customer deposits are missing and they've already located 7.3 billion in liquid assets and they're sitting on a pile of other stuff that's worth easily another billion. So it's gonna be really interesting to see how much is actually missing in the end. You write, it didn't cross Natalie's mind who was working with him and knew him for quite a bit of time, uh, to feel even a, a tiny bit irritated with Sam. She could never be upset with him for the mess he left for her to clean up because she knew that he never intended to make a mess. He has made a, a bit of a mess. <laughs> at, a bit of a mess. <laughs> at, 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 at this point, I, I think yeah, it's yeah, fair to say. Yeah. And then it go, you go on to say, if she herself didn't fully understand Sam, how could anyone? Do you feel that you got to, to fully understand Sam when most people failed or, or struggled to at best? So when I think about understanding a person, it's always complicated, right? You never know what's going on inside of people. But I think, it, can you predict what they're going to do? Can you predict what they're gonna say? Do you have some predictive power about them? And I developed a lot of that. I mean, I can't predict everything he's gonna do, but I have a pretty good sense of him. There are critics, as you know, who, who say that you've been too sympathetic to Sam. Do you feel they're wrong? I think they're crazy. And there are two stories. The defense is offering one and the prosecution is offering another. I have a completely different one with lots of other stuff that they haven't, they're not mentioning that leaves a reader with the possibility of thinking lots of different things. The, in this case, it's been very interesting to me to see just like the lynch mob mentality, very quick rush to judgment when it all fell apart. Mm. Very quick movement by the prosecution. And I think a lot of people are certain about what happened when they don't actually know what happened. One thing you seem to be certain of, at least in a recent interview, you said this was not a Ponzi scheme. How can you be so sure? Well, I mean, there's a definition of a Ponzi scheme, right? Ponzi scheme is when the dollars coming in are coming in to pay off the, the kind of phony returns to investors who are going out the door. And F FTX itself, so this is complicated. There are two businesses, Alameda Research, which is his hedge fund, which he started first, and out of that came FTX. And FTX was a pretty simple business. It was an exchange. And the way they made money was not by betting. They made money by taking a little piece of the bets other people made. Like that itself 
was a gold mine. I mean, venture capitalists, he had 150 venture capitalists who invested in the thing, and they'd valued it at like $40 billion. The problematic part of the thing, which was totally unnecessary, was this hedge fund he had on the side, this legacy business. And that's where the losses occurred. And, and didn't really have anything to do with FTX. You've recently pushed back on comparisons between him and Elizabeth Holmes, obviously the founder of Theranos, and you said specifically that she was supplying phony medical information to people that might kill them while he was, quote, possibly losing some money that belonged to crypto speculators in the Bahamas. But do you acknowledge that there was potentially some harm? Oh, no, no, of course, of course. Okay. I, I'm a creditor. He took my money, he's up mixed up in that. So yes, of course, of course. But you know, if you wanna do degrees of harm, I think there's a little, it's a little different. And I also think you got, can't ignore the fact that these people might get 100, 100 cents back on the dollar. They're gonna get something back. And the thing I don't even really wanna speculate about, and what, but the, the system of justice has to sort of grapple with is intent. And that, that's, that's the tricky part. Nobody disagrees that like the money was in the wrong place. It's sort of like, it's not a, and, and we know who did it. It's sort of like how and why he done it. it. You write of him that he wrote one day, I don't feel pleasure, I don't feel happiness, somehow my reward system's never clicked. My highest highs, my proudest moments come and pass as I feel nothing but the aching hole in my brain where happiness should be. He goes on to write, I don't feel anything or at least anything good. I don't feel pleasure or love or pride or devotion. I feel the awkwardness of the moment enclosing on me, the pressure to react appropriately, to show that I love them back and I don't because I can't. Yeah. Do you think he feels bad about this whole situation? Or does he have the ability to? I don't know if he has the ability to. Mm. I mean, I think it's just how he's wired. It's not like this is not a, it's not a it, this isn't a moral choice. It's sort of like how he came out. His parents, when he was very little, I think their parents, his friends would, their friends would say they were kind of afraid for him and of him. They didn't know how he was gonna make his way in the world. Certainly uh, fascinating uh, all around, yeah. the, the character of Sam and, and the book that, that you've written here. Michael Lewis, always a pleasure to yeah. talk to you. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Want our viewers to know that his new book, Going Infinite, The Rise and Fall of a New Tycoon, is now available wherever books are sold. The WNBA Finals kick off this weekend, and the New York Liberty is in position to do something that no other New York basketball team has done in the last 50 years, bring a title to the Big Apple. Our Eva Pilgrim sat down with four of the team's stars to talk about their title hopes, growing bond, and the future of women's hoops. It's a showdown of the super teams for this year's WNBA Finals. The Las Vegas Aces, the defending champs, versus the New York Liberty. Vandersloot, she got it. We've never won a championship. We came together for one goal, and that's to win a championship. In the offseason, these ladies helped turn the franchise and the WNBA world upside down, sparking a transformation unseen in the history of the league. <laughs> This year's WNBA MVP, Brianna Stewart, alongside John Quell Jones and Courtney Vandersloot, joining Sabrina Ionescu in New York with one goal in mind, to win. What the Liberty was able to do in free agency is something that really hasn't happened that much in the WNBA. The ability for players to kind of move where they want and, and figure that out. We're coming together for a number of reasons. How did it all start? Did someone text someone and say, hey, I want you to come here. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> did you really? Yeah. Just express the vision that I had, but also knowing what we could accomplish if we all came here together. Just who we are as people and understanding that there's gonna be a lot of sacrifice to come together and, and wanna win and having so many great players on the court. We all have to, you know, be at the right with the right mindset and, and having the same goals and I believe we all shared that vision. All of us just are really competitive, so we expect a lot from ourselves first of all and then of each other as well. It's easy to speak to somebody when you know that they have the same level of drive as you and same same passion for the game. The star power on the court bringing big expectations to the Big Apple and Here's big ratings. She got it. Plus the foul. This season, the most watched regular season across the league's networks in over 20 years. Let's talk about kind of the state of women's basketball at the moment. It's pretty exciting. All-time high viewership, record sponsorship, attendance is crazy high. When you see that, what do you think? We've been trying to get people to see what we do on the court and come out to games, and, and now it's, it's finally um, being put in that spotlight. It's exactly what the WNBA deserves. It's what women's sports deserves. Just continuing to fight for equality and know that 
this is bigger than just us here in, in New York and in Brooklyn, but we're trying to really change the game in a broader sense. Now our league is in a position to have a lot of firsts in, in knowing that we're part of that and bringing that here in New York City with a great crowd that we've been able to draw every single night. And then we've been a part of that change and excited to see where it's going to go into the playoffs as well. It's a lot of pressure. No? Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, you know, we kind of put a target on our back when we decided, I think, in the offseason to all come here. And people are, I don't think we started the, the super team narrative, but that name kind of, you know, followed us around. You know, we're, we've enjoyed it. The move paying off. After five consecutive losing seasons, the Liberty punching their ticket to the finals. Dominant performance to get the job done. Something is definitely brewing. And these ladies are determined to bring the first WNBA title to New York. Ionescu connects on the other end. You want to win the championship? Yes. yes. <laughs> if we don't, then, yeah, it's not the outcome we wanted. Let's go, Liberty, and our thanks to Eva for that. That is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, an ABC News exclusive with the family of a former swimming champion who died of an alleged fentanyl overdose. Why they're now questioning what really happened. A push from the Pope over the future of Catholicism. Why the issues now being discussed are giving some hope and others raising the alarm. news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed getting you behind the stories as they happen abc news live prime we'll take you there streaming free on abc news live from America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there 
You're streaming ABC News live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to this evening, including, for the first time ever, a leaderless House, and not for the first time ever, a Congress in chaos as the financial health of the nation hangs in the balance. But controversy in the Vatican, Pope Francis opens a closed-door meeting to determine the future of the church. And they left behind a nursing home and jumped aboard a ship for years instead. The heartwarming story of a couple who got to see the world together. But we do begin on Capitol Hill with what comes next after that unprecedented and historic ousting of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Two high-profile candidates, Representative Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan, have now come forward saying that they plan to seek the speakership. But since just one Republican can move to oust a speaker, getting 218 Republicans to agree on anything may prove to be quite a challenge. Moderate House Republicans are beginning a push to try to expel Matt Gates from the GOP conference for ousting McCarthy. The House cannot conduct any other business until a new speaker is chosen. So what comes next in this process? Mary Bruce leads us off tonight from Capitol Hill. Tonight, an all-out power struggle in the House, one day after a handful of rebel Republicans forced Kevin McCarthy out as speaker. The first time that's happened in American history. Now the race to succeed him already in high gear. Jim Jordan of Ohio, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, the first to announce he's running. But are you That's confident you can unite show. Republicans? Is that even possible at this point? Well, we better. But Jordan is known as a lightning rod on the Hill, the founder of the far-right Freedom Caucus. He's a close ally of Donald Trump. The question now, can he control the chaos in his party? But why are you confident you can do what McCarthy couldn't? Um, I, I think I can I think I can unite the conservative base and the party and the conference. Uh, that's why I'm running and we'll uh, we'll see over the next week. An hour later, he had competition. The number two Republican in the House, Steve Scalise of Louisiana, making it official. Scalise imploring his fellow Republicans not to lose sight of our shared mission, saying they must mend the deep wounds that exist within our conference. But Scalise faces health challenges. He's currently battling blood cancer and undergoing aggressive treatment. This after he was shot and seriously wounded in 2017 at a congressional baseball practice. Do you feel you could do this job? I feel great. Uh, I know we have a lot of work to do. Uh, help us stay focused on getting our job or get our job done. We're happy people. Right now, McCarthy's close ally, Patrick McHenry of North Carolina, is serving as interim speaker. Republicans hope to unite around a new leader next week, though many are skeptical. Race like we saw in January. Hell no. Hell no. I think there are scenarios where Patrick McHenry could be in this job for, for an extended period of time. But they are up against the clock, just 42 days left to prevent a government shutdown. One looming question, will the new speaker support additional funding for Ukraine? Jordan says he doesn't. I'm, I'm, I'm against that. The most pressing issue on Americans' mind is not Ukraine. President Biden today admitting he's worried, but he's still staying out of the speaker fight. Sir, not that they're asking, what's your advice to the next, next House speaker? <laughs> That's above my pay grade. Our thanks to Mary Bruce. Tonight, a summer of strikes is extended to health care workers. 75,000 health care workers walked off the job this morning at facilities run by Kaiser Permanente. This is the largest health care worker strike in U.S. history. Workers say understaffing and low pay are hurting patient care. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, reports from Los Angeles. Tonight, more than 75,000 health care workers walking off the job in multiple states. The union coalition calling it the largest health care worker strike in U.S. history. Why are we here? Patient care! They're picketing Kaiser Permanente, the company that provides health care for nearly 13 million people. Who's got the power? Workers from California, Oregon, and Washington State to Colorado and Virginia and Washington, D.C. are fighting for increased pay and against what they say are unfair labor practices and unsafe staffing levels. Respiratory therapist David Boston telling me... We're working, you know, one respiratory therapist that should be doing the job of two or three. Crystal Dunn works in the optometry department. She says she has to work side jobs to make ends meet. I can't even cover outside of my rent, like everything else that I need, groceries and food, um, 
homes, uh, just toiletries, different things like that. The strike, set to last for three days in the West and one day in the East. Doctors are not striking, though, and Kaiser is using temporary workers in place of its employees who are. Our thanks to Matt. Now to the manhunt after the murder of a Brooklyn man in apparently random attack on the street. Ryan Carson and his girlfriend were returning from a wedding early Monday morning when the well-known social justice advocate was stabbed multiple times. Authorities say the suspect has been identified and they're now looking for him tonight. Here's ABC's Trevor Alt for us in Brooklyn. Tonight, the NYPD says they've identified a suspect in the brutal killing of a man in front of his girlfriend at a New York City bus stop in what appears to be an unprovoked attack. Police pouring over this video showing 32-year-old Ryan Carson, a well-known social activist, sitting with his girlfriend just before 4 a.m. Monday. The suspect walking past, the couple then heading in the same direction. This male then turns his attention to Mr. Carson, stating, what are you looking at? Mr. Carson immediately places himself between the male and his female companion to protect her. Carson tries de-escalating the situation, backing up and tripping over the bus stop bench. He's then stabbed in the heart several times. The male with the knife kicks him in the chest, threatens to stab the woman companion, and spits in her face. The suspect then running away. Soon after, a woman who police believe is the suspect's girlfriend appears, apologizing and referencing a person named Brian, who authorities believe is the suspect. And police sources tell ABC News the suspect works at a nearby school and frequents a park not far away. They're now searching for him in that area. Hello, my name is Ryan Thorson Carson, and I'm a political organizer and policy analyst from Brooklyn, New York. Ryan Carson was a well-known activist working to reduce poverty and overdose deaths in New York City. His friends and colleagues now remembering him as a generous man who loved poetry. Overnight, more than 100 people gathering in Brooklyn for a vigil in his honor. It's incredibly tragic. A, you know, a life full of promise uh, is uh, snuffed out and uh, the world is the worst place for it and we'll miss him dearly. Such an unfortunate story here. Trevor all joins us now. Trevor, what are police saying about the suspect's history and their efforts to track him down? Yeah, so Lindsay, from what we've heard from police sources is last year this suspect has a summons out for disorderly conduct. And actually just two months ago, his aunt called 911 and described him as emotionally disturbed. Now authorities, from what we're hearing, know where he is often seen and where he was working. It's a matter of finding him now. Lindsay? Yeah, certainly is. All right, Trevor Alter, thanks to you. Tonight, another urgent search, this time for those involved in a shooting that injured five people at Morgan State University in Baltimore. The gunshots happened as homecoming celebrations were underway. A shelter-in-place order went into effect, and students huddled inside for hours, but the shooter or shooters slipped away. ABC's Faith Abube is in Baltimore tonight with the latest on this investigation. Tonight, authorities in Baltimore say five people, including four students shot on campus at Morgan State University during homecoming festivities, were likely unintended targets. We know that there was more than one person with a weapon. It looks like it was probably a dispute between two smaller groups. Officers racing toward the gunfire around 9.25 p.m. on Tuesday near the Murphy Fine Arts Center in Thurgood Marshall Hall. Gosh, they're going to have to shoot that Morgan State. Finding those five victims all taken to hospitals with non-life-threatening injuries. The entire campus sheltering in place for several hours. Students recording the chaos on their cell phones. First responders loading one person onto a stretcher. <laughs> as SWAT teams went room by room, yeah, yeah, clearing the yeah, dorms, yeah. searching for a suspect. Tonight, the mayor of Baltimore defending the university and its security protocol surrounding homecoming events. This is about people's reckless abandon, the overproliferation of guns, uh, folks' inability to deal uh, with, with conflict and their inability to handle their mental health in the right way. Lots of people want to have that conversation. Our thanks to Faith. Next tonight, we go inside Uganda. The East African nation is considered to be the harshest anti-LGBTQ law in the world. Being gay could be punishable by death, and even failing to report same-sex acts is considered a crime. The U.S. has condemned the law, but American-based evangelical groups played a role in shaping it. James Longman reports from inside the country where he visited a secret shelter providing refuge to gay people on the run. Tonight, inside Uganda, these men and women are living in fear under what's considered the harshest anti-LGBTQ law in the world. Here, being gay could now be punishable by death. 
Hi, Henry. Hi, hi. How's it going? We meet Henry, who operates secret shelters for those on the run, a rare lifeline. While we're there, he receives a call. Somebody has just called me that they need a shelter. Uh, he has been evicted and uh, he is on his way He's coming now? He is coming. We have to be careful. This refuge outside Kampala could be raided at any moment. Here, even renting a room to a gay person is illegal. Under the new law, a person found guilty of same-sex conduct could get life in prison. Someone simply advocating for gay rights could serve up to 20 years behind bars. And critically, failing to report same-sex acts to police is a crime. It essentially turns everyone into a potential snitch. Thank you so much. Hi. Asuman Basirwala is one of the law's sponsors. For us, we look at gay as a deviation. A deviation? Yes, there's no doubt about it. Activists claim U.S. evangelical groups have fueled the anti-LGBTQ sentiment that's spreading here and across Africa, spending tens of millions of dollars on their campaign. Before the bill was signed, the head of one such group, Arizona-based Family Watch International, was seen on Ugandan state TV at a conference called Protecting African Culture and Family Values. We must stop this cultural imperialism that is destroying our children and our families. The group denies it helped author the bill, posting on its website that it opposed the law and its penalties, including the death penalty and punishing people for not turning in others. Now that law is forcing people like Emmanuel, the man who called the shelter looking for a bed, into hiding. My biggest fear is um, the police can find me anywhere. Lindsay, the US government has condemned Uganda's anti-LGBT law, even though US evangelical groups have played a role in shaping it. And this goes way beyond Uganda. There are countries across this continent considering similar legislation. Lindsay? James, thank you. And you can see much more of James reporting on the danger from inside Uganda tonight on a special edition of Nightline, Am I Next? Gay and Targeted in Uganda. Now to an ABC News exclusive interview with the family of the former swimming champion who died of an alleged fentanyl overdose. We first covered this story back in March when Jamie Kale, a former U.S. team swimmer, was found dead in the Virgin Islands. Authorities there claim she died of an accidental drug overdose, but her family suspects foul play. Our Janae Norman has the latest. A grieving family demanding answers in the death of their daughter, a former swimming star found dead in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Jamie was getting ready to leave the island on March 14th. She was coming home. It makes no sense. Um, all the evidence out there uh, has been completely overlooked. What we are looking for is justice for Jamie. We're looking for truth. Pat and Gary Kale claim island authorities haven't been forthcoming with details into their daughter Jamie's death, limiting access to information and withholding an official copy of the autopsy. We had somebody that we, that we authorized to go to the funeral home and to view, and that's all they would allow us, all they would allow her to see and see photograph the face. So we don't know what the rest of the, if there's anything else on the rest of the body uh, because we don't have the autopsy report. The family sharing those photos, too graphic to show here with ABC News. She had a black eye. Um, her forehead appeared to have had a blunt trauma to the forehead. Um, it appeared that her nose had been broken. Her lips had blood around them. Kale was a high school champion swimmer from Maine, winning a gold medal in the 1997 Pan Pacific Championship 800 free relay. She then notched silver at the 1998 Swimming World Cup in Brazil. She lived in the U.S. Virgin Islands for nearly two decades. The 42-year-old was found unresponsive in her home by her boyfriend back in February. According to the original police release, Kale's boyfriend, with the help of a friend, then took Kale to a nearby clinic where CP PR was rendered, but Kale succumbed to her ailment. But months later, authorities saying she died of an accidental fentanyl overdose. Her family insists Jamie didn't use drugs. Never. Jamie Kale never did drugs. Never. There's no way that she had fentanyl in her voluntarily. 
Our thanks to Janae for that. Mourners in San Francisco are paying their respects to the late Senator Dianne Feinstein today, whose casket is lying at San Francisco City Hall. Grievers brought bouquets and cards to her casket in City Hall, the same place where she launched her groundbreaking political career, spending a decade as the city's first female mayor. Fellow San Franciscan and former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was among the officials in attendance. Feinstein died last week at her Washington, D.C. home after a series of illnesses. Today, President Biden revealed a new round of federal student loan relief. It forgives $9 billion of student loan debt, benefiting 125,000 borrowers. The White House is providing the relief just days after payments had resumed. It comes from fixes to existing programs for teachers, health care workers, low-income earners, and people with disabilities. And we still have much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, we're in a world full of creators and influencers, but that certainly wasn't always the case. Columnist Taylor Lorenz tells us how she's exploring how we got here and what the future of being online could look like. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland, here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado from Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas, ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Controversy in the Vatican as Pope Francis opens a closed-door meeting to determine the future of the church. The pontiff is pushing for Catholicism to be welcoming to everyone, a call that has sparked hope amongst progressives and alarm among conservatives. On the agenda are calls to elevate women to senior roles and to welcome LGBT, LGBTQ plus Catholics and others who have been marginalized by the church. In Israel, police say they've arrested several people after a video showing ultra-Orthodox Jews spitting on the ground beside Christian pilgrims caused outrage this week. The incident occurred in Jerusalem and drew rare condemnation from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And the hosts have been decided for the 2030 Men's Soccer World Cup for the first time. The games will be held in six countries across three continents. Fans will be able to see matches in Spain, Portugal, and Morocco, as well as Argentina and Paraguay. But the opening game will kick off in Uruguay to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the tournament. Before the words influencer or creator ever existed, online media started with blogging. Then came MySpace and Facebook to connect with the world, later a chance to go viral on YouTube or Vine by uploading videos. And now we're in the era of Instagram and, of course, TikTok, where you can do it all. The book Extremely Online, the untold story of fame, influence, and power on the Internet, tells the history behind the Internet world and how each online media era revolutionized the next generation. Joining us now is author of the book in Washington, and post technology columnist Taylor Lorenz. Welcome to the show, Taylor. Thank you for having me. So let's first start with 
I was forgetting that mommy bloggers kind of started all of this. Why do you think that there was such an interest in, in what they had to say and, and that really started creating and, and having all of this influence? Yeah, I think mommy bloggers were the original influencers and we don't think of that. We think, you know, influencing started with YouTubers and teenagers. Um, but in the early aughts, these mothers, these Gen X mothers actually felt like traditional women's media didn't really speak to them. It was this sort of sanitized view of motherhood. So they went online and they started writing these super candid you know, accounts of what their lives were like. A lot of it was anonymous, actually, or pseudonymous, um, so they weren't giving away some of their real names or the real, real names of their kids, but um, they really changed the conversation around motherhood and normalized things like postpartum depression and struggling to breastfeed, all those tough stuff that you didn't really read about in traditional glossy magazines. Which era would you say really revolutionized the way we think of creators and influencers as we know them today? Well, I'd have to say YouTube, uh, the rise of YouTube, especially in the early 2010s, because you just saw this explosion of, you know, people building audiences suddenly of millions of followers, building these huge, you know, global beauty brands, for instance. Uh, a lot of beauty vloggers, you know, took off in that era. Um, so I do think, yeah, I do think that that era of YouTube kind of normalized this idea. Are you surprised that we ultimately started looking to YouTube to find the next great thing, the next sensation when it came to singers or actors or beyond? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, YouTube very early on allowed people to monetize. They actually rolled out their monetization program in 2007, which was years before other platforms did. Mommy bloggers are of course, monetized as well through ads, um, but it was really nascent in early days. But I think it's the, yeah, the, no platform has transformed entertainment more than YouTube, except maybe TikTok. The shutdown of the video platform, The Vine, shocked a lot of people in the online community. What do you think we can learn from that as far as the, the rise and fall of The Vine? So much. <laughs> Vine was such a transformational short form video app. I mean, it was TikTok before TikTok. It was owned by Twitter. Twitter totally dropped the ball. Um, and the important lesson of Vine is treat your content creators well. Vine really alienated all of its top talent. And that ended up being a huge mistake for the platform because the most popular people on the app said, you know what? You guys aren't going to pay us and appreciate us and roll out features that, you know, help us build sustainable businesses. We're all going to go to YouTube and Facebook and, and elsewhere. And it, app never recovered. What do you think is the future for the online world? Well, I definitely think that we're just, we're all getting more online. And that's why I named my book Extremely Online, because I think actually all of us are getting more online and we're living in a more internet mediated world. Even if you don't post on Facebook or you don't post a single thing, maybe you just got a LinkedIn account and that's it. Um, you know, the elections are being decided by the internet these days. And, you know, you have things I wrote about the GameStop phenomenon, which is the stock market being manipulated by, you know, online communities. So I just think we're increasingly in an extremely online world, whether whether we like it or not. And whether we like it or not is my question, really. Is this a good thing? I would say it's good and bad, right? There are really liberatory aspects of um, the internet. I have my career thanks to social media, and I'm so grateful for that. I think a lot of people like these moms have found community online, and that's great. Of course, the downsides are huge. Disinformation, you know, the depression, the mental health effects. I think we're especially be, for kids. And, oh, and absolutely. I think we're going to be grappling with that stuff for a while. Taylor, thank you so much. Want to let our viewers know extremely online. The untold story of fame, influence and power on the Internet is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, many people retire in a small town or perhaps a thriving community with other retirees. But one couple is doing it all at sea. Why they're cruising through their twilight years. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, retirement is the end of one chapter and the start of another one. And one couple is beginning their next phase of life on the open seas. Danny New introduces us to Jessica and Marty Anson, who are spending their post-work lives on a cruise ship. A cruise ship can be a great place to meet someone, but how about to spend retirement with your partner of 53 years? Yes, and after dinner at night, we go to a show and then we go dancing. I mean, where else can you do that? Marty and Jessica Anson became internet darlings this past week after revealing to Australian television program A Current Affair that they have been aboard this Coral Princess cruise ship for more than 450 straight days. How about a cold beer? The nautical adventure started last summer when Marty told his travel agent back home in Australia to just book as many cruises in a row as possible. Why? Well, besides for just loving cruises, the other reason, shockingly, was affordability. For us, it's, it's more cost-effective than a retirement village, but it might not be for everybody. Marty and Jessica's day usually starts around 5.30 when they get a little ping-pong workout in together. They also love to lay out and read and just enjoy the merriment of never having to cook a meal. I mean, it's a party every day. We even have some alcohol sometimes. Of course, they've become quite well known amongst the staff, and Jessica even got a little surprise serenade for her birthday last month. The staff are wonderful. They look after you. Now, they don't know when they'll be done cruising, but they're booked on this ship through August of next year. That's more than two years straight. But hey, they love this lifestyle, and yeah, they know it's not for everybody. This is how retirement should be. Assuming, of course, you don't get seasick. Has its perks, I'm sure. <laughs> and that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. 
I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From the 2024 campaign trail in Erie, Pennsylvania, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is Nightline. It's not even light outside yet. And Acela Santos has her bag packed, ready to go. Marta Reyes and her daughter Sunny also started their drive before the sun came up. These women are setting out on very similar journeys with two very different destinations, separated by an international border. So I can't sleep. I'm kind of nervous. How about the surgery? You've entered the parking lot for your destination. We're a country where so many are obsessed with plastic surgery in a world obsessed with the fountain of youth. Globally, cosmetic surgery rakes in more than $45 billion a year. From music stars like Lotto and Cardi B, SZA even sang about her surgery. So classic that asshole fella look natural is not. To reality stars. Come on, follow me on this journey of liposuction 360 and a professional mini BBL. Like Nene Leakes and Larsa Pippen, pricey procedures send patients on the hunt for the best bargain. Many times, that search leads them outside of the U.S. I think my tummy tuck procedure in Mexico, I added it up and I spent about 5000 Here, it would have been about 18000 but cheap doesn't always mean safe. Can you explain what fungal meningitis is? Think about a dime size or quarter size lesion eating into the substance of the brain, eating it. Now, a lethal fungal infection is putting dozens of women in danger and the CDC and the World Health Organization are sounding the alarm. What we're seeing more in this outbreak than anything else is women. This is sort of part of the phenomena of medical tourism. These are severe, life-threatening infections. At least six American women have died, all after plastic surgery in Mexico. This entire outbreak appears to be a symptom of a much bigger problem, an entire industry rife with loopholes, leaving patients vulnerable. So. Is looking good really worth the risk? Is this something that could happen in the U.S.? Absolutely. My biggest fear is death. I haven't seen nobody walk home yet from this. So we're here in Texas at the Brownsville Airport, just a few miles from the Mexican border and the city of Matamoros. More and more Americans are taking the trip over the border for so-called mommy makeovers. Anything from a facelift to Tommy talks to Brazilian butt lifts. Matamoros is one of Mexico's chief ports of entry for tourists. It can also be very dangerous. Earlier this year, four Americans were kidnapped on the way to a cosmetic surgery. Two died. The filler is going to change the, 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 the shape of the nose. 
checking that we are in a good, right position. My name is Dr. Franco Reyes Jacome. I'm a plastic surgeon. I have more than 35 years of experience. Dr. Hakome has worked in Matamoros for years, building one of the most respected plastic surgery clinics in the area. Hakome says nearly 80% of his patients come across the border from the U.S. And this incision, we're going to find a space between the muscles. This is the implant you can see. 280 miles away, on the U.S. side of the border, another surgeon is also getting ready to glove up. Getting a full 360 BBL tummy tuck. I'm Thomas Genevieve. I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon. I'm from the East Coast, but I live in the great state of Texas. If you could just ballpark it, how many surgeries do you do a day? In my busy months, I'll do 25 surgeries a week. I'll do 100 a month. Estella Santos is a school teacher and mother of three here. For her, this surgery is a key step toward a more confident future. I mean, after kids, like, your body just gets messed up. I've already tried the exercise routine and lose weight, but, like, the skin is still there. Like, even if I lose the weight, it's still, like, loose. So the only way to fix it is through surgery. She lives here in San Antonio, just a few hours from the Mexican border. It's better to pay the three extra thousand or four and be safe than go over there and then something bad happens. This surgery, liposuction, a tummy tuck, and a Brazilian butt lift will cost her about $15,000. The reason this is dangerous is because this is called the triangle of death here, which is on the buttocks. Dr. Genevieve says one of his most popular surgeries is the infamous BBL. So believe it or not, this is the most dangerous operation in America right now, besides like cardiac. So now I'm going to shape her butt. You can see the flatness here and how that's got a little bit more curve. So a Brazilian butt lift may seem very benign with low risk. As it turns out, it's by far the riskiest procedure in plastic surgery and potentially the most fatal. So 700 here and 1,100 here but it kind of equalized. Dr. Genevieve prides himself on his experience. He says he's never had a patient die because of one of his surgeries. Being so close to the border, Genevieve says he does get patients who went to Mexico and now need help fixing botched surgeries. You're four hours from the border. So do you get patients who come in here and find out your price and are like, well, wait a second, I could drive across the border and pay quite a bit less. We do, and if it's good, you got lucky. And if you made it and you didn't get weird stuff happening to you, infections, bleeding, then congratulations. I am now five days post-op. The latest TikTok rage is all about the ubiquitously titled mommy makeover. Plastic surgeons love to talk about and use the terms having a little work done or having a mommy makeover, or going for medical tourism vacation. It sounds so cute, doesn't it? Well, complications and fatalities are not cute, okay? And now, the usual risks of traveling for plastic surgery are coupled with an illness that's much more mysterious and more dangerous. You know, my life is more important than anything else, and I won't go to get surgery ever again. Alondra had surgery in Matamoros in March, a BBL and liposuction. Now the mother of two has been living in a Phoenix hospital for nearly two months, being treated for fungal meningitis. The doctors told me that if I didn't go on time, I could have died within 24 hours because this is a fatal infection. We reached out to both clinics involved in the outbreak. We've received no response. Mexican officials have closed both of them, Clinica K3, where Alondra went, and Riverside Surgical Center. The CDC has issued an alert telling anyone who had procedures under epidural anesthesia between January 1st and May 13th of this year that they need to go to their local emergency room and get tested for meningitis. What are your greatest fears at this point? Fears? Death. And I only say that because I have not seen one lady leave. 
I have not seen no girl go boom yet. Our thanks to Janae. You can see the full episode of If Looks Could Kill on Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. I just want to share my light with the world. As long as I'm sharing my light some way or another, like I think that's my true calling, I think. Internet superstar Bretman Rock has gone global. The 24-year-old Filipino-American striking a pose at Paris Fashion Week, strutting around New York City, or simply chilling at home in Hawaii alongside his 58 chickens. Five months, bait. Bretman shares unfiltered humor. Calling all my chickens to the picnic table. They're coming. And fierce personality with almost 50 million followers across social media. Bretman's new memoir is all about leaning into being unapologetically yourself. What does that mean, the tagline in the book is unapologetically yourself? That's truly really what it means to me, is just like embodying everything that makes you you. We dished about it all while dishing up a childhood recipe. I could cook this with my eyes closed, girl. At Balao in New York City, launched by three Filipino-American nurses. I, that one-handed uh, cracking, you, got, uh, you know your stuff. I grew up in um, the restaurant industry, girl. And over some dessert, of course. Oh, my gosh! Oh, oh Elle. Look at this. Wow. Wow. This is colorful and mm. It's giving LGBTQ. It is. It's rainbow. Happy, happy pride, pride. And happy belated <laughs> API to us. Thank you. Bretman now sharing what it means to be gender non-conforming in today's world. I actually go by all the pronouns. That's how I feel about my gender. I'm whatever I feel that day. You recently shared that you're non-binary, yes. right? And so what does that mean to people who don't 
have a clear understanding. Everyone who is non-binary has kind of like their own definition of it. And for me, I truly just think non-binary is someone who doesn't conform in the spectrum of gender. Like, I truly do think I fall like straight dab in the middle between masculine and femininity. Somewhere in the middle, and with a wide range of interests. Oh, yeah! From weightlifting, to makeup and beauty. What I love about my feminine side is the fact that I have the freedom to explore it, and I was surrounded by people that let me explore that. Bretman proudly breaking barriers, becoming the first openly gay person to grace the cover of Playboy magazine in 2021. Bretman immigrated to Hawaii with his family at just seven years old. In Hawaii, we had a five-bedroom house with 25 people in there. I was with my grandma, my mom, my brother, and my sister in one room. From humble beginnings to loudly and proudly representing, the lesson of feeling good in your own skin, something the mega influencer said took time to learn. I read that you didn't love your features growing up. My nose took me forever to love. And then my skin color on top of that as well. You really just have to decide one day that you're beautiful. That confidence on full display on the cover of Vogue Philippines' first ever pride cover. I'm just gonna pull up a little prop, okay? Okay, Gary. What do you... Oh! Not her. Yes, her! Oh my God. What do you think? I, what am I, what do I think? When I you see think... her, what do you think? I think about little Bretman Pebble, honestly, because this was so, oh my girl, juju girl. Are you gonna have to start crying? I don't cry. Okay, you don't cry. Especially on camera, never. You know, big girls cry, that's okay. But every time I see, I just think of little Bretman Pebble. It's truly a love letter to my baby self in the Philippines. Brown gay kids, we're not supposed to be cover girls. We're not supposed to be cover boys. That's not supposed to be possible, but I did it. But you made it possible. And that cry. makes it possible in other people's <laughs> minds. We're all supermodels. The biggest takeaway from that cover for me is that like every brown queer kid deserves their own Vogue cover because I think they deserve to be seen in that way. So every day, I have to wake up and I have to show the world that I'm a man. It's not enough that I am a man. I have to now prove my worth. You're never gonna look as good as you do in the gym. It was the same, almost the same feeling of this has to happen now or something terrible, something really bad's gonna happen to me the same way your body is maybe telling you you're gonna die if you don't take that breath. You've heard the term gym rat. You've seen fitness models all over social media touting how they achieve their enviable figures. Maybe you even have a friend who seems to spend all their time at the gym pushing themselves to the limits. No pain, no gain. Can there be too much of a good thing? When does working out become an addiction? Justin Baldoni is known for playing handsome, muscular characters like Rafael Solano in Jane the Virgin. Why were you trying to get in the shower with me? Like so many, his own masculinity became tied to how he looked. I ran track, I played soccer, and I tore my hamstring my senior year. And I lost everything. And I got depressed. So I overcompensated, like we all do, and I went in the gym and I tried to get as buff and strong and big as I could. And from that point on, the way that I, I felt in clothes, the way that other boys and other men looked at me, the way that other girls looked at me, I was like, oh, okay. So in order to get respect, in order to have the girls be attracted to me, in order to feel like I'm enough, I need to be big. You can use my shirt. And that began a whole journey in my 20s where I was just the dude that always would take off his shirt, that always had the six pack, that was just always in shape. Noah Neiman, the co-founder of Rumble Boxing, remembers 10 years ago showing us on ABC how to get the perfect V-cut. Make sure you're using your abs. I want you to 
to lean it back. It's this little ligament right there. Okay. So, here. Yeah. But even as the literal model of fitness, he too was his own harshest critic. I'm on national TV talking about, you know, looking good and feeling good in your abs, and I was self-conscious. And I'm a professional, and I was at home being like, oh, I should have done I some more sit-ups. I felt that I didn't look good. And aspirations of the ideal male physique don't just impact Hollywood actors and fitness professionals. My friend had like a gym in his shed in the back of his house, in like his garage. Um, and I went there and started lifting weights. I was hearing words of dedication and consistency and, and working hard and all, the, all these things that felt good, felt like I was getting that kind of respect. And a lot of this revolved around masculinity for me as well and the idea of being manly. Muscle dysmorphia, sometimes known as bigorexia, is a type of body dysmorphic disorder where someone perceives their body shape as a distressing flaw in their appearance that doesn't line up with how they might actually look. It affects mostly men uh, and boys who think their body build is too small and puny, that they're not big and muscular enough. Um, when in reality, they look entirely normal or some of them are very muscular, but they don't see themselves that way. The more you focus in on it, the more you can find flaws? Yes, and the more distorted your perception gets. Perhaps it's a little bit like staring at a word on a page that you're reading. After a while, it starts looking a little distorted and odd, right? Uh -huh. Dr. Katherine Phillips, along with her fellow authors, coined the term muscle dysmorphia more than 20 years ago in their book, The Adonis Complex. Take us back to the early 90s. I mean, how was body dysmorphia, or more specifically muscle dysmorphia, considered in society? Was it even considered at all? No, no. Uh, scientists weren't aware of it. Doctors weren't aware of it. If you think of Cary Grant and, you know, the era of my father, your grandfather, <laughs> they weren't obsessed with being muscular. They were perfectly happy with a sort of ordinary body build. And then over the decades, especially I'd say from the 1990s onward, we see an increasing emphasis on a more muscular male body in advertising, in action figures, the toys that boys play with. It's a secret crisis Dr. Phillips estimates 2 to 3% of the general population suffer from, largely in silence. I remember one of the first patients I saw with muscle dysmorphia, I noticed that he had six layers of t-shirts. He was trying to look bigger. And that idea of looking bigger has become an increasing expectation for men around the world. 26-year-old PhD student George Mycock from England says his journey with muscle dysmorphia started when he was just 13. When he originally began playing rugby to be tough like his dad people started to kind of call me big man or like people started to kind of award these violent behaviors that I would do on the pitch and people would associate me with being tough and being strong and being powerful. It became a part of his identity, an identity that was taken away when he broke his back and told he should never play rugby again. I was emotional eating because I was just upset about not being able to play rugby anymore um, and losing this part of my identity. So I gained a significant amount of weight. That's when George began to hit the gym arguably too often, but online forums told him otherwise. You know, the, the term freak is a term of endearment in the fitness community. If you want to become really muscular, you want to be you know, successful and push and pushing through this barrier, pe friends are going to not understand, your family is not going to understand, but it's your responsibility to ignore that and push through. After nearly 10 years of tough workouts and strict diets, he was still not satisfied with how he looked. I basically got to the point where I felt like I would never be what I wanted to be, and I felt like it would be better if I wasn't here. And one of my friends noticed that I'd been away for a long time, and I was literally on that day, I was planning how I was gonna do it. For trainer Noah, and a lot of men worldwide, his story parallels George's. I was really self-conscious, so I would avoid playing basketball because God forbid I was picked on the skins team. You're literally looking at the mirror, and I've done it before. You know, I've had, I've, I've, I've gone as extreme as, you know, eating the Rice Krispie treat and being like, damn, that's 100 calories, I gotta get on the bike. You think that negative thinking would have killed you? Yes, I mean, I was over-exercising. 